Have you ever played with a corpse? It happened when I was a little kid, just before when I was about to enter kindergarten. I went to the small valley with my family, grandparents, and my relatives. I was such a brave child as I was too young at the time. Just relying on my little swim tube, I used to play alone deep in the valley water without wearing a life jacket and come out and eat watermelon. My siblings were a little older than me, but being scared, they didn't come in. So I always hid them and then went into the water to tease them. And the adults were sitting on a low wooden bench near the valley just watching us. After eating lunch, I got bored again. I think it was about after five or six. I went back to the water to play alone. Thinking back, it was totally crazy. I was circling about with my hips crammed in a tube carelessly. I was in a situation where I might die right away if the tube flips. But I was just looking up at the sky and thinking that the clouds were pretty at that time. Then, suddenly, the center of my swim tube was shaken a little bit. That was the moment. A girl who looks like a middle school student suddenly grabbed my arm. Her lips looked slightly purple, as if she had been playing in the water for a long time. Then she smiled and said, as if she was reassuring me, You're gonna fall off. Grab it tightly. She looked kinda older than me, and I was just excited about the thing that she's gonna stay and play with me for a while. So I grabbed the tube, and then I swam with her. While she dragged my tube, I couldn't even realize what time it is now. I had so much fun with her. About an hour later, she started to take me to a shallow place near the riverside. It's going to be cold soon. I'll take you to the adults, she said. But at that moment, my grandmother suddenly screamed and kept shouting my name. She was very old and she didn't even come into the water, but she hurriedly came into the water with her socks on and she lifted me up and then ran out. Grandma, what's wrong? What happened? I shouted. But as soon as I came out of the water, my family tried to cover my eyes so I couldn't see the valley. And my grandma was crying while saying that I was possessed by a ghost. I remember going to a temple or shaman's house for a while after that. A few years later, I asked my grandmother what happened that day, and what she told me was a pure shock. The moment my grandmother looked at the valley to see if I was playing well alone, she saw that I was talking to myself while giggling, and something black got stuck at the end of my tube and was wobbling together. Wondering what I was so funny about, she put glasses on to see me and that black thing. And at that moment, she saw that I was swimming around holding someone's black and long hair. Her heart sank, and as she decided to approach me quickly, she then saw the dead body slowly coming up. That's why she ran towards me. Now that I think about it, that memory didn't scare me at all, literally. However, I still can't forget the faces of those adults who saw the scene. This story is about my grandfather's experience. He died a long time ago. After he was declared dead at the hospital, we took the body home and put it in his room because my grandmother wanted to see him a little more before saying goodbye to her husband. But then, something happened. Two days later, the room door suddenly opened and my grandfather crawled out asking for water. Literally, my grandmother and all of the aunts just fainted, and only my uncles and my mom were barely awake. And I was just staring at this weird sight because I was too young at the time. I gave my grandfather a whole body massage after I brought him water, and on that day, the house was in chaos. A few months later, I went to my grandparents' house again, and he was so lively that I couldn't believe that he's the one who once died. One day I was sitting with my grandfather eating ice cream, and he started to tell me a story. On that day, my grandfather woke up in the hospital, and he noticed that everyone was crying. He asked them why they were crying, but no one answered, so he was just standing there. And then a man in a black suit called him outside the hospital room. Without time to think, he began following him, and he started to feel a little bit sad rather than scared. The crying sound from behind gradually decreased, and as he walked along with the man, he could see the village where he used to live as a child. There was a river at his feet that he had never seen before, and the river was really, really red. So he got goosebumps. 
The man was walking on the surface of the water, and he pressed my grandfather to come over quickly. So the moment he tried to follow him, he was also walking on the water. After crossing the river, he then saw a black wooden structure long past the wasteland. When he was about to pass the gate, a woman in black mourning came out from the inside and kicked him out, saying, No, you brought the wrong person. If you want to live another three years of your life, go and ignore everyone you meet. Do not look back. Just follow the four-legged animal. The woman said like this and disappeared into the house with the man. So my grandfather was going back the way he came. And then he saw one of his friends who had died a few years ago standing there. He beckoned him to come closer, but my grandfather ignored him, thinking what the woman had said just before. Even if his friend cursed at him. After that, he met other friends, but he ignored all of them and just passed by. The moment he arrived at the river again, there was a bridge that was not there before. At that moment, he saw his daughter who had died of fever when she was young standing in front of the bridge. He could not ignore his daughter. So he approached and she stretched out her hand as if she wanted him to hold it for her. As soon as he was about to hold that hand, something pulled on his legs. When he looked down, he saw a white dog that had been raised by him a long time ago was biting his pants and dragging frantically as if he should not hold that hand. It's like he was telling him to cross the bridge immediately. He stepped back from his daughter quickly, and that was the moment when she suddenly rushed to him. Her mouth almost ripped to the ear and she repeated like this, I'm going to catch you. I'm going to take you. She was running toward him with a rope in her hand, and it was horrifying. He started to run toward the bridge, and the dog was barking at the ghost and guarded behind him. As soon as he crossed the bridge, that thing vanished with loud crying, and the dog was still barking as if he was telling him to hurry. He looked back when he was far away from the bridge, and then realized that the river, the bridge, the neighborhood, and the dog were all gone. The surrounding area was as white as a sheet. It was the moment when he finally opened his eyes and he found himself lying in his bed. Grandfather also told this story to his local friends, and the oldest man told him a story that had been told by a shaman. There's a ghost that brings the dead who met with violent death, and he suggested that the ghost that Grandfather saw seemed to be that kind of type. If ghosts lack a place to live in the afterlife, they would take the dead to build a new house. Anyway, after that, my grandfather lived really well for the rest of the three years, as the woman in the dream had said, and then he passed away while taking a nap on the same day he first died, three years ago. After that, I kept recalling my grandfather's lonely face while he told me a story at that time. My grandfather was not the type who originally believed in ghosts. While he was alive, he always cut the weeds around the grave and brought some drinks and snacks for the grave's owners whenever he saw the ownerless graves around his town. This, of course, is just my grandfather's very personal experience, so it's okay to think of it as just a novelty story, because he told me exactly the same thing. I guess he absolutely went to heaven, but I just miss my grandfather. I live in Limburg. That is the most southern province of the Netherlands. I'm 20 years old and all my life I've been wanting to work as a caretaker for people with a disability. Just a few months ago, my dream came true, and now I work as a full-time caretaker at a living facility in Maastricht. At this facility, my story takes place. The living facility is positioned just outside of Maastricht city. Before the building became a housing facility, it was a laundromat for the people living on that street. The facility consists of three houses that are internally connected. 
Each one can house eight people. That makes a total of 24 patients that live in the facility. Each patient has his or her own room, ranging from small to large to a separate bathroom and kitchen to a shared bathroom in the hallway. I first began working at this facility when I was just 17 years old, as an intern for my education. The story starts two years ago, when one of my patients that had lived there for three years moved out to live at another facility. His family claimed that the patient did not feel safe in his room because he would hear knocking coming from his closet. We made our apologies for the inconvenience, but didn't think much of it. One month later, when the room was cleaned and disinfected, a new patient came to live in the empty room. It was an elderly man, who I'll just refer to as Rick. Rick was a warm and kind-hearted man, who always loved talking about horses that he had as a child, as well as his great love for Russian opera. You'd always catch him sneaking into the kitchen to get a snack, or hear him sing opera. I must admit, he had quite a powerful and wonderful voice. At first, he would bid us a good night before he went to bed. But as time went by, Rick seemed more and more distressed. He didn't eat and didn't drink as much as he used to, and he lost weight at a troubling rate. He would sit quietly on the couch, staring blankly at nothing. When asked what was wrong, he would say that he had a terrible nightmare of some kind of creature lurking in his closet. My colleagues and I debated whether or not he could be getting Alzheimer's and would need testing for it. He had been tested, but nothing came out of those tests. Every night, Rick would scream us awake, and when we came into the room, he'd be sitting on his bed, trembling and pointing at the closet. He'd say that something crawled out of the closet and joined him in his bed. He described this creature as being skinny, even bony, with rotting meat hanging from its bones. The creature had green eyes, the same color as his deceased mother, and huge fingers that ended in claws. The creature's face was that of a human skull, those green eyes being nothing more than small lights, and a mouth that was filled with sharp teeth, like a crocodile. The creature would lie next to him in his bed, wrapping its claws around his body. Rick described so vividly how he could smell the horrible scent of decay as the creature opened his mouth to whisper in his ear, Get out! This is not your home! Rick would cover his ears as he said that, and he would soil himself. Poor Rick. My colleague checked the closet, but there was nothing there, and the only thing we could say was that everything was going to be fine. Fast forward about a month later, and Rick would wake up with markings all over his body. Deep scratches that appeared to be claw marks. There were even bite marks that were deeper and more animalistic than any human bite. Rick would not want to go into his room anymore, and he would bring his dinner to his room and place it at the door of his closet. My colleagues would take the food away, much to Rick's horror. He'd say that we would make the creature angry, and if it was angry, it would punish him. I feel so sorry for him, especially seeing the fear in his eyes as we scolded him and took away the plate. There was two weeks of this, the same thing happening with Rick. One of my closest colleagues and I were working the night shift one night. We were making our usual rounds, checking if everyone was sleeping and all the machinery was still up and running. That was when we heard a horrible, bone-chilling scream echo through the building. The scream came from Rick's room. We stormed in, throwing the door open hard, revealing a horrible sight. Rick was lying on his back in his bed while he was grasping for air. He was clawing at his neck and chest, ripping the flesh off, making bloody gashes all over his upper body. His bed and himself were covered in blood, and there was a trace of blood leading to his closet, which was now slightly opened. My colleagues dialed 112, 
That's the emergency line in the Netherlands. While I desperately tried to stop Rick from clawing, the only thing Rick did was scream, as if possessed, and stared at the ceiling. After what seemed like forever, the ambulance came and took Rick away. A week later, we received the sad news that Rick had died. The room once again was left empty. The blood was cleaned up by a cleaning company and the room would be occupied soon enough. But even before the room was occupied, I found another patient standing in the room in front of that closet. Hey, what are you doing in here? I asked her as I walked into the room. The patient had stared at me and had muttered, This room should not be occupied ever again. It is angering him. Uh, who's him? I asked with a shaky voice. You know who I mean. The devil who lived in the closet. After she said that, she walked out of the room and left me breathless. Two weeks later, that same patient moved into the room. I don't know why she was placed in that room, but I do know that she too changed. She can't remember her own name now, and all she does is sit in front of that closet, talking to the devil. I don't know what's going on at my work, but strange things keep happening. Colleagues tell stories of hearing footsteps in the hallways, Others hear whispers in the garden, and one even claimed to have been attacked by a shadow demon. Whatever's going on, one thing is for sure. The creature in the closet is real, and he's not happy about our patient living in his room. Back in the 70s, when I was a teenager, I had a girlfriend named Daisy who was a neighborhood babysitter. Everyone on my block used her to watch their kids when they would go out. There was no need for her to have a regular job, because she made good money babysitting. I would usually stop by after the kids went to sleep, and hang out with her until the parents got back, where I'd quietly make my exit and wait for her outside to walk her home. I remember that this was a couple of days after Halloween 1977. I'll never forget that year's Halloween, because that was the night I was clipped by a drunk driver while I was riding my bike. The guy ended up going to jail, but that's another story. The point is I would not be visiting Daisy that night because of my broken arm and fractured rib, but she said that she would call me after the kids went to sleep. So I spent the evening in my living room watching television, waiting for Daisy to call me. I would say it was around 8.30 when the phone rang. Hello. Hey, it's me. What's up, babe? Did the little rascal finally pass out? Yeah, Mrs. Clark let him eat all of his leftover candy before I got here, and he was bouncing off the walls for a while. Sounds like fun. Totally, but it's pretty funny to see little Dennis when he's all hyper. He talks so fast that it sounds like he's speaking another language. <laughs> Is that so? Yeah, but anyway, how's your arm? Eh, it still sucks. It's just like crazy. And when I try to scratch at it, I end up moving it. And that's when I feel the pain come back. Ooh, jeez. Yeah, tell me about it. I'm just grateful it's my left arm, and that my dad does a really bad job at hiding his dirty magazines. <laughs> oh, shut up, you perv. So, what are you wearing? Hmm, I'm not answering that. Use your imagination. Be careful what you wish for. I might just... Shh. I think I heard something outside. Very funny, Daisy. No, I'm serious. I think I just heard someone walking around outside. I could tell by the sound of her voice, Daisy was a little creeped out. Maybe the Clarks are home? No, they said they wouldn't be back until 9am tomorrow. I'm staying the night here. Okay, don't freak out. Maybe it's just a stray cat or something. It didn't sound like a cat. Just stay on the phone with me while I go check it out. Okay. A couple of seconds went by, and the next thing I heard was the sound of glass shattering followed by Daisy screaming at the top of her lungs. And the 
the line went dead. I quickly got up, left my house, and made my way over to the Clark's residence as quickly as I could. They lived at the very end of the block, so it took me about five minutes to get there. When I arrived, the front door was open, and I could see Daisy lying face down on the living room floor in a pool of blood. I quickly got to her and turned her over with my good arm. She had been stabbed in the chest. At first, I thought Daisy was dead, but I soon realized she was just unconscious. I applied pressure to her wound and looked behind me to see that Dennis was by the stairs. He had a look of absolute terror on his face. Dennis, buddy, I need you to call the police. Tell them that someone broke in and attacked Daisy. I actually knew Dennis very well. My dad and his dad were very good friends. So Dennis wasn't afraid of me, and he also wasn't a complete moron like most kids on my block. He did what he was told. While I was trying to stop the bleeding, I happened to see that one of the large living room windows had been completely shattered. That was where the attacker must have entered, and then left through the front door. The police and ambulance showed up a few minutes later, and Daisy was rushed to the emergency room. The police contacted the Clarks to explain the situation, and Dennis ended up staying at my house until they got back. When Daisy finally came to, she was hysterical and could not tell the police any details about her attacker. It was completely random. Nothing like this had ever happened in my neighborhood before. This incident pretty much destroyed our entire community. Nobody trusted anyone after this. A rumor even started that I was the one who attacked Daisy that night. Unfortunately, Daisy ended up suffering from mental complications brought on by the trauma of this event. Our relationship fell apart, and she moved away a year later. I'm sad to say that she developed a drug addiction, which led to her taking her own life in 1983. The police never found out who the intruder was, or what his motives were. Nothing from the house had been taken. It's truly a shame that they never caught the person. Because of their actions, they destroyed a wonderful community. And I can't imagine the anguish that Daisy's parents went through watching their daughter turn from a happy normal girl into an emotional wreck. It's sad, but this is the world we live in. I don't advocate that you live your life in fear. That's not healthy. But be aware that there are people out there who are just pure evil. And sometimes, they don't have a reason for doing the horrible things they do. Back when we moved into our house, we were introduced to all of our neighbors by them coming to our house with cookies or brownies, kind of like they do in the movies. This was a nice, quiet, middle-class neighborhood made up of mostly older white people and new families. I mention that because we were the only black family in the neighborhood. No black wives, husbands, not even adopted children. We didn't really find it strange though. It was just very clear that we were different. I was about 13 years old at the time and my brother was 15. Our backyard was about a half an acre and is fenced, but it's also connected to two other houses backyards. Each one is about half the size of ours, but we all have separating fences. So to paint a picture, there's a T-shaped fence separating our backyards. The house to the left was the home of an older man named Tom. He kind of reminded me of Willie Nelson, but without the cool pigtails. He liked to be outside shirtless and usually with a denim vest, no matter what the weather was. He was a pretty well-built man, but visibly kind of frail. We actually found him to be quite funny, in a creepy old guy type of way. As I got older, he had started to make comments. I played in the backyard with my dogs a lot, and Tom could see me in his living room window that faced his backyard. Whenever I glanced over, I could always see him in the window just standing there watching me. When he noticed that I saw him, he'd come out and talk to me. I would try to get away before he would come out, but sometimes I was just too slow. I didn't want to make it too obvious, so I would just walk. But if I didn't make it inside, he'd yell for me to come back. I never got too close to the fence, though. I'd speak from a distance. 
He would ask me about school, what grade I was in, tell me I was pretty, and ask if I was old enough to have a boyfriend. Also if I had an older sister or older friends that looked like me. It was pretty weird, but I'd just laugh it off. But after a few questions, he'd stop talking to me and just stare at me, silently. I would always give an excuse about needing to go inside, and he would nod and stand at the fence and just watch me walk back into the house. This kind of thing happened almost weekly. My mom really loves to decorate, so she changes the house decor every few months or so. It's pretty annoying, actually. During one of her designing sprees, she had decided to get a new sliding glass door for the back porch, which required her to take the curtains down in the living room. It took forever to get them installed, but she figured that there was no point in putting the curtains back up if we'd have to take them back down again. Fine, I guess. Now, our family TV was in the living room. I didn't have a TV in my room, so I'd often watch TV late into the night in the living room with my brother. One night, my brother went to bed pretty early, so I decided to watch TV by myself that night. Right around midnight or so, I had turned off the TV so I could go to bed. I got up from the couch, turned off the light, and then turned around to see another light on. Not in my house, but in Tom's house. It was in his living room, and he was there, just standing in the window watching me. I later told my parents about it, but they just shrugged it off. I'm a pretty anxious soul, so I often just chalk things up to my anxiety. Fine. Not too long afterwards, though, my dogs had started to get sick. I would take them out to play and they'd start throwing up or have diarrhea. We knew that it wasn't their food because we didn't give them anything new. We also threw away the dog treats that we recently bought just in case that was the problem. But it didn't stop. I had started to notice that every time I let them out alone, they'd always run straight over to Tom's fence jumping up and down and wagging their tails. He would slowly walk outside, reach over the fence, and then feed them his treats, which was really odd because Tom didn't even have a dog. I told my parents and my dad went to talk to him, telling him the dogs were getting sick. Tom had apologized and he had also stopped feeding them, and they got better. A few weeks later, I was coming home from school. My brother was in the grade above me and I was a senior, so he was in college at the time. Whenever I got home, no one else would be home for a few more hours. I had a routine. I would put my book bag downstairs, then change clothes, let the dogs out of their cages on the porch, get a snack, and then let them back in. For some strange reason, I was just unusually excited to see my dogs that day. So instead of going upstairs, I went straight to the back porch. I had got to the door to open it, and I then saw Tom just sitting on the ground right in front of the dog's cages. I froze. He didn't see me, though. I looked over to see if the door was locked, but it wasn't. I had began to lock it as slowly as possible so it didn't make a noise, but it did. Tom then looked over and he saw me standing there. I ran upstairs to go call my parents. My mom's a nurse, so she didn't have her phone on. And my dad, well, my dad just never answered the phone. I didn't really think that it was serious enough to call the police, so instead I just hid. After about a moment though, I had then heard Tom knock on the door. It wasn't loud or aggressive though. It was almost like friendly, like he just wanted to talk. I tried my dad's phone yet again and he then answered. I was crying hysterically and I had then told him that Tom was on the porch. He said he'd head home but he was about an hour away. I just sat in my room just waiting for my dad. The knocking stopped. All I remember was that my dad got home and Tom was gone. I don't really know what happened between Tom and my dad but he did stop coming outside and talking to me. He never did stop watching though always standing in his living room. Sometimes I'd see him through the window and he would wave at me, but always with the light on, just so I knew that he was still there. It was pretty creepy. I grew up in what people would consider a bad household. My mom and dad were in a bad relationship, 
and they did nothing but argue every day. My mom would complain that my dad would stick in the basement almost every day and never spend any time with me. And my dad would always have the same response, that he's doing research down there. The only problem was that we were prohibited from going down to the basement. Three locks were built into the basement door, and he kept his one key on his old key ring. The key had a torn blue sticker at the bottom of it with a brown rusty tip. However, my mom finally got a hold of it somehow. And that same day when I came home from school, Dad suddenly told me she left us for another man. He seemed truly broken and sunk in his misery. So I tried acting, I mean, pretending to be normal at first. But I couldn't stop crying like a baby when I finally got back in my room. After a few months of emotional breakdowns, my dad finally got over it. Furthermore, he started to visit the basement more consistently to the point where I would feel like I lived alone. I kept thinking my dad was working very hard since I saw him being very distraught after coming upstairs from the basement. I thought everything was fine until I started hearing noises at night. They weren't just regular noises. It was kind of someone's crying and scream of agony. But the most disturbing sound of all was the sound of growling, like some kind of beast would exist down in the basement. The next morning, I complained to my dad, but he acted like he had no idea what I was talking about as he walked past me to get ready for work. So I just shook it off, assuming that he was watching some horror movie down there, or if I was just imagining the whole thing. I went back to my room. As it was the weekend, I was ready to catch up on some Saturday morning cartoons. I turned on my TV, and as I got ready to change the channel, I heard a familiar name. The news reporter was naming over 40 missing people in our town, and my mom was one of those names as they briefly showed her picture and information. I was confused about who would file a missing person report for her because my grandparents both died in a tragic car accident years ago. She had no siblings, and my dad told me she left us for another man. I wanted to inform my dad, but soon I was concerned it would make him depressed again. And in a way, I was still angry at her for leaving us. So I ignored it and changed the channel. A few minutes later, my dad came in to tell me he was leaving for work. He gave me a kiss on my forehead and informed me that he'd be back later that night. After he left, I invited my best friend Austin to come over. He then arrived shortly after and we played a game on my PlayStation. As we were about to plunge into the game, we suddenly heard a strange noise coming from the basement. What was that? Austin asked, being confused. I don't know. My dad does some kind of experiments down there. It's probably a rat or something. Austin looked amused. No, dude, we can't go down there. My dad said so, I said quickly, bringing an end to Austin's excitement. It has no reason to doubt that Austin was disappointed. Then he asked for something to drink, so I went to the kitchen to get some juice for him. However, I was hit with a foul odor of something rotting as soon as I arrived in the kitchen. I looked around to see what could be the cause of the smell, and I found that the basement door was cracked open. I went to close it, but the curiosity got the best of me, so I called Austin to help me investigate. We darted down the stairs to the basement, clenching our noses at that horrible smell. It was dark until Austin found a light switch and quickly flicked it on. However, we had to regret our decision instantly after we saw the inside of the basement. There were people hanging from hooks with random limbs missing. As we were standing in horror, Austin clenched my shirt strongly. I could see the piles of feces and human remains contained within certain sections of the room. But the most disturbing and disgusting sight of all was the cage in the dark right corner of the room. The inside of it seemed to be a person sleeping at first. But as it looked up, I quickly realized that thing was not a person. Wh what is that? Austin shouted, shaking with fear. I ignored his question. Uh, to be more specific, I couldn't answer. That thing was indescribably frightening. It looked like a deformed human with its mouth filled with crooked and ragged teeth covering a majority of its face. 
Its face pointed outward with creases where the nose should be. The eyes were bulging out of its head as it fixated its glance toward Austin and me. Food, it said to us slowly with excitement and a malicious voice. Then it started clawing at the iron bars of the cage with its needle-like hands. I sat there in horror until Austin grabbed my wrist. We ran up the stairs scrambling for the escape and shut the door. After I made sure it was perfectly locked, I saw Austin sitting on the carpet floor with his knees to his chest. Once we had a few moments of silence, I then finally realized what really happened to my mom and those missing people in our town. At that instant, Austin muttered like this. Your dad, he was feeding those people to that thing. Now, what should I do now? It was one night. I was drinking out with my two friends when we left the bar after drinking and chattering for a long time. The last bus had left already. Well, I guess we have to stay a night somewhere, one of my friends told me, and we had no choice but to stop at the motel and sleep together. We lay side by side in bed and it was about two hours after that everyone became quiet. The one who was sleeping in the middle suddenly woke me up with a frightened face. Hey, let's get out of here right now, she said. What? We just lied down, I grumbled. But she said this again and again in haste. Please, let's go. I'll tell you the reason later. If you want to stay here, then I'll leave alone. I felt something uneasy about her reaction, so I woke up and shook another friend's shoulder lying next to me. But he didn't wake up no matter how many times I woke him up. Since we were all drunk and couldn't communicate properly with each other, I finally decided to go back with her first, leaving him in the motel. While I was just killing my time at a convenience store nearby until the time of the first bus, my cell phone suddenly rang. It was a phone call from him who was at the motel. Wasn't he sleeping? Thinking like that, I answered the phone and he screamed at once. Why do you guys leave me alone in that room? Oh no, he must have seen it too, she muttered blankly. Later, my friends said that they saw something in the room. As one of my friends felt thirsty during sleeping, she woke up and went to the refrigerator to get some water. And at that moment, a woman with long hair suddenly appeared from the ceiling, hanging upside down. Her face was covered with blood. She heard a voice from her that seemed to appeal to something, but she couldn't understand what it meant. Her body was so stiff that she couldn't move as if she had been paralyzed. However, the moment she turned her eyes, the woman disappeared and she was finally able to move again. Early that day, I joined with my boyfriend and went home right away, but I couldn't get rid of my uncomfortable feeling, and I couldn't get over it until the next day around noon. So we ended up heading back to the motel to complain to the custodian. However, the police and police cars were crowded around the hotel when we got there. We found the custodian in front of the hotel entrance and approached him. What's going on here? Anyway, I'd like to tell you that we are very upset and unpleasant that we'd seen something here yesterday. While I was explaining about this, his gloomy face was slowly contorted, and he slowly opened his mouth when I finished talking. There was a woman who was killed last night in another room after being hit on the head by a baseball bat. The room where she died was the one right above where we were asleep yesterday, and my friend saw a woman's ghost in the ceiling almost at the same time as the woman was killed. The moment we heard the story, we got goosebumps and came back home hurriedly, the moment she died, she might have wanted to show up to ask us for help desperately. That's what I think to this day. Back in 2016, my friend Lachlan and I thought about doing the best prank ever. It's the ghost girl walking through the streets prank. I went to some Halloween store where they sell the white dress that's the perfect fit for Lachlan. Then I got some red paint for fake blood for the white dress and a long wig for covering Lachlan's face. After buying the stuff, I went home to set it up. Lachlan tried on the whole costume and I thought it was pretty scary. Scary enough to scare my friends, at least. These other two friends are Jesse and Gavin. Now it was time to set the plan into motion. I called the two of them and told them to meet each other in the car. 
then come pick me up so we could drive around that night, around 10 p.m. They agreed and hung up. It was 8 p.m. at the time. The perfect time, in fact, to take Lachlan in his costume to the scary bridge that no one drives through anymore. It took us about half an hour to get there. I dropped Lachlan off on the scary bridge, telling him, When you see the light of their car, walk all creepy like a ghost girl. See you when we're done. I drove back to the house and waited until 10. Soon Jesse and Gavin arrived, and I hopped in their car. I asked Jesse, who was driving, Hey man, can I drive tonight? He replied, Sure, why not? He let me in the driver's seat, and we took off. Now this is where the fun begins. I make my way to the same street where I drove to drop Lachlan off on the scary bridge. But things get weird here. I must have driven about 20 minutes when I saw Lachlan walking on the road. He wasn't on the bridge, but the road. All Jesse and Gavin saw was a creepy, ghost-looking girl walking on the road. They were practically begging me to drive away now. I told them, Wait, I need to text uh, Lachlan about this. I texted him. Hey, dude, why are you ten minutes away from the bridge and walking on the road? A few seconds later, Lachlan texted back. He said, What do you mean? I'm at the bridge waiting for y'all. Where are you anyway? My heart sank when I read that. Quickly, I texted back. Wait there, I'm picking you up. We're not doing this anymore. So, Lachlan was ten minutes away. Who was in this costume? What are the odds that it's another prankster in the same outfit? Jesse and Gavin were still begging me to go back. I told them, We need to go past this prankster. Jesse shouted, No way! I ignored him and I began to drive past whoever was in the same costume. I drove slowly and steadily. When I passed the person, I got a glimpse of their face. I couldn't breathe. What I saw was either the most realistic looking makeup, or that was not a costume. I drove faster now, knowing that I had to pick Lachlan up, but tempted to just drive away. Ten minutes later, I made it to the bridge where Lachlan was waiting. He was just sitting on a rock waiting for me. I honked at him and he came in. Lachlan asked me what was going on. Now everyone needed an answer. I told Lachlan what happened, and I told Jesse and Gavin about the prank we had planned. It was supposed to be a prank for you guys, but it was interrupted. I began to drive back, dreadfully knowing we'd have to pass the same stretch of road where we saw that girl. But ten minutes later, when we should have been seeing her, she wasn't there. But I wasn't going to ask why. I just wanted to get home safely. Twenty minutes after that, we got back home okay. We all talked about what happened. After the conversation, Jesse and Gavin headed home. Lachlan stayed the night, which was probably for the better, because what we saw that night made me lose sleep and terrified me for months. This incident happened when I was around 10 years old. I lived in a small village. There were about a hundred people in the town, and there was a lady who used to live next door. She was a very kind person. She used to bake cookies to give us, bring flowers sometimes. I mean, everybody in the town loved her. Until one day, she went missing. All the neighbors tried to look for her. We even reported to the police to make a search for her, but she was never found anywhere after that. She had been missing for years and there had been rumors around the town that she had committed suicide. However, I didn't believe those rumors, because I knew that she would never do such a thing. A few years later, I became 16, 
and I was playing with my friends one day. We found that there was a storage container while we were hanging around the town. To be specific, it had been there since I was 10, but I never wanted to open it since it stank of something rotten so badly. Hey, can you open that door? One of my friends started to tease me, and as a stupid teenager, I didn't want to be a loser, so I decided my mind. It was really hard to open when I grabbed the door, but I tried strongly. And when the door had opened, what I found at that moment still creeps me out to this day. There she was. The blood was spread in all directions. She had no eyeballs. All the organs were empty, and the maggots were crawling on her body everywhere. It was literally awful. Smelling inside stench, I cried and called my parents, and they immediately called the police. After that, the police started a huge investigation again, and they eventually detected who it was. Turned out, it was a man who was living in our village. The police told my parents that she was murdered that night when all the neighbors tried to find her. I'm glad the criminal was arrested finally, but I still can't stop thinking about her death to this day. I, I feel sorry for her. I hope she can rest in peace. One evening, I got hungry on my way home, so I found a restaurant nearby. I can't remember the detail of the restaurant's name exactly. It was some kind of a weird word like an old man mispronounced, something like that. When I went inside, I could see a table with glass on top of green felt, a strange tiger frame made of a hooked needle kit, and the fish bowl which was encrusted with yellow slime. There were no guests at all. The damp smell of the subway hit my nose, and the inside was just dark with only dimly yellow light. It seemed a bit weird, but then I caught someone's eye that seemed like the owner of the restaurant, so I just sat down. He came up to me and handed me the menu. When I opened it, there was a flash on the photos everywhere, as if it were just taken before the car accident. And the whole time I watched them, I felt that my appetite was decreasing. Unless I had deluded myself, the menu was all consist of French fine cuisine, such as faux gras. However, the name of the menu had many typos, and the calligraphic style was so countrified, it was a total mess. Well, I guess I came in the wrong place. Let's just finish the food and get out quickly. Thinking this, I raised my hand to order something, but he just stared at me. About a few seconds later, he approached me again but the way of his tone was kind of odd. May I ha have your order, sir? With a strangely bright voice, he went inside, but I could not hear any cooking sound for more than ten minutes. The quiet inside gave me the chills, and at that moment, I could feel that someone was watching me. When I turned around, the owner, who thought he had gone in to cook, was sitting on the back chair and staring at me. I asked him with a puzzled look, Uh, is there someone in there to cook? Maybe he's warming it up, right? However, he was just smiling, staring at me without saying any words. A few minutes later, I felt burdened by his gaze suddenly, so I just left the store. Come to think of it, I came out because he didn't start any cooking. But anyhow, I didn't feel good for some reason at that time. Just in case he would come after me with a smile on his face, I closed the door and ran away from the restaurant with all my strength. I know that it wasn't that scary, but it was the most uncomfortable place in my whole life. The atmosphere of the restaurant and the owner, everything was strange. I am a truck driver. I work for a certain water company that is located in Michigan. The route that I drive for this company takes me as far as the Upper Peninsula, down to Central Michigan. 
To give an idea of where this creepy experience took place, I was near Roscommon County. This was way back in late January, when the night would come as quickly as 5 p.m. I was driving down a rural highway around 8 p.m., and a snowstorm was picking up. As I was cruising down the highway, my truck began to sputter and shake. With a sigh, I pulled off to the side of the road, turned on my hazard lights, and put the vehicle in park. I've been dealing with this all day because of a coolant leak in the heater core. I have to fill up the coolant reservoir, which takes about five minutes. Dressed in nothing more but my regular clothes and a baseball cap, I exit my truck and I enter the snowy January night. I unlatched my hood and pulled it up. The sound of it opening was the only sound to be heard. It was very quiet out there at the time except for some blowing wind. The night was overcast and very dark due to the storm. My only light was from the hazards on the truck and a small flashlight in my mouth. The thick line of woods is about 100 feet away from each side of the road, and as I began to fill up the coolant reservoir, I heard some rustling in the undergrowth about 150 to 200 feet deeper in the woods. I thought nothing of it due to the fact that deer are common even during winter. But the strangest thing was the rustling was quite loud, like a lot louder than animals would usually be. I mean, the wind was blowing decently hard, but I could still hear the rustling in the woods. I was wondering what could be so loud when I heard a loud crack and a soft thud. Now this noise really got my attention. It didn't sound like a deer anymore, it sounded more like a person stumbling around. Humans are very loud in the woods and no animal would purposely make a noise to give itself away like that, especially that loud. Yes, there were bears, but it wasn't a big concern for me in that area. Now, a real concern I had was that the last house I saw was about 10 miles away, and no cars had passed me by yet, and somehow there was some dude walking around out there in the woods in the middle of a snowstorm. Still cautious of the guy walking around, I finished refilling the reservoir. I locked the hood down and began to enter the truck. Before exiting the truck, I had the windows down. I kept them down due to the fact I could still hear the guy out there. Then, as soon as the crashing around the forest started, it just as quickly stopped. That put me on edge. I turned the key in the ignition. A loud beep resounded from the truck dash, therefore allowing me to turn it on. The truck roared to life, and I started to pull back onto the road to continue driving. As soon as my truck started rolling, I heard the crashing start up again, but at a loud and quickened pace. By the sound of it, whatever it was seemed to be making a line straight for the truck. I thought this guy was dumb or something, but it still freaked me out so I pushed the truck to go faster. With the hazard light still on, I could see the outer edges of the semi. And then, I saw them. There was a person running near the rear passenger side of the trailer. The creepy part about it was that I was traveling at about 15 miles per hour and pushing it, still climbing, and the guy was fast enough to keep up, and he was closing the distance to my cab. Now, with the cold sweat, I pushed the truck into a higher gear, and the engine roared louder. I was pushing 25 miles per hour, and this guy was almost to the cab, when all of a sudden he just disappeared. It seemed he was so focused on catching up with the truck that he fell to notice and hit the guardrail on the side of the road. Though it still freaked me out, I continued traveling down the road ignoring the speed limits until I got to the hotel I would be staying at. That was just one of the creepiest moments on the road. This is the story about an incident where my friend was almost killed by a stranger. So this was around February, 
I was heading home after hanging out with my best friend as usual. We had to walk maybe 20 to 30 minutes to reach each other's houses. There was a two-way road with a Y shape in the neighborhood, and I had to go left and my friend had to go right. All of a sudden, my friend called me two or three minutes after we had separated. But when I answered the phone, I could only hear him breathing and walking around. At first, I hung up and started walking again, wondering if my friend accidentally called me. But he instantly called me again. This time, he started to talk, making a joke that wasn't very funny, and started laughing to himself. What is wrong with him? Is he really crazy? Or did something happen to him? Thinking like this, I told him to text me. I couldn't figure out what was going on. A few minutes later, I received a text message. Dude, someone's following me. And he's singing alone, breathing hard, and his lyrics make me go crazy. Seriously. I replied, asking what the lyrics were, and another response came a bit later. Wait. 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 Wait, wait, wait for me. Wait, 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 wait. Stop at the right spot before you get home, because I'm going to kill you. I won't get caught. Come on, turn around before you get home. It won't hurt because I'm going to stab you with my knife. It was a very long text written roughly like this. The lyrics were the same as the popular song at the time, but only that part of the lyrics was different. So I just called the police right away. Yes, just go straight ahead in front of the alley. Please, come quickly. In fact, both the right and left roads were alleys, and there was a row of fancy buildings around the place. So I didn't know where exactly my friend was. I began to worry as I was walking for a while. Because I kept thinking about the text messages from my friend. Soon, I heard the police car from far away, and it was getting closer. I texted again to reassure him. Hey, I just called the police to see if you are okay. So don't worry, they're coming. I could see the car lights getting closer behind me. I thought the car was going to pass the road I was on, so I tried to move aside. But at that moment, I got a reply from my friend. Dude, are you sure they are coming? I heard the siren too, but... I froze. The police car came into the alley where I was standing. I went to the officer who was in the car and spoke to him. Excuse me, sir. I'm the one who called. And you should have gone the other way, not this way. I told you, it's on the right side. The police then said, I'm sorry. We have so many cases to deal with. I'll go back to the opposite side. Then he drove the other way. Are they kidding? The police just headed towards you. Is he still singing? I soon got a reply to my text. Yeah, but you know what? The lyrics have changed. Then he wrote down the lyrics again, and they were like this. Don't. 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 Don't text. Don't call. Don't do it. Put down the phone you're holding right now. I'll stab you. Don't worry, it won't hurt you. Read the text that just came in right now. If it's the one you met earlier, I'd stab him too. I thought this was going to be a big, big problem, and that my friend might die. I ran home quickly. I threw my bag to the side after arriving home, called my parents in a hurry, and we headed to my friend's house. My parents and his parents incidentally went to the same place from elementary school to high school, so they got along well. I was running to my friend's house with my parents, but suddenly I started hearing the sound of a police car again. As we were walking toward the direction where my friend was supposed to be, I heard some noise, and he was standing there in front of me. Recalling the creepy moment a while ago, I thought I might cry as soon as I saw my friend. I hugged my friend and asked, what happened to him? What happened to you? My friend said the man who was following him was now handcuffed and in a police car. The moment I looked at the man, I got goosebumps. The man. He was staring and grinning from his ear to ear. And the next thing that happened was he was taken to the police station, and we headed to the same place. When we arrived, my friend and I explained everything we had seen and heard from the guy. 
and the police decided to make him guilty due to the fact that he threatened my friend. I could see my parents, and my friend's parents got mad at him. By the way, it was the first time I knew my mother was really good at cursing at someone. Then the police told us that we could go now. After we got out, we decided to go to a nearby restaurant to eat and calm ourselves down. It might seem like nothing to y'all, but I was still nervous at the thought that if I had been a little bit late, he would have been in really big trouble. Since then, my friend moved to a house next to ours, and now we're always together, like when going to school or coming home from school. I think that horrible incident happened to him because we went home too late that day, and because he was alone. So, nowadays, we always go home early. After the incident, our bond and friendship became much stronger. And most of all, it was fortunate that my friend was not hurt at all that day. I wonder what the man who threatened my friend is doing now. I hope this never happens again. When I was about 14 years old, my dad and I took a road trip to Nevada to visit my uncle. It was already dark outside. As we were driving along this dark road, the car suddenly stopped, which I thought that's kind of weird because we had filled up our car's gas tank full just a couple of minutes ago. My dad got out of the car to check what was wrong with it. As he was trying to check the problem, I then suddenly heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around, but there was nothing. In fact, I couldn't see it at all because of the darkness. Maybe I just misheard it, thinking like this when I shrugged it off and the car suddenly rumbled, and I knew that meant it was turning back on. Well, I see a gas station up ahead. Let's stop there, my dad said as I went back to listen to my music. When we made to the gas station, he asked me to go pay for the gas and get some snacks that I want. I agreed and stepped out of the car with a few bucks. However, when I got off, I could feel that it was quiet around. It was pretty weird, but we were in the middle of the road now, so I guess it was not that weird thing. So I entered the building and went up to the counter. There was a man behind it staring at me as I approached him. At first, he looked like he was shocked to see me a little bit, like I interrupted or bothered him for some reason. And soon I could realize that his appearance looked kind of scary. He was a totally skinny man with black hair and worn-out clothing. He didn't say any welcome greetings like those common sentences, hello or how's your day. He just stared at me with his big, beady eyes. I picked up some snacks, put the money under the slit, and just waited for him to take it. Then he started laughing at me. Hey kid, you know what? I'm not the one who works here. I didn't understand what he's talking about now. I slowly took a look behind the counter, and then I saw a body lying there. What the heck? What is it? I was absolutely in shock, and I was positive that he must have noticed it because it was the exact moment when he stopped laughing. I screamed at the top of my lungs and started to run to my dad. He turned the corner of the counter and started to follow my back, which was lucky to me that I was much quicker than him. My dad saw me, but as he saw the man chasing after me, he couldn't ask what happened. And then we just both hopped in the car and locked the doors. The man banged on the driver's side door and yelled, Let me in! I'm gonna kill you, little girl! I burst out crying, and my dad told me to get in the back seat immediately. I jumped back there, and as I saw his knife in hand, I cried even harder. A loud banging sound from outside kept getting louder and louder. I hid under the seat, and after that, I blacked out. When I woke up again, I could see the police lights were everywhere. I got out of the car and asked quietly to my dad what happened, but he didn't notice me approaching and continued talking to the officer. Turns out the man had broken in the gas station and killed the employee just right before when my dad pulled up the car. He was on the loose from the police because he had committed multiple robberies and murders in the past. And he was the one who ran behind the car to the gas station, which I didn't see at that time. After that, we ended up making it to my uncle's, but I never went on long road trips again. I would always take airplanes. A couple of years after I finished my junior year, I found out the man had been killed in prison. I don't know the reason, but I don't feel sorry for him at all. 
Well, now I'm 25 years old and I still thank my dad every day for saving my life. But I also wonder what would have happened if I couldn't run fast or if my dad wasn't there at the time. Harvey, my unfriendly roommate. This takes place in my old house where I used to live with my mom and older sister. From a very young age, I started believing in ghosts and paranormal beings because of our roommate, which we used to call Harvey. Harvey wasn't a human being, even an animal, either. It's a strange entity that you couldn't see. I'm not sure if he's a ghost or a demon. All I know is that he's definitely not a human. When Harvey started appearing, he seemed harmless because all he did was just playing pranks, such as turning lights randomly on and off around the house or slamming doors. And next it was on my sixth birthday. I got a lot of presents and my grandma gave me a helium balloon with a princess on it. It just sat in a corner of our living room for a few days. It was almost completely deflated but still hovering about three inches off the ground. Then Harvey started to grab the balloon and bring it everywhere in the house with him. If Harvey went into the basement or the bedrooms, we could notice that he was there because of the balloon. Because there was a balloon around him, we'd know that Harvey was following or watching at us. Of course, we were all pretty scared at first, but we eventually got used to it. Harvey seemed not to like that, so he started acting differently, like more scary things. One night I woke up because it felt like there was something heavy on my chest. I couldn't breathe, so when I opened my eyes to see what's going on, then I saw a figure sitting on my chest that looked like a little boy. He had wide eyes, and it was much bigger than any human's eye. I could see his frightening smile stretching from ear to ear, and I suddenly realized that he was holding the helium balloon in his right hand. My heart dropped at that moment. I definitely could say that it was Harvey. I screamed as loud as I could, but Harvey put his hands around my neck and started strangling me at the same time. I was overwhelmed with so much fear. I didn't understand what was happening. Then everything went black. When I woke up again, it was in the middle of the morning, and that was the last time I've ever seen Harvey in my house. When I was in elementary school, a prank pretending to be a ghost and making people frightened had caught on through SNS. In my case, I was still young at that time. I also wanted to try that prank, so that evening, I went to the stairway of the apartment's emergency exit, crouched down on the stair, and waited for the people to come in. Just then, I saw a boy coming to the emergency exit. He didn't say anything, but just stared at me. I thought it was a perfect time, so I decided to play a prank on him. Do you see me? I was laughing up my sleeve, and then I suddenly saw his chilling grin. Wow, you see me too? As soon as he asked me back, I felt like my mind went blank at that moment. The exit was completely dark. Then the sensor lights once blinked. When I looked forward, There was a boy standing in a weird position that people could not even try. He was staring at me with his body facing the exit and his neck turning 180 degrees. I jumped up to the exit in fear. As soon as I turned around before opening the door, I saw his head begin to turn slowly, staring at me with a curious look. And then I could barely get out from there. When I was in high school, I was on my way home after finishing my night study. It was late at night when I finally got home. I was about to turn on the light, then I saw my mom was staring at me from the front porch. Mom, why are you standing there? Come out. Speaking naturally, I walked towards the kitchen to drink some water and then found a note on the table. I'm going to attend a night meeting. Eat your dinner with your brother. What? Then, who is she? My heart dropped. I thought I should not stay here anymore. However, I was terrified that it would follow me right away if I tried to run at that moment. 
So I slowly began to walk across the living room toward the front door. And it was still standing in the same position, but only its eyes kept following my moving. I left the house in my bare feet the moment I arrived at the front door and then immediately called my older brother. And what he told me was a pure shock. Did you see that? Turns out my brother had come home earlier. It is said that the thing on the back porch was standing in the main room when he first came inside, and it was staring at him through the open door. He also said that the whites of its eyes looked abnormally large, and the black part of the eyeball was so small as if only the pupils were left. My brother and I had to stay up all night in the PC room until mom finally came back that day. I'm from West Virginia and I moved all the way to Lexington, Kentucky for a girl. Now that might be well the scariest part of the story, that a dude from West Virginia moved over the border to Kentucky and only for a girl, but I assure you, it gets worse. A lot worse. She was super affectionate when we first got together, like I couldn't have wished for a better girlfriend. But as time went on and we got more secure in the whole thing, that affection dropped off to next to nothing. It was a slow process, almost like a leaky bucket or something. I barely noticed the relationship dropping off bit by bit until one day, I just realized that there was nothing left of us. We were like roommates more than anything, hardly spent any time together, didn't actually get intimate for like months at a time, and in the end, sleeping in the same bed as her was so depressing that I ended up just staying on the couch. Not long after I started calling the couch my bed, we broke up formally. It sucked, but I saw it coming a long way off, and it wasn't entirely unwelcome. And that's when I started talking to this girl on Reddit. Now, I should make it perfectly clear that I was never, ever unfaithful to my girlfriend. Only when we broke up, I was so starved for affection and female attention that I looked for it wherever I could. I wasn't confident for dating apps, I don't think, so Reddit's anonymity suited me just fine. Eventually, me and this girl that I met on the r slash gaming sub swapped numbers and actually started planning to meet. She lived over in Arizona, but flying down there to meet her didn't seem like a big deal at all. Not when she was so nice and pretty too. I remember staying up super late talking to her one night, trying to keep my voice down so my ex wouldn't hear. We planned all the stuff we'd do together, all the places that she'd take me in Phoenix, all the bomb Mexican food we were going to eat. I was excited, and I went to sleep smiling, but I sure didn't wake up that way. I woke up to loud crashing noises just feet away from me in the TV room. At first, I thought it was a home invasion or something, but when I looked around, it was her, my ex, and she was smashing my Xbox with a baseball bat over and over again. I screamed at her, asking her what she thought she was doing, then went to grab my phone so I could call the cops. Only it wasn't on the coffee table, where I usually put it on charge every night. It was nowhere to be seen. That's when my ex started ranting about how I'd been cheating, how she knew everything, and then mentioned the Reddit girl by name before she swung at me with the baseball bat. I fell backwards over the couch trying to avoid the strike, and I did, but Jesus Christ, the whole rush of air as it went past my face just about put the fear of God into me. She chased me around the apartment, swinging that bat as hard as she could until I locked myself in her bathroom. I thought I might be able to reason with her from the other side of the door to be able to actually explain that the Reddit girl was someone I started talking to after we broke up. But she actually tried to bash the door down, and I'm still amazed that she didn't manage it. Like it was legit like that scene from The Shining. She bashed a hole in one of the wood panels and proceeded to scream through that. Thank God it wasn't big enough for her to reach through and unlock the door, otherwise I'd have been in some serious trouble. Eventually she calmed down enough to stop trying to kill me, but she wanted me out of the apartment, like that night. I didn't even gather everything up. I just threw some essentials into a bag and got out of there. I kept imagining her sneaking up with a kitchen knife or something, catching me off guard and then just stabbing me to death or something. 
I've had friends ask me why I didn't just restrain her, why I was so scared of a girl, but that's about the dumbest response I've ever had to this whole story. A swing from that bat or a stab wound in the right place, it wouldn't have mattered what was or wasn't dangling between a person's legs, I'd have been dead as a doornail. I got out of there pretty fast, drove to a motel, then tried and failed to sleep through the rest of the night. The next morning, I called my mom in West Virginia, told her everything, and arranged to stay with her for a little while until I could get back on my feet. I'd have gone back to the apartment to get the rest of my things if I didn't think that she'd either smash or burned everything I owned. Besides, I was just happier to be out of there by that point, and I'll tell you another thing. I have never, ever been back to Kentucky since then. I'll wait until Tyler Childers comes back round to Virgie, rather than bring up all those bad memories. Three Scary Stories Animated 1. The Man in My Dream I've been having a nightmare for ten years. The same guy keeps appearing in my dream, and every day he's coming to me little by little. At first I think he was apparently standing outside the room, but now he was staring at me, blinking in front of me, and it was just yesterday. I've been getting used to having this nightmare for ten years, but now I feel like I'm going to die. If I fall asleep tonight, I think he'll come one step closer, and he'll finally kill me. 2. The Feet in the Mirror Six years ago, in the winter, I was arranging my bangs looking at the mirror next to the elevator after class. There was a staircase reflecting in the mirror behind me at that time. After I had my bangs adjusted for a long time, I glanced at the stairs in the mirror and then noticed that there's a white feet at the top of the stairs. Stupid, who the heck is going around with barefoot in this weather? I was wondering who it was, so I looked back and there was no one there. My heart sank, and my whole body became stiff at that moment. I thought I was mistaken, so I looked back into the mirror, but those feet were still there. And it even came down a couple of steps more. I got goosebumps, burst into tears, and then ran out of the spot screaming. I never look in the mirror when I'm alone ever since that day. What was that foot? 3. The Man in the Subway I used to go to the academy by subway. One day I was sitting at the end of the seat by the door and an old man was sitting right next to me. Then the subway stopped at one station. The moment the door in front of me opened, the guy came in from the side door of me at the same time. The door next to me won't be able to open due to the system, so how could a person come in through there? I still remember this moment vividly. When I glanced slightly to the side, he was wearing a sweatshirt, and I could see that he was just standing there with a blank look. The old man sitting next to me said to me, who was staring blankly at the man, Kid, you have to pretend not to see that thing. This incident happened when I was around 10 years old. Every half term, we would have a week off from school, and it's very common for families to go on safari in places like Savo or Masai Mara as I was living in Kenya, Africa. It was basically like a tradition for my family to go with this other family since they had a camp which they were trying to develop at the same time near Savo National Park. And it was perfect because you didn't have to pay for the park entrance fee, which costs $90 per day. Since this camp was on the border of the National Park, you could see everything, like lions, leopards, buffaloes, elephants, whatever things without paying a cent. So on a Friday afternoon, my dad filled up his Land Rover with all the necessities, like beer, steaks, water, some sodas, and we started to follow the other family's car to Savo. If you were really lucky, you can get there within four hours, but most of the time it took almost eight hours because there was just one road to get there, and since I was living in a developing country, the traffic was like a hell. So we finally got there in the middle of the evening. My dad was really eager to set up a barbecue for the steaks and have a bit of wild time with the other adults while I and my friend with her younger brother were playing on the picnic table. The camp was very basic style. 
It had mud huts with mosquito netting windows just to protect us a little bit from the mosquitoes. But the bathrooms were outside in the open without much privacy. And there were a couple of rangers taking turns to walk around the camp just to make sure that the electric fence was working right and the entrance to the camp was clear. So while my dad was grilling at the barbecue, one of the rangers, who I've known since I was a toddler, came to us and told about the safari horror stories. It was how a leopard dragged its prey in one of these rooms, or how he got his various deep scars from wild animals, something like this. After he told us this, he shone his flashlight towards the darkness beyond the electric fence. I could see various reflecting eyes, some smaller, some larger. As a kid, I was terrified, but the adults were continuing their conversation. Around 11 p.m., I decided to go to the bathroom. With my flashlight, I could see there were loads of scorpions on the ground. As I was walking down the path to the bathrooms, I shone my light towards the fence. And I saw the back of the lion behind the bushes, which means they were much closer to us than what we had expected. I rushed back without peeing and told my parents and the rangers what I saw and the rangers sent us off to our designated rooms immediately. I was in the hut with my friend and her family, and my dad was with my stepmom. Each parent had a walkie-talkie that had direct contact with the rangers. During that night, I could hear the commotion through the walkie-talkies, but I just shrugged it off. Around 1 a.m., I was dying to pee, so I woke my friend's dad to go with me because obviously I was terrified to go by myself. Trying his best to reassure me, he said that I couldn't go right now. I couldn't understand why he said that, so I kept questioning why. As I was getting frustrated that I couldn't hold it any longer, his walkie-talkie was suddenly on and we could clearly hear the ranger's urgent voice. Sir, do not leave your room. There is a lion right in front of your hut's door. We then both froze. I could hear grunting with the occasional lion's call. For those who have never been on safari or have never heard a lion's calling, when it is that close to you, you can feel the roar vibrating your bones. I was in so much shock that I couldn't even cry. I held my breath for what felt like an eternity, and well, to tell the truth, I even peed myself a little bit at that time. Then we heard scratching and sniffing from under the door, which caused my friend to wake up and start screaming. When she was about to scream, her dad immediately covered her mouth to try to make it as silent as possible and calm her down we all realized that this situation could end badly. We were in a small mud hut with bunk beds and just behind the door was an over 190 kilogram lion being curious to see what's inside. Suddenly, we hear gunshots. I guess it was from the rangers. And then there was a silence, maybe about five minutes. All I could hear was the cricket in the far distance. Abruptly, the walkie-talkie started with one of the rangers' voices that the lion which got scared from the gunshots had left the camp. However, they also told there was still one other lion around the camp, so they were searching for it to drive it out. At that moment, I heard my stepmom screaming from the top of her lungs in company with gunshots. That's when we started to worry, so my friend's dad was constantly talking with the rangers to figure out if she was safe. Luckily, nothing happened to her. It turned out that she woke up because of the first set of gunshots. And when she was about to go back to sleep, she saw the lion with two glancing eyes and a black mane staring from outside the mosquito window at her, which caused her to scream. Eventually, the lion ran away from the place, being surprised at the second gunshot by the rangers. We were able to come back safely from the camp. However, I've been gotten goosebumps whenever I think about that incident. I'm just glad that I didn't try to go out by myself. A co-worker told me this unforgettable story about his time in high school. I'm going to write this from his perspective. Central High School in Springfield, Missouri is haunted. I know what you're thinking. Every kid says their school is haunted. But my story is different. I saw it. Central was actually the first high school in Springfield. The original brick building with its tower still stands, but has now expanded with many new wings. We'd all heard the stories about the steam tunnels that connected the buildings and the supposed hangings, but far more compelling was the story of the deadly principal 
who would whip troublesome students to death. That would have happened long ago when Springfield was a small town and not the Queen City of the Ozarks. We had heard the rumors, the stories that were likely exaggerated, but being high schoolers, we knew we had to do one thing, be at the school late at night. I was the one who came up with the idea that we needed to join the drama class. They were preparing a performance of South Pacific, and as I explained to my group of friends, the way to get in would be to join the class as stagehands, stay to clean up after the performance, and then just stay. And that was what we did. Well, only a couple of us actually got onto the crew, but after everyone else had left, letting the others in was simple. We split up into three pairs, myself and Sarah, Rich and Paul, and Michelle and Dan. We didn't have flashlights, and this was before we had cell phones, but the moonlight from the windows and the familiarity of the halls allowed us to get around the school very easily. After about an hour, we began to think perhaps the stories were just stories. We began to make our way to the gymnasium. We started to compare experiences, but everyone said the same thing. They hadn't seen anything, nor heard anything strange. And that's when a chair flew across the gym and slammed into the wall. What the heck? I gasped before I saw something else. Swarms of glittering little things crawling across the floor. They were cockroaches. We'd see cockroaches in the gym on occasion, but usually one or two, not, not hundreds. Let's get out of here, yelled Michelle, and we hurried to the nearest exit, a stairway leading up to the second floor. It wasn't until we got upstairs that we realized that going upstairs probably wasn't the best course of action, but the cockroaches didn't seem to follow us there. As we stood next to a classroom, catching our breath, we heard loud footsteps down the hall. All of us backed up against the wall, trying to let whatever this was just pass by. As the loud, plodding footsteps came nearer, our tension grew higher. Oh, screw this, Rich said, and he ran into a classroom, Sarah following quickly after him. The door slammed shut behind them. Guys! I called. I almost didn't notice that the footsteps had stopped. Suddenly, we heard them scream and something slammed against the wall. And then something else hit it. They kept on screaming. Paul pulled at the door, but the handle was stuck. Finally, after a few minutes of them screaming and something hitting the wall, it opened. We entered the classroom. All the desks and chairs were knocked over and some had clearly been hitting the walls. How they'd gone that far was a mystery as they were pretty heavy. We found Sarah crouched in a corner crying and babbling incoherently, a puddle of moisture underneath her. Rich, on the other hand, was stumbling toward the window. Get him, I called, and Dan ran towards Rich, grabbing him. Let me go. Just let me jump. Let me die. Rich cried. Guys, this is enough, I said. We need to get out of here. Michelle and Paul helped Sarah up, and helping Dan with Rich, we made our way back into the hall. As we stepped into the hallway, all at once, all the doors slammed shut. Then they all opened again and slammed again. Screw this. Michelle yelled, and she and Paul began hurrying down the stairs, supporting Sarah between them. Dan ran after them, and I pulled Rich after me. The cockroaches downstairs had seemingly dispersed as we made our way to the nearest exit. Pushing at the door, nothing seemed to happen. Come on, push it! Michelle yelled, and Paul, Dan, and I struck the door together, forcing it open. We pulled Sarah and Rich outside, and as we made our way to the cars, we heard the door behind us slam shut. Dan helped Rich to his car while Michelle and Paul brought Sarah to the car they'd arrived in. As for me, I ran to my own car. 
As I was about to climb inside, I happened to look back at the school, looking at the tower. There, in the top room, was a window, and very clearly I could see the outline of someone looking out the window directly at us as we made our escape. It was then I realized the most horrifying thing of all, that we knew there was something in the high school. It knew we knew, and we had to go back to class on Monday. My name is Eric, and this happened to me when I was around seven or eight years old. One summer, my dad took me to a campsite for a long weekend. When we arrived, there were some kids around my age playing in a small park. I looked at my dad and he said, go ahead. So my dad unpacked the car and I went to maybe make some friends. There were two boys in a small park. I said hello and they said hello back. Their names were Kevin and Graham. Graham had to go shortly after because his parents were calling for him. So Kevin and I hung around and we talked about things we liked and how long we were staying at the campsite. After about an hour, Kevin's mom was calling for him, so we had to leave. I was about to head back to my dad when a boy appeared from the woods. He said hello. I said hi back. He introduced himself as Daniel. He seemed like a nice kid and we got along pretty well. He asked me if I wanted to play hide and seek, so I said yes. We played hide and seek at the campsite for maybe 45 minutes until I told him I had to go, so I went back to my dad and went to the camper. I told my dad I had made some friends and my dad asked where their campers were. I told him where Kevin and Graham's were, but I never asked where Daniel was. I thought maybe, well, I'll see him the next day and I'll ask him then. So the next day I went outside to see if any of the kids wanted to play. Kevin and Graham were both unavailable. I was about to just return back to my camper when Daniel appeared out of nowhere, out the woods. We greeted each other and I asked him if he wanted to play hide and seek again. He said, yeah, but he said, we should play at his house. I asked him where his house was. He told me it's not far, it's just through the woods. I followed Daniel in the woods toward his house. We were walking for ages and one thing that I found unusual was, the more we walked, the less talkative and distant Daniel became. Eventually we exited the woods and Daniel said, here we are. He pointed at a rundown old house with a white van parked beside it. He started walking toward it. I slowly followed and asked Daniel, so this is your house? He replied by saying, yeah, let's go play hide and seek. I got this bad feeling. And it became worse the closer we got to the house. It didn't look like a normal house. I started to notice that there were people standing by the windows inside the house. I asked Daniel if that was his dad in the window. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about him, he's harmless, and just continued walking. I don't know what it was, but something made me slow down. Daniel was by the front door at this point, and when he turned around, asked me if I was coming, I told him I had to go. I turned around and ran through the forest and back to my camper. I spent the next few hours watching TV, then I got bored and decided to go back outside. I knocked on Graham's door, but he wasn't available. I knocked on Kevin's door and his dad told me he was already out with some boy named Daniel. So I went back to the camper and did something else with my time. Late that night, there was a knock on our door. It was Kevin's parents. They asked us if we had seen Kevin anywhere as he's been gone for hours. I asked his mom if she had checked Daniel's house and she said no because she didn't know where Daniel lived. I showed Kevin's parents along with my dad and a few other people through the woods to Daniel's house. When we got there, the van was gone. And when we knocked on the door, there was no answer. And the whole house was empty and abandoned. We didn't find Kevin for the rest of our time at the campsite. And he's still missing to this day as far as I know. I thought then, and still think today, that Daniel was some kind of bait to lure kids in the same age as him to be kidnapped. And I'm thankful my gut sensed danger and told me to leave. It was on August 6th. A 
I came back home after work, thinking of taking a long sleep during the weekend. As soon as I arrived home, I washed up quickly, lay down in bed, and slept right away. And the time was around 7 p.m. But when I opened my eyes for some reason, it was at 2 a.m. I was wondering why I woke up so early, since I usually fall asleep on weekends and no one can wake me up. However, I decided to drink water while I was up anyway. So I got out of my bed, went to the kitchen, and lay in bed to sleep again. Just then, it was something furry, I think, and it touched my back. No, it can't be. I used to lie on my side and sleep. I opened my eyes for a while because of the strange feeling, but soon I decided to just ignore it without much thought. However, that was not an illusion. I could feel someone kept touching my back. It seemed to be rough, and there was even something sticky about it. My heart dropped, and I slowly looked back. There was a man lying there. I was sweating like the cold sweat was coming out of all the holes in my body. I've never seen such an awful look in my life. I could see his hair turned all white. The skin all came off. His mouth and nose were all crushed, but I couldn't recognize his face. And he was staring at me, just like that. I opened my eyes screaming, and then realized it was a dream. Because of sweating a lot, I got thirsty, so I went to the kitchen drinking some water again. I lay down thinking that that was the end of the nightmare but it wasn't. I had to go through the same situation two more times. In the first dream, I also got up in surprise, but the second one was different. Somehow, I was courageous and eventually talked to the person. Why are you doing this to me? Then he beckoned to me instead of answering, and it felt as if he were asking me to follow him. If I follow you, you won't be in my dreams anymore? He nodded and headed to the kitchen. So I followed him and he pointed his finger to the refrigerator and this time he pointed to a clear glass bottle when I opened it. He then opened his mouth and said for the first time, I know you are thirsty, drink it. It was just a dream. However, I was so scared that I couldn't reject it. So I ended up drinking the water in the bottle. After I finished drinking, he asked me to send him off and said that he would no longer come. Unwillingly, I opened the front door and went with him. Even though my house was an apartment, there were no elevators and stairs in my dream, and we went straight out to the yard. And it was weird that my whole body began to sweat while I was walking on the flatland while sending him off. I finally arrived at the front gate and tried to take a step forward to see him leaving, but I was clearly blocked by something, even though there was nothing in front of me. He kept beckoning but it was no longer possible to move forward. Just then, I felt the water dripping on my head, and then I ended up waking up. As soon as I opened my eyes, my legs suddenly throbbed, and the moment I came to my senses, I was purely shocked. I was on the rooftop and kept bumping my thighs and knees on the railing that was blocking right in front of me to move forward. The rainwater woke me up, saving my life just before I was almost falling from the rooftop and killing myself. The rooftop door, which was supposed to be locked, was also open for some reason. Being terrified, I ran home without even thinking about using the elevator. I was out of breath after entering the house, so I opened the refrigerator again and started drinking water. Meanwhile, I suddenly remembered the glass bottle that he made me drink in my dream. So I checked what it was, and to my surprise, it was a whiskey which I used to drink when I couldn't sleep. And the bottle was definitely full until yesterday, but there was not a sip left. To sum up, I couldn't wake up because he made me drink that whiskey. And the reason I had a hard time walking when I sent him off was that I was actually walking toward the rooftop. If my body hadn't actually caught on the roof railing, I would have killed myself and said goodbye to the world. I knew that there were people who often had this experience out there but I was really horrified when I literally experienced it myself. I got a flower from a stranger and something was wrong. After I had entered the company, I joined a small group. It was a gathering where the office workers met once a week to read or do other things together. 
However, I was being shy, so I felt awkward after joining there for the first time. Then I met one person who joined the group for the first time that day, and he was a very sociable type. I became strangely close to him, and after that, I started to meet him at some other place beside the day of the small group, and we had a meal or drink sometimes. He would often give me some flowers, introducing himself as a florist who works at a flower shop. For your information, we weren't dating each other at that time. But one weird thing was that he always asked me for a small amount of money whenever he gave me the flowers. And it's always been a very small amount, like one, five, or ten cents. When I asked him why, then he always answered like this. There's a superstition to all the florists. If they don't get paid for making a bouquet, they will become unhappy. I've often wondered, but I didn't know much about flowers and believed in superstitions like that, so I would take my coins from my wallet readily. I mean, it wasn't a lot of money, it was just a coin, not a big deal. One day I had to buy some flowers. Then I suddenly remembered a flower shop where he was working. Well, I better buy from someone I know since he said the flower shop is near here. However, I couldn't believe what I heard when I finally got there. He was not there, and the shopkeeper said that he doesn't even know about him. He was not working here. Suddenly, I felt uncomfortable. The bad feelings got worse that I realized that he had always taken cash from me. So after I came back home, I searched the internet and went to the shaman with the flowers that he gave me. When I showed his picture on the cell phone and talked about him, she said, I think he put his bad luck into the flowers and gave them to you. What he got money from you was that he had an intention that he's trying to do business with you. It's hard to just hand the bad luck over to someone who doesn't know. But it is said that the money in someone's wallet contains some of his or her luck. So if you receive it, you get someone's luck and it becomes like a deal. In other words, you bought his bad luck. She also told me that there was a lot of bad energy in both of my hands and my head and actually, I had been having a lot of nightmares and suffering headaches at that time. She said to burn all the flowers in the house as soon as possible. Bring me everything if you receive any from him. She also told like this, and as soon as I came back home, I packed the flowers and the book that he had given me, went back to the shaman, and we decided to burn things together on the spot. While I was passing over the stuff, I suddenly found the part of the book was fixed with a tape. I slowly took it off and there was a dried grass flower in it. I got goosebumps in an instant. I didn't want to get involved with him anymore. So after returning from the shaman's house, I left the group and blocked his number. However, he somehow contacted me for the next three months. He would text me quiet, calmly, asking me when I would meet him, why I left the group, and even saying, the weather is so nice and I will send flowers for you. I was so horrified by his attitude, so I changed the number after that, and there was no more contact from him afterward. Fortunately, I didn't have nightmares, and the headache disappeared as if nothing had happened before. And since that day, I never received anything from a stranger. When I was around eight years old, I transferred to another school in the middle of the summer. Because I was so young at that time, I was able to get along with my classmates quickly. One day, all the girls left the class for their prior engagements, and the boys asked me to join them to go somewhere, saying they had found something interesting. I followed them through the paddy fields behind the school, and there was a three-story house that had been deserted a long time ago. School finished early that day, so the sun was still up. The exterior of the house was not too scary except for a broken window. Well, nothing here. Five of my friends and I went inside and we saw the window broken on the stairs leading up to the second floor. I thought it was just an ordinary restaurant when I saw it from outside. But as soon as I went up to the second floor, I could say that it was definitely someone's house. But the weird thing was that the inside was so cold that it was almost freezing, although it was sunny and especially hot that day, and all the furniture was standing upside down. We then came into the main room and one of my friends found a wallet on top of a pile of furniture. When he opened it up, there was a resident registration card and cash inside. I suddenly got goosebumps 
so I asked him to put the wallet down and turn my eyes to the living room for a moment. And it was exactly that moment. It wasn't clearly visible, but there was a woman's silhouette in a long dress, dancing in the living room. She was jumping up and down, swinging her arms from side to side, and that was the creepiest scene I've ever seen before. We were the only people in this house. So being surprised, I looked at my friends and looked back into the living room again, and there was no one there anymore. Guys, I'm scared. We should leave. I told my friends and they got scared too, so they followed right after me. The moment we got out of the main room, the door suddenly slammed shut. What was that? One of the friends tried to open the door, but it didn't open, as if it was locked. Just then, I realized the other one who had found the wallet was still holding it. And we all screamed and ran downstairs. As soon as we were about to go home, someone began to make a fuss about that he'd left his shoe bag upstairs. We had no choice but to decide the people to go back inside by playing rock, paper, scissors. Eventually, I was the one who lost, so I had to go upstairs with him. But as soon as we went up, we couldn't say any words and couldn't believe what we just saw. The bedroom door was open. We couldn't even think of bringing back the shoe bag. We just had to run downstairs in a rush with a loud scream. The next day, I came back home after playing outside with my friends as usual, and that evening, I heard my friend who took the wallet was in a car accident on his way home by bicycle. Unfortunately, he was not seriously injured. However, I didn't feel good about it anyway. So a few days later, we ended up heading back to the deserted house to return the wallet. And there was something inside. I can tell you that there was literally nothing in the living room or on the second floor when we first went there. However, now there was a baby doll hanging on the light. I will never forget that experience my whole life. True scary story about my teacher's memory. I want to talk about the incident that my art teacher experienced in person. When she was a high school student, there was a girl whose mother was a shaman, and there were a lot of rumors about her that she literally can see the ghosts. She would always space out and often had seizures while attending classes. So she eventually had no friends around her, and even the teachers didn't touch her or care for her. One day they went on a school trip. When they arrived at their room, everyone went outside, and my teacher was also playing around with her friends, leaving her alone in the room. A few minutes later, my teacher suddenly heard the girl's shrill scream. She jumped back into the room in surprise, but other teachers and students were already standing in front of the door and blocking her sight. No one dared to enter the room. They just stood there in fear. My teacher, who was puzzled at that time, eventually pushed through the crowd and headed forward. And she could not believe what she was watching. The girl was standing upside down while foaming at the mouth and crying loudly. However, something was a little bit weird. She was not standing by herself. It was like someone had grabbed her both ankles and lifted them up. Her legs stretched straight and her face was pressed down on the floor. My teacher often says that she still remembered that day so vividly as what happened just yesterday. What was it that got that girl's ankle that day? Still, I have no idea. When I was a kid, I visited my grandmother's house with my younger brother in the middle of summer. Like all the children, I was having a good time wandering around or playing in the valley. After the sun went down, I was talking to my grandmother while we were having dinner together, and she suddenly said like this, Do not go out of this house late at night. Her face looked really serious. Her warning without a reason was weird to me at first, and it was a little scary for me being a young child, but soon I thought it was because the outside was too dark to go out and play. 
Because my grandmother's house was located in the countryside, we had to ride our bikes for almost 30 minutes to go to the nearest convenience store. And there was no street lamp on the road, so it was pitch black. After eating dinner, my brother and I went to bed. At about 1 a.m., my brother suddenly started whining that he wants ice cream. I recalled my grandmother's words not to go out at night. However, I suddenly wanted to have some ice cream too. I mean, what can I do? We ended up riding a bike together secretly and out to the town to get some ice cream. After finishing ice cream, we were on our way back home. We were riding our bikes on the road, chattering about Pokemon, which was popular at the time. Then all of a sudden, my brother told me like this, Hey, the shortcut is over there. However, it was so dark around that I couldn't see the way that he pointed. And I don't know why, but I did not want to go that way. Now, nah, let's just go back the way we came. As soon as I said that and looked forward, I could see my brother in front of me who I thought was behind me. What the? The moment I realized sent a chill down my spine. Then who was it who's been talking behind me? It was that very moment that I remembered my grandmother's words. Do not go out of this house late at night. Sweating like a pig, I pedaled vigorously on my bicycle as best I could and arrived at my grandma's house. I started to get off my bike in a hurry, and then I heard a sudden voice coming from my ear at that very moment. Hmm, too bad. I dragged my brother's wrist, went back to our room, and ended up staying all night covered in a blanket. The next day, we kept the fact that we went out at night yesterday under wraps while we were eating breakfast, and we took a bus to go back home. What the heck was that voice yesterday? Being curious, I started to look around carefully while I was sitting next to the window, and finally, the bus passed where I'd been yesterday. And at that very moment, I froze. It was a cliff. What would have happened if I headed for a shortcut because of the voice that I heard from behind on that day? Even now, whenever I visit my grandma's house, I still think about that moment and get goosebumps. My mom passed away a year ago due to a kidney problem. She had suffered in pain a lot while she was sick, and she ended up dying at home in front of me and my grandparents. That moment was tragic, and it hurt me and my family a lot. Since her death, I've been having a lot of nightmares and problems with sleeping at night. And last week, I was in my bedroom, sleeping next to my cat, and I suddenly felt like I was being pushed on my bed like someone was trying to suffocate me. I couldn't move or scream at all. Since it was totally dark inside, so I couldn't see who was doing that to me, I was so scared. Not long after, I don't know how, but I eventually managed to free myself. I took my cat and tried to rush towards my door, but for some reason, I couldn't open the door, although it wasn't locked up at all. I froze on the spot. I ended up kicking it roughly and suddenly, it opened. When I was about to go out of my bedroom, I looked back at my bed and then saw a figure with a white bed sheet on top. You know, just like that ghost that appears on the movies in general. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, so I ran to my grandparents to tell them everything I saw, but only my grandma was there. She asked me, where's your grandpa anyway? All of a sudden, we heard his voice. He was in the room that used to be my mom's. And to our surprise, he was speaking with somebody like chatting and laughing with a person. And we could recognize the voice. It was my mom. However, instead of feeling happy to hear my mom's voice, it made me terrified. I don't know the reason. The next day, I was reminiscing about yesterday, and I remember that when we lived in another house that we believed was haunted, my mom used to joke with my grandfather. She would put a white sheet on her head to scare him just for fun, and that literally hit me at that moment. Then who was it? 
Was my mom trying to suffocate me and kill me? Or maybe it was someone else? I'll never know forever. All I know is as soon as the quarantine is over, I will get some psychological help. The early mannequin is said to have been made of pose using a real human corpse and then placed it in a plaster mold. Human flesh and blood contain the most ideal proportion of nutrients that humans need. In general, these foods taste very delicious. Animals have evolved to feel the most terrible smell of dead bodies, instead of the same taste in order to prevent extinction through eating each other. So if you can't feel the smell, you will feel that human flesh is delicious. Meanwhile, the human sense of smell has been rapidly weakening over the past few hundred years due to deterioration caused by environmental pollution, disease, and a change in the way of survival competition. The human brain emits endorphins, one of the drug ingredients, in order to maintain control of the body when the pain reaches its limit and to make people forget the pain and feel pleasure. It's a pretty famous story that a hanged person is smiling at the last minute. Meanwhile, research from the University of Maryland found that many people who fainted from extreme pain often take their own lives after being rescued. There's a small cave on the Scandinavian peninsula in Europe and the cave runs endlessly. A guy went into the cave to find the end of the cave, but he went missing. And four years later, the man is said to have been contacted in Mexico. There was a strange statue called a crying Siddhagarbha Bodhisattva. Siddhagarbha Bodhisattva is a Buddha who protects hell in Buddhist terms. He usually looks peaceful, but sometimes he looks like a crying or troubled face in the evening. When it was crying, it rained the next day, and when it was in trouble, it snowed. On a day when nothing came down, the face of the statue was the same, so it was used to set up a schedule for the next day by watching it. One day, the statue had a bright smile that had never been seen before. It was August 4, 1945, the day before the incident about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. In 1998, a blueprint believed to be about 400 years old was discovered from a warehouse in a private residence in the UK. The blueprint, titled Automatic Calendar, had the dimensions of the bizarrely shaped part and the assembly strategies. When an engineer carried out the restoration of the device on the basis of its design, a machine displaying AD and a date was completed. But there was an odd flaw in this device. By the time had passed the year 2050, the tooth wheels did not engage with each other, and the device suddenly stopped displaying the date. There was a famous man in a restaurant called Milan in New York who always suddenly appeared and told strange stories to customers that they had never heard of. When he was out of sight, the customers began to talk about that man. However, no one could remember his face and even the stories that they'd been hearing from him. I am 19 years old and a high school student. I have a brother who is 17 years old now, and he often does creepy things recently. One day I was watching TV with my brother in the living room, and he suddenly started yelling. Shit, stop it. You think this is funny? It was kind of strange because my brother usually doesn't curse and get angry like that. What? What's wrong? I asked, and he replied, Hey, go to your room and you can come out maybe 30 minutes later. What's wrong with you all of a sudden? Well, I'm not kidding. Go inside. Hurry. Being scared, I went into my room, lay down listening to an MP3 player, and fell asleep. The next morning, I was woken up by my parents. 
We have to go to the hospital right now. I asked what was going on, and it turns out that my parents found my brother was lying with bubbles in his mouth when they came back home after closing the store. They ended up taking him to the hospital having a test, but there was nothing wrong with him eventually. The doc said it was just a sudden case. I felt something really odd at this point. Why did he send me into the room so abruptly? There was once my brother had caught a bad cold, and after that he's been changed a little bit. And one day he was playing with his computer and suddenly came to my room saying like this, Hey, aren't you feeling chilly? Before I asked my brother why, I kept getting goosebumps behind my neck. Don't know the reason yet. Then he continued, If you want to look behind, do not close your eyes, okay? Why? I don't know, just someone told me. Shrugging, he went out of the room again and I thought he was a little bit weird. He was hospitalized for a few days and finally came back home. Why did you pass out that day anyway? His expression suddenly changed as soon as I asked about what happened that day. And what he said followed was just pure horror itself. Actually, I've been seeing strange things since I was in middle school. What do you mean? Do you remember that day when we were watching TV? I told you to go into your room. And the reason I told you like that was... I saw three women that day in the living room, holding their hands and kept spinning around you. I had goosebumps all of a sudden. But when you get up and about to enter the room, they started to follow you. He told me that he then continued to hit the floor with his palm to prevent them. Then they looked at my brother, smiling widely and suddenly approached him. You know what they said to me when you went into your room? He was laughing, saying like this. What did they say? Want to join? We are all thirsty. He said the reason the ghosts said they were thirsty was that they wanted the human's life. Anyway, he started to curse at them indiscriminately, but suddenly his body did not move. Then one of the women approached him. Her face had changed into a grotesque look, like exactly the same as a ghost in the movie, Juon. And she was smiling at him. In front of my frightened brother, she moved her face closer to him and started licking his face with her black tongue. He ended up passing out. That's what he told me. Even when he was in the hospital, he had the same nightmare, and he had sleep paralysis for a while. This incident is what my aunt experienced when she was a high school student. She went to school camping one day. You know there is often a student who does not get along well with the classmate and plays alone in each class? And there was such one classmate in my aunt's class. Honestly, she was not an outcast, but always left out because she couldn't get along with his friends. This time again, she went around alone at the camping. My aunt was sharing a room with her. Not thinking much about her, the last night of the camping finally came. All the classmates were all sleeping in the room and all of a sudden my aunt opened her eyes for no reason. The beds in the room were all bunk beds at that time. And as soon as my aunt, who was sleeping on the second floor, turned her head to the side, she saw her classmate looking down at her. Being surprised, she pushed her shoulder and said, Hey, you surprised me, why did you wake up? Her body turned a full circle around. Then she looked at my aunt again without a word. And when she pushed her again, her body circled again. What's wrong with you? This time my aunt yelled, but she was just staring at her. The other friends woke up one by one at the sound of her yell. And as soon as one of them turned on the light, everyone in the room screamed. Her classmate eventually committed suicide by hanging herself from the ceiling. My aunt ended up fainting on the spot that day. 2. The Guilt Last summer, me and a few of my friends went to a valley together. While everyone was playing inside the valley, having fun, a girl who was a friend of my friend accidentally fell into the deep water. At first I was about to go inside and save her, but the other boys stopped me. We couldn't dare to save her, so we just stood there watching her, and she eventually died there. In the panic of this situation, we all ended up deciding to cover it up. After that, we went back and told her parents that she eventually went missing while walking around that area alone. Everyone started pretending to ignore everything about her after that. 
I literally want to spread this accident, but this is the only place that I can talk about it. I feel massive guilty when I keep thinking about her, and as much as I think about that day, I want to just kill myself. And she's been appearing in my dreams recently. 3. My Cousin I think I can confess it because it's anonymous. When I was a child, I pushed my cousin just for fun. However, he ended up hurting his head severely, and later became a disabled person who even couldn't speak properly. Anyone in my family remembers knows that I did it because nobody was there at the time. It's just they didn't even notice, and no one thought I was the one who did it. But then he started to cry whenever he sees me. My mom and other relatives thinks it's just because he misses me and I was the only person who played with him a lot and spent most of the time when we were young. However, there is one thing I have to tell you. I don't feel guilty. Never. I guess I have a problem with myself. I used to work at one company for about a year before I entered the company I'm working at currently. Time I was living alone with my wife, although we both like kids, we weren't ready yet. Anyway, it was one night and I was heading home being drunk as usual after finishing a get-together. Passing through the front door of the apartment, I pressed the button to get on the elevator, and the elevator that was stopped on the third basement level began to climb slowly. Finally, the elevator arrived on the first floor, and I felt cold as soon as I walked inside. It was almost 12 o'clock and my body was getting hot by the effects of alcohol, but I could definitely feel chilly inside the elevator. Well, I guess it's because the elevator stayed deep underground for a while, I thought, and then pressed the 16th floor button where I live. The elevator started moving slowly. However, it suddenly stopped on the 5th floor. Normally, the people in my apartment didn't take the elevator very often at the time. So, I was standing in the middle of the elevator. As soon as the door opened, I stepped aside. But no one was standing there. I thought someone who was impatient must have pressed the button and then just went up to the emergency exit stairs. So, I pressed the close button and the elevator stopped again on the sixth floor. And there's no one there either. When the elevator stopped on the seventh floor, I suddenly got angry. Hey, stop! I stuck my head out the door and shouted. But I didn't feel any human presence upstairs. A sudden shudder passed over me. But still, I thought it was someone's prank. The elevator then stopped again on the 8th floor while going up. But this time, there was a little girl standing in front of the door. She seemed like she was about 6 or 7 years old. But you know what was a strange thing about her? Despite the late hours, there was no one around her. Like parents, you know, someone like that. But this kid just stood there still without getting on. Hey kid, are you going to get in? I asked, but she didn't answer. As soon as I felt chill somewhere, I soon pressed the close button of the elevator. Just as the door was closing halfway through, she pressed the open button again. The short kid standing on tiptoes opened the elevator door, so I told her again to get inside. However, she still stood there without answering. Just at that time, I thought this was the one who's been playing pranks on me. So I pointed my finger at the CCTV and yelled at her not to prank anymore. Then the girl staring at me slowly opened her mouth. I'll get in when my mom comes, she answered in a small voice but I couldn't see any shadow of people no matter how much I looked around. But somehow her voice seemed really dark and creepy. It wasn't a childlike voice at all. I pressed the close button again roughly, and fortunately the kid didn't press the open button this time. The elevator started going up again and didn't stop on the next floor. With a sigh of relief, I just wanted to get off and get home as soon as possible. It was at that very moment. I was on the 11th floor and the light suddenly started blinking. I was staring at the light with a nervous mind and something was strange with it. There was some spot on the light that was stained as if someone had dropped black ink. And to my surprise, it was getting bigger and bigger every time the light went on and off. 
Uh, it, it can't be. I'm imagining because I drank too much. I kept repeating it inside, but the stains grew bigger and bigger as if it was teasing me. Although I was sweating on my back, it was still chilly inside the elevator. And the moment I looked at the light and then looked straight front this time, I couldn't help but doubt my eyes. There, I could see a person's hand reflected on my back. Seriously? I was the only one in this elevator. After having confidence that there's an unknown thing that exists here, I was seized with extreme fear. The time to go up to the 16th floor was like an eternity. I couldn't hold my fear back. I eventually pressed the button to get off the 14th floor. I was about to pop out as soon as the door opened, but I had to stop suddenly. The girl I saw on the 8th floor was standing there, like she was waiting for me. I felt like my heart was sinking. Shivering, just as I was about to get off, she raised her head slowly. At that moment, I saw it. Unlike before, she was smiling brightly, as if her mouth was going to be ripped soon. My mom is here now. I'm going to get in. M mom what's she talking about? I'm sure the elevator was empty from the basement floor. Besides, not even a small rat was to be seen, let alone a human while I was inside. Then who is it? I was strained to the limit and my legs were trembling. I almost pushed the child and ran out of the elevator to the emergency stairs. For some reason, I was afraid that I'd never see my wife again if I stayed here. I was going up the stairs frantically. Just then, the sensor at the emergency exit started turning on much faster than my speed. It's like someone was already going up. I was about to go insane. When I finally reached the 16th floor, I flung the emergency door open and rushed out of. I turned. I tried to run toward my house and then someone was standing in front of the house. The woman with incredibly long hair and the girl I saw at the elevator. They were there. How the heck did they know my house? I didn't know what was going on right now, but only one thing came to my mind for a moment. I must not go back home now. I barely managed to turn back and carefully twisted the emergency door again. And at that moment, my sweaty hand just slipped and the door clanked in the quiet hallway. The moment I looked into the hallway with a desire to cry, I suddenly heard a sound from the end of the hall. It was the sound of a woman's shoes and baby shoes. I pushed the emergency exit door. While I ran frantically downstairs, I could hear the shoe sounds behind me at regular intervals. Almost rolling over myself, I went down through the front door and then rushed into the lighted security office. However, the security guard was just patrolling his round at that time so he was not there. I lifted my trembling body and looked at the front door through the small window in the front. And at that moment, I felt my legs weaken. A woman and a child didn't come out of the front door, but they were glaring at me fiercely, as if they were going to kill me. I was about to scream, but just then, the guard came into the office. He got surprised to see me trembling and asked me what was going on. I tried to explain by pointing my hand at the front door, but then I realized that there was no one. Eventually, the security guard came to my house with me. To my surprise, my wife, who thought she was asleep already, was waiting for me with the lights on. And what my wife told me was a surprise itself. She said that someone rang our doorbell when I was seeing the woman and kid in front of my house. My wife thought it was me out there, so she walked to the front door to open it. But then she felt something wasn't right, because whenever I came home late at night after dinner, I always acted more carefully instead of ringing the bell. So my wife turned on the intercom and looked out. But there was no one. And when she returned to her seat, the bell rang again, and the same situation repeated on and on. So this time she was looking closely at the screen when the moment the bell rang without putting down the phone, and there was the face of the woman who filled the screen to the full. At first, it's like someone was sticking her face on the screen intentionally. But when my wife looked closely, her face looked so pale as if it were dead already. 
She urgently turned on all the light right away and tried to call the administration office. However, the guard didn't answer because he was just on patrol in at that time. And I was running downstairs like crazy. When my wife saw the intercom screen again, it was already gone. The next day's morning, I went to the security office to check the elevator CCTV, and I couldn't keep my mouth closed for a while in a panic. On CCTV, I could see that I was waiting for the elevator on the first floor. I stepped inside. Nothing happened at first. However, I suddenly started to press the buttons from fifth to eighth floors as if I were possessed by something. There was literally no one on the seventh floor, but I screamed into the air and when the door opened on the eighth floor, I murmured something and then pressed the door's button to open. I pointed at the CCTV and said something and then finally pressed the close button. Furthermore, I was gazing on the elevator lights for a while. Then I suddenly pressed the button on the 14th floor and ran out. So, that means I was doing something really weird by myself. The CCTV on the front door also captured only me. No one came out. The guard laughed at me and my wife saying that we saw imaginary things. But the feelings I felt at that moment were so real. It was so vivid. Who the heck were that woman and the child? Still, I have no idea. I'm a 24-year-old male, and this happened to me a few years ago when I was around 21. I remember because it was shortly after my birthday in December. It was really cold outside and there was snow on the ground as we had just had a snowstorm pass through our area. I lived with my parents at the time and my mom is not really a fan of driving in the snow so she asked me if I could drive her to the gas station for her to pick up some cigarettes for her and my dad as well as a few other items they might have needed. I said sure as I wasn't really doing anything at the time and I grabbed my keys then following her to the car. I remember the cold air hitting your face pretty hard that night, so it had to be at least around the teens, which made the snow and whatever else was on the roads really slippery. This is important to know for later on in the story. The nearest gas station was about 5 minutes away from us, but given the conditions of the roads, it took us about 10 to get there. Once I was able to park the car, my mom got out of the car, then made her way inside the store. From where I was parked, I could see her inside the store standing in the line that was leading up to the register. I kept the car running as it was really cold and I just didn't want to be sitting in the car without any heat. I was browsing on my phone while waiting for my mom to get done and right around that time I had seen her finally approach the register. There was a black truck that pulled up into the parking spot right next to my car. I found this a bit unusual given that the parking lot was empty, so I mean, there was really no reason for them to park right next to the spot where I was. But I kind of just chalked it up to them wanting to be as close to the entrance as they could given how cold it was that night. No one got out of the car at first, but I didn't even notice this until I looked up to see my mom walking out of the entrance back to the car. I glanced over to the truck's passenger side window, and I could just make out a figure sitting in the passenger seat and they were facing in my direction. My mom opened the door then got inside before then asking me what I was looking at. I told her about the truck pulling up well over a few minutes ago around the same time that she approached the register but that nobody had gotten out. She first chalked it up to maybe they were just waiting for someone inside the store to come out. But when I mentioned seeing a figure in the passenger side of the car looking towards our direction, she then began to sense why I was so spooked out by it. She told me to just back out and get out of there and that we didn't need to worry about them once we drove off. As soon as I put the car into reverse and then began to back up, the passenger door swung open and hit the side of my car. A tall, very built man stepped out from the car as soon as the door made contact with my car. I hit the brakes as soon as I felt the contact and the man stood there before throwing his hands up at me and then staring in my direction. I didn't really know what to do as I'd never really been in any sort of accident before and my mom was sitting right there next to me and could see as well as I had that the door had not been opened until we had already started moving. 
the man slowly walked up to my window and just stood there. I cracked it very slowly and I told the man that I was sorry, but that I didn't see the door open as I was backing out. For a brief moment, he didn't really say anything. That is, before he simply asked, Roll down your window a little bit more. I can barely hear you. I knew this couldn't be true as it was really quiet in that area and I wasn't even speaking in a low tone. I told him that I'd prefer to keep it cracked as I really didn't want to let cold air get into the car. This really angered the man and he immediately spoke in a more angered tone now. He was telling me to roll down my window yet again. I again told him no and this is when things then took a turn for the absolute worse. Without any warning whatsoever, the man smacked my window really hard with his hand. Startled, I immediately jumped back and rolled the window up. My mom was right beside me just absolutely yelling for me to just back out and leave, but I was really afraid of hitting the man in the process as he was still right next to my car. The man kept smacking my window really hard a few more times before he then tried punching it. It was right at this point where I realized that if I didn't get my mom and I out of there fast, this guy was definitely going to hurt us. I could see the cashier inside the gas station heard what was going on and he looked to be on the phone with what I could only assume was the police. But there was absolutely no way I could wait for them as the man was now both punching at my window and now kicking my door. It was like some switch had been flipped on in this man's head and he had just totally lost it. I told my mom to hold on as I put the car into reverse again and backed out of there as fast as I could, just barely missing the guy by a few inches. I pulled fully out of the parking spot before the man ran out in front of our car and slammed his hands right on the hood. I sat there frozen not knowing what to do as the man looked right back at me. I turned the car wheel then sped around him trying to avoid him the best that I could before booking it the hell out of there. After that, I honestly thought that was the end of it. But as we made our way down the road to a stoplight, I was able to see headlights that was fast approaching from behind our car. And once it was close enough behind us, I could then see that it was the same truck the man was in. There appeared to be two people inside of it. I assumed the man I encountered must have been the passenger, and I guess the driver was someone I hadn't noticed before. I told my mom that it was them behind us, and she started to freak out and call my dad, then letting him know what was going on. We were still probably about 10 minutes away from our house given the road conditions, but I knew that there was no way that I could get us back to our house in that amount of time before these guys tried to ram us off the road or whatever else they had planned for us. My dad told my mom for us to attempt to head back towards our house and that he would try and meet us halfway in his truck. She told me this and I agreed that this had to be our best option given that I couldn't turn around and head back to the gas station still not knowing if the police had even been called or not. So once the light turned green, I punched on the gas and sped off. I'm going to be completely honest. I really wasn't being that cautious of the road at this point, as there really weren't any other cars at this point of the night. There were a few times where the car slid from the ice on the road, and I knew that it would only take one turn of the wheel to lose control. But I wasn't going to slow down and let these guys catch up to us. After about a few minutes of driving, we were able to see headlights right in front of us on the other side of the road. I was thinking that it had to be my father, and as we got a little closer, we were able to make out his truck beyond the lights. Very surprisingly, the truck was still behind us, still keeping pace with me given the road conditions. I could see my father cut across a midsection of the roads and then stop shortly off the side of the road. I started to slow down right as we approached and then pulled off to the side of the road, the truck still following me. As I came to a stop, the same man from before that was in the passenger seat hopped out of the car then started making his way to our car. The driver opened his door but before he could step out, both of the men stopped dead in their tracks at the sound of my father's voice. I suggest that both of you hop back in that car and drive right on out of here before I put a bullet in the both of you. I could see my dad walking out into the light, radiating from both his and my headlights. He had his 9mm pistol pulled and named right at the man's head as he stood right next to my car. I pretty much just watched as both of the men just stood there for a brief moment as my dad slowly inched his way towards them. 
The man then very slowly backed away towards his truck, before then speaking to what I assumed was my father. You're really lucky you got here when you did. The man laughed and jumped back into his truck, before it quickly backed out and drove off in the other direction. My dad walked to my window and he asked me and my mom if we were okay. I remember telling him that other than being scared shitless, I think we were fine. Shortly afterwards, my dad followed us back home just to make sure no one else followed us. I really have no idea what those men's intentions were or why the man acted the way he did. All I know is that if I hadn't reacted how I did to get my mom and I out of there, I just really hate to think what those men would have done to us. This story happened to me a month ago. I used to talk with one of my friends before going to sleep. So that day we talked as usual and went to sleep. The next day when I woke up, I got a call from her and she told me about last night. Hey, why did you call me last night at 5 a.m.? As soon as I heard her words, I felt really weird since I was sleeping at that time, of course. I definitely remember that I didn't call or talk to anybody. What are you talking about? I was asleep. No, I swear to God, you literally called me and the voice was exactly the same as yours. She then said that she felt that the call was so weird, so she ended up hanging the call. As soon as she told me, I heard a sudden voice coming from the bathroom. Hey, I gotta go. When I hung up the call, then went to check the bathroom, I found the door was open, which was strange because I remember that it was closed when my friend just had called me. I looked inside, but there was no one there. So I closed the door and walked a few steps just until I heard the door behind me open again. I slowly turned around and went to close the door, but this time I went inside to check that no one is there. At that very moment, I could feel a cold breath on my neck. Being freaked out, I got out of the bathroom and went back to my room. While I was sitting on my bed trying to calm down, I heard someone whispering in my ear, Veronica. That name, I immediately remembered it. That name was spelled by the Ouija board last night, which I was playing with my friend talking on the phone. I asked if there was someone with me, and the board answered yes. Her name was Veronica. So she was the one that talked with my friend last night. This post is actually what I wrote on the internet website anonymously. Hello, I have something to ask y'all. Let's get to the point. There is a strange smell like a fishy smell of water in my house somewhere. For your information, we don't have any fish tanks in our house, and we don't even raise fish. I can't exactly define that it's a real fishy smell of water, actually, but it smells that bad. It doesn't smell anywhere else, but particularly bad in the main room. The house where I live is newly remodeled. We had moved here and lived for about seven months now. Since we moved here and lived for about seven months now, there was nothing wrong with it at first. The weird thing is, it doesn't smell always like that. But I don't think I can live here anymore because of this disgusting stench. This is the first time I've ever smelled this awful smell at home. My family tried to find the source of the smell, but we have no idea what it is. At first, I thought it was coming from the curtains. When I sniffed on the curtain, I could smell something similar near the curtain. However, when I smelled it again a few days later, the stench was gone. And just yesterday, now my bed's mattress cover suddenly started smelling. I bought this around fall and washed it very often. I don't know what happened to this. I really don't know what the cause is since I don't have anything that smells bad in my house, like foods or something. Now, I'm so freaked out. Could the house itself smell like this? If anyone knows the reason, please let me know. Thank you. A few days later, I read a few comments posted on the website. Comment number one. Well, you should ask a control office. Comment number two. It sounds like mold. Look carefully. The window where the curtain was attached might smell. Comment number three. Congratulations. You've moved out. As you know, some movies go like this. When the dead body is hidden in the wall, 
It does smell. I go to uni here in Leicester in the UK, and like most students, I'm out clubbing every weekend that I can afford it. I've had some of the best nights of my life with the girls in Leicester City Centre, but I'm not going to lie. I've seen some really horrid things too. From girls weeing themselves while they're too drunk to stand, to bar fights where rabid lads were whipping bottles at each other. I think alcohol has the ability to bring out the absolute worst in people. And it was on a night out in Leicester that one of the scariest things I'd ever been part of or witnessed to happened right in front of me. So we're leaving a club one Saturday night, planning on stumbling over the road to the kebab house to get ourselves some cheesy chips when we see this girl sitting outside the club, looking absolutely rotten drunk. The poor thing can barely keep her eyes open and it doesn't look like anyone there is looking after her, which was honestly a little bit concerning. But the kebab place we ended up sitting down in had these big glass windows that looked out into the street, so from my window seat I could still keep my eyes on her. I got my cheesy chips and I'm sitting there eating them when I see this lad walk up to her who takes her by the hand and then starts trying to get her to stand up. I was really relieved at first because I thought her boyfriend had showed up to take her home, but the longer I looked, the more I just got this bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Not only was this girl just refusing to go with this guy when she had every reason to want to get home and out of the cold, but the guy was like looking over her shoulder and looking around like he didn't want people to see what he was doing. You know, making sure the coast was clear or something. It was such an obvious sign of guilt and I could just tell that something wasn't quite right. Eventually the guy just pulls the girl up to her feet while she weakly struggles and fails to shake him off. Then he starts dragging her away from the club and into the middle of the street. I start alerting my mates to this and immediately we all get up from the table we're at, grabbing our boxes of chips and heading out into the street to confront the guy. We rush over, intending to give it our best British passive-aggressive, uh, excuse me, do you know her? When out of like nowhere, this car rushes up and breaks violently next to the pair of them. But in doing so, one of the front wheels like runs over the girl's foot and she lets out this kind of dull wail of pain. Then as the guy drags her around the side of the car that we're approaching, we see her foot like flopping around in this really unnatural way where her ankle is really obviously broken. The guy then starts to basically bundle the girl into the back of the seat that had at least three other guys in it, and we only just catch him in time to try to stop it. We're asking if he knows her, and asking if the girl if she's alright, insisting he needs to call an ambulance for her right that instant. He starts trying to tell us that everything's okay and that he knows her, and he's going to take her to an accident emergency to have her foot looked at. One of my mates asks him what her name is, and he sort of freezes, hesitates and pulls some random name out of his butt in a way that made it painfully obvious that he didn't know her before he walked up to her just a few minutes before. We start going mad like telling him we're going to call the police if he doesn't let her go, and this gets the other lads in the car really agitated, who start barking at him to get the girl in the car, which he does almost violently before the car starts to drive away. I'm trying to get the car's number plate while one of my mates is on the phone to the police, but I can't make it out properly. So for one horrible moment, I thought that was it. That something terrible was going to happen to that girl and we totally just failed to stop it. But I turn around, and my other two friends are piling into a hackney cab screaming, Get in, Chloe. Then what followed was legit like a movie. My mate is all like, Follow that car, and then we're off. Whizzing around Leicester City Center, following this black Volvo with the lads and the injured girl inside. As we're following it, it's just chaos in the back of the cab. One of my mates is still on the phone to the police telling them what's going on. Another one of my mates is giving the cab driver the lowdown on the situation, all the while I'm noting the fact that the lads don't seem to be driving anywhere near the local A&E. They're actually headed out of the city center towards the suburbs, which, to me, was a pretty good indicator that we're trying to take her somewhere dark and secluded to do only God knows what to her. My maid got off the phone with the police and told us that they told her that they had a unit in the area and they weren't messing about either. It was like a minute or two before we saw blue flashing lights and the cab driver pulled his cab back away from the Volvo to let the police slip in to pull them over. When they finally do pull over, 
We all pile out of the cab while the driver waits for us, watching what was going on and shouting over and over, liar, liar, when the guy starts telling the policeman that the girl is their friend and that they're taking her home. The other policeman who was there then comes over to us and starts getting our side of the story, which basically involved me telling him everything I'd seen and how I said it was incredibly suspicious. What happened next all unfolded over the course of like an hour, with more police cars turning up to keep an eye on the lads while one set of policemen got the girl out of the car and drove her to the hospital. I'm not sure if the lads got arrested or not, but I know they got their details taken down and no matter what happened after that, I know the girl ended up being taken away from the obvious danger and getting her foot seen to. My only real concern then was that the cab driver was going to charge us like an arm and a leg for keeping him occupied for so long, but he actually refused to take any money off of us and in the end, saying it was just nice to see some people doing some good in the world, and that when his daughter is our age and gets into any trouble, that he'd hope there'd be some good Samaritans like us to help her out. I always see 44 minutes. Hello, I'm posting this on the website because I have a question. Every time I look at the time, I always see 44 minutes. I mean a number, 4-4. Four, four. Those five years of marriage with my husband was the beginning of this phenomenon. I've been going through a hard time because of his bad habit that he drinks almost every day. And we've been living a dry life with each other, sleeping in separate bedrooms, without any marital relations. My life was not happy, and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I ended up leaving home one day, carrying my four-year-old baby on my back. I demanded a divorce, but my husband didn't agree. While living apart from him, I started to meet someone for a while, and that's when all the things started. He often said that he sees 44 minutes whenever he had his eye on the clock. And one day I started to experience the exact same thing with him. After divorcing my husband, I broke up with the guy I met later since I couldn't get along well with him either. However, I've been watching the same time, 44 minutes since then. For example, it would be 10.44 p.m. when I turned on my cell phone all of a sudden and it would be precisely 4.44 a.m. when I checked the time by myself at dawn. Another day I heard a hallucination that sounded like my phone bell ringing, so I checked my cell phone and it was exactly 44 minutes. It's been more than two years since living like this. Meanwhile, I heard that my ex-husband had passed away lately due to a cerebral hemorrhage caused by excessive drinking. I was very sorry for him and suddenly wondered whether the 44 minutes had been predicting all these things. If I knew he'd leave like that, I'd try to get along with him one more time. I couldn't breathe with regret and apology when I thought about him who had a hard time alone. Anyway, I thought everything settled down like that. However, I still see 44 minutes to this day. Like most of the Asian countries, the number four is often recognized as an unlucky number. I'm frightened, and I'm sick of those numbers, 44 minutes. What does that mean? Please let me know. Please help me. Regarding I always see 44 minutes. You see, 44 minutes is just one of the 24 hours. One minute, 13 minutes, and 44 minutes are all just one number in 60 minutes. I know number four is given a special meaning, but time is just time. For example, if I see seven minutes every time when I look at my watch, I guess I'm going to think that it's just one of the numbers in 60 minutes. It's not a symbol of luck or anything else. Not a big deal. Just do not pay too much attention and try to use it in real life. Let's say you are cooking noodles at 41 minutes, and you think it'll be 44 minutes at some point, right? Then you can stop making noodles and eat them right away. And there's another case. Let's suppose that it's about 8.04 p.m. now. If the drama starts in 40 minutes, then turning on the TV thinking like this, oh, it must be 44 minutes exactly. I'm so sorry that your ex-husband died, but I think it's a natural result of his frequent drinking. First of all, thank you for your answer. 
By the way, the answer adoption rate is 44.4%. It's really weird, isn't it? In December of 2006, I was 15 years old at the time. I had an extreme fear of the dark. While laying in bed, I would always cover my mirror, or I'd face the opposite side of the room that my mirror was on. I'd also make sure that I didn't stare at any dark corners of my room, along with my closet, which was a very dark space that I couldn't help but face because it was on the opposite side of the room from my mirror. The next thing was that if I look in the mirror from my bed, I could see my closet. So one night, for some reason, I decided that I wanted to get over my fear of the dark. When I went to bed, I didn't cover up my mirror, didn't put my head under the covers, nor did I face the opposite side of the room from my mirror. I laid down, turned my lamp off, and stared at my mirror. Then I guess I fell asleep. When I woke up, I was looking at my door. Then I panned my eyes over to my mirror. And to my surprise, there was someone standing in the darkness of my closet that I saw in the mirror. I fumbled to turn on my lamp, and I looked at my closet, but no one was there. I told my parents what happened. For some reason, they said it was my imagination. My 15-year-old imagination, I guess. I told them that I wasn't three years old, and I know what I saw. A week later, I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, surprisingly seeing the same dark figure in my mirror. But he was closer to my bed. A lot closer. I ran screaming out of my room and told my parents again. I told them that there's no way that I will sleep in my room again. So my father said he was sleeping there starting the next night, in which I pleaded for him not to do it. Of course, he didn't listen and went anyway. The first few nights, there was nothing happening. My father didn't understand what scared me, but insisted that I never go in the room again. I'd go in there and grab anything that I needed. One night, my parents were placing more gifts under our Christmas tree while joking about the so-called monster in my room, as my father says. This whole time while he slept in my room, I slept in his with my mother, but I was on the floor. We all watched the movie and went to bed like usual. But my mother and I watched the Grinch movie, and that's when I guess I dozed off. <laughs> My mother and I were startled hearing my father scream like that. We both ran into my room. My father was grabbing his left arm in the left side of his chest area. At the same time, he was pointing at the mirror with a startled look. My mother screamed for me to call 911, in which I ran to another room to call. When I came back, my mother was crying uncontrollably. My father wasn't moving anymore. His eyes were wide open in the direction of the mirror that stuck on it. My father passed away from a massive heart attack. After that night, my uncles and grandparents helped us move out because we didn't want to stay there anymore. My grandfather found a journal on the nightstand next to my bed. I never put it there. My mother looked at it and said it was my father's handwriting. What we didn't know was that my father kept a log for every night that he slept in my room. He mentioned that he saw someone in the mirror and every night he would get closer to the point that the dark figure was standing over the bed. He just didn't tell anyone because he didn't want to scare us. I really don't know what to think honestly. Is this my fault that he's dead? I know our Christmas that year was not joyful as we wanted it to be. One, like this? I'm currently living together with my best friend. One day, while we were sleeping, she suddenly screamed and jumped up from the bed. I asked what happened and she explained what she had just experienced. So she got a sudden sleep paralysis when she was sleeping. She couldn't move her body at all. Moaning, she called my name desperately and said, Help me. I think I got sleep paralysis. Give me a hug if you can hear my voice. Just then, someone started to press on her chest with an unbelievable, tremendous force, and she replied with my voice to be exact. Like this? Like this? And my voice sounded like frantically, she said. Two, the ticking sound. One day in the middle of the late night, I woke up to the sudden sound of the clock ticking. 
And what I realized right after I opened my eyes was that there was no clock at all in my room. As soon as I recognized the fact, the ticking sound coming from my room suddenly began to be heard, like an offbeat. You know the ghost could make the sound of ticking. 3. The computer in the motel room. Because of my work, I had to stay at a motel one night. While I was sleeping for a long time, I suddenly saw the computer turning on automatically around 4 a.m. On top of everything else, internet broadcasting suddenly started. I thought something was weird, but I was so tired that I was almost going back to sleep. Then I heard the sudden voices of two men on the computer. Wow, 22 people are watching now. Terrified, I immediately turned off the computer right away. 4. The coincidence. I experienced this myself once before. While I was sleeping, I had a dream of someone pulling me roughly. Surprised, I swung at someone that pulled me in my dream with my fist and then woke up. And when I opened my eyes, I was hanging on the balcony railing and my mother was pulling me desperately. Her nose was bleeding and I realized that it was my mom who pulled me in my dream at that moment to save my life. What was more surprising was that one of the female students jumped to her death from our apartment at that daybreak. In late 2008, I came one night to find my mom sitting in the kitchen all alone and in floods of tears. When I asked her what was wrong, her answer made my jaw drop. My dad had left her. There was absolutely no indication that anything was wrong with their marriage or that he was remotely unhappy. But that afternoon, while I was out, he had apparently packed a few things into a suitcase, told her he was leaving, and just disappeared. I only mention this because it explains why my mom and little sister just didn't want to be in the house over Christmas and New Year. That kind of family-oriented time of year would have just been way too hard on them, so they basically buggered off to Mexico for a month to just decompress or whatever. Point being, I was all alone for Christmas and New Year's. Christmas Day sucked, and I realized that they were seriously right about not wanting to be alone in the house at that time of year. So for New Year's Eve, I decided to throw a little get-together for me and a load of my mates, hoping that a little party might take away some of the sadness I felt as a result of my dad leaving us. So on the night itself, it ends up being about 20 to 30 of us getting together in my parents' place, getting drunk, listening to music, playing Xbox, just a big hangout among some of the people I was closest to. It was a really good night to start off with, and... It really did help take my mind off of things for a little while. We did the whole New Year's countdown thing, set off a few fireworks, generally having a brilliant little night together. But the drunker we all got, the messier things became, until it was just a medley of people throwing up, hooking up in the spare bedroom, or arguing amongst themselves. Two of the people who ended up fighting were my mate Chris and his girlfriend at the time, a girl named Katie. And when I could gather... Katie thought Chris had been flirting with a mutual friend of ours and had taken issue with it. Chris was insisting that they were just being friendly and it was nothing to worry about, but Katie was adamant that something was going on, that he was cheating on her, blah blah blah. You know how it is, teenage drama. Now I know Chris really did love her, so it wasn't like a stand-up argument. It was more like him begging her to see reason and not go mad and dump him over some perceived bit of flirting. He swore he'd never do anything like that, that she was the only girl for him, how much he loved her, all this romantic, theatrical stuff that you might expect from two young lovers. It wasn't really anything in my business though, so me and the other party guests just sort of left them to it while we got on with trying to have fun. Then a little while later, I find Chris sitting in the back garden, swigging off a bottle of raw vodka on his own. I go up to him to ask him if he's okay, only to find that he's crying, rotten drunk, saying that Katie had dumped him and gone home. I tried to be a good friend and console him as best I could, saying that she probably was just drunk and over-emotional, how there was a good chance that they'd just get back together over the next couple of days when she'd realize she'd made a mistake. But he was insistent. She was gone for good and they wouldn't be getting back together. 
All I could do was get him on his feet and hug it out with him. The poor guy really was in one heck of a state, and I managed to convince him to hand over the vodka, drink some water, and then get some sleep in my bed so he could maybe sober up a wee bit before heading on home. He agrees, I tuck him in and then leave him to get some rest. About an hour or so later, the party is winding down and the remainder of us are just chilling in the TV room when someone goes off to use the toilet. They return like seconds later, saying someone's in the bathroom throwing up, then asking if they can go and take a pee in the back garden. Of course, I tell them no. I didn't want them peeing all over my mum's flower beds and that I'll nip upstairs to see if I can get whoever is out of the bathroom. So I get the toilet upstairs and I can hear someone gagging and retching on the other side of the locked door. My friend Julia joins me, a wee bit concerned, and starts trying to help me talk to the person who's locked themselves in the bathroom. It's some time then that I notice that two doors are open, the first being my bedroom, the second being a little cupboard on the first floor landing. I check my bedroom and see that the bed is empty, so it's obviously Chris that's in the bathroom, puking his guts up because of all the vodka he drank. I shut the door to the bedroom, then go to close the door on the other room, which happened to be a little cover that my mom kept cleaning supplies in. My first thought was that Chris had opened up that door thinking it was the bathroom in his drunken haze, then legged it to the right bathroom in his desperation to puke. But I noticed something that, at first, I didn't really understand the significance of. The cleaning supplies that my mom usually kept all neat in a little plastic box were spilled all over the floor. Not like open fluids spilling out, they were just all out of the box like someone had been rooting through them. As I'm wondering why someone would do something like that, Julia calls out that the person who'd locked themselves in the bathroom, presumably Chris, had gone quiet all of a sudden and that they weren't responding. That's when I put two and two together. Violent vomiting, cleaning supplies missing, deep drunken depression. Chris was trying to end his own life. I absolutely pegged it to the bathroom door and started trying to kick the door off the hinges. Julia screams in shock at what I'm doing and people from the living room start piling out towards the bottom of the stairs in utter confusion. I've been really protective of the house all night, not wanting people smoking inside, not wanting people peeing anywhere they shouldn't, trying to stop spillages and all of that kind of stuff. Then there I was, booting down my own bathroom door. It was way too heavy to actually kick off the hinges, but I did manage to kick a hole in the wood paneling, and that's when I got to look inside. Chris was laying there, a bottle of bleach next to him, and there was like pink puke all over the cistern, the floors, and his clothes. It was pink because he drank the bleach and it had corroded or burned the inside of him so much that he had vomited up blood. We were distraught, terrified, almost sure that he was dead but we were quick to call an ambulance. Chris had his stomach pumped and he survived, but it took a long time for him to be back to normal. Because he puked, the fumes had damaged his lungs or something. I'm not a doctor, so don't have a go if I get the details wrong. So he had trouble eating, drinking, and breathing for at least a month after that. Twelve years later, and I've never forgotten that, and I'm pretty sure neither has he. Because as far as I know, Chris never drank vodka again, because of the smell of it makes me think of that night. God knows what horrible memories it brings back to him. Before the story, just a little background information. I'm a 15-year-old guy living in northern Florida with my mom and my dog. We live in a two-story apartment located in a small apartment complex that just happens to be right next to an old cemetery. Just to be clear, I get out of school at 3 o'clock and my mom doesn't get off work until 5, so it's typical of her to take a late lunch and pick me up. Then go back to work for another hour and a half and get home around 5.30. Anyways, on with the story. So it was around three months after we moved into our condo when this occurred. It was a typical Friday for me, go to school, get home at 
and be home alone until my mom got there. On this particular day, my mom decided to stay late and wouldn't get home until 8 o'clock. I, like most other teenagers, didn't mind being home alone for extended periods of time, simply because I got to play video games without any interruption. It's around 6.15. My dog was whining, so I decided to take him for a walk. As I walked downstairs, I heard what sounded like someone breathing outside my front door. Not just light breathing. I mean it sounded like someone had finished running a marathon or something. I turned to investigate, and to my horror, I saw a tall shirtless man standing with his face pressed directly against the glass. This man had to be at least six foot seven in his mid-fifties and had a lumberjack-style beard with very large glasses. My kitchen is right next to my front door, so I grabbed the biggest knife I could and told him to fuck off. He seemed emotionless and simply walked away. I wish the story ended there, but of course, it didn't. It was now around 7.30 so it was getting dark, and there was no signs of the creepy man, so I decided it was safe to proceed outside. So me and my dog walked our usual path, which led us directly past the cemetery. This time, it was different. I had this eerie feeling that I wasn't alone. I could feel someone watching me. My dog's ears perked up and eventually stopped walking altogether. He began to stare towards the cemetery and started barking uncontrollably. I started looking to see what he was barking at, and to my absolute shock, I saw the same bearded guy from before. He looked different though, almost like he was leaning on something. But I couldn't quite see what it was. As I leaned in to take a closer look, I realized that it was a shovel and he had a red bag on the ground next to him with what looked like a human foot sticking out of the bottom of it. Was this creep digging a fucking grave? Was this creep digging a fucking grave? I asked myself. What happened next still sends chills down my spine. He gave me the creepiest smile I've ever seen. Then. He simply picked up his shovel and once again began digging as if he never saw me. Safe to say, me and my dog got the hell out of there. When I got back home, my mom was already there and I told her what happened. She called the cops and I guess they went to the cemetery to investigate but found nothing. We moved out of that place a few months later. Six months have now passed and I still haven't heard anything from the police. I just hope he's either dead or in jail somewhere. So sick fuck in the cemetery, let's never meet again. My name is Alex and this incident that I will never forget happened in 2019. It was about exactly 10 p.m., and I was still miles away from my house. I couldn't drive yet due to my young age, so I was walking home by myself. I used to be afraid of strangers and the dark, so the anxiety was getting worse. I was walking down the street, pulling out my cell phone flashlight since it was pitch black outside. Nobody was on the road, and I felt that was very weird because the street usually had lots of people around there. Let's just get back as soon as possible. I was nervous, but didn't have any choice. After about an hour of walking, I heard a sudden piercing scream of a young girl. What was that? I froze in place and my heart was beating intensely. After about 30 seconds, I heard it again, but it was different. It sounded like someone was being killed this time. I started to run in the direction of the screaming, however, it suddenly stopped as soon as I arrived at the place. I was terrified at this point. Just then, I heard light footsteps. I shined my flashlight on and to my surprise, there was a little girl crying with a bunch of stab wounds. The wounds looked serious and she should have died already because of that, but she was alive. 
I asked what happened and she told me that she was kidnapped by a guy at the Walmart when she was going to buy a drink. They covered my face and mouth and I passed out. She then said that she was in a van with three men inside. There's some other stuff I will not explain in this story because I think it's beyond normal crimes and she doesn't want others to know what happened. So anyway, I couldn't leave her just like that so I carried her on my back and she was light like a feather as if she hadn't eaten in weeks. I eventually took her to my house and my parents made some food for her and it was kind of scared to see her pale face and skinny body. Then I called the police and they went to the area where I found the girl. After a few hours, they reported to me that they had found an old cabin and the parents' dead body of the young girl inside. And their bodies were brutally dismembered. After that, they had found a man with a knife hiding in the cabin. The girl was still eating, looking at me with a confused look, and I felt really sorry for her at that time. The criminal was arrested on the spot and eventually sent to jail for life in prison on a charge of murder. The case seemed to end like that, but we left a girl. She had nowhere to go back. I told my parents, and after having lots of conversation, they eventually decided to adopt her. Now I'm 17 years old and she's turned eight years old and we have such a good brother and sister relationship. However, to this day, I've always wondered what would have happened to her that day if I didn't go and search for where the scream had come from? Got a call at about 4 a.m. Typical car wreck in rural area. Respond and find car hit light pole and no one around. Figure it's a drunk and start walking around the area trying to find where he's hiding. One house in the area across the street and about 150 yards away. After a couple of minutes, a woman comes screaming bloody murder from the house towards my unit. Full sprint, screaming at the top of her lungs. I shine my flashlight on her so she knows where I am because she's just running towards my car. She sees me and runs straight up to me. I'm trying to calm her down, make sure she's not injured and all that good stuff. She tells me it's her car. Okay, getting somewhere, but she wasn't driving. Here we go. Let me guess, somebody stole it? Nope. She told her husband she was leaving him. He freaks out and says he's going to kill himself. She says he downed a bottle of aspirin and no clue if this was true or not. When that didn't work, he jumped in the car and drove into the light pole trying to kill himself. When that didn't work, he ran back over to the house and they argued some more. Sees me pull up, makes her leave and locks all the doors. I asked her why she didn't leave and was he being violent towards her. No, he would never hurt her, she said, but he grabbed like a 12 inch butcher knife from the kitchen and told her she needed to go, so she did. Once he locked the door, she panicked because the children were inside. Don't remember the ages, but very young. Cue the screaming and running. I look over to the house and began to see the interior lights going off one by one. Well shit. I hurry up and jump in my car and drive over. Fellow cop pulls up. Quickly fill him in. Armed suicidal male with kids inside. House is dead quiet. We begin stalking around in the darkness trying to peek in windows to assess the situation. As we get to the back door we hear a noise and my buddy swings his light up and we see him in the backyard behind us. Freaking guy was outside the entire time watching us. He's sitting on his feet, half sitting up is the best way I can describe it. Tats all over him, no shirt on with jeans. His head is cocked to the side and he's just staring at us with that giant ass knife in his hand and not saying a word. We both draw but keep our guns by our sides. He's about 20 feet away. Start talking to him but no response. Then all of a sudden without saying a word he begins cutting. I mean full on slicing his forearms and chest. Then he begins screaming and crying. We're telling him to stop, just talk to us, you're not in trouble, we'll get you help. He says he deserves to die. Well, I'm not killing him and my buddy's not either. He switched hands and started slicing the other forearm. Just deep terrible cuts and he won't stop. He starts slicing his thighs, chest and even his neck a little. We already called for the ambulance. 
He finally stood up and was begging for us to kill him. We kind of danced around a little while not allowing him to position himself to become a threat to us. Yes, I know about the reactionary gap and I wasn't worried about it. He was losing blood and getting weak, so we basically decided to wait him out. He cut a few more times and he walked around a bit and then just fell down. We pounced and got the knife away and the ambulance showed up. Got him to ER. Docs advised it took 250 stitches to patch him up. No charges and we got him referred for some help. The kids were unharmed by the way. He sent her away because he wanted to die and didn't want her to see it. No shit, I pulled that guy over about three months later on a random traffic stop. And when he saw me, he just burst into tears and gave me a big old hug. Wife and kids were in the car and they were making it one day at a time. Said he got some help and was in a dark place that night. Ever been thanked for not shooting someone? Yep, it's just as weird as it sounds. I'm 30 years old. My family moved to the United States when I turned 14. I grew up in Russia, in a town called Kirov. It was big enough to house a full spread of criminal activity, from organized crime to cannibalistic hobos. These few stories are not tied together with anything else other than a cultural connection, and hopefully will give you a small glimpse of the state of Russia during the 90s, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. When I was very little, we lived in a typical Russian five-story apartment building in what was considered to be a middle-class neighborhood. It was fairly quiet, with nothing much happening, so us kids could play outside for as long as we wanted to, without adult supervision. I remember a man who lived on the first floor of our building. He was probably in his mid to late thirties, always wearing a dirty wife beater, never a clean shave. Every time it seemed, when I would walk or ride my bike past his window, he would jump up from his chair and begin to yell and shout as loud as he could at me, swearing, calling me all kinds of names and threatening me. He would always do this with excessive violent movements and facial expressions. As a four-year-old boy, I would just stand there in horror watching him do this crazy murderous rampage. He would fall on his elbows on the windowsill and shake his head feverishly, spitting out curses and death threats at me with his eyes bulging. He would punch his chest with all of his strength and was almost in tears from his psychotic rage. He would announce his hatred towards me and how much he wanted me dead. I just remember being shocked and would just stand there and let the horror overtake me, leaving the crazy man just staring at me out of his window. One day, the man disappeared. No more insane harassment at the window. Being a kid, I just moved on with my life and didn't think about it for years until much later I told my parents about him and what he would do to me as a kid. The story that they told me confirmed my suspicions about him. Around one of the last times I ever saw him, a strange occurrence happened in our city. Body parts were found scattered throughout our city, all far from each other. They all belonged to one unfortunate man, whose wife plotted to kill him for the sake of acquiring his apartment and belongings. The woman's brother happened to be the freak living downstairs who apparently killed the husband and dismembered his body in a tub and discarded the pieces throughout the city, including the head. Everything led to the wife, and it didn't take her long to blame the entire thing on her dear brother, who to this day is sleeping in some dark cell, far away in the cold. When I was a young kid, we had moved to another house once. One afternoon during the weekend, my dad asked me to go to church with him. However, being a little kid at that time, I was tired of going to church, sitting inside and just praying like that. So I refused, and he soon gave up, and finally, I ended up staying home alone on the weekend. I suddenly felt thirsty while I was enjoying my alone time watching TV. 
It was about 2 p.m. and I woke up and headed for the kitchen. Then something strange next to the refrigerator caught my eye. It looked like a black silhouette, like a person with short hair and a long skirt. At that moment, I could feel my whole muscle got flinched and strained. Shoot, whatever. Uh, I'm not here to drink water. I'm just here to get some tissue. Being scared, I gave up getting some water out of the refrigerator and then went straight to the bathroom. I grabbed the toilet paper and began cleaning the place around the TV for no reason. I was really terrified at that time, though. I kept trying not to look at it, but then I realized something more frightening. The head of the silhouette was moving in the same direction that I was moving. Like it was literally watching me. I couldn't stay here anymore, so I ran out of the house. As soon as the front door closed, I ran down to the playground, sat there and waited for hours until my dad finally came back. After that day, I remember my dad started to chant the Buddhist scriptures all night long, floating a bowl of water on a small table. In the end, we eventually moved to another place. Me and my dad were talking about a ghost story when he started telling me something about the house we had lived in before. While we were living in the house, my dad started to dream very often. One day, he had a dream that a woman was cutting something in our kitchen. When he got closer, he noticed that she was cutting hair continuously. Another day, he heard the sound of chopping something damp, like meat. When he got closer, he saw my body was crumpled in the sink and only my face was on the cutting board. And she had taken my tongue out and was finally chopping it with a big knife. My dad was able to see her face for the first time in his dream. Her eyes were purely red and she kept smiling at him with her mouth almost ripped and she never stopped using the knife. He also said that the woman had short bobbed hair and was wearing a long skirt. I think it was the same day that I saw a woman's silhouette in the kitchen. Since then, Dad has visited the church, asking the pastor for help. He even visited the temple to get a recording tape of the Buddhist scripture from the chief priest and prayed all night, but it was all useless. So we eventually moved out again soon. And thankfully, my dad no longer had the dream anymore, and I didn't see the shadow in our new house. I was only nine at the time, and we had just moved to a better location. Our apartment was on the sixth floor and was the last one on the landing. It was the furthest you could go from the entrance of the building, and was fairly secluded. The staircase was also completely indoors, with four apartments to a floor. One day, I came home from school around 2 p.m. My parents weren't due back for at least another three hours, and I set about doing my usual homework, watching TV, and emptying out the fridge. It was around the time that I settled down for an episode of Babylon 5 that I heard the front doorbell ring. This was very odd, as my parents both had their keys, and no one else usually visited around this time of day. I went over to the front door and asked, Who is it? I heard a man answer back, Hello there, I am from the electrical company. We are doing a routine check on the electrical meters. May I come in and inspect yours? It will only take a minute. I looked through the peephole and saw a young man probably nearing his thirties, very clean, neatly dressed, with his hair combed to the side. He held a clipboard in his hand, with some papers attached. I was about to twist open the lock, when something caught my eye. Because of the fisheye view I had on the landing, I could also see a little extra to the sides, on my left and the man's right. I saw a light bouncing from what looked like a sharp metal object. It took me a second but I clearly saw what it was. It was the cutting edge of an axe. Someone was standing right next to the door, attempting to hide from view, holding an axe in their hands. At this point, my memory gets blurry. I remember stepping away from the door and creeping into my room, which was the furthest in the hallway. I closed my door and didn't come back out until my parents got back. 
The bell kept ringing for a few more minutes, and then it finally fell silent. I never told anyone about it, until now. So these were my stories, and I think there's always something important to learn from encounters like this. I grew up during the 1980s in a very tight-knit community in Georgia. When I was a kid, I used to love camping in my backyard. Almost every Friday night, me and my little brother Donnie would set up a tent in our backyard and spend the night playing with our G.I. Joes inside the tent. Our neighborhood was nice, but the surrounding area was a bit shady. You see, this was at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic. And within a few years, our small town became infested by addicts and drug dealers. I remember there was an old man named Mr. Carl, who was once a pilot in World War II. He used to live across the street from us. His wife died of cancer around 1984, and after that, he went off the deep end. Three years after his wife's death, he became addicted to crack and began wandering the streets at night. It wasn't long after that when his house got repossessed by the bank, and Mr. Carl became homeless. Me and Donnie would see him almost every morning sleeping on a bench at our bus stop. Sometimes, he would be awake and would talk to us. We knew Mr. Carl, so we weren't afraid of him, and he never tried anything with us. He was always very friendly. After a while, Donnie and I noticed that Mr. Carl was no longer around. We asked our parents if they knew anything about what might have happened to him, but they didn't have a clue. I can't recall how much time went by since the disappearance of Mr. Carl, but I would say it was at least a month. So on one Friday night, me and my brother were in our backyard playing with these rubber band rifles our dad made for us. It was a piece of wood with a wooden clip glued to the top of it and a nail sticking out the front so you could stretch a rubber band around the nail and clip it to the top. That way when you release the clip, the rubber band went flying. Me and Donnie were shooting up plastic toy soldiers when we heard something rustling in the bushes outside. Now, this is Georgia. We've chased away our fair share of raccoons and stray dogs. And with our new makeshift weapons, we were feeling extra brave that night. We decided not to go get our dad and that we would handle the intruder ourselves. So we both exited the tent and made our way to the very back of the yard where a chain-link fence separated our property from a small forest area. Donnie had brought along the flashlight and was pointing it into the forest just beyond the fence. When we got to the fence line, a figure emerged from behind a tree. I recognized the jacket that the person was wearing. It was a dark brown bomber-style jacket, and I saw that the person was also wearing one of those army veteran caps. There's only one person I knew who wore a jacket like that, Mr. Carl. However, when I got a better look at the guy in the woods, it didn't really look like Mr. Carl. He was definitely wearing his clothing, but the man appeared to be way too young to be Mr. Carl. I couldn't get a good look at the man's face. He was looking down, so the bill of his cap concealed his features. That's when I noticed the dark red stains all over the man's jacket and jeans. Me and Donnie just stared at the man for about 30 seconds before asking him what he was doing back there. The man then reached down and grabbed a large axe that was lying at his feet. He then began coming towards the fence. Me and my brother dropped our wooden guns and took off back towards the house. As soon as I turned around, I felt something fly past my head. I looked to the side to see the axe flipping through the air. It crashed into the tent, causing it to collapse. The rest of that night is a blur to me. According to our dad, when me and Don burst into the house, we were absolutely hysterical. It took about an hour to get the full story out of us, and by that time, the mysterious man in Mr. Carl's jacket was gone. I just remember my parents talking to a police officer in the living room later that night. As far as I'm aware, there was never any follow-up, and I don't know if they ever caught the guy or retrieved the axe he threw into our backyard. This incident effectively put an end to our Friday night camping, and we never figured out what exactly happened 
to Mr. Carl. Okay, so this event only occurred really recently, and I still can't believe it happened. I live in Sydney, Australia, and I'm very used to the occasional insane or creepy person on the street or bus, etc. I know how to deal with them and act around them most of the time. A few weeks ago, I decided to go shopping at a big shopping center known as Westfields in Australia, I'm not sure where they're called elsewhere. They are always busy and it's hard to find parking, but I managed to get a great spot in the parking lot on the level where you can enter the center. I shopped and everything was good. I had some lunch, bought some groceries and a new dress. I exited the shopping center and started walking towards my car. There wasn't anybody in the parking lot except for a few cars trying to find a spot. Nothing out of the ordinary. Then I noticed a lady walking in the other lane next to mine. She had tangled, matted, and thinning hair. She wasn't dressed in the nicest or newest clothes. She was talking to herself, but I didn't think much of it because people do that when they're trying to remember something or going over something in their head. Then she starts screaming. Nothing in particular, just gibberish. I look over to see what she's doing or if she's injured, but nope, she's fine, just staring directly at me and screaming. She locks eyes with mine as soon as I turn to see what she was yelling about. A few seconds pass and nothing happens. She keeps screaming while keeping direct eye contact with me. Then her mouth spreads into an insanely terrifying grin. She stops screaming and starts bolting towards me. I was frozen for what seemed like an eternity, but it was probably only three seconds. I hightailed it to my car, chucked my shopping bag in the seat next to mine, cracked all my eggs, and slammed the door shut just in time. This lady starts banging on my car, screaming while trying to open the doors. I quickly back out of my spot, not caring if I knocked this batshit crazy lunatic to the ground. I didn't, she was fine, physically, but at this point she climbs onto my fucking trunk and tries to break my back window. I start to move the car and she jumps off but chases after me for a few levels and then I lost her. My heart was beating so fast I thought I was going into cardiac arrest. I called the police and told them where I saw her and what she did. They didn't find her at the shopping center, and I haven't heard anything else about this. But my boyfriend offered to get me a new carton of eggs. My mom is quite a tough person. Her first impression, her way of speaking, and even her personality were so tough that she was often told that she would have succeeded if she becomes a shaman whenever she went to see a fortune teller. I guess that's why my mom has seen ghosts since she was very young. Sometimes she always told me this whenever we went driving to go somewhere. You know there are many ghosts around in this town. According to her, there's a rule in areas with a lot of ghosts. She said that they exist usually in areas with large bodies of water, like rivers or lakes. Because those places had strong yin energy, the ghosts have nothing to do but just stay there. One day, Mom suddenly started screaming as we were driving along the road next to the river. Then she said that this place was full of ghosts. When I asked which place it was, she pointed her finger at one specific area near the water and replied, Right there! My heart dropped at that very moment. After we passed that area, she kept looking back and saying that it was strange. And something more horrifying happened after that. A few days later, we heard that an unidentified body was found by the river while watching the news. And the place was where we had passed by that day, and it was exactly the same place that my mom pointed her finger. When I asked my mom making a fuss, she then answered as if nothing had happened. Oh well, so that's why. 
they were gathered to see that body. I ended up staying up all night that day because I kept thinking about the scene my mom told me about. So right when I had just finished college, I was living in a one-bedroom townhouse slash split. I met a guy on Plenty of Fish and at the time, I wasn't exactly smart about my online digital footprint. It's not like I've really changed, but at least now I'm not as ridiculous as I was. Anyways, he seemed like a really decent guy. He was really good looking, he said he had a good job, nice teeth, and he looked like he really cared about his personal health. Pretty much all the things that I would typically look for in a guy. I'm not a shallow human, but I really like to be presentable. And if I'm with someone, I would like them to care about being presentable in a business environment also. After about a week of chatting online, we agreed to meet. We had met at a restaurant that was downtown, which was really far from where I lived. Right when I got there, I had noticed him standing at the door. We sat down to eat, and the evening went really great. At the end of the day, we said bye, and I got into my car and began to drive away. I realized right away that he was following me. Because of the distance to my house, I wasn't immediately scared because it's a really big city. Maybe he'll turn off the freeway or something. But he didn't. My exit was coming up, and I decided not to take it. I just kept driving. I circled the entire city on the freeway, and he stayed right behind me the whole time. I was really starting to panic a bit, so I decided to go to my friend's house instead of mine, and when I pulled out of the exit, I noticed that he didn't. So I had a little bit of a moment to breathe, and I just decided, okay, screw it, I'll just go home. I took the off-ramp back onto the freeway and began going back to my exit. I got home and showered and was getting ready for bed. I started feeling really dumb and I started thinking things like, was that really him? Am I overreacting? Maybe I should ask him if he was following me. Pretty much just a number of things racing through my overactive imagination, or so I thought. I decided I was going to message him and just say, hey I had a good time tonight, good night. And right when I started typing, all of a sudden a message came through to my phone of a picture of my car right outside my house. I nearly died upon seeing that. My heart jumped out of my chest and I started shaking. I didn't know what to say and he then texts me and says, I didn't know you lived across the street from me. Now I've met my neighbors before and not once have I ever met him. There's a huge apartment complex kitty corner to my townhouse, so maybe that's where he lived, I don't know. I popped up and I went to go look outside. And there he was, just standing there outside like he was waiting for me. I opened the door and he asked if he could come in and if I still wanted to hang out. I told him I was really exhausted as I'd rather just crash out as it had really been a long day. The very next morning I woke up to go to work and my windshield had been smashed, my car was keyed, and my back two tires were completely slashed. As I was noticing the damage to my vehicle, the guy comes out of his car with two coffees and is like, Oh, I thought I'd surprise you with a morning coffee. So again, I'm totally freaked out. I called the cops and I reported the damage to my vehicle. The guy offered to drive me, but something in my gut was just telling me not to get in his car. So I called my boss and I told him about the situation and I explained that I wasn't going to be there until after the police came. This guy just hung out the entire time, by the way. When the police finally got there, this guy was acting really suspicious. He walked away and he started hiding on the other side of his car. I filed the report and the police basically just told me that they hope I have insurance right as they were on their way to leave. They pulled around the corner and all I heard was the siren and then the cop car's lights turn on and then the cops screamed. Freeze! Put your hands in the air and get down on your knees! I turned to look and the cop has his gun drawn on this guy and the dude's on the ground getting arrested. I spoke with the cop after he got into the back of the car, and he explained that he was wanted for stalking, breach of probation, assault with a deadly weapon, fraud, as well as aggravated assault. I was absolutely shook. It took me a couple of days to get over the hypothetical situations that could have happened to me. About a week later, I was on my way out the door to work, and guess who was sitting right in my driveway? 
We live in Canada, so essentially you're released on conditions until you go to jail. I told him that I was late for work, but that I'd call him when I was done working. I never went to work that day. I went and found a new apartment in another area of the city. I changed my phone number, and I hired my friend's husband and his friends to go pack my apartment up and move it to their place for about a month, and then move it to my new place because I was just so scared this dude would follow them while moving. So yeah, that's my scary story about the first time I used plenty of fish, and I'm never using it again. One, the man I saw in my apartment. It was around the time that our area was plagued by lots of sexual assault cases. And there was advice for us, which used to be that if someone followed you, look straight at his eyes and talk. Then one day, I was coming back home after hanging out with my friend. I saw a middle-aged man walking behind me, and suddenly I felt like he was following me. And he literally came to my apartment elevator so I turned around intentionally and greeted him, smiling. Hello. He pretended not to hear me at first, so I spoke to him, making eye contact with him more and more. I think I've never seen you in this apartment before. Did you move here? He, this time, looked at me with his eyes wide open and then ran away from the spot, and I rushed towards the security office to report what I had experienced just before. And the moment when I saw the CCTV there, I had no choice but to just freeze in there. I was talking to myself, staring into the air. 2. The Note in the Trash Can It was during class time. I was exchanging a little note with one of my friends, writing just a boring story, you know. And after class, I tore up the paper and threw it into the trash can. On my way home after school, I realized that I had left some of my stuff in my locker, so I headed back to the classroom. But I felt something strange when I arrived in front of the class. So before I opened the front door, I slowly looked at people through the window next to the door, and when I looked inside, there was another of my classmates there. And he was picking up my torn note that I had exchanged with my friend in the trash, assorting it as if it were like a puzzle, and reading it. 3. How do you know? One day I ran into my neighbor in the elevator. Hey, I recently got to know a lot of good songs these days, thanks to you. By the way, do you want to hear my ringtone? He said like this and turned on his ringtone, which was one that I used to listen to at home by myself these days. For your information, I've never heard it loud enough to be heard in the hallway, and I was positive that I haven't let him know the name of the song either. Did I? When I asked, he replied, Yeah, sometimes I put my ears to your front door and I could hear everything. It turns out that he was a man who didn't mind eavesdropping at random people's doors. As soon as I heard it, I got sudden goosebumps and didn't want to live here anymore. I feel like I'm going to move to another place as soon as my house contract is over. 4. The Taxi Driver when I was in high school, I would always go to school early at 5 a.m., around during the exam period. My school was a little far away from where I lived, so I used to take a taxi with my friend at that time. However, I came out too early that day, so I had to ride alone. So I was on my way to the school, then I realized that the driver was wearing sunglasses even though it was dawn, and I felt like he kept glancing at me through the side mirror. How old are you? I answered his sudden question. 18. He kept driving without saying anything and he suddenly stopped where the car had to turn left. Then he called me. Get off. Excuse me? Totally freaking out, I asked him and he calmly replied. I said get off. You couldn't have gotten off if you weren't the same age as my daughter, you know? The moment I heard his words, I got goosebumps from head to toe. I ended up getting off the car without looking back and ran away to school. 5. The Talisman There was a pretty famous fortune teller in our town that everyone knew, and this year they started to make talismans for free for those who are weak or in bad situations. I didn't think of it that much at first. Since it was just a talisman, there was a rumor about its effectiveness, but you know it wasn't sufficiently proven. 
Then one day, my mom's friend made a talisman from there for her son who became a middle school student, and he eventually carried it in his wallet. But one of his friends took the talisman from his wallet and played a prank on it. He rubbed the talisman on the stone and it got crumpled all over the place. And the incident happened the next day. While her son was riding his bike to school, he was hit by a dump truck in front of the main gate, which ended up becoming a paraplegic. I got goosebumps and afterward, I repeatedly asked my mom not to even think about getting anything like a talisman from the fortune tellers for a while. This happened a little over a decade ago, when I was an undergrad. I worked as a pharmacy technician my sophomore through senior years. At a pharmacy, of course, you have regulars. One regular was Joe, a mid-thirties man with long straggly hair and an affinity for bizarre outfits. He was very sweet, but also very ill, mentally and physically. He was on a cocktail of antipsychotics, anti-anxiety, anti-depression, etc. Also, he was on medicine for AIDS. Normally, Joe would come in with his mother, who took care of him. However, his mother was older and had her own health problems. Towards the end of my junior year, Joe started coming in by himself, so he would walk from his home or take a taxi. Joe told me frequently that I looked like a young Michelle Pfeiffer, that I should be in LA, yada yada. Aside from the curly blonde hair, I never really saw the resemblance, but okay. I was polite, told him thanks, and asked him how his mother was. Made general small talk while I rang up his scripts. He never gave me the beware vibe. My senior year, Joe's mother came in without him and told us that Joe wasn't doing well. He was refusing to take his antipsychotics, and she was getting too old to defend herself if Joe went into a rage. She was having him placed in a home for patients like Joe. I didn't know until that day that Joe was technically under guardianship. The courts and his doctors deemed him too ill to make important financial and medical decisions. Joe's mother gave us the medical release so that Joe's new home could send their staff to pick up his medicine. We didn't see Joe for about four months. It was the end of my senior year, a Friday night. Just me and the pharmacist were working because Friday nights are slow. I was reading a magazine when I heard, Hey, Michelle. I'm not Michelle, so I didn't look up. Then angry, Michelle! And a slap on the counter in front of me made me look up. It was Joe. He was bleeding profusely and left a bloody handprint on the counter. I was shocked and all I could do was slowly back away to put distance between myself and the very bloody Joe. The pharmacist came rushing over to ask Joe what he was doing here. His home had picked up his meds on Tuesday. I wanted to see Michelle. I miss her. Then he started opening the waist-high door to get behind the pharmacy counter. The pharmacist called the store manager and told the manager to call 911 while she called Joe's mother. Michelle, come here. Give me a hug. No, I don't think that would be appropriate, Joe. Give me a hug. Then he just started screaming this over and over and attempting to climb over the counter. The pharmacist told me to go into the back storage room and lock the door. This just pissed Joe off. He started picking up items, which covered them in blood, and threw them at us. It was a chaotic mess. A patron was about to attempt to subdue Joe, but both the pharmacist and I both shouted not to touch him, due to him being covered in blood and positive for HIV. We told the small crowd that had formed to leave for their safety as Joe was flinging items and getting blood everywhere. Eventually, the police and EMTs arrived. The store manager must have explained the blood and HIV issue because they had on protective gear, long gloves, face masks, etc. 
and were able to forcibly sedate Joe. The store had to be shut down and a special cleaning crew had to come in and clean the entire store. Joe's mother came to apologize after the store reopened. She explained that Joe had developed an obsession for me and grew angrier and angrier each month when he was not allowed to tag along to pick up his meds. He attacked one of their home residents the night of the incident, so the home grounded him and sent him to his room. Joe broke his window and crawled out through the broken glass and walked to the pharmacy. The home did not know he had broken out until his mother called frantically. His mother was considering suing the home for negligence and she had moved Joe to a more secure mental health facility. Back when I was a senior in high school, a buddy of mine's parents went on this anniversary trip down to the Florida Keys for a weekend, leaving him as the sole occupier of their three-bedroom house. His older sister was off at college, so he literally had the entire place to himself. So, he did what any self-respecting teenager does when faced with that kind of situation. He threw a house party. And not just the kind where two dozen or so of your closest friends come over for some drinks. He threw a rager, the kind of party that half our entire high school managed to get an invite to. I mean, not everyone made it, but there was at least 200 people there at the very minimum. The old house was bouncing, for real. Now, I know people were playing fast and loose with the kinds of people they told about the party. There was no planning involved, basically, and my buddy wasn't the kind of guy to put the effort into making sure only a select bunch of people got it, so he basically just was like, Bring all y'all's friends over, everyone he knew on Facebook. So people we didn't even know just showed up like, oh yeah, I know, XYZ, etc, etc. And whoever opened the door to them would just be like, whatever, and let them inside. This turned out pretty cool for the most part, and we ended up meeting some pretty decent randoms as a result. But not everyone that showed up was cool or there to just chill. And we ended up learning the hard way that you don't just throw out invites to your house party unless you want some bad hombres to show up once in a while. So, the party was in full swing, music is pumping, people were drinking and dancing, it was an awesome time. Then, some drama apparently kicks off in an upstairs bedroom when one of the randoms that showed up gets caught stealing by someone who knew my buddy. This person is being an all-around good guy by taking it personally and wanting to keep our buddy's house safe, so he starts telling this random thief to leave the party before he gets knocked out. These guys are stepping to each other. The thief's boys step in, but they're outnumbered by everyone at the party, so they just went back down and headed for the front door to the house. But as they're leaving, this mutual friend of ours is walking them out, talking smack, telling them he does MMA and they're smart not to mess with them, etc, etc. Just drunk guy stuff, you know. He was probably showing off in front of his girl or something too, who knows. Anyway, the guy walks them all the way out, opens up the front door, then sings, Na 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 na, hey hey hey, goodbye, song like in their faces before he slams the door behind them. Now I didn't see this next part, so I'm just telling you guys what I've been told happened. Apparently the guy like stands in front of the door, fists on hips, puffing his chest out in some Superman pose like, yeah, I kicked these idiots out, get me. People were literally clapping for the dude like he was some kind of hero and then out of nowhere, people just start hearing these cracking sounds coming from the street outside before our hero just slumps to the carpet. One of the thieves we just kicked out turned out to have a gun on him, and he was so angry at the way our buddy just tried to humiliate him that he pulled it out and fired it right at the front door. He ended up shooting this guy four times in the back and neck. We immediately called 911, got the guy on a stretcher pretty quick, but one of the bullets nicked an artery or something and although they got him to the hospital in good time, he didn't make it. The shooter handed himself in to the police the next day. Apparently he had no idea that there was anyone still behind the door and 
just wanted to damage some property while scaring the people still inside. He had no intention of actually hurting anyone and threw some sort of plea bark and I know he managed to pretty much get off with second degree murder or something. Basically, he'd get a super lenient sentence. And this all happened about 14 years ago too, so I'm pretty sure that guy is getting out soon. And that scares me way more than knowing that there's a dude who murdered someone at a party that I was at. And he's just free to walk around the city like the thing he did wasn't even that big of a deal. Like how he is supposed to just act like nothing happened all those years ago. Does he just try and forget? Because although I'm really glad I didn't actually see anyone get shot, it's not something I've ever forgotten. And nor am I likely to. And honestly, my biggest worry right now is bumping into this guy in the grocery store or something. I'm not sure I'll be able to hold it together if I see him. Here's hoping he decides to make a fresh start someplace else. That's what I'd do. I just wouldn't be able to hang around the same old people, knowing I murdered one of them. A few years ago, me and my now ex went on a weekend away together. We ended up staying at the Hilton Hotel, which was nice and we had a really good time. But I'll never forget the last night we stayed there. Throughout the trip, we kept seeing the same hotel worker. I mean, he did work there, but with it being quite a large hotel with many staff, you'd think you wouldn't run into the same one over and over. But there he was. He was there when we ate. He was there when we went to use the pool, and every time I walked past him, he'd give me the strangest look. I remember on our last day there, I left our room to get some more ice. And guess who appeared as I was at the ice dispenser? You guessed it, the same guy. I thought as we were leaving in the morning anyway, I tried to ease the unnecessary tension and smile at him, and I tried to make small talk. He just ignored me. He stared at me. Well, glared at me intensely watching me as I finished filling up my bucket and as I left I very stupidly said well bye then and offered a half wave this visibly angered him he actually started to grind his teeth so I very briskly walked back to our room once I was back I very casually locked our door and I also put the chain on unnecessary I know nobody without a key card can get in but I just felt a bit creeped out by this guy I didn't mention anything to my ex. I just wanted us to enjoy our last night as we did. Well, up until about 3 a.m. anyway. We were cuddling in bed, trying to sleep. We both shot up when we heard what sounded like the doorknob starting to jiggle. We both looked at each other, surprised. But I assured her someone probably just had the wrong room. I was sure of that assumption until we heard that familiar beep and then the door unlocked. Someone had a key. The door slowly pushed open until it snagged on the chain, and upon realizing this, the will-be intruder swiftly closed it. We were both stunned, but I quickly snapped out of it, hoping that I could catch a glimpse of whoever it was. I ran to the peephole and peeked through it just in time to see a hotel employee briskly walking away. I could only see the back of them, but I knew exactly who it was. I wanted to tell the desk what had just happened, but my ex had begged me just to stay in the room with her and that she didn't want to leave the room. So I told her to come with me, but she didn't want to, so I just stayed in there with her. We tried to sleep, but couldn't. We checked out first thing in the morning. I did mention it as we left, and they said that they'll look into it, but I never heard anything. The Hilton is a nice hotel, and truthfully, I'd love to go back one day. Hopefully, I'll never see that creepy guy again. One, the man with a fret saw. The house I used to live in was a kind of detached house form. Although the house was an open place, it would not be possible to break in even if someone climbed over the wall if the door was locked. However, the incident just happened one summer. Being tired of the hot weather, I just put a chain on the door and went to sleep without even thinking of an uninvited guest's invasion. Not long after, a weird sound began to be heard from somewhere at night. 
At the moment I opened my eyes to the sound, I saw a man cutting our door chain with a small fret saw in front of the door. I, who was terrified at that time, screamed loudly, but he didn't stop sawing. Surprised by my scream, my parents and older brother ran outside, and my brother, who was grabbing a golf club in one hand, yelled to the man, What are you, man? Do you have a death with? Then the man smiled and said, If this gets cut, you guys all die. Fortunately, the man was arrested by the cops who arrived quickly, and we didn't suffer big damage, though. But the memory of the day still scares me up to this day. <laughs> 2. My dear, were you scared? I once had a big sleep paralysis while I was sleeping. Fortunately, I was able to wake up soon after, and I rushed to my mom's room with fear, and she hugged me. My dear, were you scared? Mom said to me like this as she patted my back, and I seemed to be relieved by her voice at first. However, I suddenly felt something was wrong. My mom began to ask the same question over and over again, scratching me on the back with her fingernail slowly but continuously. My dear, were you scared? Were you scared? Were you scared? Three, my missing friend. Today I went to my friend's funeral. It was really heartbreaking, maybe because he died absurdly with a month left before his marriage. So he was living alone in a studio apartment. He told me and other friends that he will travel to Europe by himself for a while before his wedding. When he said he wouldn't be able to contact us for a month, we all thought he was enjoying his travel. However, I felt something strange that he didn't come back after the day he had mentioned. We all felt anxious, so another friend ended up visiting his house and he was found dead in the bathroom. It turns out that while he went in the bathroom alone, his big mountain bike fell on the floor and it didn't open, and my friend was locked up for a month and dead like that. Even now my tears still flow with the sadness lingered in my heart. I hope you guys, whoever read this, always be careful. 4. The Woman in the Restroom Our school went on a trip to China for a vacation. We were supposed to go to one hotel as our lodging. But due to traffic problems, the reservation was canceled, having communication problems with the hotel. All the teachers were freaked out, and we had to gather at a nearby McDonald's waiting for about two hours. Meanwhile, our teachers were looking around for the other hotels, and there were available rooms in an old mansion-style hotel run by a Korean. Anyway, we were able to explain quickly since the owner was Korean and ended up staying for about a day. We unpacked our stuff, washed up, and fell asleep. But one of my friends kept waking me up that night. Hey, can you go to the restroom with me? However, since the hotel, which was different in structure from a regular hotel, it was difficult to find a restroom, and I was afraid to walk around this night, so I refused and just continued sleeping. The next morning, while we were checking out, she was constantly asking a question at the counter, and her face was turned deadly pale. So I asked her what she was asking about. Friend, I went to the restroom alone yesterday, you know. It was too dark and scary, but I really had to pee. So I ended up finding the restroom and was sitting inside, and then I heard a Chinese woman said something outside. So I was thinking, oh, the other guest is gonna use the restroom too. But then she only repeated one word, Zai Ming, like this. My poor friend got scared and thought for a long time whether to go out or not. Finally, when she ran out at once and there was no one there, she returned to the room in fear. After she calmed down a little, she then started to search for the word that she heard just before through the internet. But the results did not come out, so she had no choice but to sleep again. Eventually, she knew the word's meaning that she had heard in the restroom only after she went to the computer the next day and asked. What she said was, on top of you. The sound from the upstairs. My aunt once moved out to the apartment. However, the location was rural and the apartment was constructed around there, so it was totally empty at that time any residents were coming in. Anyway, after my aunt and uncle had moved in, they began to hear footsteps from upstairs every day at dawn that seemed to be someone was walking around. It's not like just a few times, 
They heard it for the whole month. My aunt gradually started to get mad, so she ended up visiting upstairs, but there was no one in the apartment. Then she visited the security guard and asked, Excuse me, is there a person living in that apartment? Well, it's probably an empty apartment yet. My mom told her that the thief, the beggar, or the stray cat might have come inside. So the next day, my aunt visited the guard again and told him about this. And he eventually went upstairs that night and searched the whole inside, but there was no sign of forced entry to the apartment. Nevertheless, the running sounds from upstairs didn't seem to stop and bothered my aunt and uncle. And my aunt, who felt something strange, ended up calling a shaman. When the shaman arrived at the apartment, she took a look around inside and calmly told her like this, You must leave here. Move out to another place. What are you talking about? Being dumbfounded, she asked back as soon as she heard it. However, after hearing the shaman's next words, she changed her mind, and they eventually ended up leaving the apartment. So this is what the shaman actually said. This is the sound of ghosts wandering around. But the problem is, it's not from the upstairs. This sound is from your ceiling, and it's walking around, hanging upside down. The Amusement Park One day, one of the employees was preparing to close the ride in the amusement park. Then he saw two people coming in. I guess you guys are the last. The staff led them to their seats, and the two, who appeared to be a couple, sat in a friendly atmosphere and said, Oh, we are celebrating our 100th day anniversary. Congratulations! What kind of anniversary is it? Date? Operating the ride, he also said pleasingly, and at that moment when he turned around, the woman said to him, No, the anniversary of our death. He immediately got goosebumps and blankly looked back at the place where the ride left. What kind of prank is that? However, to his surprise, there was no one on the ride when it came back. And when he checked the CCTV again, he only saw himself staring into the air, greeting and talking to himself, and operating the ride. So, this incident happened to my mom before she had me over 20 years ago. She worked at a local pub. The pub mainly catered for fishermen, as the town was on the coast of Western Australia. So she knew most of the people who would come in for drinks or food. However, every now and again people from town would come in. She told me that this one guy who came in she knew from house parties around the place and always wanted to talk to her while she was working and would say sorry and keep doing her thing. One night she finished work around midnight and walked home which is only a few kilometers away. She lived with a few housemates who all were guys. When she got home from her shift she decided to have a shower. Making her way back to her room she realized that her door was open which is normally shut. All the fellas were asleep so she blew it off as the wind or something. She laid down in bed to go to sleep, but something didn't feel right, and for reasons that she can't explain to me, she felt the need to look under the bed. What she saw under the bed was the guy from the bar, he had followed her all the way home. She tells me that she just stared at him for ages, and he didn't move, he didn't even breathe, to the point where she thought he was dead. She went out of her room calmly and went to one of the guys' room to tell them that she had a dead man under her bed. They all raced in with baseball bats to find the guy halfway out the window. He managed to escape and run away. The police were called and because they knew who he was, the cops picked him up the next day. 
The thing that bothers me the most is what his intentions were with my mom that night. That asshole got a fine and was never allowed back in town. Too soft in my opinion. For your information, this story is not my personal story, but is one of my friends. Her name is Miranda, and one day she did her typical morning routines right before school, messaging people on Snapchat while walking. Around 20 minutes later, she arrived at her school. However, then she immediately realized that something weird. There was no one outside of the school. At first, she thought that everyone just entered inside, or that she was kind of late, so ended up shrugging off and quickly walked into school. She tried to message her friends, but no one responded at that time. No service? But I have full bars on my phone, though. The inside of the building was quiet when she entered, and she noticed that there was also no one around. She was even more confused and didn't know what to do. She began to walk to her class. As she went past the cafeteria, she saw that there was only one person in there and his head was down. When she was about to pass by and at that moment, she realized that there was blood below the person. She froze in the spot. Just then, her phone buzzed, and it was a Snapchat notification from one of her friends. Hey, there's a shooter in the building, and the person already shot a few people. Obviously, Miranda freaked out at that moment. She started to run out of the building. To tell the truth, Miranda was a very lucky girl. As Miranda ran out of the building, the shooter, who was in the office that was next to the exit, didn't see her because he was stabbing a student at the same time. After the cops entered the building, the massive killer already killed himself. Fortunately, almost everyone was evacuated, but there were a total of seven deaths and over a dozen injured. One of Miranda's friends, who didn't respond to her, was one of the people that were killed. And actually, her friend was the one in the cafeteria that was laying his head down. Miranda eventually went to the police station to watch the security footage, and as she watched the video, it turned out that the man stabbing someone in the office slowly raised the gun and pulled the trigger towards her running to the exit. However, he ended up failing because the gun was out of bullets. Although the school now has more security guards all around the building, along with more police officers and more cameras and metal detectors around all areas, she doesn't go to that school anymore. If he had one more bullet, she would have been a goner. She thanks God every day that she eventually had survived from hell. A married couple went on a trip abroad with their baby. They rented a car there and enjoyed their trip, but the baby suddenly disappeared while they left him in the car for a minute at the shopping center. With pale faces, they desperately asked the embassy or local police to find their baby, but eventually they couldn't find him anywhere. A few days later, another young couple with a baby was going abroad by airplane. The baby was not moving at all as if he were sleeping in his father's arms. The flight attendant was passing by them. Then the airframe shuddered from side to side and she accidentally ended up dropping a magazine over the sleeping baby's head. She immediately apologized to the couple and tried to check the baby's condition. Surprisingly, the baby's head was bent at a right angle. However, his dad hugged the baby again, saying, Never mind, in an anxious manner. Then he kept trying to send her away. She kept trying to see the baby, but he refused to allow it and rather got mad at her. 
feeling strange about this. She reported to the captain, and the couple eventually got caught by the police as soon as they arrived at the airport and was investigated by them. It turned out that the baby was dead, torn from his neck to the belly. Instead of his organs all missing, it contained a large number of drugs, and he was the one who was missing. My parents said that I'm crazy. They put me in a mental hospital, but I don't remember what I did, and I don't think I'm crazy. There were so many different people in the hospital. Someone kept talking to me and said he was the successor of Satan, and someone kept going around the ward from morning to night. He continued to walk from the ward to the corner of the bathroom every day. One day, I met a patient in front of me who couldn't speak at all. He tilted his head at me with a strange hand gesture. I smiled awkwardly as a courtesy. He suddenly glared at me with a fierce look and then cried with a strange noise. I tried to calm him down, but he kept screaming. Then he suddenly lied flat on the floor, flapping his arms and started to squeal like a bird. Then he shook his head back and forth, moving as if a bird were pecking at the feed. When he banged his head on the floor, I could see his mouth and nose were bleeding. His eyes stared blankly at me as if he had no remaining intelligence or memory, as if he didn't know the language at all. He didn't say anything, just blinked his eyes and tilted his head. I got so scared that I got out of there. That night, I woke up with a scream. It was said that a patient jumped from the roof and the hospital became chaos itself. The hospital's building was located on the 12th floor. The rooftop had excrement, which believed to be from the person who jumped. He was naked when he fell to the floor and died instantly. And he was the same person I met that day. It's still a mystery how he escaped and climbed to the rooftop avoiding the staff's surveillance. What I heard later from his family was shocking. He used to have a blackbird in his life. One day, he said he wanted to fly in the sky and tried to use a sort of black magic to change souls between the bird and himself. His family told me he was a normal person and very active. However, he was unable to speak from some point on and was unable to do anything but only eat and defecate like animals. His family cried that bringing the blackbird home was eventually the cause of his death. Later, they tried to let the bird go, but it wouldn't fly away. And it continued to return home again and again. When I was in high school, I had a stalker. Here's the story. I was 16 years old and we had met on Facebook. He went to a school nearby and we decided to meet up for a movie. We had a really great time together and we actually ended up dating. The first time that he came to my parents' house, he had an anchor monitor on for house arrest and he wouldn't tell anyone why. And since he was a minor, we couldn't find out. Now, my parents obviously didn't allow us to hang out so we had to hang out at his house or at around town at the YMCA camp. I was rebellious and naive. Things started to get weird when I noticed his family was pretty odd. One day while we were having sex in his bedroom, I saw his father looking through the blinds. I screamed and called him out for it, and his dad ran off. He told me that his dad was into redheads and he just liked to watch us. I went to leave and his mom was doing crack in the kitchen, so yeah, I decided it was time to break up. This is when it got bad. He actually started crying and he told me that he's in cancer treatment and that's why he needs me. That he doesn't have long to live, blah blah blah. I actually believed him and I told him we could be friends. And this is when the stalking began. He switched schools to my high school but he never went to class. He would just stand outside of my classroom looking inside until it was passing period. 
Whenever I would leave class, he wouldn't address me. He would always just follow about 10 to 15 feet behind me to my next period and just stand outside the classroom again. I was too intimidated to say something to him. He was six foot four and kind of a heavy set guy, so I kind of just let it happen for weeks. It started to progress to where he would follow me home every day. He would get on the same exact bus as me and walk 10 to 15 feet behind me all the way to my house. He would stand outside just staring up at the windows until around the time my parents got home and then he would just leave. I finally had enough and I told him to screw off and leave me alone. I told him that we could no longer be friends or even acquaintances and to just forget about me. However, that only escalated things way further. I started getting about 150 calls a night. Half of them were screaming death threats and in detailed torture methods that he wanted to do to me and the other half were him singing love songs that he wrote on his guitar. Every time I blocked his number, he seemed to just magically get a new one and leave even more messages. I woke up one day to see that overnight, he had left me one of those singing, dancing snowmen on my porch. He had stabbed it in the head and the knife was still sticking out. He covered it in his liquid deodorant that I had previously mentioned liking the smell of and I noticed there was a hole where the little song recording device was. When I pressed the hand, it wasn't the regular Frosty the Snowman that usually played. It was his own voice saying eerily, I'm going to have you forever. I'm never going to let you be. I was absolutely done at this point, and I told my parents, who then contacted the school. They suspended him from school, but he still waited at my bus stop every day, and also walked to my home with me. One day he actually ran at me like he was going to tackle me or something. When I tensed up for the impact, he stopped and hugged me. It wasn't a regular hug though. It was like he was trying to crush me. I was 5 foot 1 and about 90 pounds at the time, and he actually ended up cracking one of my ribs. I cried and he started crying too before then running off. He left me a voicemail where he apologized in song. This one night is the night that I'll never forget, and it's actually the sole reason that we got a restraining order and my dad getting a gun. I woke up one evening for no reason. I was just fully awake. I got up to go to my kitchen and go get a glass of water to relax, and in the reflection of my fridge, I saw movement in my backyard. I couldn't really see well because it was so dark outside and so light inside, so I went to the back sliding glass door to get a better look. When I got a little closer, I was met with the silhouette of a six foot four man standing just outside the door. My stalker Rex was actually in my backyard under my room at three in the morning. He was just staring at me. I yelled and my parents got up, but he was long gone by the time my dad went outside. There happens to be a patio right outside my bedroom window that goes all the way to the ground. So it's very possible that he could have been on top of the patio looking directly into my bedroom window before. We got a restraining order granted shortly after that, and my stalker ex dropped out of school. I haven't seen him since in person, but every six months he makes a new Facebook and he always tries to friend request me. I just block it and report it every time. Scary stuff. Have you ever heard of that myth that if you wake up in the middle of the night for no reason at all, there's likely something looking at you? Well, maybe it's true. I don't know what he's doing now or where he went, and I really don't care to know. Y'all remember that thing, Omegle? I don't know if it's still as popular as it used to be, or if there's just another version of it that people use, but for those that don't know, it's a website that puts you in a completely random, one-to-one -one chat room with people, either just text or with webcams too. When I was in my final year of high school, me and my buddies thought it was like the greatest thing ever after we talked three rando girls into flashing us one night. So as thirsty as it sounds, that's all we did for like a whole summer. Just chilling in one of our friend's mom's basements and just burning through different people all night. It got to the point where I'd go on Omegle sometimes when I got bored at home. Not to talk to girls as such, just to kind of mess around and see who was online. But I don't go anywhere near that site anymore. Not after seeing the most messed up thing of my life on there. Something that reminded me that the internet is still a pretty dark place sometimes. And that sometimes you can just happen across something seriously messed up. Just on accident. So I have my webcam on and 
I'm on a roll of just closing chat after chat. Everyone on that night was either a dude playing with themselves, a lonely weirdo, or someone legit mentally deficient, and I was just about to close that browser window out of sheer boredom when I see something that catches my eye. It's a girl, kneeling in a room lit solely with red lights. My first thought is that I might have gotten lucky, and that I was in for a little bit of a show. But then I saw the plastic sheet underneath her. Now as crazy as it sounds, I had seen something like that before, when this older woman in a mask had a plastic sheet down and was urinating on whatever the stranger in the chat asked them to. Me and the guys had a good laugh at that one, but it was obvious that the idea was to make us laugh at that time or some other strange interest. But what I ran into that night was most definitely not designed to be humorous. I'm still watching it, wondering who this girl is, why she isn't wearing a mask when she's basically completely uncovered. Whatever was about to happen though, she sure seemed nervous about it, like she was visibly shaking and trying her best to hide her face, not that she was doing a good job of it. It seems really dumb in retrospect, like the whole thing was giving off the worst vibes, but my dumb horny brain has me still thinking that this is some kind of weird fetish. And for some reason, when this masked dude appears on screen, that just cemented it for me. Some kind of weird BDSM thing was about to go down and I wasn't mad that I was going to be the rando person to get to watch it. The dude walks up to the girl and puts a black bag over her head. She squirms a little, but other than that I think she's still just nervous. Or maybe she was acting like that as a show for the audience. I mean, heck. Maybe the dude liked her to act like that, who knows, people are weird. The dude then disappears from view before reappearing with a cordless drill. He makes a show of this, having a finger on the tip of the drill like a magician would all, this is a real blade type thing, and then walks around the back of the girl and grabs her by the head. Only then do I start to realize that this isn't quite what I thought it was and that maybe just maybe... I should close the freaking chat before I see something I end up regretting. But there was something about the whole scene, something about the way the guy was acting and how the girl didn't try to run away. It seemed like a setup, like it was designed to freak someone out. Even the red lights were sus, like I remember reading about how old Italian horror movies would tactically use red lights on set to disguise how terrible their fake blood looked. Something about it meant I couldn't look away. So. I was watching as this hulking, bare-chested dude grabs the girl by the head. She's tiny too and the size difference means his hand is basically wrapped around her entire skull. He then fires the drill up twice to ensure it's working properly and that's when the girl really starts to panic. It was also coincidentally the moment I started to panic too. Either this girl was doing a very good physical acting job or her fear was real. And if her fear was real, it meant the whole thing was real too. She starts flailing and struggling so hard that the monster holding her had to like lock a knee into the small of her back to keep her still. The way they fell, you could basically only see her head and her legs kicking behind them both. Like I said, I was almost certain the whole thing was fake, but the part that made me really doubt that was when what happened to the girl's legs when the guy started to push the whirring, spinning drill into the back of her head. First of all, there was the noise. It was absolutely stomach-churning, the sound of what could easily have been metal on bone just grinding against each other. But that could be faked, right? And there was this horrible mix of screaming and the drill's motor whirring, and the girl like grunting as the pain started to hit. But again, could all be acting at the end of the day. What I'm almost certain you can't fake is the way this girl's legs started to spasm when the guy pinning her down started to really push that drill into her brain. They moved in a way that I don't think I've ever seen before, almost like people act in cartoons when they're being electrocuted. I got this sick feeling in my stomach and I immediately closed the chat window before I saw anything else. The whole thing left me really shaken up. Everyone I've explained what I saw to says they think it was faked too. But then again, 
I'm almost certain that's because I feed them so much info on how it could have been fake and not really on all the reasons why I think it could have been real. I think I actually just want people to tell me that. Tell me, stop freaking out. You fell for some elaborate prank that'll end up on the internet elsewhere. Because the alternative is just way too messed up for me to quantify. And a part of me still does think that I actually did watch a live snuff film that afternoon. I want to tell you guys that I later heard the cops found a body with a drill hole in the back of the head or even that I read somewhere that it was just a prank or even like a weird kind of viral marketing campaign or something. But the truth of the matter is, I just don't know. I never heard anyone else talk about the kind of thing I saw on Omegle that day, and I didn't ever go on that site again, so I didn't give myself a chance to catch a repeat performance, so to speak. I just try and tell myself that what I saw wasn't real, and that it was just an elaborate show to scare random internet strangers. That's what keeps the darker thoughts at bay when I'm reminded of it, and that's what helps me get to sleep at night. When this encounter happened, I was only 10 years old, and my older sister was 12. Our father passed away when we were very young, and to this day, our mother never remarried. During our childhood, our mother would go out on dates with men that she had met, but they never would amount to anything more. One Friday night, she went out and left us at home. She would always leave right after we went to sleep. The door stayed locked, but this time I guess it just slipped her mind on the way out. Anyways, the living room connected to the hall that the bedrooms were on. My room was the second bedroom down the hall, with my sister's being the third. In the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of the door opening. I figured it was my mom coming in from her date, so I rolled back over and tried to go back to sleep. A few minutes later, I hear the door shut again, and a few seconds after that, my sister comes into my room terrified. She told me that when she woke up, she saw a man standing in the doorway, staring at her. He was wearing a long black trench coat. He never said anything, and when he realized that she was staring back at him, he turned and walked out. I grabbed my baseball bat from my closet and crept out into the living room. The door was wide open. By this time, my sister had called my mom, and she had called the police. When the police arrived, they searched for fingerprints but found nothing. The scariest thing was that nothing was taken from the house. He came in, but didn't take anything. We stayed with our grandmother that night, and the following night. The next day, the police returned to look for more evidence. My mother did notice that one of our chairs was missing from the back patio. It was found in the woods behind our house, on the top of a little hill. This man had taken our chair, sat up there, and watched us. How long had he been doing that? Apparently, there had been two other similar break-ins in the neighborhood. He would come in and not take anything, and all the people were single mothers. What would have happened to my mom if she had been home that night? A few weeks later, this hermit guy that lived down the road was found dead from an overdose. I don't know why, but my mom seemed to think that he was the one that was watching us. But there hasn't been any break-ins in the neighborhood since. The Mystery of the Burglar When I was seven years old, living in the big city, a burglar once broke into our house. My mom had trouble sleeping at that time while I was sleeping deeply, and he invaded in the meantime. Thinking that he might be a petty thief who just steals little things, mom pretended to sleep, praying just go away. However, we found something really terrified the next day when we woke up. 
he drank the entire water from the fish bowl which contained the goldfish that we were raising at the time. Of course he swallowed my goldfish too. We felt uncomfortable since that day and we ended up stopping raising fish. The Unknown Voice This happened when I was very young. Almost every parent didn't buy a cell phone for their children at that time. And because of that, we used to yell outside calling our friends names. I had one friend who had an exceptionally loud voice in our town. Let me call him A. Anyway, his voice was so loud that almost everyone in the neighborhood knew him. He used to call his friends B, C, and D's names every day around 2 p.m. and asked them to come out and play. But one day, the children's moms visited A's mom angrily. Why does he come out late at night and keep calling our children's names recently? They are whining every night that they want to go out. Then A's mom replied with a puzzled look. What? My kid never did that. I've never sent him out since when he gets back at home in the afternoon. The arguments between their moms got worse, and the whole village ended up knowing what's going on, and they eventually all took A's mom's side. If A had screamed at night with such a loud voice, everyone in the neighborhood would have heard it, but no one ever listened except his friends and their family. However, they have been suffering from hearing A's voice every night since then, and eventually B and our house, who was one of A's friend's houses, also moved out. I've been forgotten about this for a while and suddenly remembered a few days ago, so I talked to my mom. Wasn't we all possessed at that time? I told a joke, laughing, and she answered, No, it was a person. It turned out that a man who heard A shouting his friend's names during the day had recorded the voice at his house, and he intentionally played it every night near the windows of B, C, and D's houses. Since most of the neighborhood lived in a residential area, others could not hear it at all, and only the children and their families could hear it. In other words, the criminal already knew where each of the children was living. No one knows whether he tried to do something bad when he called the children out at night with a recorded voice or just wanted to torment the family. However, B's family eventually caught the back of a man fleeing with a recorder. And then they told the rest of the parents about what had happened. The B's family ended up moving out first for that reason and being scared. My family followed them immediately after that. Now that I think about it, I feel like it's so creepy. For whatever reason, he was definitely one of our neighborhoods. In December 1999, she suddenly appeared in my house. In the evening, my dad called me downstairs, but when I was about to go down, he was standing at the end of the stairs and reached out his hand to stop me. His eyes looked something nervous, and I felt that something was wrong. You have to keep in mind what I'm saying now, my dad said. You're going to see someone in our house. Just focus on me. Don't be as conscious of her as you can. I almost burst into laughter. I was 12 years old and I took the situation as a joke from him. However, he continued talking before I could answer. She's going to whisper something and she's going to do everything to follow you or get your attention. It's going to be really hard to ignore, but son, you must never mix words with her for any reason. If you pretend she doesn't exist, she'll leave here. Will you do that? Countless questions passed through my head, but I answered my dad, Okay, since I was scared at the time. Okay, it's time for dinner. Let's go downstairs. What I told you about her made her stronger, but this is the only way I have. I just wanted to avoid you running into her by accident. Trust me. Now, focus. I followed him downstairs slowly, 
focusing only on him, heading to the kitchen, as he said. The downstairs had a cool atmosphere, as if the temperature had dropped sharply and smelled sour. A raccoon once died in the wall of my house, and it smelled so bad that it kept going inside for a while. My dad and I sat at the table at the same time. My sister was sitting across from me, looking down at the empty plate in front of her, and my mom was taking food out of the oven, and I could see the signs of crying around her eyes. Well, I tried to concentrate on my family, but then I noticed something gray-skinned with black hair standing at the corner of the room. The atmosphere of the kitchen was subdued, and there was no laughter or warmth that could be seen in our kitchen as usual. My sister grabbed my knee under the table and whispered, Do you see her too? I nodded quietly. Be quiet, my dad said threateningly. Then the woman approached with a soggy sound of footsteps, and I could smell a terrible stench from her. She walked slowly toward the table and stopped right behind my sister. Then she stood close to my sister and put her dried, skinny hand on her shoulders. My sister crouched down and looked at me, and I lowered my head hurriedly. Mom forced herself to act as if everything was okay as she prepared dinner. Under the table, I could see my dad was holding her hand tightly so that she wouldn't go crazy. My sister had to keep those unpleasant skinny hands on her shoulders all evening, and only an incomprehensible whisper from the woman's mouth filled the kitchen. We lived like that for months, trying our best to pretend nothing happened. During this hellish time, my parents didn't invite any guests to our house and didn't allow us to go to our friend's house. When we were talking about her, we could whisper to each other as long as she wasn't too close. My dad asked me to not tell anyone about her, and that was how to isolate this woman. We made a conclusion that she seems invisible to others until they know about her existence. A few years later, I found out that my dad was the one who brought her in. In the 70s, my aunt ran into her for some reason, and since then she seems to have followed my aunt and lived together. And in 1999, this time, my dad couldn't get rid of his thoughts about her for some reason. Then she followed him. We tried to remain not telling about her, and this was the most difficult thing in our lives. She was with us when we left home, or were in the car. We couldn't act separately. It was the hardest time for my mom, who had to be home alone after we went to school and my dad went to work. One snowy night in February, we had dinner and my mom went up to bed a little early, and the woman was sitting on my parents' bed. Unfortunately, my mom couldn't take it any longer. I heard my mom screaming in the bedroom, Please, leave my family alone! Dad's face turned deadly pale with fear and jumped up to stop her. And that was the last time I saw her. The woman was still there, but mom disappeared forever. And the pool of blood on the white carpet was all that was left. For weeks, the woman whispered to me, I'll let you see your mother again. So just ask me what to do. However, I never did that. The reason I'm telling you about this story is because I want you to think about her. For the first time in 18 years, I saw her again this morning. I don't want to lose my wife or put my children in the same danger. I want you to imagine she's in your house. Then she'll leave me alone, maybe. Now you're already involved, and someday she will visit your house. You should never be conscious of her. It's the only way for you. I am really sorry for you. I don't have any friends. Not only boyfriends. 
but also the girls, too. I'm tired of putting my energy into hanging out with others. Maybe lack of socializing. So that's why I like to see movies. It's because I can just look at the screen. I go to the movie theater every weekend. Sometimes I go to a big theater, like Multiplex, but I also go to a small theater for independent films. I can say that it is a happiness to sit in a quiet seat with a few people. One weekend, I went to the movie theater as usual. I was waiting for the ticket and a man wearing sunglasses talked to me. He was a man and a stranger, so I stepped back, expressing caution. But he said with a bright face, Excuse me, I'm the director who shot this movie. Could you tell me how you feel after watching it? What? Oh, uh, okay, sure. It was so sudden, so I was in a panic at first because I don't usually talk to a man, and he is a director? No way! I was fascinated by his smile, and I could feel my face turning red. The movie I watched that day was kind of a B-horror movie. The story is about a woman who is the main character being kidnapped by a man and imprisoned in a secret room without any windows. To tell the truth, the movie was not that good. I don't like the hard gore scene. However, I kept thinking about what to say to the man reminding his smile. I stood up after the movie. When I came out, the man was looking this way with a smooth smile. After much thinking, I tried to say a word to talk about it, and he talked to me first. You know, there's my office around here. Could you tell me about the reviews and do a survey for me for my next work? I'm worried about it in many ways since this is my debut film. Of course, it wouldn't take long and I'd like to give a reward to you for helping me. He happily talked about the behind stories when he made the movie. We started to have a conversation while he guided me to the building, a little away from the movie theater. As the elevator was going up to the 20th floor, he asked me shyly, How was my movie anyway? I was embarrassed to hear the answer because... There were so many people there, but no one here, so you can tell me honestly. I replied, it's a simple horror story, but I liked it because it was rather straightforward. Well, the story is about a woman eventually dying in a secret room. I'm just curious about your intentions. Uh, what exact message did you want to deliver? The elevator door opened just in time, and the man didn't answer. He took me to the door with a soft smile. The name of the production company was printed on the door. He opened the door and led me into the office. The office was completely dark, and the room was covered with curtains even though it was the middle of the daytime. When I turned around, he was leaning against the door with his body and talking on the phone. Oh, I'm sorry. I got a call regarding my work. Please wait for a moment. He spoke to me in a whisper. I looked around the room again. There is no furniture in the office, just a desk and a few chairs. Strangely, I couldn't even see the kitchen or bathroom. It was just one studio. Come to think of it, it was strangely familiar, although it was my first time visiting there. I thought I'd open the window, so I approached the window. However, when I pulled the curtain, there was a wall behind it. I turned around and looked at the man. With a friendly smile he showed at first, he went to the front door and closed the door quietly. I dropped the bag in my hand. I could see there was no handle inside the front door. That was when I remembered. Now I knew why this room looked familiar. Last summer, there was a suicide by jumping from the apartment where I was living. Our apartment was a hallway-style place, and it turned out that the person deceased jumped from the hallway to a flower bed in broad daylight. A few hours after the incident, I was on my way to the security office for a moment. I saw an old lady was standing on the sidewalk, and she was looking at the pool of blood that was still remained in the flower bed. Why is she looking at that? Does she relate to the dead? Or is she sad? 
Thinking like this, I was about to pass by her, but she suddenly walked over to me. Then she pointed her finger at the pool of blood and said, You know, this is a secret. I pushed her. I suddenly got goosebumps. So I ran to the security office without even thinking of answering back her words. And when I came out, the old lady, who was still standing there, grabbed me and talked to me again as if she was waiting for me until I came out. She said it like this. Don't tell anyone. It's our secret. The look on her face was so scary and terrifying that I just nodded, saying yes, and then ran towards home quickly. Was that true? Nobody knows. My hometown is located in the countryside. I was staying at my parents' house for a while after I went to the army. One day I was drinking in front of a local convenience store with my friend. Feeling liberated after I just got out of the army, I went around the streets with one of my friends drinking a lot and singing with our shoulders crossed. Then I saw a white car coming in front of us. Soon the car window opened and a woman in her early 30s wearing white clothes was seen. Hey, would you like to do a part-time job? She laughed and said like that. And we answered, totally drunk. How much you gonna give us? Then she gave us $100 and said, Prepaid, I'll give you an extra $100 when you finish this. It was my one-month part-time salary. Of course we accepted it on the spot, and the woman picked us up in her car. The car began to run along a nearby mountain road. There was the sound of rain and the wind blowing so hard that I could hear the leaves hitting the windows. And I still hate the sound of leaves on windy and rainy days. The car driving along the cement road pavement stood on a hillside. Suddenly she got out of the car and took a shovel and hoe out of the trunk. Come on guys, both of you, get off and I could see her pupils were kind of loosened a little bit. Only then did I start to think something was wrong. Next, she took a small box out of the car and told us to go down to the road and bury it. I'll give you another hundred dollars, y'all know. I and my friend were forced to go down the road to bury the box and dig with a shovel. But as soon as we tried to bury it, the car suddenly went down really fast like an arrow. We haven't even received that hundred dollars yet, though. The rain and wind were still blowing hard and lightning was pounding, and we had no choice but to stand blankly in this sudden situation. But we got a prepayment anyway. Well, let's quickly bury that stupid box and go down, I said to him, but he who was staring blankly at the place where the woman disappeared for a while mumbled, Hey, what do you think what's in this box? He became curious as soon as she left but I just wanted to go home quickly. I objected. However, he kept urging me to open it. Then he literally opened the box immediately. There was a black plastic bag in the box and there were cut fingers inside. 10 fingers, given that the size of the fingers is small, I thought those were baby's fingers. Being terrified, I was just looking at those fingers, and he shouted, Hey, this is a gold ring! There was a ring in one finger, and he insisted on taking it away since we received less money. I was madly opposed, but my friend eventually pulled out the ring after an argument, and we buried the box in the ground and walked down. After that day, I had a bad cold and laid down for days. And my friend had not contacted me either in the meantime, which was really strange. I haven't heard from him in the last 15 days after I woke up. Being curious, I called his house. Then his mother answered the phone. Oh, God, what should I do? My son died yesterday. A few days ago, he was exposed to rain and came home. From that day... He kept saying that he's cold and found dead alone in the blanket a few days after. I still regret when I think about that day. I should have stopped him and reported the box to the police. I will never forget it. I'm 
I'm 22 years old, and this incident happened to me a year and a half ago. I just moved into my first apartment and was still in the process of moving in. The door that leads into my apartment locks itself automatically when closed, so I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my boyfriend. I returned to my apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail and still on the phone. I accidentally dropped the phone on the floor. It landed under the bed, so I had to lie on the floor and stretch out for it. I saw something that caught my eye. There was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head in his chest, so I couldn't see his face, and he didn't see me. Trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone and said, Sorry I dropped my phone, I'm just going to take a shower, and I'll call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed, so I hastily walked in and quietly locked the door turned my shower on, and jumped out my window. My apartment is on the first floor. I called the police and they told me to wait nearby, but to go across the street and see if anyone comes out of the door. This was during the summer, and it was still light out. I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car while watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my boyfriend, and he came just before the police. I gave them the keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin, tired looking man. His eyes looked absolutely crazy, but he didn't even try to get away. The policeman that stood beside me and comforted me while the other cops searched through my house told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under my bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. It happened when I was in college. One of my friends rented an apartment although the apartment was very small and old and the facilities were not good enough he set his furniture and started to unpack his stuff since then he kept feeling something strange for any reason however he was tired from moving in and he had a class the next day so he decided to go to sleep when he was about to lie down on the bed he heard a knocking sound on the door did someone come he approached the front door, but there was no one outside. Thinking it was someone's prank, he went back to sleep. But then he heard a sound again. Knock, knock. Being annoyed, he decided to wake up and waited next to the front door to see who was knocking on his door. And no doubt he heard a knock again. However, he realized that the source of the sound was strange. This time, the sound was heard from the wall next to the bedroom. Next to the bedroom is the kitchen. What's in the kitchen? He went to the kitchen and looked around, but nothing was found. He got mad, so he ended up waiting in the kitchen until the sound to come out again. And this time, the sound came from his bedroom. Scared by the strange phenomenon, he went out of the apartment and looked inside the house. The lights in all the rooms were on except for one window, and there was a window in the space that he thought was just a wall. The window was between the kitchen and the bedroom. He was curious, so went back into the apartment and began to find a way to get into it. He knocked on the wall of the bedroom to find where the door was, but he couldn't find any strange parts, and it was just the same of the kitchen. Finally, the last place he looked for was the stairs. He slowly walked up the stairs, knocking on each wall. Soon, a clear sound was heard. Out of curiosity, he ripped the wallpaper off that part and looked inside, but the inside was blocked with a window. 
It was so dark that he could not see anything inside. In addition, he eventually felt strange, so he ended up sleeping in his girlfriend's house that day. Then the next morning, he went back to the room with his girlfriend. When he lit the inside with a flashlight, he could see the completely worn, rusty bed, a broken toilet, and sink. As soon as he saw the window, there was a white bone in old clothes. The two ran out screaming in fear and reported to the police. They arrived soon after and ripped off all the secret room, and one body was found inside that was rotten and left only a bone. Later, it turned out that the body was a man who went missing around the time this apartment was built. He was rumored to have raped the constructionist's daughter, and the owner always would say that he's going to get revenge for her. The police investigated the owner after that man's missing. However, since there was no evidence, he was soon released and then died shortly after. The police reported that the man had scratched the wall so that his fingernails were all broken and the wall was covered with blood. But I still have one question that cannot be solved. So, who made that knocking sound in his apartment? I was 13 when this happened. My parents left on a business trip to LA, so I had to stay home. My dad gave me his card so that I could order whatever I needed, so I kinda enjoyed being alone. And I wasn't scared because I've been home alone so many times, and besides, it was only for three days. Well, this was around the time the clowns were breaking into houses and doing some weird stuff. But they never came to my area since they usually hit more quiet places, especially the area near a forest. Although we had a fence that could easily allow someone to climb over, we didn't really think much about it because the area where we lived in was very safe. Anyway, it was around 6pm and this was in the winter so it got dark pretty fast. We had a glass room at the back of the house, also known as a conservatory, and it leads straight to the garden. The room was right next to the kitchen. I got a little hungry, so I went to the fridge, took out some snacks, and went back to the living room to continue watching TV. There was a roof on the glass room that intensified any sound that landed on top of it, even the gentlest drop of water. That day, it was raining heavily, so it was too noisy to hear anything except the rainfalls pounding on the roof. About a few minutes later, I was quite sleepy, so I decided to go up to my room and lay down. I was about to grab my phone and check my social media, but then I heard something drop really hard on something downstairs. It really creeped me out. I got really scared but decided to go downstairs to check, thinking that it would be nothing. So I came out of my room, went halfway down the staircase, and looked down the hallway. The whole area was dark, but I knew that someone was standing there. I saw the back of a silhouette. I quickly went to my room trying not to make any noise. Then I heard someone walking around the living room. I immediately called the police and whispered to the operator that I needed help ASAP. <coughs> but all of a sudden, I had a sneezing fit. <coughs> I was so panicked at that moment, so I instantly ran to the bathroom since it was the only room with a lock. As I was reaching the bathroom, he sprinted up the stairs so fast. I locked the door and tried not to cry. The man tried to open the door. He kept turning the doorknob. The bathroom had a small blurry window, but I was able to see outside. So, just then, I got a glimpse of what was at the door. It was a clown, with green hair and without a nose. He was wearing a very weird outfit and was holding a gigantic knife. I had no other choice, so I quickly hopped inside the bath, opened the big window, and jumped out. 
I slid off the big groove and fell on the concrete. I couldn't even feel my injury because I was so scared. As I was about to hop on the fence, I heard the cops. They entered our house, and after that, they arrested and cuffed him. When he walked past me, I was so scared and my body was shivering. But I was glad that it was over. The police contacted my parents, so they came back home in a hurry. I would see them again, and I knew that I was safe now. From then on, I never stayed at home alone, and that clown guy was in prison for several years for scaring kids and for possible murder. This happened when I was 17 years old. I was a senior in high school. It was the middle of the week and my friends and I were chatting online about wanting to do something new and fun over the weekend. We usually just went to the movies, went to the mall or got dinner. And I thought we should try something different. The next day, I was in the computer lab for one of my classes and I had some time to kill because I finished my assignment early. Keep in mind, Snapchat and Instagram were just starting up and didn't have the same kind of popularity as it has today. So the only thing we really had at the time was Facebook. However, my school was strict and blocked Facebook, so the only thing I could really do was read articles on news websites. While searching and scrolling through the internet, an article showed up. It was about an interview with a man who was discussing the truth of paranormal activity around the area I grew up in. Intrigued, I read the article and looked up the places the guy was talking about. And sure enough, I found a bunch of things. One place in particular caught my eye. It was a place about 20 minutes away from where I lived. It was known to have multiple paranormal occurrences happen on the exact same road. As soon as class ended, I texted my friends about what I found, and we all agreed on going and seeing what this road was all about Friday night. Friday night finally arrived. It was me and four of my friends. Right before we entered the location, I parked my car and had my friend drive because we believed that if a guy drove, not much would happen. So she drove my car while I was sitting in the passenger seat. While switching seats, my other friends put baby powder on the top of my car because one of my other friends read that it helps people see when ghosts touch or brush your car. It started to drizzle a bit, which bummed us out because the baby powder would be washed away. As we were driving my car, we turned off the radio to make it more suspenseful. All of a sudden, we heard someone from a distance scream bloody murder. At that moment, I heard the sound of a car door trying to be opened as if someone was aggressively trying to get into my car. After that, we saw a police car driving so fast with the sirens on as if they were chasing someone on a major highway. The problem with that was the road was paper thin and had tons of sharp turns, so you couldn't go that fast without crashing into another car. Plus, the car didn't have any of the county police or trooper tags from the area I lived in. I knew that because my dad was a cop and I saw all kinds of different cop tags in my lifetime. I was freaked out that those two things just occurred. We were all freaked out and drove to the nearest parking lot so that we could calm down. As we got out of the car, one of my friends started to freak out even more. The baby powder on the roof of my car was smeared and it was all over my passenger seat side door. What was even more creepy was the fact that there were finger marks all over the door. Now, this wouldn't normally creep me out, but we were driving the entire time, and we all made sure not to touch the doors when entering the car. The strangest part was that the finger marks had no fingerprints, but were clearly shaped like a hand. It was as if someone was trying to reach for the door handle. Not only that, but we also noticed that there were fingernail claw marks on my door handle. This freaked me out because earlier I heard someone violently trying to open my door. In the next few days, we told everyone both online and in person about that night and how it freaked us all out. Then someone sent me a link to an article about the street we drove on and all the activity that occurred on it. 
but it wasn't the one I originally read. It was a different one. As I was reading the website, I started to notice that all the things mentioned also happened to me the same exact way that night. But what freaks me out the most to this day is thinking about what would have happened if I didn't have my door locked. Would the door have opened up? <laughs> A few days ago, I went to a Macy's store with my mother and son to go check out some jewelry. While my mom was checking out jewelry, I noticed an old man around his 50s come near us. He was about 8 feet from us. At first, I thought he was just a random customer checking something out for his lady or something. Then, from the corner of my eye, I noticed he was just standing there without moving and looking at us. It made me feel uncomfortable, so I turned around moving the stroller, which my toddler was in, because I didn't want him looking at my baby. I turned my eyes to look at him again, and I could see that he was just staring at me with a creepy look. He was staring at me and my baby, then all of a sudden, he grinned widely at us. The weirdest thing about him was that he was wearing women's shoes and a scarf, and also holding a dress in his hand. He opened his mouth and tried to say something. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but I could read his lips. I like you. I like your baby. I just thought the man was a weirdo. And then my mom also noticed that he was odd and creepy. He saw that my mom was glaring at him, so he walked away. But then he appeared on the opposite side of us and started staring at me again. This time he pulled his phone out and made it seem like he was about to take a picture. He was staring at us and his eyes opened widely. He was smiling like a crazy psychopath. That was enough. I wanted to go up to him and tell him to get away from us, but I had my boy with me and didn't want anything to happen, so I chose to just get out of there. I told a lady who was working there what happened. She said that she would go take a look at him. A few minutes later, she came back and told us that he was a customer who has been reported before by other people. My mom asked, Why hasn't he been kicked out then? The lady said, well, because he hasn't threatened or hurt anyone, so the store doesn't have a good enough reason to kick him out. My mom and I were pissed off, because obviously the man is just there to harass people. The lady then told us that he said something creepy to her and also made her uncomfortable. She told us that when she went to go ask him what he was up to, he told her that he went to the store to return a dress. He decided that he didn't like that he bought it for his lady. He told her with a smile, Yeah, I need to change quickly because she's cold now. My mom and I instantly felt so creeped out so we just left. What did that mean? Could he have been hiding a dead body back at his place? A few days later, and I feel relieved that the crazy guy didn't harm us. But I'm still wondering what he meant by, she's cold now. This story happened in the summer of 2017 when I was 10 years old. My older brother and I had a babysitter, and she was around the age of 17. Since my mom was home on Tuesdays, the babysitter would come on the other weekdays. Most days when she babysat, we would go to the neighborhood pool, hang out, and eat lunch there. Then we went back home and my mom would arrive a bit later at around 5.30 in the evening. On one Thursday, the day was just an ordinary one and the babysitter came around 8 in the morning. A few hours later, we decided to head to the pool and eat lunch. We all got ready and headed out the door. As I used to be a little paranoid back then, 
Every time I went outside, I made sure I locked the door and would immediately turn the doorknob and try to open it to make sure it was locked. The door was definitely locked, so we walked to the pool and swam for a while. Then we ate lunch and decided to head back to the house. When we got home, I pulled out the key from my bag, but I noticed that the door was a crack open. I pushed it and the door swung open. A little chill ran down my spine as I remembered that I made sure the door was locked before leaving. My babysitter had a frightened look on her face too. But my stupid brother thought nothing of it and just walked right in, so we followed him. About my house, when you walk into the house, to the right is an entryway to the living room and straight ahead is a hallway to the kitchen. The stairs are to the right of the hallway, and you can see the upstairs railing from the entrance. We walked into the kitchen and set our stuff down, and I went to go lock the door. After I shut it, I turned back around to go back to the kitchen, but something caught my attention at the corner of my eye. Looking up at the railing, I could see the silhouette of someone crouched behind a tall, narrow floor fan. I looked a little closer, and I could see their eyes. They were wide open and were staring directly at me. I was frozen in fear and couldn't move. All I could do was stare back at them, not knowing if it was a man or woman. My babysitter called for me to come to the kitchen, and the figure slowly walked into a nearby room and disappeared. I ran into the kitchen, telling my babysitter and brother what I saw. At first, they didn't believe me, but then, all of a sudden, we were all silent as we heard slow footsteps creaking from upstairs. She quietly grabbed both her phone and a kitchen knife and ushered us to the back door. She slowly turned the doorknob and tried to not make any noise while opening the door. We made it to the backyard, and she was going to call 911 on her phone. But before she could, we heard a tapping sound coming from one of the windows on the second floor. So we all looked up, and then we saw him. He was a man, late fifties, short black hair, eyes still wide open, staring at us. He was pushing the blinds out of the way, so we saw his face very clearly. We screamed and started running to the gate on the side of the backyard. The babysitter dropped her phone while scared, so I picked it up and ran behind her. I dialed 911, told them our address, and explained to the operator what just happened. She said they would be there in a few minutes, told us to go to a nearby neighbor's house and stay there until the cops arrive. We rang a doorbell a few times, and one of our neighbors, who was retired, came outside. He let us in, and we explained what happened as we were looking out of the window. Then we saw three cop cars pulling up, and the cops were surrounding my home. Three cops headed in through the front door and investigated our house. We went outside to tell them that we were okay and the other police officer started questioning us. Soon the cops came back after finding nothing and doing a thorough investigation. They told us it would be best to not stay home, as the person may come back. So the babysitter said we could go to her house, which is about a mile away. Just then, we heard our neighbors screaming from down the street. A few houses down, a policeman's car was set on fire and was smoking a lot. The cops spotted a man running past the corner down towards the end of the street. One officer took us to the babysitter's house while the other three went after that man. We later found out that the man had gotten away, so he never got arrested. Our parents arrived home as they were contacted by the police and freaked out. Later that night, we came back to the house and we searched the whole place to see if anything was missing. A cash box that was stored in my parents' bedroom was missing. 
but we didn't report it since the man was never found. I have no idea who that was or how he opened our front door. I still wonder to this day what would have happened if I never noticed the man. He could have done something to us while we were sleeping. I still feel uneasy sometimes when I'm home alone. It all started one summer afternoon in August. My best friend Mike invited me to his house. Mike was the type of kid you'd call a nerd. He always got good grades, wore glasses, had freckles, and believed in things like dragons and magic. One of Mike's favorite things to do was performing magic for me. Every time I'd come over, he'd perform magic. But this magic trick, though, would be the one that I'd never forget. When I got to Mike's house, he said, I have a new magic trick to show you, and it's the best one. He grabbed my hand and we went into the living room where he had a large box in front of his family photo. It was all four of his family members in that picture, Mike, Josh, and his mom and dad. The box was about his size so he could fit in it, and his older brother Josh was standing next to it. So I sat down on a couch and Mike started introducing the name of his magic trick. It was called The Vanishing. Josh opened the door to the large box where nothing was inside, and Mike walked in. After Josh closed the door again, he then said some weird words and then yelled, Poof! Josh slowly opened the box, and Mike was no longer in it. However, I was in the seventh grade, so I was smart enough to know that under the box was a trap door so he could climb down out of it. So I looked down at the bottom of the box, but to my surprise, nothing was there. No door, no secret, no Mike. Just at that moment, my mom called and said that I need to come home right now. I said bye to Josh, grabbed my backpack and yelled, Nice trick, Mike. Gotta go. Everything was fine, just until the next day. The next day, Mike didn't invite me, but I thought of going to his house again. I ran up to his house, stood in front of the door, and rang the doorbell three times. His dad came out and said, Oh, hello. Nice to meet you. He acted like, like that he'd never seen me before. It was weird, but I asked, Good afternoon, sir. Is Mike home? Then I could see his confused face, and he answered, Mike? Who is Mike? I felt stupid at that moment, as if I had come to the wrong house. I then quickly asked, your son, Mike, you have two sons. During explaining the situation, I felt irritated, so I pushed him to the side to get into the living room. Josh, I said, pointing to the photo, and M And then my eyes widened. Mike wasn't in the photo. I was pointing to nothing, which would have been where Mike should be standing in that picture. I panicked, and I couldn't believe what was going on here. I then said, you're your son, Mike. He has good grades and he's good at magic. Oh, the box. I thought that everyone was playing a prank with me or something, but he looked extremely confused and even terrified. He looked at me as if I was some kind of lunatic. So I ran upstairs to check the box and I opened the door thinking that I must be dreaming. The room was full of bookshelves and beanbags all in a circle. It was just a cozy reading room. I was horrified. I kept saying, no, it, it can't be, over and over. That moment, Josh came in the room. I thought, this is the last chance. I quickly took out my phone thinking that I could remind Mike to them by showing selfies that I took with Mike before. However, just when I did, he was in none of the pictures. The one where I gave him a hug where we went to the other friend's birthday party and took a picture with the clown, nothing was there. It was like he never even existed before, and I felt that moment was like a nightmare. To this day, there is literally no one who remembers Mike in my town. I still can't believe what happened to Mike, but I definitely believe that Mike is real, and he must be somewhere.
My name is Kyla. This story is about a piano that was in my elementary school. When I was a kid, my friends and I used to record random videos in my school's basement. Most of the time, the basement's lights were off because hardly anyone went there. And the reason was that that place was scary and sometimes smelled really bad. The basement was completely dark. We slowly walked in the basement with our phone lights on. I was nervous, but my friends were already walking ahead of me, so I just followed them. We were a group of five, so I felt like I shouldn't be scared since I was with them. My friend Michael was in the front since he was the bravest and also the one recording on his phone. I was in the very back and holding onto my friend Kate's shirt. There was a room just beside the basement's wall, and inside of it was a grand piano. Nothing else, only the piano. We went inside that room first. We were all quiet, and you could only hear our heavy breathing as we walked through the basement. But we didn't hear anything. And then, out of nowhere, Michael said, Boring. It took us around three minutes to reach the end of the basement. Michael put his phone back in his pocket, and we all started walking back in the long basement. We finally returned to the main gate of our school and sat on a bench. Everyone was focused on Michael as he pulled out his phone and started playing the recording. It was quiet at first. And then, all that could be heard were our whispers as we tried to figure out whether or not we should continue with the recording. And then, all of our eyes widened when we heard a sound coming from what seemed like just beside the basement. We couldn't believe what we just heard, so we paused the video, rewinded it, and played it again. The sound came from the grand piano. It was playing a creepy song, and at that moment, Michael almost dropped his phone. We were all shocked and scared. We didn't say anything for a while. I'm 100% positive that we didn't hear that piano playing as we walked through the basement. It was definitely quiet. And the scariest thing was that the piano was still playing when Michael said, Boring. The recording was around three minutes long, and when the recording was done playing, we were all speechless. This was many years ago, but to this day, I still don't have an explanation for what happened. Maybe someone went to that room and played it, but if so, why couldn't we hear it while we were walking through the basement? We also didn't see anyone else down there. And why did we only hear it when we played the recording? I am still confused about that incident. This happened in the middle of last year. At that time, I was at home with my boyfriend Dan watching TV. Dan was deeply concentrated on what the TV screen was showing, so I was about to start making a romantic atmosphere. But then I heard a knock at the door. I got pretty pissed off as it interrupted, but got up anyway and opened the door. We lived with one of our friends, so at the moment, I thought it would be my friend. But to my surprise, it was a man around the same age as me. He looked a little bit tired and was forcing a smile on his face. He was all sweating and his eyes were red as if from crying, but it wasn't my business to ask. Oh, hello. The stranger said with the wide smile, taking his hand out for me to shake. Hi, I said, looking at his hand and back at him. Can I use your bathroom, please? He asked, still having this huge smile plastered on his face. Before I could say anything, though, Dan came behind me and told the guy that, indeed, he could use the bathroom. The man went in there, and Dan and I just went back to the couch and waited for him. Then I heard some sounds, like water pouring in the bathtub. After ten minutes, I slowly started to get curious, as he didn't come out yet. I told Dan that I should check on him, 
but he told me to wait a little bit more. So I just waited, and 20 minutes later, he didn't come out. There was just silence in the bathroom. After 30 minutes, well, Dan decided that he'd check the bathroom. However, having a bad feeling, I went along with him just to be sure that nothing happened to him. Hey, is everything all right? I knocked at the door at the bathroom, but there was no response. I repeated the actions, but this time I knocked louder and yelled. Dan told me to wait a little longer, but I refused. I pressed on the handle of the door, expecting it to be locked, but to my surprise, it wasn't. I couldn't believe what I saw in front of me. To my horror, there was blood splattered on the floor everywhere, and the bathtub was filled up with a red liquid, as well with a lifeless body in it. The smell of blood filled the bathroom, and I wondered how I couldn't smell that outside. I told Dan to call 911 while I went over to the body to check his pulse. But when I got closer to it, I noticed that a razor blade was shoved deep in his neck. He was just dead. After half an hour, the 911 arrived with the cops. They took his body and we had to give our report to the cops. To this day, I became more paranoid about a stranger. Especially, I'm positive that letting a stranger use your bathroom is not safe and just nonsense. So, don't let the stranger come in. Ever. This happened to me last summer. My best friend and I went to Ibiza for a week. Once we checked into our hotel on the first day, we threw our bags in our room and drove our rented car to the nearest supermarket. On our way there, we talked about the hotel, which was located in the very old suburban part of the city. It was really dirty. It just had an overall weird vibe to it. My friend was really bummed out about it, but we agreed that it wasn't going to ruin our excitement for this trip. Later that night, around 3 a.m., after coming back from a club to the area where we stayed, we couldn't find our hotel. We were completely drunk and probably walked around the streets in circles. My friend laughed a lot, stopped, and then pointed at a tall garden fence. Through it, we saw the hotel building. It was right behind the garden, so without putting much thought into it, we tried to climb over the fence. My friend managed to succeed, but I fell and hurt my right leg quite a bit. He helped me up, and we stood in the middle of a bunch of green bushes. What the? My friend murmured all of a sudden. I looked up, and there were a bunch of tombstones. We were standing right between two walls, and at the end of the walls there was a small chapel. The door was wide open, and from a distance, we could see that it was full of lit up candles. I was about to ask my friend why the lights were on, but that drunk idiot suddenly started to laugh and walked toward the chapel with big, awkward steps. Due to my injured leg, I couldn't really catch up with him. I almost felt like puking, so I looked down for a moment, and when I looked up again, he was standing inside the chapel. I took a few more steps and stopped as I saw his face look completely gray. What's wrong? I asked, but he gave me no response. Suddenly he raised his hand and signaled that I should back off and be quiet. He leaned his face a bit forward as if he was trying to see something in the room. At that point, I was really scared. So I just took as many steps back as I could while still looking at him. Then, I heard something. The sound of footsteps, maybe four or five people, was directly in front of him. He immediately turned around and started to sprint as fast as he possibly could while yelling, Run! Run! Go! I could hear the footsteps getting closer and closer, and whoever was chasing me was yelling some words in Latin. My friend caught up to me just as I was about to climb the fence. He helped me out and gave me a push forward. The footsteps were still right behind us. However, when we hit the ground on the other side of the fence and looked back between the bars into the green bushes, 
There was no one to be seen, no one to be heard. As frightened as we were, we glanced in every direction, looking for them, but there was nothing. We then got back on our feet and eventually went back to the hotel. Our legs were shivering. My friend entered the lobby first, and as I was just about to enter too, I looked back at the street we just came from and saw five figures standing in the darkness. They wore long black clothes and all stared directly at me. I got scared, so I immediately got in and went up to my room. Our hotel room was located on the fifth floor, so I looked down the window into the streets, but I couldn't see any of the figures. I remained extremely paranoid during the rest of our stay, but we never encountered anything similar. Even to this day, we haven't talked about the incident. This happened about four years ago, in December of 2015. Me and five of my friends have our own business editing photos and videos for social media content creators. And because of this, we tend to have a lot of spare time on our hands. We used to go on road trips to a local lake that has a few nice spots to camp at and a ski resort. We usually went there on our days off. One week, the six of us finished all of our projects early, so we had a few days off. We decided to drive to the lake. I won't be using their real names for obvious reasons. So I'll call them Kevin, Stephen, Brittany, Katie, and Josh. Katie and Brittany rode in Katie's old sports car, and Stephen and I rode on our motorcycles. Usually, Kevin and Josh took Stephen's Jeep. But on this trip, Josh had just bought a new Sprinter van, which the previous owner had converted into a two-person camper. So Kevin decided to ride with Josh. When we arrived, we skied, had some really delicious camping food and listened to Josh brag about his new van. It was a pretty normal trip. On the last day, we all packed up to head home. About two hours into the trip back home, we were a little hungry, so we stopped at a gas station to grab some snacks. We all parked our vehicles outside and went into the gas station together, which was kind of foolish. We were in there maybe four or five minutes, and the car's door was left open the whole time. When we came outside, we had a huge shock waiting for us. Josh's van was gone. There was a huge dent on the side of Katie's car and another dent on the side of an old truck in the parking lot, which I assume belonged to an employee. We were so panicked at that moment, so we immediately called the police. But since we were a little off the grid, the police took 15 minutes to arrive, and by then, we knew the chances of them being able to find Josh's van was slim to none. The scariest thing about it was that Kevin brought his work laptop on the trip, and I knew that Kevin didn't have a password set up on it. We waited for another two or so hours while the police searched the area, but they couldn't find anything. They told us to go home, and they would contact us if they found the stolen van. Kevin and Josh rode with the girls in Katie's car, while Stephen and I rode our motorcycles, following them very closely. We didn't stop once during the remaining three-hour trip home. Fast forward two or three weeks later, we received a frantic call from Josh. He said that the police contacted him and that the van had been found. All six of us showed up to see the van, and the van had somehow been rolled on its side and was left in a ditch near the highway, about an hour from where it had been stolen. Once they got it out of the ditch and flipped it upright, the police let us look inside to see if we could salvage any personal items. Sure enough, Kevin's laptop was gone, along with a set of kitchen knives that Josh had used for making kebabs. The most disturbing thing, though, was that once we got the busted driver's side door open, we saw that both seats were stained a deep dark red in multiple places, and the dashboard had slash marks all over it. At that point, we were really afraid of the van. Josh let the police take the van for further inspection, but we never heard what happened to it, or who 
the blood belonged to. My name is Louis and I live in Switzerland. This story happened five years ago during the winter holidays. It was an icy cold day and the snow was falling continuously, so we had to warm the house all day long with the firewood, putting it into the fireplace. My dad told us all the time that we should take care of the firewood. However, for the next days, we didn't do anything but just played Nintendo. Eventually, we noticed late around 9 p.m. that we had run out of wood. Dad got angry. So, as a punishment, he sent me and my older sister to the local lumberjack who was famous in the area. His shop was located one and a half kilometers away from our house. He was a really tall guy with a long beard and wore a black and white lumberjack shirt as a classic lumberjack. Anyway, at first he seemed very talkative. We ordered two bags full of wood which were about 50 kilograms. He said, Okay, hold on. It'll take about 15 minutes to cut and wrap everything. All of a sudden, my sister had to go to the restroom. He said that he would let her know where the toilet is, so she followed him. I was waiting for about 15 minutes, and then I noticed the place was silent. I saw neither my sister nor the man. I called my sister's name, but there was no answer. Then I got a message from my dad that if we bought the wood, then we should come home immediately. According to the local news, the police are looking for a serial killer in the village 50 kilometers from here. Dad also attached a picture and unfortunately, he looked very similar to the lumberjack. My heart dropped. I wanted to scream, but then he came with the bag of wood suddenly. He was smiling, but I could feel that something was weird. He looked joyful. Please ask me where's your sister, he said and winked at me. She's certainly not far away from you. Then I noticed the red stains on his shirt. I nervously opened a wood sack and the pink hair clip of my sister came out. I was full of anger. I grabbed a wooden bag with all my strength and hit the man. He screamed and fell on the floor, and I pulled out my pocket knife and stabbed him. Two or three many times. Suddenly I heard a loud scream out of nowhere. Stop! Lewis! It was my sister. That was a prank! She was crying. I, I couldn't think straight. My head was all messed up. What have I done? I killed the wrong guy. I dropped the knife and stared at his cold body. But then I recognized that I had no time. I knew that we had to get rid of this body quickly while we were still alone in the shop without employees or customers. So I quickly looked around and found a hidden room, which was locked. We kicked the door and pushed him inside. And we were about to turn on the light in the room to find a cover, but then what I found was a huge shock. The room was full of people who had been cut in several pieces and the floor was covered with blood. The lumberjack was the real serial killer. We were so terrified that we quickly covered him with some fabric and then ran out of the shop. We ran home as fast as we could. My dad asked us what happened, but we couldn't tell our parents anything. Since that day, we always made sure that we keep enough wood before the heavy snow. And I'm still wondering if the police found all the bodies at that shop. My name is Melanie. This happened when I was six years old. In 1989, I lived in San Bernardino, California. One night, after watching my favorite TV show, I decided to sleep with my mom. I used to sleep alone, but somehow I went to her bed and she smiled at me. While I was sleeping with her, I had a dream that I was at a park. It was sunny, and there were a lot of big trees around. I was in the car, and my mom was standing on the corner of the sidewalk. I struggled to open the door, but it didn't open at all. As I was pounding on the back of the car window, crying for her to help me, she just stood there, smiling and waving to me. Then I woke up. 
crying hysterically. Mom also woke up and rubbed my back, asking what was wrong, but I couldn't bring myself to repeat the horrible dream. Nothing. I told her and fell back asleep without any more bad dreams that night. After a year, we moved to Las Vegas, and I was getting ready to turn seven in a couple of weeks. My older brother, sister, and I went to the airport to visit my aunt who lives in Washington for a while. After finishing check-in, we went through security and got ready to board the plane. When I looked back at my mom, she was smiling and waving at me. It was the same way as in my dream. I couldn't dismiss the weird feeling during the flight. But despite the anxiety, we eventually arrived at my aunt's house peacefully. We were about to have a big party since my birthday was coming. And on my birthday, my mom called to greet me and said that she loves me. That was the last time I ever heard her speak. Everything was alright. I was so happy at the time. I was waiting for my mom to come over here and spend time with us. A few days later, my uncle told us to sit down in the living room as he had something very important to tell us. I noticed that my older sister was sitting in the corner chair and was crying quietly. He proceeded to tell us that my mother was no longer with us. At first, I couldn't understand what he was saying. He then told us that she died from a car accident. There was nothing more devastating than that day. Everybody in the living room was crying with such piercing sadness. Now I've grown up, but I still have dreams of my mom smiling and waving at me. I hope this story urges whoever is watching this video to cherish your loved ones. Because it could be the last day you see or speak to them. My name is Gabby. And this story is my true experience. When I was 11 years old, my family and I moved to a big house in a tiny town. Our new house was located at the highest point, which was at the end of the town. When we bought the house, the owner explained to us that his wife had just passed away due to cancer, and that the house was very precious to her, so she never wanted to sell it. Still. The owner said the house was too big and lonely for him, since all their kids were grown up and already moved to other cities. However, during the final part of the deal, he suddenly changed his mind and didn't want to sell the house. But it was too late. The owner stormed out of the office saying that it was his house and that we were going to regret it. Anyway, this was during the time my dad was sent overseas because he was in the military. So my mom, my older brother and I had to live by ourselves for six months. During that time, we had really weird experiences. Sometimes we would wake up to the sound of a goat in our backyard. It would last the whole night. The next morning, we talked to the neighbors and asked if one of them had goats, but none of them did. So at first, we just decided to ignore the issue and leave it alone. Now, just for your information, our house design was kind of odd. Downstairs, we had my room, my brother's room, my soon-to-be-born sister's room, and a weird wide walkway that led to the backyard. And upstairs, we had a kitchen, living room, and my parents' room. The downstairs was underground, and the upstairs was technically the first floor. Anyway, one night, I decided to sleep with my mom, so I went upstairs with my brother. Later that night, we heard a sharp scream coming from downstairs. It sounded like it was my dad's voice screaming for help. He was calling all of our names. My mom rushed out of the room and was ready to run downstairs. All of a sudden, she stopped at the top of the staircase and looked at us with a weird expression on her face. But your dad is still in Colombia. How could he? And the next thing I saw was my mom abruptly falling down the stairs. 
That moment was so horrible. It was like someone pushed her backwards before she was able to resist. My brother called the police and I ran down the stairs to check my mom and see if she was okay. We struggled to bring her up the stairs, but we managed to make it to her room. When the police and ambulance arrived, they took my mom to a hospital and left two officers with us that night. I was crying the entire night and we were so afraid. Due to falling down the stairs, mom was injured and unfortunately, we lost our new family member. The most chilling part was that they found large handprints on my mom's back, as if she was pushed by someone. This led to an investigation, but they had to leave the case open because no one was found in our house, other than the three of us. We all suffered and went through a hard time that year, especially my mom. She slid into depression. When she recovered, we moved the following year. However, more things happened throughout the year, but not as bad as the previous one. Just footsteps, broken plates, or similar stuff to that. We put that house on the market when we left, but no one has contacted us. One thing is for certain. I hope that we never have to go back to that creepy house again. I really, really don't want to go back. It was late in the evening and I was driving on the highway. I was coming back home from my friend's party. I was so tired at that time, so I decided to check in at a hotel near the village. The hotel was not too big, seemed normal, but was kind of creepy. After finishing check-in, I got my key and the room number. My room number was 23. I walked to the hallway. As I was passing by the other doors, I heard a kid's giggling voice from the room number 20, which was located <laughs> just two doors away from my room. I stopped walking. Then I noticed that the door on this room looked different from the others. The door looked very old and it had a big keyhole and it was big enough to peek inside the room. I was actually curious about the inside, so I looked into the room, and there was a girl who was sitting on the bed with her face down to the floor. I couldn't <laughs> see her face clearly because her hair was all covered. She was wearing a white dress like the 1990s style, and it looked dirty. I thought it was weird, but soon I just disregarded it. So I headed to my room, locked the door, and just passed out. The next morning, I was walking the hallway again. I didn't know why, but I instantly had this feeling that I wanted to look through that keyhole again in room 20. So I stopped in front of the door and looked through the hole. But this time, I couldn't hear any sound and see the girl though. All I could see was a whole red color. I thought maybe she saw me yesterday, that I was looking through the hole, so she probably covered up the hole with a red cloth or something. I thought that was childish, but cute. So I smiled, stepped back, and headed to the counter. Before leaving, I asked the lady at the counter, hey, what's going on in that room 20? Why does the door look different and why that girl stays alone? She stared at me for a while and then began to talk. Oh, you mean the room number 20. There used to be a family who checked in that room when this hotel wasn't renovated before. The couple had a daughter and stayed in here for their vacation. But then, they killed their daughter in that room. And when the cops arrived, the couple killed themselves too. But the weirdest part about it was, after that, lots of our guests told the staff that they saw the same girl who was wandering the hallways. And they all said that the girl's eyes were too red, as just like she was shedding tears of blood. What she told me shocked me. My heart was pounding and I couldn't even speak anything. Then what was that red thing? Was she looking at me through the door, just like I was watching her? That day, I saw him on one of my usual walks along the bridge. 
He was a tall, middle-aged man in a cheap-looking suit. I approached him carefully, not wanting to spook him. I asked, Sir? He turned around quickly with his face drenched in sweat. Who are you? He asked nervously. I answered with a smile. I'm Mandy. You should move away from here. It's pretty dangerous. I said, pointing to the edge of the bridge where he was standing. What are you doing here? He looked at me for a few seconds before speaking again. Oh, I come here often. It's quiet, so I like that. I smiled at him again. He then looked down at the water below. He also said that I really shouldn't be hanging out in a place like this. Your parents must be worried about it. He sounded calmer, but wouldn't meet my eyes. I spoke softly. Well, my parents know I'm here. They know I like to help people like you. He turned to me, and I looked at him without blinking. I knew that he wanted to jump. The look on his face changed to one of uneasiness. So he tried to say something, but nothing came out. It will hurt like nothing's ever hurt before. And it's just a fall, but the aftermath is even worse. His eyes widened and he shouted, Get out of here, kid. You don't even know what you're talking about. He sounded more alarmed than angered. I continued to look at him as he breathed heavily. Then I slowly pointed to the pictures and flowers attached to the railings just behind him. Actually, I do. He looked in the direction I was pointing, taking a few seconds to process what he was seeing. He then turned around slowly to look at me, pure horror on his face. How... how can you... At that moment, I knew I had saved him. At least for now. He stood there for a moment longer, frozen and unsure of what to do. Then he didn't say any words, simply turned around and ran as fast as he could. I dropped my shoulders and breathed a sigh of relief. I walked over to the railings and just sat there, looking at the pictures. We miss you, Mandy was written on a big card decorated with hearts and flowers right next to my yearbook photo. Gone too soon, said another, surrounded by teddy bears, clothes, and lots of flowers. It all looked so pretty. My name is Mandy. I was 19 when I died, and now I try to help people live. This took place in the summer of 2017 in the small town of Alexandria Bay, New York. My parents own a small vacation house there, and we usually go down for a few weeks during the summer break. It was your typical Saturday night. My parents were out partying with friends, and I was chilling out playing video games. I heard a noise from the docking area outside where my dad keeps his yacht. My initial thought was that my parents had come back early. It was around midnight, and that would have been pretty early for my parents since they usually come back around 3 in the morning. I just continued playing my game and paid no attention to the fact that someone could have been trying to steal my dad's boat. In fact, I forgot about it entirely. Around 2 in the morning I exited the house to have a smoke, and I saw that the doors to the yacht's main cabin were open, and there was no lights on inside. I grabbed a flashlight and boarded the yacht. I didn't turn on any lights, because if there was someone on my father's yacht, I wanted the element of surprise. Now I considered the fact that my mom and dad were doing something that I absolutely did not want to see under any circumstances, but I didn't see their car anywhere outside. So I came to the conclusion that there was someone on my dad's boat who wasn't supposed to be there. I heard footsteps down in the lower levels where the sleeping quarters were. At this point, I'm fired up, and I'm ready to teach some asshole a lesson about intruding on someone else's property. I hid behind the wall that separated the cabin area from the kitchen, and peered out just enough to see what was going on. Soon after, 
I saw the silhouette of a man emerge from the stairwell at the opposite end of the room. Now I had turned off my flashlight, and the only source of light was the moonlight coming through the long window that rimmed around the cabin. Point being is that it was fairly dark, but my eyes had adjusted. I saw the shadow move in front of the long window. It was a slim figure. Now me being 6'2", 250 pounds, built like a linebacker, I thought I would be able to take this guy on easy. I came from around the corner and yelled, Hey fucker! And lowered my shoulder. I was expecting to knock this guy on his ass, but something strange happened. Now again, it was pretty dark, so I can only speculate. But the intruder somehow was able to jump up and grab onto something hanging from the ceiling and avoid my charge entirely, causing me to hit the wall pretty hard. I flipped onto my back to see the intruder coming towards me with something in his hands. He was seconds away from hitting me or possibly stabbing me, so I had to think fast. I raised my right leg and landed a kick to the stomach. The intruder grunted and stumbled backwards, dropping whatever he was holding. As soon as I stood back up, I saw the figure dart out of the open doors. A loud splash followed shortly after. The intruder had disappeared into the water below. When I turned on the lights, there was a serrated knife laying on the floor of the cabin. I called the police who came out and investigated, but aside from the knife, they found no traces of the intruder anywhere. I gave my statement and filed a report. My folks came home at a record-breaking 6 a.m., and I decided that I would fill them in on what happened when they woke up. They were in no shape to process this information when they came home, if you know what I mean. Please take care to make sure that everything is locked up tight before you go to bed. You never know when some lunatic may be out looking for a place to crash or to steal something of yours. And also keep in mind that some don't mind confrontation. This upcoming Halloween will be my 40th birthday, and even after nearly 25 years, the terrifying memory of that night has never faded. You see, I lost my virginity in a pumpkin patch on Halloween. I know, cliche. Specifically, I lost it in the bed of a pickup truck while it was parked in the pumpkin patch. To give you an idea, the patch was maybe 80 by 100 feet, and fenced off by wire mesh to prevent cows from getting in. My house was just across the street from the pumpkin patch. We shared a bottle of wine, awkwardly talked for a while, and then got to business. My family had two border collies, and as we were changing positions, the dogs wandered in and started barking at us. My date and I paused and drunkenly, playfully, began throwing scraps of food out into the pumpkins for them to chase. After a couple of minutes of that, we continued where we left off. After we were done, we sat there in the truck and looked up at the stars, while the dogs wandered around sniffing random things. After a short while, I saw my father return home, pulling into the driveway across the street. The dogs bounded out of the patch towards him, and me and my date quickly began to dress ourselves. Once we were fully clothed, we just sat on the tailgate and kept talking as we watched my dad pet the dogs and go into the house. It was about then that we heard it. A rustling sound coming from the patch somewhere behind us. We both paused and turned. At this point, there was only moonlight to illuminate our surroundings, but it was enough. And this is exactly what we saw. A single pumpkin began to rise up out of the patch, but not like someone was lifting it. It was kind of sideways like it had been resting on its side and was now sitting up. For a split second, I thought someone was rising this pumpkin out of the patch on a stick or a metal bar. But then the stick changed position. It coiled like a snake and then shot straight up, like a man would be if he went from a squatting position to a standing position. I then saw two spindly legs with knee joints protruding from the thing, but no arms. There was a buzzing in my ear and all of a sudden, my date screamed. We both jumped off the truck and booked it out of the patch and sprinted towards my house. I glanced back once, 
and I'll swear on whatever you want me to swear on. A tall, skeletal figure was leaning over the truck where we had both been sitting, and I caught a glimpse of two beady red eyes staring back at me. We made it to my garage and forced our way through the kitchen door. I began screaming at my dad to get his gun. It wasn't until I saw the blood on the kitchen floor that I realized that my nose had been bleeding. Even more alarming, my date's nose was gushing blood as well. I told my dad that there was someone in the pumpkin patch, and he grabbed his gun and power walked out of the house, the dogs following closely behind him. But they stopped halfway there, refusing to come any closer to the pumpkin patch. When my dad returned, he was livid. He wanted to know what had damaged the fence and broke the tailgate off my truck, which technically was his truck. I could only shiver in confusion and abject terror. He reported that something had knocked the tailgate right off the truck and then tore out of the patch from inside and destroyed a huge section of fence. I didn't sleep at all that night. I cowered in terror in the living room with all the lights on. The next day the police came and examined the scene. The wire fence had been torn out of the ground and dragged a short distance away. My father and the police were convinced that it was a trespasser pulling a Halloween prank. But I never believed that for a moment. I tried to explain that the dogs had been pounding through the patch minutes before the thing had appeared, and neither of them had made a sound to alert us that there was a trespasser nearby. Furthermore, the entry gate to the patch made plenty of noise whenever the wind rattled it. So if someone climbed over it, it would make even more noise, and we had been sitting right by the gate. Another thing that terrified me is the shape of the thing as it stood. Even if it was a trespasser with an elaborate costume, none of that would even begin to explain the tailgate, the destroyed fence, the nosebleeds, and our dogs being too nervous to approach the patch, or the eyes I had caught a glimpse of. My father went to his grave believing that we had been vandalized by trespassers. My date and I concluded later that whatever it was, it hadn't been human or an animal. So, no one really takes me seriously. But I've heard that skinwalkers can take the form of anything that best suits their surroundings. Our property wasn't anywhere near a Native American reservation. But I can't think of anything else it could have been. So what do you think it was? I've been a trucker since my mid-twenties. I've had many odd experiences on the road. I'm pretty sure that I've come across a couple of UFOs while driving late at night and encountered many strange drivers at times. However, the encounter I'm going to share today is by far the most terrifying and strange experience I've ever had. This happened on a country road in the middle of Kansas when I was 37. The year was 2009. The night started off like most nights, which consisted of me driving and listening to some music on the radio, usually drinking some coffee to keep myself from getting too tired. As I drove through the night on the empty road, I had noticed that it began to get foggy. This fog eventually became very thick, and I started thinking to myself whether I should pull over for a while, as I could barely see ahead or keep driving. I thought about it, and decided to continue on. There were zero other people so far out driving in the middle of the country, so maybe it was safer than I thought. I still took precaution. I was going slowly, just in case an animal or something were to run across the road. As I continued driving, I started to pick up an odor. This odor was the most foul thing I've ever smelled, and it soon filled the inside of my truck. I quickly closed the windows, but that didn't help. This terrible smell was already inside, and I felt as if I was going to vomit. The smell and the fog became overwhelming. I remember thinking to myself, what in the world could be causing such an awful stench? In that same moment, I felt that unpleasant feeling when you know you're about to throw up. I had no choice but to quickly stop the truck and open the door to empty my stomach. When I was finished, I quickly covered my face 
as that horrible smell was still in the air. I closed the door and prepared myself to start driving again. And that's when I noticed something ahead crossing the road. The figure was unmistakably a man, and this man appeared to be limping. Other than his limping, I also noticed that the man was wearing an old white button shirt and black suspenders. I recall thinking to myself how strange and freaky the situation was, and not knowing what to do. I decided that I was just going to ask if he was okay, and if I should call anyone for help. Before I was able to drive up to him, I soon noticed that four more people came out from the side of the road, all walking in the same direction as the first man I saw. Each of them were walking in that same odd limping gait, all of them wearing outdated farming clothes. What I found even more strange was the fact that they didn't acknowledge the huge truck that was on the other side of the road. I thought to myself, if these people needed help, then surely they would come to me. However, all of them continued limping across the road, disappearing into the darkness and the fog. I must also remind you we were in the middle of Kansas, so basically the middle of nowhere. Just then, another figure emerged from the darkness and began to cross the road too. However, this figure was far smaller. I soon realized that this was a child. I got out of my truck, but I did not go up to the kid. Rather, I stared at him as he continued to cross the road. This child was also walking in a weird way and was wearing that old clothing too. Right when he was about to make it to the other side, I said aloud, Do any of you need help? The child stopped, turning his head to face me. My heart sank all the way to my feet as soon as I saw his face. I wasn't looking at the face of an ordinary child. I was looking at the face of a corpse. I cursed under my breath and stood there in fear. This thing then let out the most awful scream I've ever heard and began to limp towards me, but at a quicker speed than before. I quickly got back inside the truck and slammed the door shut. In that very moment, I heard even more of those horrifying screams and saw more of these things beginning to emerge from the darkness. I quickly swerved around the kid, speeding out of there as quick as I could. During that whole ordeal, I saw the faces of the other ones that were coming, and they all had the face of decomposed corpses. Once I made it back to civilization, I stopped at a gas station. I just sat there in my truck. My mind and heart were still racing and had no idea what to think. This experience opened me up to many things. I feel like I understand that this world is indeed strange, and there might always be things which we do not understand. My name is Allie, and I'm from Germany. I have experienced this incident when I was 12 years old. One day, I went to my grandparents' house to stay for a while. The house was quite an old one and was located in a pretty isolated area. When I arrived there, it was already late and dark outside. I stayed with my grandmother in the living room, and then I asked her a question. Granny, what was the scariest thing you've experienced? She replied, well, I think you're too young to hear it, dear. However, I kept convincing her to tell me her story. For your information, my grandma has a backstory when she comes from an old, small village in Turkey where still people ride on horses. Eventually, she began the story. It's not my fault if you can't sleep tonight. She asked me if I know how the devil looked like. 
and I said they look like red man with spikes on their forehead. Well, the devil has a split tongue, and he has only three fingers on both hands. The fingernails are so sharp that they could slice the meat almost in half, and the air he is breathing is dead souls. Her description was so detailed that I could almost imagine clearly, and I was a bit scared, and she then told me that she once had seen him a few years ago. It has become bright in front of her eyes when she had a heart attack, and then she saw something red thing approaching her. She could see him clearly, and it was definitely something else. It's time to go, he said to her, but she refused. I didn't commit any sin. Why are you going to take me? Then Satan replied, Silence! You are going to come with me. She yelled, No! He stared at her for a moment and opened his mouth. No one ever comes back to me. You are going to regret it later. When he disappeared, my grandma finally woke up from a coma, and she realized that two years have been passed. My mom told her that her brother got lung cancer and nearly died. After leaving the hospital, she went to visit him, asking if he had seen something. That night, I saw a red man, and he said like this, She doesn't want to come. So you have to come with me. He replied, after that, my grandma told about him to the whole family. Everyone believed it, except me, who was a little kid. Granny, I don't remember. I know. You were pretty young at that time, sweetie. After finishing drinking a hot chocolate, I ended up going to bed. However, I couldn't close my eyes because of the story that my grandma had told me. Then, I suddenly heard someone open the door that I had locked. There was a clock in the room. When I saw the clock, I could see that it said 4.61 a.m. There is no way that 61 minutes can exist. Something was wrong. I grabbed my phone and turned on the lights. And there he was, the red man, Satan. Being scared, I screamed at the top of my lungs. I immediately hid under my blankets, and that's when I felt a sharp pain on my left arm. That's only what I heard at that moment. After a few seconds, my grandpa ran into the room with his baseball bat, but he was already disappeared. While he was driving me to the hospital, he kept praying on the way. It took around 30 minutes to drive to the nearest hospital, and I eventually had to stitch my wound on my arm. This happened six years ago, but I still have scars on my arm. Thankfully, I have not been encountered something like this anymore. About 13 years ago, I was a second grader in elementary school. It was when it started getting hotter just before the summer vacation, and there was no place for kids to play around. Since the PC room and arcade were far from where I lived, my friends often visited my house because there was a small river near my apartment complex, a playground, and most of all, there were junk shops around the area. It was not a small shop, but a really large place with a bunch of old cars and electronics piled up and we used to go into the back door and play when we got tired of playing in the playground. And of course, my mom always scolded me a lot if I got caught by her while playing. Anyway, it was a Friday. It was a holiday for the school anniversary, so I woke up late and went out to meet my friends as usual, but no one was around the street. Jung Ho, who lives the furthest away from my house, was the only one at home. Since his parents went out to work, he was kind of bored being alone. So he came out right away when I called him out. He and I went around finding our friends, but it was in vain. Eventually, we started playing in the playground. 
but soon we got tired and two of us ended up going to a junk shop. The big junk shop was divided into several sections. Me and my friends used to name the places by section, such as TV, refrigerators, car corners, etc. But that day he wanted to play in the refrigerator section. The refrigerator section was literally filled up with a bunch of refrigerators, so the height was about a second floor. While we were playing hide and seek in the refrigerator without getting caught by the employees, he suddenly called me saying he found something amazing. And there was a huge silver color refrigerator the size of a full size van. I think it was for storage, but it was just a novelty for the kids at that moment. While we were looking around for a long time, he suddenly said he would go inside. Being scared, I stopped him, but he refused to yield, insisting that he would come out in 10 minutes. He said to wait and see if someone's coming from outside, and then he entered inside and closed the door. I didn't want to be caught playing here and scolded by the employees, so I kept watching and the sun was going down slowly. Not long after, I heard him asking me to open the door. I felt something strange when he asked me to open since he'd opened it with his own hands easily until earlier. As soon as I held the handle and tried to open the door, I could notice why he asked me such a weird favor. The door didn't open. It definitely opened well just a minute ago, but it seemed to have some kind of lock system since it was for business use. Eventually, both of us got scared and began to argue for no reason. Why did you get in there? Wait, I'll get the parents. Hang in there. I didn't expect this, okay? Just come back quickly. I'm in big trouble. Shouting inwardly, I ran back to my home, approached my mom who was setting up dinner and tried to talk about the junk shop. However, I couldn't speak any words. I used to get in a lot of trouble and even was whipped when I got caught by my mom while playing at a junkyard. So it was really scary to tell her the truth anyway. Should I have to tell them? What do I do? I was hesitating to tell them about it for a long time until my dad came back from work and I saw a chicken pack in his hand. And I think it was since then I completely forgot about my friend while I was eating up the chicken. Saturday morning, I woke up and saw my parents preparing busily to go out. The reason is, we're going to the valley with my aunt. Excited, I had no more thoughts about my friend. After arriving at the valley with my family, I played in the water, ate delicious food all day long, and finally fell asleep when we were coming back home. Sunday morning, I woke up late, watched TV, and followed my mom to the church at lunch to play with my friends. When I got back home, I was tired as usual, so I fell asleep right away. Finally, it was Monday. I was going to school as usual, and someone was handing out the paper in front of the school gate. It was Jung Ho's mom. Right, Jung Ho. Only then did I remember him who I had left in the refrigerator. Oh no, I am doomed. I turned around and ran to the junk shop. I felt like it was the first time in my whole life that I ran so fast. Anyway, I headed to the refrigerator corner after I arrived at the junk shop. But the refrigerator was gone. I mean, all the refrigerators in that section disappeared, including the big refrigerator. I looked for all the area, just in case I came in the wrong way. But it seemed that all the refrigerators must have been collected. After searching for a long time, I eventually gave up and went back to school. Of course, I was scolded by my teacher since the class was already started, but I couldn't stop thinking about him anyway. What should I do? Should I confess the truth? Who should I talk to? To Jung Ho's mom or, or to my mom? I've been thinking about it all day and I've come to the conclusion that I'll get in a lot of trouble if I tell. Jung Ho had already disappeared, and there was nothing I could do anymore. In the end, I decided not to tell anybody. After that, we moved right away to another area, and I started to go to the other middle school. 
Jung Ho has never been found from what I've heard. I'm now in college. On weekdays, I see Jung Ho's mom still standing in front of the elementary school whenever I pass by that place. And there was a photo of him attached on the sign with the words, I'm looking for my missing child. So my story ends here. I mean, who else knows whether he was abducted or just thrown away by the employees? I mean, since the refrigerator's already gone, who knows whether he was abducted by a kidnapper or just thrown away by the employees? I'm sorry, my friend. I am currently 19 years old, a high school student. I almost died today, and my hands are still shaking. Because of my dad's friend's father's funeral, neither of my parents was at home today. And I was lying down on my bed to sleep around 2 a.m. after putting an online application in university. Before that, I went to the convenience store in front of my house around 11 p.m., and I think I forgot to lock the front door. I could see the front door sensor light turned on through my door that was slightly open. Are they back? At that moment, there was a cough outside, and I instinctively noticed that they were not my parents. I got out of bed right away, closed, and locked the door quietly. In case the light would escape outside if I turned on the light, I went under the desk and quietly called the police on my cell phone. I think there's someone in my house. When I spoke quietly but clearly, the police replied that they would send the other police soon. About 10 minutes later, there was still no contact from the police. Shaking with fear, I approached the door to check the sound and heard the sound of opening the refrigerator door. It was certain that someone was in my house. My hands were shaking and my heart was beating like crazy. The person outside started to open the door one by one, but this time he tried to open my door. When he noticed my room was locked, he started turning the doorknob a few times, and it soon became quiet. A few seconds later, suddenly someone knocked on my door. Police, open the door, please. But I couldn't hear the front door open. He kept turning the doorknob, and I started crying, being frozen. Just then, the police siren began to hear. As soon as I opened the window and screamed like crazy, the police came in with 911 emergency technicians opening our door. The house was soon full of police and technicians. But strangely, I couldn't see the man. I cried and explained all the circumstances, but there was no trace of him anywhere. To take me to the hospital, one of the technicians raised me up, who was shaking at that time. The rest of the police were about to leave my house, and then someone cursed loudly. The man was hiding in the washing machine. The police arrested him right there. After I ended up moving to the hospital, I told my parents about it. Both of them immediately returned home right away, and my dad headed for the police station. I don't know what happened after that but I probably won't be able to open the lid of the washing machine now and forever. I hope those of you who see this always lock the door securely. A year ago, I moved into another town. The town was very small and isolated and had a small population. I started going to a small boxing gym, and only a few guests used that gym as well. Whenever I go to the gym, I could see there were about one or two people. The gym was barely managed and used to smell something weird, like someone's sweat. I learned almost nothing from there for two months. The instructor was not always there, and I just go to the empty gym and work out by myself every time. Still, I had no choice but to go there since it was the only gym in the neighborhood. 
In addition, it was good to use as much exercise equipment as possible. Another advantage was that there were quite a few punching bags in the gym, which were much softer and more elastic than ordinary ones. It seemed to be a kind of luxury punching bag. The instructor always looked at me with a cold eye whenever he meets me, but it didn't matter anyway. All I have to do is just exercise at the gym. Then one day, something happened. Suddenly, the cops came into the gym and started asking the instructor lots of things. It is said that people were constantly missing in this small town. After concluding that the criminal was in the neighborhood, the cops started to look for him, but they were unable to catch him. It was a little creepy for no reason. Well, I'm a strong dude. Thinking like that, I just shook it off. After that, the time has passed. One day, I came out to exercise as usual, then found police cars parked in front of the gym. As I got closer, I couldn't help but be shocked. The instructor was being arrested. The cops blocked me from entering the gym, but I could literally see it. I could see those things through the narrow view. It was the bodies that were being pulled out of the punching bag by the police. The punching bags in the gym contain the bodies of the missing person. The police investigation revealed that the instructor had killed a total of six people in the town and kept the bodies in a punching bag to create an alibi to avoid the police. I started to panic after the police interrogation and immediately came up with something. I mean, the feel of the punching bag. I threw up right away. After that day, I've been suffering trauma and eventually quit boxing and moved to another place. However, even now, I can't forget the weird stench of the gym. The smells that I thought were just sweat. This happened to me when I was 16 years old. I never imagined anything like this literally had happened to me. I was in the local library searching for some science fiction or fantasy books since they were my favorite genres of anything. While I was searching the books, I came across this older man who looked like he was in his 50s. He appeared to be one of the employees, so I asked him where the SF books were, and he said they are in a section which he had pointed to. After I thanked him, then I went over to the area where he pointed at and eventually found a Star Wars book. Being excited, I went to the front desk to rent it and then walked home, which took just a 15 minute. About 10 minutes walking, I looked behind me for no reason and saw a black van kept following me. This made me really uncomfortable. I know that I've always been suspicious of vans, but this specific one that was following me looked just like it had been burned more than five times. The van soon caught up to me, and that was a hair-raising experience. When the driver rolled down his window, to my surprise, it was the same old man from the library. I asked him why he was following me, and he answered by saying he just wanted to make sure I got home safely. I know he was lying. Without any choice, I bolted all the way home and told my parents about him. No matter how close the place is, just drive wherever you go. They told me like this and I thought it was over. However, what really makes this story scary was when I was playing video games in my room after that night, while I was focusing on the games, I heard a knock at the window beside me. And guess who was there? It was the freaking same guy from the library. However, only this time, I could definitely see him holding a 44 Magnum in his hand. I don't know where that courage came from. With anger, I quickly ran toward the window, opened it, and punched off that insane guy to drop onto the ground of our backyard. As my room was on the second floor, I ran down to my parents in their room to tell them what just happened. My mom called the police immediately, and they arrived in 10 minutes. They found him hiding in a bush in our backyard, 
and he was arrested right on the spot. We soon found out that he didn't work at the library and even had many records of homicides, kidnapping, rape, and many other crimes. If he raised his gun on time when I ran to the window, I probably would have been another one of the victims killed by him. This happened in late September when I was walking with my dog, Bubba. First, I'd like to mention that Bubba is a small chihuahua mix and weighs about 12 pounds. I'm also a small woman myself. I live in a relatively safe area in California, so I wasn't too worried about walking my dog at night. About a week ago, I was on my way home with Bubba and I noticed that he seemed visibly upset about something. Although it was pretty dark, the streetlights provided enough light so I could see what the reason was. In the distance, a young girl who looked to be around 13 years old was walking toward us. She was dressed in what looked to be a school uniform and also wore black and white striped knee-high stockings and black Mary Jane shoes. And I could see that she was shorter than me. Bubba was getting more aggressive, barking and growling. Since he has never acted like this before, this made me feel like there was something off about this girl. I looked closer, and that's when I noticed her unusual posture. She appeared to be limping with her head down, and it occasionally twitched every five seconds or so. Her right hand was in her pocket, and it looked like she was holding something. I now could see she had long, greasy black hair and bangs that covered her eyes. However, I couldn't see her face at all since she was wearing a mask that covered her nose and mouth, and that really creeped me out. Bubba kept on barking, which sounded deafening in the silent street. When we were about five feet apart, I could finally see what was in her hand. It was a flip phone. As I passed by her, then I could see one bloodshot eye peeking at me through those disgusting bangs. I started to pick up my pace. To my horror, she turned around and started to follow me. Being horrified, I was trying not to cry, and Bubba was pulling on his leash, still snarling and baring his teeth. Just then, I heard the girl saying from behind me, Yeah, I found her. What should I do next? That's when I picked up Bubba and started running home. When I looked back, she was still walking peacefully with the phone up to her ear and staring at me. I didn't have any choice, just kept running, and I couldn't stop crying, although I finally got home. After that, I told my mom about what happened, but she was convinced it was just a Halloween prank so we never ended up calling the police. Fortunately, I never saw her again, and I definitely never take walks at night. When me and my best friend were younger, we would ask our babysitter to take us to the school playground at night so we could play hide and seek. We lived in a small town where everyone knew everyone and we were friendly with one another. So this wasn't abnormal or dangerous, at least not at the time. One night we went over past our bedtimes, but our parents were cool and let us stay up to play hide and seek. At one point, I was trying to find my friend and my babysitter. As I looked for them, a car slowly drove by the playground. Their lights were off and the windows were tented. I watched them as they drove by and felt as though they were watching me. When they were out of sight, I instantly forgot about it and went back to seeking. It came to be around midnight and our babysitter thought that it was about time to go. Of course, we begged to stay a little longer but he said it was late. We started to walk up the hill that was behind the school. We then all heard a car behind us and we look over to see the same car driving on the grass towards us. 
My babysitter instantly grabbed both of us and threw us over his shoulders and started running towards the bushes that cut us off from the other street. The car started to speed up and so did my babysitter. When we got to the bushes, my babysitter forced us through and up a metal fence behind them. I ended up getting cuts everywhere, but worst of all, I cut my leg on the fence and was bleeding badly. I could hear the driver of the car calling out to us, asking in a kind voice, Where are you? Then, in a serious and scary voice, I know you're in there. I'm gonna find you. <laughs> We ended up getting to a house that had lights on, and our babysitter banged on the door, begging to let us inside, and that he had kids and one of them was bleeding. A woman who we knew as Emily opened the door and pretty much dragged us inside and shut the door behind her. Later that night, the police were called, and I was sent to the hospital to get stitches, and a shot for the rusty metal I had cut my leg on. It doesn't end there though. Later that week, my dad was watching the news as usual, and a story came up. It showed the playground that we were at a couple of nights ago, and showed two medics rolling a body covered with a white sheet into an ambulance. The girl had been dead for a couple of days, and her body hadn't even been there for very long. The killer was never found, so he could still be out there. Sometimes I wonder if the man in the car did get us, would we have been in the same situation that girl ended up in, and she would have been watching the news to see our bodies being rolled into an ambulance? It makes me feel guilty, but I will never, and have never, stepped another foot in that playground since. This incident happened when I was a sophomore in high school. My parents got a job in the countryside, so I was left alone in the city. I had to live on my own, so they ended up renting a small flat corridor apartment for me. For the first few days, I felt free to be myself, but also a little scared since it was my first time living alone. I felt a chill in the house somewhere and I sometimes open my eyes at daybreak after I moved in. For your information, I rarely woke up at dawn when I lived with my parents before. Another day, when I looked at the clock attached to the room, it was often pointed at 2 a.m. Sometimes I woke up at 1.50 or 2.10. Anyway, it was always close to 2 a.m. At first, I thought it was just nothing and fell asleep again but it kept happening again for about a week. On that day, I opened my eyes around 2 a.m. as usual. Oh, shoot, it happened again. Thinking like this, I tried to fall asleep again, but I couldn't fall asleep at all, rolling my eyes vacantly. At that moment, I heard the sudden sound of shoes in the hallway. Because the next side of my room was the hallway and my bed was attached to the hallway, so the sound was very clear. From the elevator, he was coming toward my house. But at the moment, the footsteps gave me a sense of chilling for some reason, and I began to feel anxious that the destination would be my house. And eventually, the sound of shoes just exactly stopped right in front of my house. Shortly after the sounds of its footstep, I suddenly heard the slide of the front door lock goes up. My door lock has numbers, and when you open the slide, you press the number and close the slide. Then the door opens. So someone was literally trying to open my door. It slowly began to press the numbers one by one. I was so scared that I put on my blanket and shouted inside, Please, don't open it. Please, it's not seven numbers. My apartment password was seven digits, so I started to get terrified. I couldn't move because my body was frozen in that state, and if I moved just a little, someone outside would be excited. It slowly pressed the seven-digit number and slid down the slide. At that moment, my heart sank and I felt like I was about to die. 
Fortunately, I heard a sharp warning. It meant the number was wrong. Thank God. But as soon as I heard the warning, it opened the slide again and pressed the number faster than before. When it got it wrong again, it pressed the number frantically. It was incomparably faster than when I pressed my password as fast as I could to go to the bathroom in a hurry after I came back from school. As the number kept getting wrong a few times, the door lock machine automatically recognized that it was an error and stopped. The outside was calmed down for a long time. So I took a breath and got out of my bed quietly. As soon as I was about to get out of bed to drink a cup of water in the kitchen, something suddenly crossed my mind. Why can't I hear the shoe sound? Is he still out at the door? And at that moment, again, it began to press the number roughly again. Come to think of it, it might have known the fact that it would work again shortly after the machine stopped, so it just waited in front of the machine. At the moment, I got goosebumps. So I ran to the front door, put a chai, and jumped back into bed. The moment I just put on my blanket, the outside suddenly calmed down again. It didn't press the number even though the machine didn't stop. Is the door opened? Shaking in anxiety, I lifted the blanket slightly, but there was no one. And as soon as I was relieved, I heard a little sound from the back of my head. To be exact, it was from under the bed. You didn't think I'd make it, did you? Did you? Did you? The moment a woman's whispering voice came into my ears, I realized it was sleep paralysis. In that state, I think I fainted without moving my body once. The next morning, I opened my eyes and went straight to the front door. Fortunately, the door was locked, and the chain above it was fine also. I opened the door and looked out, just in case, but there was no one there. This time, I looked at the password slide, and it seemed fine on the outside. However, the moment I opened the slide, I felt like I almost fainted. The numbers corresponding to my apartment's password among the number plates were all scuffed as if they were scratched by a knife or something. I immediately told my parents about this, and it seemed they were worried about me so they came right away to see me. They were also surprised to see the scratched number plates and ended up heading to the security office to see if there were any CCTV records taken at that time. However, no matter how hard we looked at it, we could not see anyone wearing shoes or unusual. There were five people in the CCTV, but all of them were residents of the apartment. Eventually, the door lock was replaced with a new one, and my parents stayed at home for a few days and went back again. After that, I gradually didn't wake up at dawn. I haven't believed in any unusual phenomenon in my life, but I could say it was definitely strange after experiencing them for the first time. Even now that I think about it, I think I'm getting goosebumps. This story takes place in the summer of 2012. I'm a male, and I was 25 at the time. I was living by myself in a one-bedroom apartment that I had recently moved into after a messy divorce. It wasn't fancy, but I was pretty proud and happy to be living on my own once again. My apartment was located in a suburban part of the city that I lived in, in Missouri. One night, I had finished a closing shift at a local restaurant where I was an assistant manager. It was around midnight and I was looking forward to a night of Comedy Central and beers, seeing how my schedule rendered me a night owl. I returned to my apartment, took a long shower, and turned on the TV after opening my first cold one. I stayed up till around 3am, watching stand-up comedy and drinking. 
I eventually turned the lights out and left the TV on as I drifted to sleep. Now, to give a visual, my apartment was on the second floor. The only window was in my bedroom, and there was a sliding glass door in the living room that led to my balcony. The front door led directly outside, and there's no way of seeing out that particular side, other than a small peephole in the door. Around 4 in the morning, I was suddenly awakened by a frantic pounding at my front door. I'm talking constant beating that seemed like someone was trying to break the door with their fists. I immediately sprung up from the couch and ran to the door wearing only a pair of basketball shorts. I looked out my peephole and there was a silhouette by the orange glow of the security light. The figure looked to be that of a small girl. I freaked the fuck out, but I thought that maybe she was in some kind of trouble. Here's where I made a big mistake. I slowly and quietly unlocked the door to investigate. She then immediately turned the doorknob and threw her body weight into the door, forcing it open and me against the wall. The only light on at the time was from my TV. And the next thing I knew, this girl was stumbling into my apartment like a zombie. I quickly turned a light on to see a dark-skinned, dark-haired girl, probably in her late 20s. She was about 5 foot 4, maybe about 110 pounds, soaking wet. She wore a tank top and shorts. I'm not a big guy. I'm around 5 foot 10 and 155 pounds, but I arrogantly consider myself physically superior to her. She turned towards me and her eyes were closed. I immediately grabbed her by the arm saying, what the hell are you doing? This is my place and you need to leave. She replied, I have to come in. I'm cold. Now mind you, it's the middle of August and well, not cold at all outside. After I got a hold of her arms, I was amazed at the strength that she had. I was trying to imagine what was going on with her. I managed to get around behind her and pin her arms back and attempted to drag her out of my apartment. I was in no position to call the cops seeing how my hands were full and I had no idea where my phone was. As I began to drag her out, saying, you need to leave now, she flung her head back into my face bloodying my nose and lip. I maintained my composure and went outside to ask my neighbor for help. The only problem was that my nearest neighbor was directly across from me and their door was wide open and the other surrounding apartments were vacant. She remained in my apartment, just standing there, facing me with her eyes closed. She yelled, Come in here! I replied, Okay, I guess I will. I re-entered my apartment, and this time, a little angry, but mainly just confused. I once again grabbed her by both arms, blood streaming down my face and neck. This time, I wasn't letting her fight back. I dragged her outside, and she put up a little resistance. I took her inside the apartment across from me, believing this was where she lived. After all, all the other apartments around me are empty. There appeared to be a tall, skinny Caucasian man passed out on the floor. I called for him, and he just moaned. After she was inside the apartment, I sat her down, and I figured that I would be a gentleman and introduce myself. My name is Jonathan, and you are? She just shouted, I'm cold! I ran back inside my apartment and locked my door. I found my phone between the couch cushions and called my apartment manager. The manager lived in the complex and had given me his cell phone number in case of an emergency. After telling him what happened, he seemed just as shocked and angry as me, and he said that he would handle it. Next thing I knew, about three cops, an ambulance, and the fire department were lining my street, lighting up the whole block. The police knocked on my door and took my statement while the apartment manager fixed me an ice pack for my busted face. I declined medical attention as well as pressing any charges, seeing how whoever this girl was, she was not of sound mind when she did this. The police told me that she was under the influence of alcohol 
and who knows what else. She ended up going to the hospital, and I never found out what happened with the man passed out on the floor. Naturally, I didn't sleep for the rest of that night, and all I can say is, crazy, druggy sleepwalker, let's not meet again. My name is Steve and this happened two years ago. I worked as a police officer. I don't want you to think that I'm full of myself, but I was the best of the best at my job. Well, that's what my coworkers told me anyway. To tell the truth, the reason I became a police officer was because of my parents. When I was 17 years old, they were murdered by a criminal who never got caught. After that happened, I decided to catch him myself. Then, finally, became an officer of the law. One day, I got a report that a serial killer who murdered 20 kids and their parents was located nearby. I went to the scene as fast as I could to capture him, but it was too late. He was already gone. A week later, I was drinking coffee at a cafe before I got back home. About five minutes after, I got a sudden call from my wife who was at home at the time with the children. There's someone in the house with a knife! She told me to come as quickly as possible and I told her to lock herself in any room with the kids until I got home. I was about to come inside with one of my fellow officers. Just then, I heard my wife screaming and saw the man when I opened the door. I immediately shot him in his hand and saw it fly off onto the ground. The other officer knocked him out. I told my wife and kids to come out. Everything is safe now! I eased her mind and asked her how he got in. She answered that the door was broken when she came back home with the kids. After that, I was watching the news at my house. It was about the criminal who broke in and threatened my family. It said that he had raped multiple children before, and then I was shocked. According to the news, he was the same one who murdered my parents. I was terrified. I couldn't breathe. My hands were trembling. He was 39 years old back then and now received the death penalty. I'm so lucky that my family is safe from him. But I still think about what would have happened had I not arrived at the right time. There are two types of people who work at McDonald's, or fast food places in general. There are ambitious, intelligent people who are trying to work hard to achieve a goal, in the hopes that one day they'll be able to quit for the sake of something better. And then there are the losers. Those with no ambition who have given up and have no desire to achieve anything other than a weekly paycheck. I like to consider myself in the first category. As I was working hard to afford my apartment while taking classes at the local community college, I normally worked the later shifts at the drive through window, which is the one spot most employees hated working the most. You constantly have to deal with extremely impatient, oftentimes very rude people who are on their phones or have music blaring and oftentimes don't realize that I wasn't the individual who took their order, so it's not my fault if it's wrong. In addition to that, you're pretty much constantly on your feet and exposed to the elements. No matter how cold, windy, or rainy it is, you have to keep leaning out into it, wishing that you were in a warm car about to drive away from this place. My point being is please try to be more kind and patient with the drive through people. Yeah, some are lazy, but most are trying their best, and even though you only see them for about half a minute, a kind remark or a warm smile might make their day. Anyways, now that I've gotten that off my chest. I work the late shift with two people who I believe qualify for the second category of employees. Connie was a high school dropout who was almost always late and was never invested in what she was doing. And Harold was a deadbeat who often smelled like weed and only kept the job because otherwise his parents would throw him out of the house. He was 32 years old. So one night I was there after 11 p.m. by the drive through window on an extremely cold January night, flipping through the pages of my class notes and trying to keep warm by the fry machine. Connie was mopping while looking at her phone, and Harold was in the back probably getting baked in the walk-in cooler. That late at night, we rarely got customers, and if we did, they were almost always zonked out college kids who used the drive through but never physically walked into the restaurant. I stood up and stretched my legs and told Connie that I was heading to the bathroom. It was around 11.30 at this point. I came back less than five minutes later, 
with Connie more or less in the same spot that she was before. I walked past her and turned the corner to return to the window and froze dead on my tracks. There was a bald man in white face makeup and a black hoodie standing directly outside the window staring in. His eyes were wide, with a blank expression that read, What kind of trouble can I create? The figure made direct eye contact with me and smirked and slammed his palm against the window. I had no idea what to do, and inside my head, the words clown, mime, psychopath, danger, and death all exploded like fireworks. The window was already shut and locked to protect myself from the cold, but the doors were all unlocked, and this person could easily walk right in and grab any one of us if he wanted to. In my head, I kept referring to it as he, but honestly, I had no idea what the gender was. The outfit and makeup made the stranger look androgynous. Open. Drawing out the word like a snake. Now, even if the figure wasn't dressed like that, I was under no obligation to open the window. It's unlawful to serve walk-ups at the drive through window, certainly for their safety, but also for ours. I shook my head and backed away. I called over my shoulder. Lock the doors. The whole time, this figure didn't break eye contact with me, and to the best of my memory, I don't even remember it blinking. It drew back its lips in a sinister smile, and I shit you not, its gums were black. I don't mean I was too far away that I couldn't see clearly, I mean its gums were as black as licorice. Oh, Ben. It hissed again, louder this time. Its other hand slammed against the window, and it licked its lips with its tongue. Oh, Ben. That's when a third hand slammed itself into the window. A left hand, and it was just as pale and as skeletal as the other two. I lost my shit. Holy shit, call the cops! I screamed and ran back into the office, which was the only room with a locking door and no windows. I heard Connie scream, What the fuck? And she dropped her mop and flew across the room and made for the back with me. All the yelling attracted Harold, and I shoved past him into the office and told him to look at the security camera. Sure enough, the white-faced creeper looked to have three hands on the window and was tilting its head back and forth, perhaps trying to discover where I ran off to. We locked the office door and called the cops, explaining to the operator that there was at least two prowlers outside acting in a threatening manner towards us. I kind of expected it to be over after I called the cops. If it was a prank, they would run once they realized they scared me enough to call 911. But it didn't end there. We watched as the figure left the drive through window, circled the building, and made for the restaurant door. Is there a second one? Look for a second one. I panicked while still on the phone with the operator. Connie was freaking out, and Harold was muttering something about not getting the police involved, likely because he was carrying weed. That's when the power went out. Everything. Cameras, lights, phone. The whole building went down. And barely 10 seconds after we all quieted down after shouting at each other in the dark, we heard footsteps in the dining room area. Connie, did you lock the doors? I whispered. She didn't reply. I think she had her hand pressed over her mouth. Oh, Ben. We heard a voice call from outside the room in the dark. Oh, Ben. The shout came at least three more times, circling from the kitchen to right off the hallway where we were hiding. I was convinced I was about to die. And every decision I had made in my life that brought me there was flashing before my eyes. We heard footsteps pass the office. After another few minutes, we heard the wail of police sirens outside. And at any moment, we expected to hear gunfire and the police shouting at someone to get on the ground. But we never did. We waited until the police identified themselves and opened the door and ran out into the parking lot. Since the power was down, we couldn't show the cops the security footage. So we just told them what we saw. They swept the whole building and said it was clear. The owner of that particular franchise store showed up about an hour later, after Harold and Connie had left. I waited for the power to be restored, so an officer could escort me back inside to collect my belongings. The next day my manager called me and asked me to work the night shift. I asked him if the creep from last night had been caught. When he said, There was no creep. I told him I quit and hung up the phone. 
this story is completely true. I have no idea what caused the power outage, which apparently erased all the security footage from the day. Without proof on video, my manager and the cops concluded that it was an elaborate prank, but that third hand still bothers me to this day, even more so than its hungry, inhuman eyes. Sure, it could have been a prank, but I wish someone would just confirm that for me, so I can sleep again. Keep your windows locked at night, and if you hear someone tapping from behind the curtains, don't open them. I experienced something in the summer of 2013 that still haunts me and continues to make me question my sanity. My girlfriend Anna and I had decided to go camping as a last farewell to summer and to get some alone time. She'd be going back to college soon after and I wouldn't see her as often. We'd been together for over two years then and I was completely head over heels for her. I was even thinking about asking her the question. So on a weekend in early August, I packed up my camping gear, driving 45 minutes away to the park we often frequented. It was a nice park, thick with trees and wildlife, along with a small creek running through it. We knew the area well, since my friends and family had camped there since childhood. I sent a text to Anna after parking my car, letting her know that I'd made it and I'd set up camp in our favorite spot. You see, Anna had been caring for her sick grandmother all summer, and her sister had finally agreed to watch her so that Anna could get away for a while, but she had to wait for her sister to get off work around 5 p.m. to relieve her. To save time, I'd volunteered to go ahead and set things up. I trekked up the trail a bit until I found the spot we always camped at. It was nice and level and was right beside the creek. I immediately started setting up the tent. I wanted to get everything done fast so Anna didn't have to help. 40 minutes later, I had it all set up. The tent, the sleeping bags, a little fire, everything was organized and cozy. My phone suddenly buzzed. It was a text from Anna. I have something to tell you, it read. Just as I began to text her back, I heard footsteps coming down the path. My body tensed up a bit, because you can never tell what kind of people you might run into out here. We had on a number of occasions met with a few drunks and the occasional rowdy teenager out here, but I soon relaxed as I saw Anna step out from behind the trees with a big grin on her face. I walked up and hugged her, scooping her up off the ground a bit to make her giggle. I set her back down and asked her what she had wanted to tell me. I love you, was the reply I got from her as she planted a kiss on my cheek. Her voice though, it sounded different and her lips were chillingly cold. I asked her if she felt sick. She simply shrugged off the question and went to check out our campsite. I gave her a brief tour before I set about cooking the dinner. I made us each one of those prepackaged camping meals that you add hot water to. It was pasta alfredo, and I opened a bottle of red wine to go with it. We sat around the fire, eating, while I tried my best to entertain her with some funny stories. The sun was setting, and I was having a great time. I watched the shadows dance off of her and the surrounding trees. I listened to the gentle motion of the nearby creek the daylight was almost gone when she said she was cold. I mentioned she could go in the tent to warm up while I cleaned up from dinner. She made her way inside, but not before giving me a smile and another freezing cold kiss. I was starting to get worried about her. I wondered if she was getting sick, but I didn't want to nag her, so I didn't say anything. I busied myself with cleaning up our dinner and it was then that I found Anna's plate of food that she had set off to the side on the ground. She hadn't even touched it. I also found her glass of wine nearby, tipped out onto the grass. This wasn't like her at all. That girl loved food, and that particular wine was her favorite. At this point, I was more than a little worried. 
So I headed into the tent to ask her if she was feeling sick and to suggest that we pack up and get a motel for the night. But when I unzipped the tent and crawled in, I found her sound asleep in her sleeping bag. I contemplated waking her up so we could leave, but she looked so relaxed that I decided against it. I went back outside and finished cleaning up camp, putting out the fire before I laid down next to her in my own sleeping bag. I had had a bit too much wine and I fell asleep quickly. Morning came soon enough and filled the tent with a soft glow as I listened to the birds singing outside. Anna was still sound asleep, so I decided to get up and start some breakfast. 15 minutes later, I was admiring the meal I made. Well, as much as one can admire slightly runny scrambled eggs from a pouch. I poked my head back into the tent to tell Anna that breakfast was ready, but that's when things got even weirder. Anna wasn't there. I didn't think it was likely that she could have left the tent without me seeing her, but maybe she had done so while my back was turned. I waited for a bit, figuring she stepped out when nature called. About 15 minutes passed, and I was starting to get worried. I walked to the edge of the campsite and called out for her, but there was no response. I walked to the trail and called out her name as I walked up and down the path each way, but still nothing. I went back to the campsite and checked the tent, but it was still empty. I searched for her belongings, but that's when I realized she hadn't brought a thing with her. I couldn't even remember her checking her phone last night which she was in the habit of doing. She always checked her phone, always brought it with her in case her grandma needed her. That's when I grabbed my phone and decided to text her. I didn't have any signal, so I walked back up the trail a bit to the truck where I knew the signal was good. That's when the text messages started flooding my screen. All of them were from Anna. My hands began to tremble as I read. I have something to tell you. That was the text I saw earlier. I went on. It's bad news. My grandma just passed away. Are you there? Can you meet me at grandma's when you can? I can't go camping tonight, I'm sorry. We should reschedule. Where are you? Fine, I'll be at my sister's house for the night. Call me when you can. My hands were shaking so violently that I dropped my phone. My mind reeled so fast that I had to fight to not pass out. I ran back to the campsite and searched it, but there was no evidence of Anna or anyone else being there. I checked the tent to look at her sleeping bag that had clearly been used last night. I even checked the garbage bag to confirm that there were, in fact, two plates from dinner last night, one with food still on it. I ran back to the truck and sent Anna a text because I didn't trust my voice not to tremble if I called her. I told her I got really sick last night and couldn't text her back. I apologized profusely and offered my condolences about the passing of her grandma. She texted me back letting me know she was okay and that I would see her later today. I walked back to camp in a daze. My mind seemed to want to shut down. It couldn't process what had happened. At first, I thought I was going crazy. I thought I'd had a breakdown and imagined everything. But the used sleeping bag and uneaten dinner told me differently. Who or what kept me company last night? Who or what could look just like Anna, but not be her? Had it been a ghost? A doppelganger? A shapeshifter of some kind? Was all of it just a sick joke? I packed up camp with difficulty. My stomach was in knots and my muscles were weak. I felt like I was going to get sick at any moment. I made it home and sent a text to Anna. I said I was still sick and didn't want to make her sick. I saw her next in the day of her grandma's funeral, where I easily passed off my residual anxiety about the whole ordeal as grief and sympathy. As I said at the beginning, I haven't told this story to anyone. Anna and I are now happily married and I still haven't even told her. 
We don't go camping in those woods anymore. We found a much nicer, hopefully safer spot. I look back on that night often. I replay all the scenes in my head, trying to find hints that will lead me to an explanation. But I haven't figured out anything. I still only know one thing. I spent the night with someone or something that wasn't my girlfriend. Friend. With it only being a couple of weeks before Halloween, it's reminded me of a story that happened quite a while ago. It was Halloween night and I was around seven years old just having fun trick-or-treating. There was a house nearby that was said to be abandoned because the owner had moved out. However, no one knew the reason why. I was with my dad and a couple of friends. When he got an important business call, we all decided to go knock on that house's door. So we walked up to the house, and you could tell that it had been abandoned for quite a while now. The front yard hadn't been mowed, there were leaves everywhere, and it was overall in a very bad condition. When we knocked, the door just flew open. It wasn't locked or anything. We were out of our minds and went inside. All the furniture was still intact, and at least the inside of the house looked great. And what we found still haunts me. We found a man eating a woman's face. Screaming, we rushed to escape from there. My dad came running towards us and asked us what was going on. I told him everything and he immediately called the police. However, the man was already gone when they arrived. To our surprise, the woman's lifeless body was still lying there. We later found out that the house wasn't actually abandoned. The man's wife had asked for a divorce and left the house. After that, the man fell into a seriously depressed state and didn't want to go out to get food. He eventually started grabbing anyone who walked by and would eat them, so it was literally cannibalism. It's been years now, but there's one remaining question in my head. If the man was just feeding off of people's flesh, where did he keep all the bodies? And why could the neighbors not smell anything from outside? One late night, I was walking along the path with my friend. Suddenly, I heard someone from behind us speaking quietly. Don't look back. Don't look back. If you look back, if you do that. I stopped in amazement. There was silence for a few seconds. And behind me, I could hear something ripping and a groan of pain that I don't know whether it was an animal or a human. Being seized with fear, I clenched my teeth to stop my instinctive curiosity to look back. However, when I took a peek at my friend Ken, he who seemed couldn't resist curiosity has been already looked back. Ken, who thought someone was fooling around, was smiling and looking around to see who it was. Although we couldn't see around it because it was dark already, he seemed to think it was no big deal. Just then, I heard someone scream. If you look back, you are going to die. Something flew in and stuck in Ken's body. And a moment later, he fell to the ground groaning. The knife was stuck in his leg when I looked at him in extreme fear. He screamed and shouted, don't look back! Run! I grabbed his arm and ran away like crazy. I heard a chasing sound from behind, but didn't have the courage to look back though. I'm starving! Give it to me! The man shouted and when I glanced back I could see him laughing, bleeding from his mouth, and following us like a mad holding a knife in his hand. Ken who was limping at that moment was soon caught by him. To my surprise, he grabbed Ken's leg and tried to cut out the flesh with a knife. It was like he was cutting steak something. I kicked him as hard as I could and he was eventually knocked out. We barely managed to escape and were able to get away from him. We hid somewhere and ended up calling the police. 
Soon, there was the sound of a police car. I took a look at Ken's condition and his leg's flesh was torn apart. When I asked him what had happened, Ken then replied in pain. The moment Ken looked back, he saw a homeless man who was eating something alive raw. And that man threw the knife he was holding at Ken when he met his eyes. The police later arrested him and also found a man whose flesh had been torn apart from his entire body. It turned out that man was eaten alive. Barely breathing, he eventually died on his way to the emergency room. The victim who was drunk fell unconscious on the floor at the time and was eaten by a homeless man. I still can't forget Ken's deathly pale face. If I had failed to run away that day, I might be lost some part of my body too. It was a dark, scary Halloween night in 2020. There were many kids having a fun trick-or-treating and the adults were giving out their candies. There was a group of kids who stood out whose names were Bob, Jimmy, Nick, Cameron, and Clyde. They were out all night trying to get as much candy as they could get. After they were done, they went to a bench and started eating and trading their candy. They then started to feel bored. There was nothing to do for the rest of the night. Jimmy had an idea. Guys, let's go explore the abandoned hospital down the road. I've heard it's super scary and there's a clown inside, he said. The rest of the group agreed to go. It was around 11 p.m. when they got there. The hospital was gigantic with it being around 20 floors tall and was wide. As the only girl in the group, Cameron said she was way too scared to go to the hospital. She ended up running back home. There were only four. When they went in, they could smell the dead bodies of rats and the mold that was growing in. You could see all the equipment still there and the beds scattered everywhere, with blood on the floor. After walking around for a bit, the whole group noticed that they saw something running behind them every couple of minutes. However, they didn't have any clue what it was. Then, they heard a voice telling them to get out multiple times. Get out. A couple of minutes later, they heard a piercing scream. Ah! The group looked around and realized that Clyde had disappeared. That's when it got serious. They were terrified and wanted to leave, but the doors latched shut from the outside and they were on the 12th floor. I think it's the one, the clown! Clyde! Clyde, where are you? Teary-eyed, Jimmy started yelling for Clyde. They soon accepted their situation and gave up. Nick went into one of the rooms and found many used syringes that they used to draw blood in. They took some, split up, and went to defend themselves. Since Bob was the one who was scared of little things, he just closed his eyes and swung his arm with the syringe. Jimmy, on the other hand, wanted to hunt down that clown and save their friend Clyde. Nick was just wandering around the hospital trying to find a fire escape and there he was. About 12 feet away from him, the clown was standing there. He screamed. Get out of my hospital! <laughs> However, instead of running away, Nick ran towards the clown as fast as he could, slid in between his legs, stabbed his back with the syringe, and finally ran out of the exit. He managed to unlatch the door and yelled for his friends to come back down, and the rest of them also succeeded in escaping. I'm going inside again. I have to save Clyde. When Nick told his friends, everyone tried to stop him, but he rushed inside. While he was going up the stairs, he found a baseball bat and grabbed it. After more walking, he found the clown in front of him limping. What did you do to my friend, you bastard? He yelled, but the clown just laughed like he was insane. <laughs> just then, he heard someone saying, help me, with a small voice. This time, he hit the clown right in the mouth with the baseball bat and ran towards the voice. He found Clyde locked in a room. Let's get the hell out of here. They started to run down another fire exit. When they were halfway there, they heard heavy footsteps above them. They all knew who it was. They gave it everything they got. They ran down the stairs as fast as they could and escaped from the hospital. 
While Nick and his friends were running away to the police station, they reported that they saw a clown in the abandoned hospital. To their surprise, when the police arrived at the hospital and checked inside, there was no one in there. The clown was never to be seen again. I've been in between jobs ever since I left college, doing different things here and there, odd jobs sometimes. It wasn't until I started as a 911 operator that I realized that's what I really wanted to do with my life. But it only been about four months when I received one of the most chilling, unexplainable, and spine-tingling phone calls of my life. The night it happened was a particularly grueling shift. I'd spent the last 10 hours dispatching police for the various houses. I was about two hours from finishing when I received a call from a little girl named Samantha. The following is a transcript of that call. 911 operator, what's your emergency? Hello? Mommy's fallen over. What's your name, honey? Samantha. Okay, Samantha. Can you tell me where you live? I don't know the address. Can you find me? Yes, Samantha. I can trace the call. Can you tell me what happened? Mommy's been acting all weird the past few days. Not sleeping at nights, going around scratching at the walls. I'm too scared to come out of my room. I was in bed and I started hearing this weird moaning sound. Mommy sounded like a zombie. And that's when I heard someone giggle. <laughs> What's Mommy doing right now, Samantha? Mommy's on the floor right now. She won't get up. Is she breathing? I don't know. I can't see her chest moving. I'm scared. It's okay, honey. Help is on the way. I'll need you to stay on the line until they arrive. Can you do that? Yes. Something's happening. What's happening? Mommy's twitching now. Her eyes are fluttering. That's when I hear the distinct sounds of someone moaning and the sounds of someone dragging something. I could hear Samantha's whimpering. Is someone coming? I'm scared. Yes, Samantha. They're not far away. What are those noises? It's Mommy. Samantha, what's Mommy doing? I'm hiding in my wardrobe. She's crawling on the floor like a tarantula. Her eyes have gone all weird. She's hissing and this weird foamy stuff is coming out of her mouth. Can she see you? I don't think she can see me yet. Is someone coming? Are they close? Yes, very close. Just then, I heard Samantha whisper something. Samantha, are you okay? Mommy's walking backwards now. I think she knows where I am. Her black eyes are looking right at me. Please, I'm scared. Mommy's trying to hurt me. Samantha, what do you mean your mommy's walking backwards? It's all upside down. Her legs are twisted the wrong way. Her body is normal, but her head is all backwards too. Do you know when you twist your Barbie's head? It's like that. She's shaking as she walks, kind of like a robot. She's coming. Samantha, the police are right around the corner. M mommy's smiling now. I think it's okay for me to come out. Samantha, stay where you are. Mommy? <laughs> Samantha? Samantha, the police are right outside. Mommy, please stop. You're scaring me. Samantha? Samantha? I don't want to eat that, Mommy. What do you mean it'll make me just like you? Where are we going, Mommy? Just then, I heard a piercing scream and the line went dead. When the police finally arrived at the scene, they neither found Samantha nor her mother. In fact, the house didn't look like someone had ever lived in it. They reported that the lights didn't work at all. There was no furniture and they found the decaying corpse of a dog which looked to have been dead for weeks in the middle of the living room. Insects, maggots, all kinds of detestable things were found slithering around the house. But not a trace of any living human being. Eventually... I quit my job the very next morning. That call has haunted me ever since then. I just couldn't comprehend my experience. My boss and the other officers were all adamant that they were sent to the wrong address. It was all deemed the fault of the dispatcher, me. But I know I wasn't wrong. I know the address was right and I know there was no error in the system. It wasn't my fault. I think about Samantha every day. And I pray that nothing bad happened to her. However, deep in my heart, I know that someone was pretending to be her mother. 
And that someone did something unspeakable to her. Something unthinkable. I will never forget that scream. This is a disturbing story that happened to me about four years ago. It was around December. The snowstorms were starting to come in, and it was becoming very cold. Me and my wife were trying to get everything we could before winter started, mainly food and supplies. The problem was is that we didn't have a car. We couldn't afford it. I worked a low-wage job, and was making enough to barely pay rent on our shitty old apartment. My wife usually stayed home and took care of our two-month-old baby, and I was doing the best I could to save enough money for a car. And finally, after months of saving, I had enough. One day I came home and told my wife the good news, and she was relieved. The next day we went to our local car dealership. There was only two cars on the lot, and they weren't the greatest, but the prices were very low, and as long as it got us from point A to point B, we would be happy. So we did what we needed to. Paid for it, got the keys, and drove off. The car was from 1984 and was pretty run down, but it drove just fine. Six months later, I was cleaning out the car when I noticed something odd under the back seat. It was something that I had never seen before. Despite having checked the car multiple times at this point, I looked closer, but I would need a flashlight in order to see it clearly. It looks like a black box of some kind. I thought it was just something the previous owner had left behind. Finally, curiosity got the best of me, and I pulled it out of the car. It was an old VHS tape, marked Happy Memories. It looked to be around the same age as the car. I didn't know what to do with it. I just thought it was some old home video from the previous owner, although it was pretty strange that it was hiding underneath the seat. While I didn't want to invade anyone's privacy, I decided that I wanted to see what was on the tape to satisfy my curiosity. I went up to my attic and found my old VHS player. I hadn't used it since high school, back when I threw parties and me and my buddies would watch movies on it. It was a bit dusty, but it still worked just fine. I turned it on and put in the tape. It started off pretty normal. It was a family during Christmas, people walking around, opening gifts, etc. Then things got a little uncomfortable. The husband and wife began arguing while the children were crying in the background. The argument got more and more intense as it went on. I could not make out exactly what was being said. The camera cut off and the screen was black, before cutting back into a scene that was so fucked up that it kept me up for weeks after. I will never get this image out of my head. The camera was now set up in a dark room. There was torture weapons hanging from the walls and dismembered body parts scattered across the floor. The same wife and children from the beginning were now on their knees chained together and sobbing. That's about as much detail as I'm willing to go into. There was also a man in the room whose face was cut off from the camera's view. The man stepped out of frame and switched off the overhead light. And what he said next won't stop repeating in my head. I guess this is a happy memory for someone like me. After that, all that was heard was the horrified screams of the family. I had to turn off the tape. I couldn't take it anymore. I took the tape out and just stared at it for what seemed like hours. The images of the bodies, all the blood, the terrified faces of the family were now burnt into my mind. It was hours before I said a single word to anyone. I eventually called the police and explained what I had found. After weeks of investigation, they found out that this tape was of a family who had gone missing 32 years ago. They said that their house was demolished in 2003, and a car dealership was built in its place. The exact same place where I got the car. That's when it hit me. Thinking back, the car salesman looked a lot like the husband from the beginning of the video, except a lot older. Now that I think about it, he was kind of in a hurry to get us out of there after we bought the car, shortly after the shop was closed down, and is now abandoned. A lot of my friends went there over the years and said it was a really good place for a cheap car. I would pass it every day driving to work. I'm assuming the police followed up on all of this during their investigation, but I never heard of any arrests being made, 
or further updates on the case. As far as I know, that man is still out there. My name is Skylar, and this happened to me when I was 12. It was a Saturday afternoon. My cousins were staying with my family over the weekend. My parents had to head over to the store, and my cousins and I decided to go to the nearby park to play. Before we left, we made sure the door was locked like we were supposed to. However, by the time we came back, I could see the door was open. There were even scratch marks on the handle, as if someone had tried to pick the lock by force. My older cousin Sam called my parents, and they said they were on their way. Stupidly we thought the intruder had left already, so we ended up going into the house. That was a mistake. My younger cousin, who was nine years old at the time, had to go to the bathroom, but when he stepped out, his face was frozen with fear. We asked him what happened, but he couldn't speak at all, just pointed at the bathroom. I slowly opened the door, and what I saw made my heart drop. A blood-soaked man was dead in the bathtub. I checked if he was breathing, but couldn't feel anything. It looked as if someone had attacked him. My cousins and I started panicking, realizing that there must be a second intruder somewhere in the house. We cowered together in the living room and waited for my parents. When they finally arrived, they called the police right away. During their investigation, they found out that those two men had escaped from a mental hospital nearby. It turned out that they were both trying to rob my house when one of the men lost his mind and ended up killing the other. From that day on, my parents never dared leave me home alone, and I always double-check the door before I leave. Now, I'm 15 years old, and my family has moved to Florida. However, I don't think I will ever forget the memory of that dead man in our bathtub. This happened to my father one stormy night in Glenwood, Colorado. It was the 1980s. My father was an electrical engineer who was just returning from a job site. He worked long hours, and it wasn't uncommon for him to be heading home around midnight to the small cabin he shared with a friend tucked back in the canyon walls. It was pouring rain. Lightning flashed only to illuminate the murky puddled patches of washed out terrain. As my father rounded the corner upon the dirt road, he passed a large willow tree. As his headlights crossed its base, he noticed someone was crouched underneath it. It was a woman who seemed to be in her late 20s, with long tangled blonde hair. She had on fairly casual clothing, and carried a somewhat large bundle under her arms wrapped in cloth. My father, being the gentleman that he was, decided to pull over and offered her to take shelter from the storm in his cabin, just up the road. She smiled and thanked him as she got into his vehicle. She explained that she had been on a hike through the canyon that day when the storm hit and she had been caught off guard by the rain. Dad smiled and pointed out that she wasn't exactly wearing the best clothing or shoes to go on a hike. She laughed and said that she had left her place on a whim unprepared. He asked if she needed him to dry anything at his place, pointing to the bundle she held tightly under her arm. Her voice suddenly got very stern and stated no. When my father asked her where she lived around the area, things started to get strange. She started telling my dad that she had no friends or family in the area and was quite vague when asked about details of where she lived. All she responded with was that it was too far to drive to tonight in this kind of weather. At this point, my dad said he felt that she was a bit off, but chalked it up to her exhaustion from hiking and standing out in the storm for several hours. As they entered the cabin, my dad remembered that his roommate had left that morning to take a trip out of town and wouldn't be back for several days. My dad would have offered her his friend's room, but wouldn't feel comfortable doing that without her permission. Remember this was the 1980s. Pocket cell phones weren't on everyone yet. My dad told her that she was welcome to sleep on the couch and dry off as he handed her several towels. She took them from him with her right hand, but still never let go of the bundle she hugged under her left arm. 
My dad at this point realized that she had never given him her name, so he introduced himself. Nice to meet you. My name is Mary Lou, she replied. My father started to feel a bit more at ease and turned on the television for her and handed over the remote. She scanned through the channels, finally deciding on a gangster flick. There was a scene that involved a bunch of mobsters getting shot to pieces. Mary found this to be quite amusing and started to laugh in a crackling high-pitched tone. <laughs> My dad started to get a bit creeped out by this. She was enjoying it a little too much, he said. Then my dad asked her about her life, and things took a turn for the worse. When asked if she was in a relationship, she pointed down at her belt buckle and told my dad the story of her breakup. She claimed her last boyfriend wanted to be domineering over her, and to this she responded by bludgeoning him half to death in his gravel driveway with her belt buckle, the same one she was wearing. He kept saying stop, please stop, and begging, but I wouldn't show him mercy, she said, with a note of pride in her voice. My dad asked if he had been abusing her, or if she was reacting defensively, and she merely scoffed and said, No, otherwise he would be dead. My father's unease grew as the conversations progressed. She told him about her mother dying on the operating table, and how the surgeon who had been working on her walked out covered in blood and said that she would be fine. How is she supposed to be okay with all of her guts in the trash can? She spewed. Then she laughed again, glancing back at the TV screen, littered with disheveled, bullet-ridden corpses. I love the sight of blood. It excites me. Turns me on, you know. Death. Draining them to death. At this point, my dad was officially done. He was bigger and stronger than she was, and he was quite streetwise as well, and had seen plenty of horrors in his life. But the way she spoke with a violent confidence, combined with her sure grip upon the bundle which lay under her arm, sent chills down his spine. He needed a plan. Finally, an idea popped into my father's head. I have a friend who's a priest in town. He has access to plenty of shelters funded by the church. You would be a lot more comfortable there instead of on our couch. They can feed you too, and arrange a ride for you to get home in the morning. I can call him right now. He's only a few miles from here. He stated reassuringly. Mary Lou's tone brightened to match his. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. My father smiled, hiding his relief. Of course, it's the least I could do for you. As my dad walked over to the phone and began to dial the number, Mary Lou erupted in a low guttural growl. I hate priests. I hate priests. She said it with a tired hatred, a clear, distinct, audible whispered disdain from the bottom of her heart with an unflinching resolve. My dad had enough. This wasn't a game to play anymore. This was beyond a stranger with odd tendencies. A darkness with coiled cruelty had crossed the threshold of his door. You need to leave, and you need to leave now, my dad said, pointing to the front of the cabin. There's the door. I can't have you here and feel comfortable. I'm sorry, but the storm has stopped, and I hate to have you walk in the dark, but that's the way this has to go. Please leave. Mary Lou gazed upon him, expressionless, and finally just shrugged. My father walked her out, standing close to her, in the event that the bundle concealed some type of weapon. He wasn't taking any chances. She smiled at him as she slowly walked onto the front porch. Goodbye for now. I'll see you when I see you, she said calmly. With that, she walked down the long dirt road with a single streetlight upon its path. She looked back at him one last time before crossing the light and disappearing, enveloped by the darkness with no trace of her to be seen. My dad called the police the next day, concerned that she may still be hiding on his premises somewhere. After speaking to his girlfriend about it, who is now my mom, and being convinced by her that she was going to cut the window screen when he was gone, hide in the house, and then kill him, they found nothing and said the area attracted a lot of transients and nomads. 
My father then made the mistake of telling his engineer buddies at work, which resulted in them bidding him farewell at the end of each shift, in the form of asking that he say hi to Mary Lou for them. My dad never saw her again. He still questions what could have been in that bundle that she so adamantly protected. He will never know. My name is Alexa, and this happened a month ago while I was having a sleepover at my friend's house. I'm going to call her Kate. Kate is three years older than me. I'm eleven. We were in Kate's room when her mother told us that she had to head over to the hospital. She said, Girls, close the windows and lock all the doors, okay? After she left, we went to the living room to play with Kate's dog. About an hour passed and we got kind of bored. So we ended up going out and heading to a 7-Eleven to get some snacks and chips. When we got back, I noticed that the door was just slightly open. Kate noticed it too. We were confused. Had we really left it open like that? We ended up just shrugging it off and going inside. Kate locked the door behind us. When we got up to her room, Kate's dog was there, barking at her closet. Stop! Kate told her, but she kept barking relentlessly. Just then though, I suddenly remembered the closet door had been wide open when we left. I was puzzled and started to feel a little scared at the same time. I slowly grabbed her baseball bat and swung open the closet door. What I saw inside was a clown with horrific makeup and a costume. And then I saw the knife in his hand. As soon as he saw me, he tried to stand up, but I started to swing the bat over and over, screaming. I couldn't stop even while Kate was calling the police. Just before he passed out, I could definitely hear him say, Y'all can't escape. There are more of us out there. When the police finally arrived, we told them everything. While the clown was dragged out of the house, he kept staring and grinning at me. He smiled and what he told me. Still creeps me out. This tragic incident happened three years ago. I need to explain my family first to help you understand my story. I used to live with my dad, mom, and older brother. Since I was young, my dad always fought with my mom, so my brother and I always spent the night shivering in fear. My mom was full of bruises and scars from being beaten by dad, and there were many times when her life was almost in danger. Three years ago, it was when I was 17. Being a grown-up, we were already used to dad's violence. Whenever he got violent, I screamed and threw myself to stop him, but it didn't always stop so easily. My brother would just quietly get out of the house. I understood him. There was really no way to stop our dad. It was the same day as usual. That night as well, my dad threw liquor bottles and cursed at us. He wielded the knife like he was really going to kill us and my mom got cut and bled while protecting us. I was crying with fear. Then someone knocked on the door outside. Piss off, you son of a bitch! My dad shouted. However, the knocking continued. My dad ended up opening the door in anger. To our surprise, a man in a clown costume and mask stood outside. My dad yelled and cursed at the man to get away, but the clown stood there still. Who the fuck are you? My dad cursed at him for a long time and turned around. Just then, the moment he turned around, the clown hit his head with a hammer from behind. Dad fell down on the floor and ended up dead while convulsing. And then I heard a sobbing sound. <laughs> <laughs> the clown was sobbing, shaking his shoulders like crazy, and walked away. After a while, the police who received the report rushed to the scene and quickly caught the clown. And the moment they unmasked the clown, I collapsed to the floor. I was in a breathtaking shock on the spot. It was my brother. Although tears were flowing from his eyes, I could see he was smiling. He kept muttering as he was arrested by the police. 
It's all over now. It's all right. It's all right. To this day, I am unable to forget about that day. I just live in the nightmare. But I never blame him at all. He just wanted to end this hell. It happened when I was in high school. I went to see an abandoned house with my friend. I was wandering around the house with him, but there wasn't much there. Just then, I found light leaking from the stairway down to the basement. When we went down the stairs to the basement, there was a man. No, it wasn't a man. It was a devil. The moment I saw him, I couldn't lift a finger. My whole body was stiff. As soon as my friend saw his face, he ran away with unbelievable speed. I thought it was a dream, but it was a clear reality. His face, skin, and eyes were all reddish. He was the devil himself. When he looked at me, he smiled and said softly, Oh, the lamb is lost. Do you know where this place is? Holding a whip in one hand, he came close. Looking closely, I could see what was wrong with his skin. He had terrible burns all over his body. I mumbled, Oh God, there is no God, so I became the son of the devil. As he approached, I was immediately struck by the smell of blood. I think he was some sort of Satanist. There were various items symbolizing Satan, paintings of goats, snakes, and other reptiles. Believe in Satan, then you shall receive everything you want, as long as you devote your soul to him. He held out a glass full of blood to me. Take of all the pleasures and desires you want, everything will be yours. Then he started uttering some spell in an ancient language. Tana bola kidin, soba tahir gunope pera adil, das varubes hotele begrablam. Just then, I felt a strong urge to drink it. I don't know why, but I almost did it. However, I came to my senses and refused. He then laughed and drank the blood. A moment later, he grabbed my face with his hand and vomited blood on it. Drink it! Satan wants your body! I freaked out and barely covered my face with my arms. The blood he spat out spread everywhere. Again, he put a cup to my mouth and tried to make me drink the rest of the blood. Desperately closing my mouth shut, I pushed him off and ran away. I finally climbed the stairs and ran outside instantaneously. I knew something bad would happen if I stayed there for another minute. He stood still behind me, not catching me running away, just chanting spells in a devilish voice. Just then, I heard thousands of people scream painfully in the back. I felt like I was in the pit of hell, but I knew that there was just me and him. When I came out, Everything was calm again, as if nothing had happened. Leaves swaying in the wind, birds flying. Everything seemed peaceful. I felt so weird. Could there be another world that exists that I don't know? To this day, my doubts are not gone. He had already escaped when the cops arrived on the scene. Only the bodies of the dead snakes and reptiles were found. Even now, he sometimes appears in my dreams and seduces me. He crams a cup of blood into my mouth and I wake up struggling desperately. And when I wake up, I feel the taste of blood and suffer from a massive thirst for it. To tell the truth, I'm afraid that my soul will be taken by Satan one day. Dear God, please save me from this fear. This story is about my ex-girlfriend. She was a lovely woman whom I met about five years ago when I was 20 years old. I loved her with all my heart. However, I was getting tired of her growing obsession and violent behavior. I realized that her mental age was lower than the average person's, and whenever she got angry, she cursed me with what she called a magic wand. I then had to pretend to be under her spell and suffer from it. 
I couldn't stand it, so I broke up with her. She didn't take it well and started stalking me for almost a year. I will dedicate your soul to the devil. She cursed me with these words, and since then, there has always been a dead body of a mouse or a cat in front of my house. Eventually, I blocked all contact and managed to escape from her. However, she eventually showed up in front of me five years later. We ran into each other at a friend's party and she greeted me with a familiar lovely face. Seeing that, I felt like I had forgotten all of my past wounds. It was nice to see her rather than hate her. It almost seemed as if nothing had happened. Then she suddenly asked me to have dinner sometime. At first, I wanted to say no, but then decided to accept her offer as I thought it would be okay to just have dinner with her. Surprisingly, she was very kind and didn't show any violent tendencies like in the past. We had a great time at the restaurant, and after the meal, she suggested going to her house for another drink. I accepted the offer as my caution against her had been lifted. However, I was surprised to see the state of her house when I arrived. The floor was littered with trash and dolls as if it hadn't been cleaned for months, and there was this unknown stench from somewhere hitting my nose. But she acted so casually that I, who was freaked out at the moment, pretended that everything was fine. Then, there was one thing that caught my eye. Through the slightly open door of her room, I could see an awl stuck through a doll. I was horrified for a moment, but tried not to show my fear. While she brought us a drink and we drank together, I was thinking about how to get out of there. She must have noticed something strange too. Her expression started to stiffen. She then went to the bathroom for a while. In the meantime, I went into a room to check what was inside. And when I saw what it was, I dropped my can of beer. Dozens of dolls, not just one, were stuck through with an awl. The creepy thing was, some of the dolls had pictures of men on their faces, and mine was there too. The doll's belly was torn apart and its arms and legs were also torn. I could see deadly weapons, dog necklaces, and a whip on the desk. I realized that something terrible would happen if I didn't get out of there. Just then, I heard her voice behind me. Finally, I got you! She was smiling brightly when I turned around with a deadly <laughs> pale face. I finally got you! She had a net and a Pokeball from Pokemon in both her hands. Come to me! Smiling brightly, she stretched out her arm. As I stood there with an absurd expression, her expression slowly began to stiffen. Then she picked up the knife from the desk and jumped at me. I screamed, pushed her off, and ran like crazy. Come back, honey! You're mine! Leaving her scream behind me, I ran out. Just then, I felt like I heard someone moan in another room. But I ran away anyway and immediately called the police. To my surprise, two men were found inside when police rushed into her house. They were dressed in animal clothes, had a dog necklace around their necks, and ate with a dog bowl. It turned out that they were all her ex-boyfriends. Being stabbed and wounded, they were held in captivity at her home for weeks. Luckily they were rescued, and she was eventually arrested. To this day, I'm still suffering from the terrible memories of that time. If I hadn't gotten away from her, I would have become one of her Pokemon. I used to live in this small, sleepy forest town, which at the time was notorious for being the most boring place to raise a family in the Midwest. That never bothered me very much. I liked the isolation and the privacy, and the knowledge that those late-breaking violent stories you hear on the news would never involve us. I lived about a minute away from a large open field, where I could easily walk for about 15 minutes without ever having to set foot on concrete. One day last summer, I was taking my dog Oscar for a walk across the field pretty early in the morning as I usually did. But today something happened to catch my eye immediately after I went through the fence. 
About 15 meters to the left of the entry gate is an old fishing pit that was surrounded by overgrown bushes with barbed wire. So I heard something rustling from the undergrowth, and I stopped to investigate. I noticed the outline of someone standing under the shadows of the trees, staring at me without moving. Completely taken aback and slightly unnerved, I decided to just keep walking my dog as if I hadn't seen anything. I usually play music on my phone, but after that chilling encounter, I had no intention of doing so, just in case that person decided to try and come at me from behind. After walking for another 15 minutes, I completed my loop around the field and was making my way back when I noticed a tall man walking from the grassy area around the fishing pit to the gate. It was hard to tell because of the distance, but I would say he was around 30 years old and well built. I made sure to keep my distance and decided to play fetch with my dog for a while and give him time to leave as my gut feeling was telling me that it wasn't a good idea to approach him. After a short while, I made sure the coast was clear and called my dog back over to me and reattached his leash. As we were making our way out of the field through the gate where we originally entered, Oscar started pulling at his leash and sniffing around the bushes where I had first noticed the silhouette of the man. I tugged at the leash and called my dog's name, but he refused to obey, which was strange because he usually didn't give me any trouble. I walked towards him to grab his collar, nervously scanning the area again for the strange man, when I noticed a piece of blue cloth on the other side of the barbed wire divider that surrounds the fishing pit. I tied my dog to a nearby stump, carefully climbed over the fence, and went to investigate. This next part is very difficult for me to recount, because while a part of me is pleased my actions that day brought light to a violent crime, and brought closure, however horrific, to someone's family. Another part of me wishes I had just been less patient and kept tugging at my dog, because the nightmares have yet to stop. There was a body of a young girl covered in bruises all over her face and lacerations to her wrists. Fresh blood was pooling under the gash in her neck. Her eyes were all puffy like she had been crying for a very long time. I couldn't even begin to imagine what she had been put through. After calling the police, I sat by the gate and waited what was probably only about eight minutes, but it felt like a lifetime. Even though I obviously knew she was dead, when I overheard the ambulance attendant confirm it, I threw up all over the grass. The police tried asking me questions, and I told them what I could recall about the stranger. While my dog whined and tried to nuzzle me while I sat on the grass, a week later, I read in the newspaper that the young girl was a 12-year-old named Megan that had gone missing no more than five minutes away from my house. She had been sexually assaulted before being murdered. After three months of continuous searching, nobody matched the vague description of the man I had given the police. More than a few times, I've noticed people in my own town giving me sideways glances that feel more like suspicion than pity, and that's almost more than I can bear. Please just remember to keep things in perspective, no matter how shitty a day you're having. However many trivial inconveniences you have to endure, you were at least lucky enough not to have found a dead child while enjoying your daily routine. My thoughts and prayers go out to that poor girl's family. During the late 90s, I was at a very low point in my life. I was a drug addict wandering the streets of downtown Los Angeles eating out of trash cans, sleeping under bridges, and asking random bypassers for spare change. Looking back, I have nothing but regret for that time in my life, but this story is about the incident that made me sober up and turn my life around. One night, I was sleeping under a secluded highway overpass. It was fairly isolated because of its location on the outskirts of the city, and saw little to no police presence. My sleeping spot overlooked a concrete foundation that had stretched on for about 50 yards. It was a pretty long walk to get back to the city from this area, so after a long day of panhandling, I slipped into my sleeping bag and began to doze off. I was suddenly woken up by the sounds of screaming. I turned on my side to see a car parked under the overpass. There were no lights on, but the vehicle's windows were down 
and I could tell that there was a commotion taking place inside the cab. Now, I know what you might be thinking. At first, I thought the same thing too. Maybe someone was getting lucky, but these were not screams of pleasure. They were screams of agony. I watched in horror as the passenger side door of the car then flung open and a skimpily dressed woman exited the car. She was holding her leg and was trying her best to limp away from the car. I was frozen in place, almost not believing what I was witnessing. The girl was begging for her life as she awkwardly staggered away from the vehicle. The driver's side door then opened and a figure emerged from the car. The person that emerged from the car then pointed a gun at the girl, then shot her. I remember closing my eyes as soon as the gun went off and then opening them to see the woman sprawled out on the ground. She was on her back and the way her head was positioned was as if she was looking at me. Her jaw was going up and down like she was trying to say something. The memory of seeing her like that, well, it still really haunts me. The shooter made his way over to her. When he stepped into the light, I could see that he was wearing a dark hooded jacket with a bandana hiding his face. He stood over her and just watched her for several seconds, then finishing her off with the second shot. I was absolutely petrified at what I had just witnessed. I was now sitting up in my sleeping bag with one hand over my mouth, just trying my best to not make a sound. But what happened next was a whole new level of fucked up. The headlights of another vehicle at the opposite end of the overpass flicked on and drove up to the gruesome scene. At first I was relieved and I stupidly thought that these people were there to help, not even factoring in that a bystander wouldn't just casually drive up to the scene of a crime with a killer still there with a loaded gun. But things became clear to me once I noticed that the other vehicle was a black van. And things became even more clear once I saw three men wearing ski masks exiting the van with one of them holding a video camera. These sick fucks were filming this entire thing. There was an exchange of words, and the other two men that exited the van walked over to the dead woman and grabbed her arms and legs, then proceeded to carry her body back to the car. The shooter had made his way over to the car before they got there, and the cameraman sat off to the side and filmed the entire thing. The shooter popped open the trunk, and the men heaved the corpse into it. The cameraman then joined them at the car for a nice close-up shot. The shooter then walked over to the van then returned with two gas cans. The men doused the car in gasoline and the shooter struck a match and threw it and the car was instantly engulfed in flames. The foreman and myself watched as the car burned. As I stared into the fire, I became numb. I had apparently reached my scare limit and now was just angry. Angry at these animals for what they had done. Even if the woman was an addict or a hooker, no one deserves to die like that murdered under an overpass in cold blood. The fact that there were others there filming the whole thing pissed me off even more. The four men eventually piled back into the van, then left. A short while later, I had emerged from the overpass and made my way to the nearest payphone to call the police. I don't think the police took me seriously at first until I led them to the burning car. I was questioned for hours by detectives, and yes, they did suspect me, a homeless junkie of foul play but I stuck to my story. They did keep me in a holding cell for a few days, which they probably couldn't legally do, but I honestly didn't really mind at all. Free showers and food. I was actually a bit bummed out when they eventually released me. I later found out that there were similar killings in San Francisco and Sacramento, and that the perpetrators were wanted by the FBI. I don't know for sure if they ever caught them. I only hope that they did. After that night, I decided that I had enough of living on the streets. The fear I experienced inspired me to get my shit together, finish college, and become an English teacher. I'm proud to say that I've been sober for over 23 years. Sometimes seeing the ugliest side of humanity, well, I think that's the cure. This happened to myself and a friend of mine. We're both 23-year-old males. We decided to go on a two-night backpacking camping trip to the Adirondack Mountains of New York. We are both very comfortable with nature and spend a lot of time outside hunting, camping, and fishing. We hiked about five miles to get to a small lake so we could set up camp on the beach. We didn't really expect to run into anyone else. 
Our first night there, as we were sitting around the fire, we saw a flashlight moving on the other side of the lake around 10.30. This was fairly unusual. However, we did not think much of it. But as time went on, this flashlight kept moving around the lake, getting closer to our campsite. We kept discussing who could possibly be wandering around the woods in the middle of the night. We did not want to deal with any unwelcomed guests. Once it was clear that the person, or people, were heading for our campsite, we moved off into the nearby woods to see who wandered up. I took a small axe with me and my friend had a 22 rifle. Now we weren't expecting any trouble, and we certainly didn't want to make any, but we figured we might as well cover our bases. Now the moment of truth. The flashlight comes near the light of our fire, and it's one man. He has a beard and was probably in his mid-forties. The scary part was that he was carrying what turned out to be a pump-action shotgun. He walked around our campsite a few times and then proceeded to enter our tent. After rummaging around for about a minute, he came out and started yelling. I know you're out there. Why don't you come and say hello? My friend and I remained motionless under a hemlock tree about 50 yards away. That's when the man proceeded to fire his shotgun into the woods, not too far from where we were. He also swung his flashlight around several times. After what felt like hours, he grabbed my friend's backpack and a few articles of clothing that we had drying near the fire and threw them in to burn. My friend had the 22 rifle trained at the man. He asked me if he should shoot. I told him absolutely not, unless he spots us and starts pointing the gun in our direction. Thankfully the man moved off after a while. We waited until his flashlight was on the other side of the lake. Then we ran out and grabbed everything we could fit in my pack and took off. It was now 2 or 3 AM. We ran out the trail with our flashlights and made it back to my car as the sun was coming up. We immediately went to the police department and reported it where we also spoke with some forest rangers. And that was it. I still haven't heard anything back from the police. And this experience creeped the hell out of both of us. I often used the subway to go to work in the morning. One day, when I was waiting for the train, I noticed a homeless man standing in a corner of the subway station, muttering to himself as people passed by. He was holding out a cup and seemed to be begging for spare change. A fat woman passed by the homeless man and I distinctly heard him say, Pig. Wow, I thought to myself. This homeless man is insulting people and he still expects them to give him money? Then a tall businessman went by and the homeless guy muttered, Human. Human? I can't argue with that. Obviously he was human. The next day, I arrived early at the subway station and had some time to kill, so I decided to stand close to the homeless man and listen to his strange mutterings. A thin, haggard-looking man passed in front of him, and I heard the homeless guy mutter, Cow. Cow? I thought. The man was much too skinny to be a cow. He looked more like a turkey or a chicken to me. A minute or so later, a fat man went by, and the homeless man said, Potato. Potato? I was under the impression that he called all fat people pig. That day, at work, I couldn't stop thinking about the homeless man and his puzzling behavior. I kept trying to find some logic or pattern in what he was muttering. Perhaps he has some kind of psychic ability, I thought. Maybe he knows what these people were in a previous life. Many people believe in reincarnation. I observed the homeless man many times and began to think my theory was right. I often heard him calling people things like rabbit or onion or sheep or tomato. One day, curiosity got the better of me and I decided to ask him what was going on. As I walked up to him, he looked at me and said, Bread. I tossed some money into his cup and asked him if he had some kind of psychic ability. The homeless man smiled and said, Yes, indeed. I do have a psychic ability. It is an ability I obtained years ago 
but it's not what you might expect. I can't tell the future or read minds or anything like that. Then what is your ability? I asked eagerly. The ability is merely to know the last thing somebody ate, he said. I laughed because I realized he was right. He said bread. The last thing I had eaten for breakfast that day was toast. I walked away shaking my head. Of all the psychic abilities someone could have, that one must be the most useless. I used to live with my husband and our lovely son. However, our family was unhappy. We had always struggled with poverty ever since my son was born. At times, we suffered hunger, and it caused many arguments between us. My husband hadn't worked for 13 years and spent his days drinking. We were just barely getting by with whatever money I could bring. In time, we found out that our son suffered from mental health problems. However, I ended up keeping him in the house because I didn't think it was too serious. We'd never had any major accidents after all, until the incident. One day, I brought home a watermelon that I had received from one of my friends. It was sweet and delicious. After finishing the watermelon, my son was so happy. He said it was the best thing he'd ever eaten. I was pleased that I could share it with him. But no one expected the disaster it would bring. In the following weeks, he became madly obsessed with watermelons. He pestered me day after day to buy him another, and started to get angry when I told him that we just didn't have the money. Once I woke up to him standing by the bed, staring down at me. I want to eat a watermelon! A sweet watermelon! His frantic shrieks scared me so badly. I started to take money away from our necessities, just so that I could buy him a watermelon or two every day. Whenever he woke up, he would look for the watermelons and eat them. However, he kept saying that the watermelons I brought home didn't taste the same. Not like the one my friend had given me. Sometimes he'd even throw away the half-eaten melons in anger and scream his rage. I felt so helpless, but still, I didn't want to take my child to a mental hospital. So, I decided to wait a little longer, hoping that his condition would improve. And it did. He started to seem a little happier, more stable again. I even got brave enough to tell him that our financial situation had worsened and that I couldn't buy watermelons for a while. He seemed to take the news with surprising patience. I was relieved. Then, one morning, I woke up to my son's screams. Where's the watermelon? Give me the watermelon! My husband and I rushed to the kitchen. I could see our son rummaging through the fridge and kitchen cabinets. When he noticed us, he started to stumble over. There was a kitchen knife in his hand. Where's my watermelon? Watermelon. A sweet watermelon. His eyes seemed to roll in his head in an unnatural, terrifying way. And then suddenly, without any warning, he stabbed my husband to the side of his head. Fresh blood splashed all over. I could just stand there in utter shock. It felt like I wasn't really there. It just couldn't be real. Then my son shouted with a white smile. I found it! That finally snapped me back to reality. I started screaming and called the police immediately. By the time they arrived, my husband was already dead. They found our son holding his head, crying and mumbling that the watermelon tasted odd. When he saw me with the police, he tried to come at me with the knife too. Another watermelon. The police overpowered him and took the knife away. At that point, I just passed out. After that, my son was confined to a mental hospital. The nurses tell me that he's still trying to search for his sweet watermelon. Do not ever meet a stranger on the internet. I don't remember any happy memories in my life. 
My depression was getting worse day by day. I wanted to die. However, I wanted to live. It's ironic. I wanted to regain my will to live. This dying life sucked. So one day I posted on the internet, I want to commit suicide. Everybody was just saying stereotype things. Life is beautiful, love yourself, blah, blah, blah. Then suddenly I saw someone's comment caught my eyes. I'll make you want to live for 100% sure. It was interesting. So I replied, how? Then I saw another reply. We have to meet first. That's the only way I can cure you. It's up to you to believe or not, but just keep in mind that your choice can change your life. We exchanged contacts and met soon. The man was more handsome than I thought. He was kind and trustworthy. He led me to his house. The house was like an abandoned one. There was nothing inside. Now it's simple. I'm going to kill you. If you want to survive, you have to kill me first. What? Are you insane? No way, I'm going home. You said you want to live. This is the best way. Just trust me. Then he took out the knife from his pocket. I said, no, don't do this to me. He forced me into grabbing his knife. I could see his eyes were already insane. Just then, he posed to fight with me. Let's fight. You've lost the meaning of life, right? You don't know why you have to live. So just fight with me. Burn your will to live. I tried to escape, but he caught me and knocked me over on the floor. If you kill me, you can live. And you get your will back to life. How is it? I'm your savior. Oh, you don't have to appreciate it. So stab me or you're dead meat. My body trembled. I've never felt this fear in my life. Hurry, stab me. He then started punching me like crazy. A massive pain rushed like a flood. I kicked him and he fell back. However, he jumped up and rushed back to me. He kept yelling at me to stab him. And this time he even bit my leg. I tore off his hair desperately to pull him off. He wouldn't stop when his hair fell out and I could see a hole from his top of the head. He was literally like a dog. And I felt the blood flowing down my legs vividly. He didn't stop. Whenever he kept biting and hitting me, the memories of my life and all the faces of my family passed before my eyes. Being terrified, I cried and begged him. Help me, I don't want to die, please. Then he stopped and stared at me. This time, I knelt down and begged again. Do you want to live? Yes, please, please. His expression slowly changed mildly. See, you are saved. Now, you do want to live. Yes, now I am all good. I want to live. Please let me go. He looked at me quietly and said with a smug look on his face as if he had done something great. Hey, remember, I saved your life. So don't you dare call the cops. Then he left. After that, it took me a long time to get back to my daily routine after getting treatment. I've been hospitalized and I'm also still in psychiatric care. I eventually ended up reported to the police and they tracked him. Then he was found stabbed and horribly murdered at home. It turned out this man was stabbed to death while assaulting another person. The person who stabbed him was also seriously injured and is now in critical condition. According to the police, more than 18 people have been found to have been assaulted by this man so far. One day, I saw a posting on this website.
The writer continued to post once every week for several years. It was a long story of a woman he was looking for, including a picture of her face, her age, her characteristics, etc. He insisted that they were a married couple, but one day, she suddenly went missing. He said it's been nine years since then. Saying that he did everything to find her, he was finally appealing with this. He said he would give $10,000 to whoever found her. While reading his posting, I found out that the neighborhood where the woman lived was the same area as mine. I thought maybe I've seen her somewhere, so I sent him a message saying that I could help. I soon got a reply from him. If you find her, I'll give you money or whatever you want. I looked at her picture and went out to find the traces based on what he had told me. The restaurants, bars, parks, etc. I went everywhere she used to go and found out if anyone looked similar to her. However, it eventually all been for nothing. I ended up giving up and forgot about it. Several seasons passed since then, and autumn came. While walking down the street, I saw a woman passing by me who looked really familiar. Feeling strange, I suddenly stopped in the spot and looked back at her. Obviously she wasn't someone I knew, so then... Just then, the lightning seemed to strike my head. She was the one that the man was looking for. I called out to her, my heart pounding in the moment. She asked me what was that about and I explained the whole story to her. After that, I could see her facial expression frown. And to my surprise, what she told me was a total shock. The man was just a guy who she met at a bar 10 years ago. Just one day, just a few hours. Those two were not in a relationship and had never been married. He was just a stranger. However, he kept looking for her for over 10 years. Well, it's horrifying. She eventually got mad and left. I got a number from her just in case, and that's when I started agonizing. Maybe I could receive the $10,000 if I tell him. I started to search the mailbox and soon found his address. I wrote down a whole story about what had happened that day. The next day, I got a reply from him saying that it's for sure his wife and he wanted to know her phone number. At first, I didn't want to tell him since I was kind of worried about her, but he kept contacting me. If you tell me your number in the right place where you met her, I'll give you that money, I promise. Being blinded by money, I ended up giving him information. Eventually, he sent the money. I honestly couldn't believe it. After that... I forgot about it again and everything seemed to be as normal. Then, one day, I heard from a friend that a woman was horribly murdered in our neighborhood. And the next part of the story made me feel weak at the knees and fall down on the spot. The criminal was the same guy who had been searching for her for 10 years. I ran frantically to the computer and logged onto the website where he wrote his posting. And there was a new post written by him. Finally, I found her. I clicked on it and started to read. With the help of my friend who I met in this community, I was finally able to find her. Although she didn't recognize me, it was okay, because I remembered her. When I kissed her, she hit me in the face, and her reaction made me go crazy. I couldn't believe this was the result of waiting ten years. With a blaze of anger, I decided to get her out of my head. However, I failed. I couldn't get her out of my mind. During these ten years, I haven't forgot about her for a single day. So I made the inevitable choice. If I can't get her out of my head, then I would get rid of her in real life. If she doesn't exist in the real world, that means she doesn't exist in my head anymore, right? I was in shock. And when I clicked my mailbox, I found another email from him. He told me to return the money he had sent, insisting that our deal was invalid. His reasoning was that she was no longer the same woman he was looking for because she had already changed. I never actually replied to him, but he kept sending emails. I will find you, and I will make you the same as her. Please look forward to it, my friend. I eventually ended up calling the police and they started searching for him. A few days later, another eye-catching posting was put on the website. 
I'm looking for a guy who I love. It said that someone was looking for a man, and it was similar to the prior posting about someone looking for a woman. Shockingly, all the information about the neighborhood where he lived and the appearance of him was all in accordance with me. He literally posted my approximate information on the website referring to my email address and my profile picture. He also said he would pay money to anyone who finds me. I'm so terrified. I feel like he'll find me and kill me someday. A few days ago, someone came and talked to me on the street. He was a stranger, but he stared at my face and tried to continue a meaningless conversation, so I had to run away. I think there are people looking for me to get that money. Now I can't go out of my house. I have to stay inside. Please, somebody help me. All throughout the mid to late 90s, I spent my time alternating back and forth between my parents who had divorced when I was six. During the summer, I preferred staying at my dad's single-story ranch-style house in a quiet cul-de-sac as opposed to my mom's place in the city. My dad's place was much quieter and had a better feeling of privacy with its big, fenced-in backyard. During the warmer months, I would enjoy sleeping with my window cracked open and my fan on. In the city, it was always too noisy to have a window open at night. I remember at the time, my dad was usually working late and would arrive home around 8pm or later. So the majority of the day I was alone. I would spend my time on my dad's computer, using the dial-up internet. Back in those days, if you wanted to use internet, you had to keep in mind that you were sacrificing your ability to use the phone. You also had to sit at a desk all day when you surfed the web. On this particular day, it was getting pretty late, and I had been sitting for a while. So I decided to get up and make myself a snack. The sunlight was fading outside, and it was just starting to get dark. But I didn't turn on any lights as I walked down the hallway and turned into the kitchen. Using the light from inside the fridge, I began to shuffle around looking for something to make a sandwich out of, when I heard something that made me pause. Back inside my room, I had a lamp on my nightstand that had these tiny charms hanging from the shade. Whenever I went to raise or lower my window, the nightstand would shake and the charms would make tiny wind chime type sounds. I was used to the sound, but I had never once heard it from outside my room because I was the only one who ever touched my window. And for such a small sound, I was surprised how far it traveled. There was this animalistic moment where my entire body froze and I felt my sense of hearing dial itself up to 11 as I strained to catch every small noise coming from my room. I heard a couple of footsteps on my carpet, some muffled voices, and I heard the creak of my door opening. I let the fridge door swing shut and rushed over to the back door, but as soon as I opened it, I paused. Out the back door led to our screened-in back porch, which led outside to our fenced-in yard. Going through the screen door would make way too much noise, and whoever was now in the house would be able to catch me before I was able to unlock the gate to exit the backyard. I would have to run back towards the intruders to get to the front door, so not knowing what else to do, I ducked into a small closet right next to the fridge, where my dad kept the vacuum. There was barely enough room inside for me to stand up straight, and I knew that if they happened to open the door, I was caught so I kept my hand on the doorknob to hold it closed. I heard two sets of footsteps walking down the front hall, and suddenly somebody was in the kitchen. He wasn't even being cautious. He was just sauntering around, opening cabinets and drawers like he belonged there. I heard him open the fridge right next to me and knock a few things around inside. I heard an annoyed voice coming from the hallway. What the hell are you doing? The second voice responded. I'm starving, man. I haven't eaten all day. Get the fuck out of there. The first voice snapped. The fridge door shut abruptly, and suddenly there was a tug on the handle of the closet I was hiding in. I tensed, and I held the door latch firm. All the guy had to do was pull on it hard, and I would have toppled right onto the floor. Hey, this one's locked. The voice came from right outside the door. As soon as I heard it, I knew I was done and I mentally prepared myself to be kidnapped or murdered. The second voice came again over by the back door. 
Hey, did you open this? No, why? And somebody was just here. They must have run out back. I heard both of the intruders run out to the back porch. I could have taken that moment to run. But I was shaking so hard at me nearly getting caught that I didn't trust myself to try and take a step. I thought about trying to go for the cordless phone on the counter, but I remembered the dial-up internet was still using the phone line. After another few moments, the two men ran back into the house and made for the front door. I heard the front door unlock and swing open. They hadn't been out of the house for more than five seconds before I heard a police siren wailing as it drove past the house. Turns out my neighbor had spotted the two men walking around outside and called the cops as soon as she noticed them opening my window from the outside. They were kids themselves, really. One was 18 and the other was 19. My dad arrived home shortly after and we ended up staying at my aunt's for the night. I was incredibly shaken for the next several days and the smallest of noises made me anxious and I was too afraid to be alone. Looking back now, those two kids likely would have taken off running if they had found me. They didn't even have any weapons on them. But at the time, I didn't know that, and the experience traumatized my tiny 11-year-old mind. Who would have thought on a quiet cul-de-sac with houses surrounding me on all sides, and the sun not even completely gone, that my house would be invaded? The city may be noisier, but at least at the time, it was safer. I was young and fresh out of high school. I needed work, so I sent in resumes to all sort of entry-level positions. I got a few responses. I settled on McDonald's because it was an easy commute. Plus, the employee discount was pretty cool. The only position they had was a night shift. 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. I'm fine with that because I was already a night owl. The first few days working there were fine. I wasn't working the counter or anything, just doing back-end stuff and cleanup. Our building was in a little strip mall off a highway exit. It's the only place there that's open at night, but we get a decent amount of customers, most of which go through the drive through On the Friday of my second week working there, or maybe it was a really early Saturday morning at that point, I'm not sure, it was just late. I remember I was grabbing the stacked trays from the lobby when someone walked in through the doors. It was a woman. She was really tall and pretty, made up super fancy in a long dress with high heels. She was wearing a big hat too. Eccentric, not your average McDonald's customer. But what was weird was that I never saw a car pull up. We have a full view of the parking lot from the window, but no car ever dropped her off. She must have walked here. I smiled at her as I walked by and headed behind the counter. I bent down to restack the trays below, expecting my coworker standing at the register to serve her. He didn't say anything though, and after I'd finished, I stood up to find out why the girl wasn't ordering anything. But she wasn't there when I looked up. I never heard the door open, she was just gone. I asked the guy on the till where the girl went, and he replied, Who? I said the girl with the hat, and he just looked at me like I was dumb, telling me he had no clue who I was talking about. So I tried to rationalize it, deciding she had probably stepped in the door, took a look at our grubby menu, and left. But something was weird about the whole thing. It didn't really make sense why someone who looked and dressed like that would be at a random McDonald's in the middle of the night. Whatever, the shift went on normally for the next hour. Then I remember taking a break after cleaning the toilets. I sat down on a chair in the back near the kitchen when I heard heels clicking on the floor. It was quite audible, louder than if someone was just walking. It sounded like stomping, sort of. So I peer out into the lobby. My coworker was gone from the front. I figured he went to take his break, but you know who I do see? That same woman. Only this time someone was with her. A man. 
He wore a tuxedo with fancy black shoes. They were dancing together, like full-on ballroom dancing in the lobby. Swinging back and forth, it was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen. I remember watching them for a bit, mesmerized, before I took my place behind the register. I said something along the lines of, uh, can I help you? They both looked at me at the same time. As they stared, I felt a hand grab my shoulder with a firm grip. Instinctually, I turned around. No one was there. I knew someone had touched me, but there wasn't anyone, so I spun back to the lobby where the people were to find them both gone. The man and the woman had just vanished. Once again, I didn't hear doors open or close. I didn't hear their fancy shoes skid on the floor. They were just there one minute and gone the next. For the rest of the night, only a few small things happened. At one point, I walked by the washrooms on my way to do something, to find both doors swinging, the male and female ones, like someone had just crashed through both of them. A little while later, I remember looking for something on the shelves in the back near the employee entrance, and something banged on the door, hard. Something heavy hit it, and only once. I remember opening it, looking around, and seeing no one. After that, the shift was regular. Really not much to say. I was really happy when I finally got off, though. The first bits of sunlight had just begun to come over the horizon as I left for my car. I was punching out ten minutes before I was supposed to, but I didn't think the people coming in would care. As I hit the parking lot, though, I see a car. It looked like a small limousine. It was just sitting there in front of the restaurant. Through the light from the street lamp, I could make out the doors opening. Two people got out, one on each side of the car. It was the man and the woman I'd seen before. The same people that were dancing. Only their appearance had changed. Their clothes seemed torn and ragged. I could see the woman's dress clearly because it was white. It was covered in dirt with holes and tears. And their faces. Their faces were terrifying. Their skin was bleach white. And their eyes, which were previously normal, were this beady black, like oversized bugs were looking at me. I stood there, frozen as I looked at them. Then the man spoke in a deep, filtered voice that seemed to echo from all around me. Would you like a ride? We have room for one more. Shaking my head was all I could muster. Without another word, the two people, if you can call them that, got into their car, shut the doors, and pulled away. None of their lights were on. I watched wide-eyed as the limo drove down the road before disappearing into the darkness of the early morning. Back in the late 90s, I used to have a serious drug problem. I was living in Las Vegas at the time, and after snorting my entire stash of coke, I would party, pass out, wake up, jack some cars, sell them, spend some money on food, and the rest would go to my dealer, and then I would snort again and repeat the entire process. One night in July, I broke into a panel van without windows. It was parked alone outside of a rat-infested motel. My gut told me that I should check the back before I drove away, but my mind was on my next fix, and I just floored it as soon as I got the engine started. I drove about an hour away into an isolated area of the desert, where I would meet my contact, who would check out the car, pay me in cash, and then drop me off at the nearest street corner. Once I put the van in park, I decided to check out the back. I figured there might be some tools or something back there that I could pawn for more cash. The back of the van was padlocked shut. 
which should have been my first clue, because when I smashed it open with my crowbar, I heard a high-pitched wailing from inside. I turned on my flashlight, and my stomach dropped. Four Hispanic children, two boys and two girls, were tied up and gagged, lying on a handful of filthy cushions. They were all in tears and staring at me in absolute horror. I dropped the crowbar and backed away from the van a few steps. This was bad. Really fucking bad. I didn't know what to do. I had clearly stolen the van from a kidnapper or a human trafficker, and they would be looking to recover it, and likely shoot the asshole who took it from them. I decided not to call my contact. I knew him pretty well, and I was fairly certain that he would either kill the kids and dump their bodies in the desert, or shoot me for fucking this up. I made a snap decision. I climbed in the van and explained to them in both English and what Spanish I knew that I wasn't going to hurt them. I gagged them and cut the bonds around their wrists, but I left their ankles tied. I couldn't risk them running off. I felt sick to my stomach with heartbroken guilt when I saw the welts around their hands. The stench of urine and sweat was heavy in the air. I climbed back in the driver's seat, drove back out of the desert, and at the first service stop I pulled in and parked. I went inside and bought four bottles of water and as many bags of snacks that I could afford. I carefully opened the back of the van and tossed the bag inside. Then I closed it again and walked across the lot. I made an anonymous phone call to the police from a payphone and then walked to the next service station where I had a friend come pick me up. After that night, I had my friend buy me a bus ticket to Texas where I had an older brother who would let me stay on his couch. I got clean and I ultimately turned my life around. I got an honest job and I now have my own family and my own home. I remember being so relieved when I heard on the news that the kids had been found and were returned to their families in Mexico. You never know when life will give you a test like that and a chance to prove your character. I like to think that those kids helped me as much as I helped them. About five years ago, I worked at a job where I would finish late and end up driving home around one in the morning. Most of the route I took was in a countryside surrounded by woods. I drove past quite a few people who needed help, so I always had jumper cables, spare gas, and other tools I might need in my car. One rainy night, when I was driving home, I noticed a parked car on the side of the road with their hazard lights on. I pulled over in front of their car and got out to see what was the problem. When I got out, two young men in their 20s stepped out. I asked them what the problem was, and one of the men said their car wouldn't start and asked if I could help them. I don't know what it was, but I instantly felt on edge around these guys like I needed to be on guard or something. I asked one of them to open the hood. I expected one of them to go back in the car and pop the hood, however, one of them just sort of signaled someone in the car. That's when I really looked into the car and noticed there were two more people inside. That's when I felt like something was really wrong. I opened the hood and took a quick look. I noticed one of the men gave a nod to the other men in the car. I was believing my instincts at that point and that something bad was about to happen. I quickly thought up an excuse to get back into my car. I said to them that I think I knew what the problem was. I would just go back to my car and get the tool that I needed. I walked back to my car trying to look normal. I remember thinking one of the men was going to attack me from behind. When I got close to my car, I quickly got inside and started my car and drove away. I'm glad I knew it was a trap because shortly after, a car came speeding down the road behind me. Of course, it was the car claiming to be broken down. The man driving kept turning into my car almost making contact. One of the men opened their window and was throwing what I guess was loose change and junk at my car. The same guy throwing things then pulled out a knife and started scratching and stabbing at the windows, causing them to chip and crack. The driver turned his car into mine, this time making contact. I had to turn my car into theirs just so I wouldn't crash off the side of the road. I slammed on my brakes and so did they shortly after. The men then got out of the car and started running toward mine. At that point though, I had already started driving and drove past them in the car. I don't know if I lost them or if they just gave up, as I didn't see them again after that. 
I've never feared for my life as much as I did that moment. About three days later, I read on the news that two men had been robbed and severely beaten by a group of men who claimed that their car was broken down. I'm glad I trusted my instincts and knew to leave. This story happened about five years ago. My dad had recently retired and we had always talked about touring the United States. We bought a third hand RV and began our road trip around America. We were about halfway through our journey and so far we had no problems and enjoyed all the places we visited. The RV had a few problems being third hand, but nothing too serious that we couldn't fix on the side of the road. We were driving late in the evening around 10 o'clock when the RV started to make noises. That was usually an indication to us that we needed to get out and make a few adjustments. We pulled into a parking lot next to a bar and took a look and I suggested that we take a little break and had a drink in the bar. As we were walking towards the bar, I noticed there were motorcycles parked outside and it actually looked like a motorcycle gang was hanging around. We were in the bar and we had some food and drinks. At one point, I looked around the bar and I noticed two men in who were in motorcycle jackets pointing in our direction. The two men approached us and aggressively told us that we were in their parking spot and needed to move. I knew my dad was going to say something, but I interrupted him before he could speak and said to the two men that we'll move our RV. I wasn't going to cause trouble. These men looked dangerous and there were more outside. We paid the bill and we left the bar. As we were outside, I remember that we hadn't quite fixed the RV yet. I told my dad to wait inside and I will finish adjusting the RV so we could get back on the road as soon as possible. One of the men who approached us earlier asked why we weren't gone yet. I told him that the RV had some problems and I needed to fix it. The man told me in a very stern voice that we better be gone in five minutes. He made a point of revealing his handgun as he said this. I quickly finished the RV and we got going again. While we were driving, I heard motorcycles loudly behind us. One bike sped up and got in front of us while the other one surrounded the RV. I didn't understand why they were after us. We did everything they said and they were still harassing us. I knew the men were armed and if we stopped, we were probably going to get hurt or worse. I told my dad to continue driving no matter what. I tried calling the police but I couldn't get through. My dad said just to keep calling them until they pick up. So that's what I continued to do. The RV started to make noises again, and it wasn't long before the engine cut out, and we had no choice but to stop. The men got off their bikes and started approaching the RV, but for some reason, they quickly turned around, got on their bikes, and drove away. My dad pointed in front, and he said, there's the police. We saw flashing lights coming down the road. I got out on the side of the road just to try to stop the police car. But as it got closer, I saw it was an ambulance. The flashing blue and red lights were enough to scare the bikers away. Me and my dad decided to let it go. We fixed the RV and continued our trip. I'm to this day grateful that the blue and red flashing lights saved me and my dad from probably death. This story happened a long time ago when I was in my late teens. I had recently got my first car and I would always drive my friends and I around, usually to a bar called Frank's Bar that our friend Peter's father owned. It had pool tables and darts there, so that's where we hung out most of the time. One night, like most nights, I was driving some friends to the bar. During the drive, a man started driving close to my car, beeping his horn and trying to overtake me. One of my friends said to not let him over in order to annoy him. I didn't let him pass. My friends and I laughed at the man's frustration. For some reason, the man slammed on his brakes, nearly crashing into a barrier on the side of the road. We continued to laugh. Then we arrived at Frank's bar. We had dinner, played pool, and had a few drinks. As Peter's dad owned the bar, we would always stay late past closing time. My other friends had left a little earlier that night, so it was just me and Peter. It was midnight when I decided it was time to head home. I said bye to Peter and his dad, and I left the bar. When I got outside, I expected my car to be the only one in the parking lot, but there was another car parked near mine. 
A man was standing outside his car, sipping on a liquor bottle, watching me. I knew right away it was the man that nearly ran off the road. I kept my head down, trying not to make any eye contact, and I got into my car. When I got in and started my car, so did the man. I drove off down the road, and so did the man following me close behind. I barely got down the road when the man started aggressively tailgating me. He drove up beside me, waving his hands at me. It looked like he wanted me to pull over. I wasn't going to, and I continued driving and looked away. The man started beeping his horn, and when I looked back at him, he was holding a handgun, pointing at it right at me. My instinct was to drive faster, and the man accelerated as well. I saw my mirror, and the man somehow lost control of his car, causing him to swerve. I didn't see what exactly happened as I was focusing on the road, concentrating to driving fast and to get away from this guy. I didn't see that man again that night, and from then on, I always worried when I went back to Frank's bar that I would see that man again. Thankfully, I never did. When I was 10, my parents divorced. My mother left the house and disappeared. A few years later, my father married my stepmother. She was a very beautiful person and sweet as an angel to me. Being that she worked as a nurse, she used to take care of me whenever I got sick. I started to open up to her and it seemed like we were becoming a real family. Until an incident happened. About one year later, I started to get sick. It was weird. I could feel my body was getting weaker and weaker. As always, my stepmother took care of me with all of her heart. However, something felt different. Sitting next to me while I was laying in bed, she took something out of her bag. The first thing that caught my eye was a syringe. She said she would inject me with a tonic to get better soon. To this day, I get goosebumps whenever I think of what she said, and how she said it with a smile. I am an angel, and I'll send you to heaven. You won't hurt anymore. After hearing that, I refused it because it felt really weird. She then kept saying it was okay and even forcibly tried to give me the injection. You need a shot now! Being scared, I kept saying I didn't want it. I eventually jumped up from the bed and ran away. She then shouted loudly from behind, chasing me with a syringe in her hand. You can't go to heaven if you reject it like this! I ran away screaming like crazy. Just then, my father came into my room when he heard my scream and shouted at her. She screamed and rushed at him. It's time for you to leave too! She then put the needle in his throat. However, he managed to block her and knock her to the floor just before she injected it into his body. Later, my father immediately called the police and she was arrested at the scene. Being terrified, there was nothing I could do but just flop on the floor. It turned out that she tried to inject us with a drug that kills people. The cops told me that if I had taken the shot, I'd probably be dead by now. The investigation found that she was suffering from severe depression and mental illness. Also, it turned out that she had been putting poison in the food which I ate over the past few weeks. In other words, I was dying slowly. I eventually recovered after the treatment, but I still suffer from the fear of that day. I'm sure you're all curious at this point, what could be the reason she tried to kill me? Well, I'm the one who's most curious about that reason. All I could say is that when she was taken away that day, she stared at me and hummed a song with a freakish, chilling smile. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. I'm just a normal guy in my mid-twenties. One day, one of my friends showed me a video that completely changed my whole life. Let me just begin my story. So, my friend was a bit of a weirdo. He would often save bizarre videos he found on the deep web on his phone and show them to me. At first, I was shocked that those things were real. 
On the other hand, the stimulating elements of the video strongly knocked on my brain. During a weekend, bored with nothing to do, I logged onto the deep website that my colleague told me about and watched a ton of horrible pictures and videos. I downloaded one of them, and to this day, it's still stuck in my memory. In the video, a man was sitting on the floor with his arms and legs tied with another man standing in front of him. I couldn't see his face because of the angle. Wearing a black suit, the man was muttering something. It was another language that I didn't understand. He seemed to be having conversations with the man sitting on the floor and soon walked off the screen. When he came back, he was holding a bucket. He then scattered some kind of liquid on his body. He turned around and made some gestures. What I saw next was terrible. Three hounds ran out from nowhere, quickly attacked the man, and began to bite off his flesh. I'm not sure, but they look like some kind of wolves. The scene of three large-sized dogs eating him up was clearly visible on the screen. While watching the man's body being torn apart, I immediately closed the site and turned off my computer. I almost threw up on the spot. My heart was pounding frantically. I'd never seen anything like that in my whole life. The shock lasted for a few more days. The scene was imprinted in my head. I hadn't been on the deep web since that day, and I almost forgot about it. A few days later, a message popped up on my computer screen. If you want to live, send $6,666 to the account number below. If you don't send the money, we'll kill you like the man in the video you saw. We know where you are. My computer must have been hacked when I downloaded the video. I was terrified, but I tried to calm down thinking someone was just playing a prank on me. Only fools send money because of this shit. They don't know my location and will never hurt me. I turned off my computer and tried to forget everything after that. It had been three days and nothing happened. Yeah, it was just a prank, I told myself. That day, on the way home from work, I saw three large dog necklaces on my front porch. I found a note next to it and it said this on the paper. My dogs are starving. Just then, I broke out into a cold sweat. No way, do they really know where I live? There was another message on the screen when I immediately turned on my computer. If you don't send the money by today, you'll be the next target. Being scared, I collected all the money I had and sent it to him. You might be wondering why I didn't call the police. I just couldn't do that. I felt like they were watching me all the time. Outside my window, people who I'd never seen before were walking with a big dog, like some kind of shepherd. If it was any other day, I might have thought it was nothing, but I was extremely afraid back then. The next day after sending the money, he sent another message. This money is not enough to feed my starving dogs. I had no more money and I thought I would become their next prey. I ended up calling the police. They constantly threatened me and I was terrified, but fortunately nothing happened. Shortly after, police called me and said the criminals had been arrested. I decided to go to the police station and meet them. To my surprise, they were two young men in their early 20s. I felt like they were completely different people from the video I saw before. They just looked like young nerds who sat in front of a computer. I was so upset. I couldn't believe I was fooled by these guys. The case was eventually over and I was able to get back to my normal life. Or so I thought. The next day, the police suddenly contacted me. They said the hackers suddenly disappeared. I immediately had a bad feeling about it. Just in case, I accessed the deep web and found a new video. As soon as I clicked the video, I saw those hackers being eaten alive by three giant wolves. Ah! After that day, I threw my computer away, moved to another place, and never accessed the deep web again. It happened a few years ago on Halloween. 
I was drinking and hanging out with my friends until late at night in a downtown club. All the clubs and streets were full of people dressed in Halloween costumes. Everyone was enjoying a crazy night. Because I drank too much, I ended up collapsing in a nearby alley and fell asleep. I don't remember how long I was passed out for, but when I opened my eyes, I felt someone rubbing something on my face. I opened my eyes and a man in a bloody vampire costume was putting something on my face. It smelled sour. And just then, I realized he was putting ketchup on me. I freaked out and pushed the man away. What are you doing? He began laughing frantically. <laughs> this is the only way no one will notice I stabbed you. <laughs> he sprinkled ketchup all over me, then suddenly took the knife out of his pocket. Damn it, I instinctively thought I was screwed. No one would ever notice if I was stabbed by this man in the alley. My extreme fear soon became a reality. He stabbed me in the stomach with the knife and I collapsed right there. While I was bleeding, he came towards me and continued to put ketchup on me. I couldn't distinguish the blood from the ketchup which covered my entire body. He kept laughing like crazy and putting ketchup on me. <laughs> Then, a group of guys passed through the alley. Even though I was out of energy and couldn't move or speak loudly, I yelled as much as I could. Help me! As they glanced at me, the man in the vampire costume put his arms around my shoulder, smiled, and bit me like he was pulling a prank. The guys eventually passed by us smiling, and I thought I was done for. However, he ran away as soon as the guys left the alley. Sitting in pain, I was fortunately rescued by others passing by and able to get treatment at the hospital. I rarely drink alcohol after that day, and I don't go out to play on Halloween anymore. And I never, never eat ketchup again. One night, I heard some noise outside my front door. When I went to investigate, I saw a man's face through the door window. He looked very dirty, and there was drool running down his chin. He was staring at me, his heavy breathing fogging up the glass. He then started laughing and knocking on the door, frantically. I was thoroughly creeped out and rushed to call 911. The guy just kept banging on the door. When I looked again, I noticed he wasn't using his fist. He was using his head, slamming it against the window, over and over and over. He kept at it, madly, almost the whole time while I was waiting for the police. The glass was starting to crack, and he was bleeding from his nose and forehead. Unfortunately, just before the police arrived, he left. I hoped that that would be the end of it, but no. Later that night... I woke up to a loud noise. It was the same guy, hitting his head on another window on my house. There were small shards of glass sticking out of his head. There was blood all over his face. The window was nearly completely shattered. Then I noticed he was handcuffed. Perhaps he was a criminal who had gotten away from the police. I ended up calling the cops on the spot again and hid in the bathroom. The guy must have eventually ran out of windows to break and got into the house. He wound up behind the bathroom door and started slamming his head against it. I was afraid he'd break the door too. That's when I heard the sound of sirens. The police had arrived. The banging stopped. They found him collapsed in front of the bathroom door with pieces of broken glass and splinters of wood stuck on his face. The man was immediately taken to the emergency room at the nearest hospital. However, he had suffered a serious concussion and other damage to his brain and fell into a coma. He still has not awakened. Until he does, there will be no answers as to why he was banging his face on my door that night.
I really like playing video games. Three years ago, I forgot about reality and lived in the game world. I wanted to go inside, decorating my character and thinking of it as me. I was obsessed with the world and the people I met in the game. But the truth is, I just wanted to escape reality. I didn't come out for a year, just played video games in my room. I was the perfect social misfit. Tons of trash was piling up on my desk and in my room. Even if I knew my mother was crying, I didn't go out. One day, I made a friend in the game. She seemed like a really sweet person. She bought me a nice item and understood me more than anyone else. It was the first time I met someone who was so nice to me. We quickly became close. Our relationship actually became more than friends. We spent all day together in the game and she became my first girlfriend in my entire life. I really loved her. Even though we hadn't actually met, I was happy. Then one day, she started attacking my character. I asked her why, but she didn't answer. She just kept attacking me. Another day, I got a phone call from her. I want to attack people, she said. But it's impossible in real life. So I want to at least feel it in the gaming world. Now, I'm going to attack your character. Scream for me, so I can feel like I'm really attacking you. <laughs> <laughs> she started attacking my character and laughed frantically. I hung up the phone and couldn't get out of the shock. I kept getting calls from her but didn't answer them. I then got a text message from her. I want something stronger. If you love me, die for me! I started to get scared of her, but I already liked her so much back then. I wanted to give her everything she wanted. The next day, she suddenly made a video call to me. Even though I had seen her picture before, she was even prettier on video. Compared to her, I was shabby. I was so embarrassed, but I didn't want to miss her. I wanted to be nice to her. Then, she suddenly told me to pick up a kitchen knife. Stab your belly when I attack your character, she said. I know, I thought it was ridiculous, but I said yes. I didn't want to disappoint her. I brought a small knife to the computer. I could see her eyes glittering. Just then, she attacked my character. She told me to stab myself in the stomach at the moment, but my hand wouldn't move. In great fear, my body wouldn't allow me to do such a thing. My body was shaking hard and I began to sweat. I thought what I was doing was crazy, but I was out of my mind. I could hear her over the phone shouting and cursing. Did you do it? No? Why? I said in tears on the spot. I can't, I can't do it. She kept saying. Do it for me, baby. You promised to make me happy. And this is what will make me happy. Just close your eyes and do it. And let me hear your painful groans. I tried again but failed. No matter how much I loved her, I couldn't do this. She started to curse at me again. We ended up arguing for hours on end. My body was all sweaty, and she said she wouldn't see me again if I didn't do it. I thought about hanging up the phone and breaking it off with her, but I was also afraid I would never see her again. After a few attempts, I stabbed myself with a kitchen knife when her character attacked me. <clears throat> A dizzying pain surged, and just then, I heard her laugh. You finally did it! <laughs> Watching me clench my stomach in pain, she laughed madly. I felt blood flowing down from my belly and my vision getting fuzzy. She smiled at the sight of me like that. <laughs> I'm so excited! This! Is thrilling. She hung up the call as I lost consciousness. When I opened my eyes again, I was lying in the hospital with my mother crying next to me. I finally came to my senses when I saw her tears. I did something really, really stupid. Fortunately, I didn't stab myself that deeply and was able to leave the hospital shortly after. As expected, there was no contact from her after.
And after that day, I never contacted her again. That's how I got over the hard times and got back to my daily life. I'm living a normal social life now. I learned a lot from that terrible experience. Humans are weak beings. Human psychology is weaker than we think. And sometimes you can't think normally because you're being psychologically manipulated by someone else. I just hope there are no victims like me again. Two years ago, I met a man while I was taking a walk in the park in front of my house. He used to jog along the trail every day, and we would talk occasionally. Soon enough, we became friends. He seemed like a nice guy. Then one day, he came up to me and said, Hey, I have two kids and I'll be home late tomorrow. Could you take care of them? I'll give you $150. My kids can't eat their meals by themselves. After considering it for a while, I soon accepted it, thinking that I would make a decent amount of money. He gave me his address, and the next day, I headed over to his house. The exterior was just like any other house, but as soon as I opened the front door and entered inside, I screamed. Two people without arms and legs were sitting at the living room table. I was so surprised that I thought I had seen an illusion or something. When I came back to my senses, I could clearly see the dead bodies. Being shocked, my body couldn't move at all. There was also a note on the table which said, Please, take care of their meals. I could see there was toy tableware and some food on the table. Just then, I remembered what he said to me. His children couldn't eat by themselves. My legs were shaking, and I looked around the house. There was a chill in the air, and a disgusting stench pierced my nose. I don't know why, but next, I walked towards the refrigerator. I should have just run away at the time. I still regret the decision to investigate. When I opened the refrigerator, I could see lots of wrapped up arms and legs. They were piled on top of each other inside. Screaming, I fell backwards. Then I heard the front door open. When I looked back, the guy was approaching me with a chainsaw. He said, Now we have one more, kids! I was frozen with fear. However, I immediately took out the pepper spray I always carried in my pocket in preparation for the worst and sprayed it on his face. After turning on his chainsaw, he ran towards me, but then he got sprayed in his eyes and writhed. Ugh, my eyes! I managed to run away from his house and call the cops. He was immediately arrested on the spot. It turned out that the bodies were of those who were kidnapped and killed by him, their arms and legs severed by his chainsaw. What was even more horrifying was his response when the police asked him why he had cut off people's arms and legs. That way, I can carry them. Then he laughed maniacally. <laughs> to this day, I live every day grateful that I survived that crazy encounter. What would have happened to me if I couldn't escape from there? Not long ago, I went to see my older cousin. He lived in a remote rural village. I was a teenager without a driver's license, so I took the bus. However, I accidentally ended up taking the wrong bus. This bus was going to another town. Inevitably, I got off in the middle of the road. It was a 40 minute walk from there to my brother's house. Also, the area was so remote that there were very few buses around there. I ended up just deciding to walk. There were only fields around and not a single person was seen passing by. Just then, 
I saw some scarecrows standing in the field, which was very unusual. They all looked like real people. I looked at one of the scarecrows. They must have set up some mannequins, I thought. Curious, I came a little closer, and they were even more shocking up close. The mannequin seemed much more real than I had thought. The skin looked real. It felt like a real person was standing here. I got goosebumps all over me. I looked at them vacantly, thinking, what are these for? The scarecrows all stood in the same position. They were standing in a strange position with their body tilted at an angle. It was such a strange and creepy sight. Just then, one of the scarecrow's eyes suddenly moved and stared at me. I was so surprised that I fell back. The scarecrow moved towards me as soon as I thought I had misdeemed it. I screamed and started running like crazy. <coughs> Just then, a scarecrow or a man dressed as a scarecrow rushed towards me with a sickle in his hand. He ran after me, making some weird sound. I shouted as I fled desperately. What the hell is wrong with you? The scarecrow kept chasing me and making that weird sound. It sounded like a language I couldn't understand. As I glanced back, the scarecrow swung a sickle at me. My legs gave way with fear. Thinking that I'd be ripped apart and killed if I was caught by him, I ran away. Fortunately, I soon managed to get out of the field. When I looked back, I couldn't see the scarecrow anymore. I didn't understand why he was standing there for so long, pretending to be a scarecrow. One more thing I remember was that when I glanced at his face as I ran away from him, he was laughing. <laughs> it seemed as if he was truly enjoying it. At first, I thought it was just someone's nasty joke, but I could tell it wasn't when he swung his sickle at me. He was literally trying to kill me. I almost lost my neck. When I got out of there, I immediately called the police. Shortly after, when the police arrived at the scene, they found no scarecrows at all. However, they did find evidence of murder such as unknown bloodstains and flesh in the field. They're continuing to search the field. What was the scarecrow that was running after me and the rest of the scarecrows doing there? I still have terrible thoughts about it to this day. Were the rest of the scarecrows the bodies of the people he killed? If I didn't get out of there, would I have become one of those scarecrows? Or... Or the Scarecrows, other murderers in disguise. Do you believe that a wish comes true if you want something badly enough? At first, I didn't believe in that at all. Just wish? <laughs> That's BS. My wishes never came true, no matter how much I wanted them to. But now, I do believe it. And you would believe me if you listened to the story I'm about to tell you. There was a man I loved the most in the world. I had wanted him for such a long time. I always watched him from a distance. And not once did he so much as gaze in my direction. Actually, he had a girlfriend. And he didn't like me. However... I wanted to become one with him, forever. So I prayed, every day desperately, to make him mine. Hiding next to his house, I watched him every night. I felt like I was with him when I saw him through the window. I tried to share a moment, like watching him eat, sleep, laugh, talk, or even just walk around. I was happy, but I couldn't make him mine, no matter how hard I tried. We just had nothing to do with each other. I prayed like crazy, day and night, for him to be mine, but it was futile. No matter how often I prayed, nothing changed. 
I ended up cursing to God for ignoring my invocations and lived in a state of constant <laughs> frustration, thinking that my life would forever remain empty. Then one day, an idea suddenly came to me. This is it. I can finally make him mine. And soon, I decided to put my plan in motion. One late night, I snuck into his house and slammed his head with a big frying pan while he was asleep. He was rendered unconscious, and now I could lay down right next to him. I could smell his scent and hear his heartbeat and the sound of his breathing. I could feel his presence so vividly, laying there. That was the moment my dream came true. I knew I had done something wrong, yet I couldn't regret it, because this was the only thing I'd ever dreamt of in my life, and the man whom I wanted so badly was here, right next to me. I thought he may have suffered serious brain damage from the impact, maybe he would be disabled. It didn't matter, as long as he remained by my side. My dream came true. Do you understand what I said before? Now I understand what so many people used to say. If you want something desperately enough, you can get it. Nothing is impossible. Now I can die without any regret. He is finally with me. However, my satisfaction was short-lived when I realized the cost of this moment would be my life as I knew it. Sooner or later, the police would surely catch me. I don't want to leave his side ever again. I lie next to him, rub a string around his neck and mine, and pull it. I'll just sleep with him. Forever. Six months ago, I moved to my new home in a new city, and I'll keep it private for my privacy. And you'll see why later in the story. I met my new neighbor. The first impression of him was that he was very nice, funny, and a down-to-earth guy. But his behavior began to change after getting to know him. He's becoming a bit weird. Then I met his son. He was telling me that his father was threatening him with stupid things because he was playing in a neighborhood and he only liked for his son to play at his house. He seemed like a hovering parent that did not like his son to go anywhere or to have any type of freedom. My neighbor began to be mean to everyone that lived near us. It became very distant, as if he wanted us to probably get away from him. At least that's what I was assuming. One night, it was around 2 a.m. when I was awakened by screaming and arguing. I stayed in my bed and I covered my ears with my pillow, but my window was open because I liked the fresh air. The arguing continued and all of a sudden it stopped. I heard grunting and something being dragged across some type of floor. I got tired of hearing the noise, so I decided to get up and close my window, which is actually facing my neighbor's house. I got up and as I were getting ready to close my window, I looked up at my neighbor's house and I saw something hanging through a window, so I took this video. I didn't know what this was, but the prior argument that I heard told me that that was a body hanging from the ceiling. I shut my window very quietly and I called the cops, but I whispered while I was on the phone with them. I don't know why, and at that point I didn't want to know why that happened. The person that he was arguing with was one of his son's friend's father. They were arguing over something my neighbor said to his son's friend. The police eventually came and they arrested him. I told them not to come over here so I didn't have to make a report, so I went down to the station. My neighbor has already been through trial, and he actually received a death sentence, but I don't want to give too much information because it'll bring up who I am.
This is the story of my friend Paul. He's an ordinary man in his mid-twenties, but he's never been normal. He's been rejected by women all his life and never had a date with a girl before. Although he never gave up, he was never popular with the ladies. I felt kind of sorry for him. He would complain every day. Women are weird. They don't even know what's important. They need to find a man like me, but whatever. They don't realize that. He then started meeting women using some kind of app. Of course, he couldn't continue a relationship, but he would have a date at least once or twice a week. He finally ended up getting a girlfriend. At first, I thought he was joking. One day I came to his house to visit him. But when I reached the front door of his house, I heard someone screaming. It was Paul. Fuck! Why don't you love me? Love me! You're my girlfriend! You have to love me! I'll kill you! I could hear him cursing frantically, and there was the sound of something bumping and falling. I froze for a moment. Should... should I just go back home? After thinking for a moment, I called Paul. He spoke calmly and said that it was alright to come in. When I entered the house, I could see Paul was alone. His house was a mess with all the furniture broken down, and blood was dripping from his hands. His girlfriend was nowhere to be seen. I asked him where she was, and he replied, She's gone now. I tried to say what I heard outside, but then just shut my mouth. He explained that he was just upset and broke the furniture himself. I wanted to inquire more, but I was afraid that things would get worse, so... I just shrugged it off. Since that day, I hadn't been able to reach Paul. I had no way of knowing what he was doing. He never seemed to come outside recently. A few days later, I heard a sudden but familiar yelling voice while walking on the street in my neighborhood. I looked where the sound came from, and there was Paul. Why don't any of you love me? Why? I'll kill you all! He cried and ran into women on the street. People around him were trying to stop him. I could see women running away in the chaos. And Paul, he just looked like hell. As time passed, I heard his girlfriend went missing. However, he claimed that he didn't do anything to her. He insisted that he's innocent. On top of that, no evidence was ever found. However... I still know the truth in my heart. I know he could be the one who made her go missing. I just don't know what to do. Above all things, there was no conclusive evidence that he murdered her. And, of course, it may be that he's not the real criminal. The case remains unsolved, and the cops still haven't spotted him as the culprit. Yeah, the owner just up and vanished. Couldn't tell you why. Here. The man took the keys and welcomed his new home. After the old owner disappeared, leaving his home and belongings behind in ruins, the colonial property became a bargain sale on the market. The man entered the renovated two-story home and began unpacking his things. Everything was fine until that day. A month later, he hears something. Alas! Hello? Who's there? The man stops on his stairs and looks around. Avas! He looks down at the steps, getting prone to listen closer. Save us! His heart stops and he jolts up. What he heard was a child's voice from below the steps. I'll get you out of there! Just wait one second! He runs upstairs to his room to find his tools. Ease, please! He hears more from below his feet. What the? But how's that? Sure enough, he hears a child begging from beneath his bedroom floor, despite the lack of any space beneath it. He finds a big hammer. Stand back! He shouts, driving the hammer into the floorboards. Prying the hammer from the hole, he dropped to the floor and started to look through it. However, he couldn't see anything, only darkness so he shined a flashlight into the hole. Just then, he saw an eye peeking through the hole. It soon disappeared and a mouth moved to replace it. 
Shrieking, he fell back. Ah! Get us out of here, sir! It's so dark! Find the exit! In search of a trap door, his hammer leaves 20 more holes behind. Help us! Help us escape! Please! The hammer hit something solid, so he pried apart the floorboards. It was a metal door. He opened it and shined the flashlight down, but the light barely penetrated the darkness, so he got to his knees and reached down into the hole. Grab on! I'll pull you kids out of there! He feels a hand, then two, then ten. Before he can speak, he's yanked hard onto the floor, his face pressed against it. When he struggled to pull his arm out, his right eye over a hole saw another mouth appear under the hole, with pink lips smiling. It was giggling, then licked his eye. <laughs> his arm started throbbing in pain. When he managed to rip his arm away from the hole and got up, he could see the bite marks on his skin. What's wrong with you? What are you trying to do? Cacophonous <laughs> giggles erupted from the holes. He had enough. He started off leaving to find someone else to help. Then, an arm suddenly broke through the floor and grabbed his ankle. Screaming, he shook it loose and started running, but dozens more arms tried to grab after him as he barreled downstairs. He slipped through them and finally reached the door. All of a sudden, the ceiling started splitting, and the giggling returned as eyes and mouths appeared in the cracks. He fleed out the door and never came back. A month later, a woman came to the house. So yeah, another disappeared, just like the prior owner. Here you go, ma'am. She took the keys and welcomed her new home. I've never had the best of luck with guys. I appear to have poor taste when it comes to dating. After separating for good from my kid's father after five years, I was ready to just be myself. About three months of being a single mother, my neighbor approached me stating that a friend of his, Steve, would like to meet me. It didn't take long before he charmed his way into my life. The first six months were amazing, but he began to drink more and more, and each time he would get extremely agitated. He would start fights with random people, and even some of our friends. Slowly, our friends would stop coming around, knowing how Steve got when he drank. This, however, did not stop him from drinking. But now all the anger was aimed at me. It took roughly six to eight months of buildup, from name-calling and shoving to punching and choking. Suddenly, this became a very abusive relationship. One time, I escaped out of the bathroom window. He later found me by beating up a friend of mine until he told him where I was. Steve began stripping all of my clothes off in a drunken rage while laughing at me and challenging me to go ahead and try to escape while I was naked. The last night of abuse was by far the worst. Before Steve started drinking that night, I told him that my son, three years old, was not feeling very well and I was going to stay with him as he fell asleep. My plan was to spend the night with my son. At around 2.30 in the morning, I heard the bedroom door open. I lied there pretending to be asleep. Several seconds went by. I held my breath as tears began to form in my eyes. When I suddenly felt his hand on top of my head, he grabbed my hair and yanked me out of bed, whispering in my ear, I know you're avoiding me. Once in the living room, he threw me on the floor then accused me of trying to leave him and demanded to know why. Before I could answer, he angrily came to the conclusion that it was another man. I swear to God if I catch you with another man, I'll kill you and him. He was obviously more drunk than normal. He punched and kicked me a couple of times, and I fell to the floor. I started to crawl to my son's room, and he slowly came from behind me, asking, where do you think you're going? He then walked in front of me, kneeled down, and said, You stay right there or I'm gonna hurt you real bad. He then sat on the couch and watched me as I sobbed on the floor. After about 30 minutes, it appeared that he passed out on the couch. I decided that this was my chance to escape. 
I put on an oversized shirt, picked up my son, and slowly crept by him. He suddenly woke up and grabbed my leg and said, Where are you going? I stammered out that I was going into the kitchen with my son to get him a drink. He then angrily replied, Hurry up. As soon as I entered the kitchen, I ran out of the front door with no pants on, no shoes and no purse. I carried my son all the way to the police station, which was thankfully only a few blocks away. After hours, the way the police station is set up is that you go into a room and press a button and talk to someone on the intercom. I ran in and put my back to the wall and pushed the button behind me as I slowly slid down into a sitting position while holding on to my son, waiting for Steve to burst through the door at any second. I remembered thinking if I was going to be beaten, at least it would be on camera. On the speaker, I heard, How can I help you? All I could do was cry. I couldn't even get a word out of my mouth. I didn't know how to explain. Two officers came out to assist me. A female officer took my son and got him some food, and I went with the male officer to make a report, and he gave me a blanket. After 15 minutes, I heard Steve screaming my name as they brought him down the hallway. I held my breath as if he knew I was behind the door. 30 minutes later, an officer came back with a sergeant. At first, I thought they were going to tell me to go back home and gather my belongings while Steve was being held in custody. Instead, they asked me more questions about his anger issues and if there had been any previous fights. I explained to them Steve's alcohol problem and how he had become increasingly more abusive. They then showed me a list in Steve's handwriting detailing how he would dismember my body in a good spot where I would be buried without being found. He also had possible dates written down with past dates crossed out. I couldn't breathe when I read this and by this point tears were streaming down my face. I looked at the cop and asked, What does this mean? He looked back at me and said, It means you're lucky. Steve was charged with attempted murder, kidnapping, and assault. I left back home to Arizona before the trial started, but gave a detailed statement before I left. Steve, of course, pled not guilty, but in the end, he received two years in prison. Just before I left for Arizona, I received a letter from Steve. It simply read, It's not over. You'll always be mine. Mommy, is dinner ready? I'm hungry. It will be ready in a minute, sweetie. I'm making your favorite dish. Meat pies. Yay, meat pies! Why don't you set the table while I get the pies out of the oven? Okay. How does that taste, sweetie? It's good, but the stuffing still tastes funny. I told you, it's a new recipe that I'm trying. Now finish your dish, and let's get you to bed. Okay, mommy. Mommy, when will daddy come home? Don't worry, honey. Daddy will come home in a few days. But you said that last week. Don't worry, sweetie. Now, sleep. Okay. Good night, mommy. Good night, sweetie. Love you. February 11th, 2025. The meat portions are getting smaller and smaller each day. And Daisy has been bombarding me with questions about her daddy. I can't hide the truth anymore. I can't forget what happened. It has been four weeks since the incident. Well, everything is still in lockdown mode. I haven't seen anyone on the streets either. The first two weeks were hellish for us. We ran out of food. We had enough to feed Daisy, but not enough for us. I couldn't handle the hunger anymore. It grew day by day. And then, on the third week, I couldn't think straight, and I had done it. I never knew human meat would taste like fully matured veal. I even made Daisy's favorite dish, meat pies. I can't think of anything else but the texture and taste of it, and the hunger is still growing. I wonder what Daisy would taste like.
About 4 a.m., I was sitting in my living room watching YouTube on my TV. I was currently watching a horror story YouTube channel we all know very well. All of a sudden, my TV cut off for no reason. When I looked around, I realized that the whole electricity went out in general. Damn it! I said out loud, wondering what's going on. Let me pause the story by saying that I live in an extremely rural area. Our neighbors are so far away that you can go outside and do basically anything without getting caught. I needed to pee, so I thought I would step outside and check our electricity meter and use the bathroom in the backyard while I was there. However, I couldn't make it to the backyard before encountering a weird guy I'd never seen before. Hey, is your power out too? He said. I looked at him and replied with a yes as he grinned and said that his had been out for a while. To be honest, this was really weird as I know pretty much everyone around here and I never met him on any other occasion. I told him I was going to the store across the bridge from my house to get some snacks. He then said, Hey, save your money. I've got plenty of snacks. Since I didn't have a job at the time, I was extremely tight on money. I asked him what all he had and he said he had some meat-based snacks. I usually don't take stuff from strangers, but I doubt I would have even had enough money to get a 50 cent can of sausages at that time. I certainly didn't have a full dollar at that point. Thinking that it's probably some kind of beef jerky, I accepted and asked him where he lived. He said that he lived on top of the hill across the road from my house. Follow me, we can hang out for a while. I don't know why I did this, but this may very well be the most stupid decision I've ever made. I thought it was a little strange as I knew there were no houses on that hill, but I didn't really care. I thought maybe he was just horrible at directions. When we got to the top of the hill, I saw a small shelter made of nothing but sticks, and the whole area smelled like rotten meat. I instantly felt sick to my stomach. The guy pulled out a plastic freezer bag from his old dirty backpack and said it was already steamed so I could eat it straight from the pack. I thought I would know what kind of meat it was if I smelled it. I opened up the pack and was hit by that scent of rotten meat again. It was at least 20 times stronger than before. I threw up right there on the ground and dropped the backpack. Ugh, what the hell is that? I asked him, trying not to vomit again. It's a special type of meat some people would kill for. It was his response and the red flags were raised in my mind just then. No, no, no. I said with tears in my eyes. Oh, but yes. He said. He began laughing maniacally. <laughs> I immediately grabbed the package and ran into a dark place in the woods on the hillside knowing he wouldn't be able to find me. I then called 911 and gave them my location. They said they would be there soon. Within minutes, a few cops arrived near my house. I sprinted towards them and showed them the package, explaining what just happened. One of the cops vomited as he looked at the package. At first, I didn't understand why, until I looked at it in the light, where I could finally see what was causing that horrible smell. It was the skinless meat of someone's face. They took the package for examination and said they would let me know what they found out. It's been three weeks now, and they haven't gotten in touch with me. I hope they find out whose face that was and catch that sick cannibalistic bastard. But most of all, I hope I never see that man ever again. I lived in the countryside until I was 16. My neighborhood was a small town. I lived with my uncle and grandmother. This is a horror story I experienced at that time. Almost 10 years later, the memory hasn't faded. When I was about 15 years old, my grandmother held my hand one day and said, If some girl begs you to help her at night, do not help her. You have to ignore it and run away. It was a very famous rumor in this town. 
I thought it was just a story made up by somebody like any other ghost story, so I didn't really care about it back then. Actually, everyone in the neighborhood knew this story. If you hear a girl's voice at night, you must run, or you'll die. It was an obvious story. Then one night, I was out playing outside with my friends, and it suddenly got dark. Man, Grandma's gonna be pissed. I started walking home in a hurry, but the way home wasn't close. It soon became dark outside, and I was walking alone on an empty road. I began to get a little scared, so I purposely hurried up, humming to myself to calm down. Then, I heard a girl's voice in the forest next to the road. Help me. I felt a chill run down my spine. As soon as I thought I heard it wrong, I heard the voice once again. It hurts. Although it was a really small voice, I could tell for sure it was the voice of a girl. I looked where the voice came from, but all I could see was the dark forest. But then I saw something behind a tree. Its appearance in the dark began to become clearer. There was a little girl lying behind the tree. I was extremely taken aback. Thinking that she might have been hurt, I tried to approach her. However, I immediately recalled what my grandmother had told me. With a feeling of wariness, I stayed on the spot and stared at her. Then, the girl moved slightly and said once again, Is anybody there? I couldn't see her clearly in the dark, but something was unnatural. It didn't feel right. I moved slowly to escape from the spot. I heard her voice again and again, but I didn't get any closer. As I kept walking to the side, I could see the back of the tree. She wasn't lying down. Someone was hiding behind the tree, holding her up and supporting her body. Her body was lulled. I couldn't tell whether she was dead or alive. Then, my heart dropped. I made eye contact with the man who was hiding behind the tree. He suddenly jumped out of the forest and started running towards me like crazy. Help this poor girl! It was the same girl's voice that I had just heard before. Screaming, I started to run away. Ah! This time, I heard the man in a deep voice. Crap, he didn't fall for it. I felt the fear of death and my whole life flashed before my eyes. Just then, I saw a flashlight in front of me and realized what it was shortly afterward. My uncle came looking for me on his bike. My god, I'm alive. Thinking this, I burst out crying. I ran to my uncle and when I looked back, the man was gone. I told my uncle and grandmother everything I saw and we soon called the police. Police began searching for him, believing that he was involved in several disappearances in the town but they failed to find him. I still can't forget the voice I heard that night. I probably wouldn't be here right now if I wasn't so lucky. Always be careful of the stranger's voice. This incident took place when I was 20 years old. Next door to my house lived a man who only had one arm. My dad said he was a very good doctor, but that he'd lost one of his arms in an accident. Whenever I ran into him, he smiled abnormally brightly and shook his remaining arm. I felt sorry for him, but on the other hand, his unnatural expression and gestures sometimes gave me the goosebumps. He lived alone and always smelled bad. At first I thought it could have been because it was hard to take a bath with one arm, but... The stench just got worse and worse as the days went by. One night, I heard loud noises coming from his house. It sounded as though he was fighting with someone. I could hear screaming, things breaking, and other unnerving sounds. A little while after, all that racket stopped. He came over to my house to apologize for all the noise and handed me a steak. I have to admit, the steak looked delicious but I had to hold onto my nose because of his own stench. He then looked me over with a strange glance and smiled. I didn't know the meaning of that expression until a bit later. After all, aside from the noise, it was just a normal day, right? When I came to and opened my eyes, 
I was lying on the floor in a room that looked like a basement. My head hurt severely. When I touched it, my hair felt wet. I looked at my hand and there was blood all over it. Had I been hit over the head by someone? I tried to remember. After thinking about it for a long time, it started to come back to me. The doctor had come over to my house and handed me a steak. Then he had looked past me into the house and said, So, is there no one at home? I was home alone that night because my parents were getting home late. So I replied, yes. As soon as I tried to close the door, he had pulled something out from behind his back and hit me on the head. Hard. I must have fainted and now... I had been kidnapped by him and locked up in the basement of his house. Then I noticed the smell. It was the same terrible stench that always followed the doctor. It hung in the air so fully that I just knew the source had to be close by. I looked around slowly. There were many things, and machines that seemed to be used for some kinds of experiments. I turned my eyes towards where the smell was the strongest. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A dead body lying on the floor. No, two dead bodies, each one missing an arm. I covered my mouth to hold back a scream. My hands were shaking. Just then, I heard a squeaking sound, followed by footsteps. The doctor was coming down the stairs into the basement. Quickly, I lay back down and stayed as still as I could, pretending to still be unconscious. Opening my eyes just barely, I could see the doctor heading towards the desk, humming to himself. On it, there lay two severed arms. He put one of them up to his stump and stepped in front of a mirror to look at himself, as if he was trying on clothes at the store. I couldn't breathe at all. After trying on both of the arms, he put them away, turned around and started approaching me. He held my arm up to his stump, then he pulled out a pen and started drawing a line around my arm. I had to do something to survive. When he turned his back to find some tools, I kicked him as hard as I could. He fell to the floor and I managed to escape. When I was finally safely home, I immediately called the police. They arrived fast and arrested him. It turns out, he wasn't a doctor at all, but a crazy man who believed himself to be one, and also thought that he could attach another person's arm onto his own stump to replace the one he was missing. The trauma of this incident has left me with the tendency of folding my hands behind my back. I don't shake hands with anyone out of fear that my arm might be taken by someone else. To the woman at the bar last night who noticed my body language, thank you. You couldn't have known the specifics. Maybe the guy that was being aggressive with me was my boyfriend and we were just having a fight. Maybe you were afraid to get involved in a stranger's business, but you saw my nervous, intimidated body language, and you acted. There were couples and groups everywhere, but it took you, another girl alone at the bar, to recognize my struggle and act. We made eye contact, I was twisting my body away from the man's touchy hands and pleaded with my eyes. The look you gave me back was more than clear. You understood exactly what was happening to me. You'd probably been through it yourself. I can see you coming over and calling me by a generic term instead of a random name. Hey girl, it's been such a long time, you said. Extending your arms and a lifeline. You wrapped your arms around me. It was a different sort of stranger's touch from the man's hand on my knee. I squealed like we were long lost best friends, and I asked you what you were doing here. I remember the dull ache in my stomach when I heard you say that you were celebrating getting your masters in marine biology. Once upon a time, Long before Rob and I ran these schemes in dirty bars, I had been a little girl that wanted to be a marine biologist. 
Oh well. That was literally a lifetime ago. Oh my god! Congrats, girl! I yelled at you violently and asked if you wanted to dance. Of course! You replied, returning my vigor like I had loaned it to you. While we were heading out to the dance floor, I thought long and hard about giving Rob a signal. Your interest in marine biology made me feel guilty for a moment, but I ultimately took it as a sign that you were just my type. That you would taste wonderful. Only God knows how hungry I was. So, we started dancing, leaving behind Rob at the table. He hunkered off, pretending to be dejected. Nobody noticed him pass by where you had been sitting before, and nobody noticed him pour a small vial of liquid into your drink. Well, to the woman at the bar last night who noticed my body language, thank you for being so gullible. Let me give you some background before I begin my story. This took place in the summer of 2014. I'm a female who was 22 turning 23 that fall. I don't want to share my location, so I'll be making some minor changes for privacy reasons. I live in a small college town. I've lived there my whole life, and I've graduated from there. There's a lot of history in this little town, but unfortunately we do have a drug problem here. Other than that, we don't get a whole lot of crazy around our small town. I worked at a gas station that was owned by a family member. My husband and I worked opposite shifts. I was the early bird, so I would work the morning shift. I would get up around 3.30, 4 o'clock and open the store by 5. I was never worried about walking out to my car in the dark because I grew up living in the countryside outside of town. I loved being outside, even when it was dark. I used to lie in the grass and look up at the stars. When my friends would come over, we would always play ghost in the graveyard at night and did your typical teenager stuff during dark hours. Just messing around and having a little fun. We owned about four acres of land and no one ever bothered us. So I was used to being outside in the dark with no fear at all, which I'm not too fond of because I was so used to being in an open space and I was never really a city girl, even to this day. Now that you've got some background, let's get into the story. Now this is going to be a two-part story, so bear with me, because both of these incidents occurred very close to each other. As I mentioned before, it was the summer of 2014. I was getting ready for work like I usually did. When I got into my car, I started pulling out of my apartment's driveway. I then noticed a man walking down the road, pulling a suitcase behind him. As I got closer, I began to wonder why someone would be walking down the street pulling a suitcase at 4.40 in the morning. I thought about pulling up next to him and rolling down my window to ask him if he needed me to call the police or something, but I was suspicious. I grew up being told not to talk to strangers or to pick up hitchhikers, so there was no way that I was going to let a stranger into my car. But I'm also a nice person, and I'm always willing to help in any way that I can but I wouldn't do something that could put my life in danger. When I pulled out of the driveway, the man then started walking right towards my vehicle. I remembered losing my nerve and took off down the street. I looked into my rearview mirror to see him just standing there watching me. I knew something was off about this person, and I was also thankful that I didn't offer to help him. Some of you might think, oh, you're just over-exaggerating. But come on, why would this man come right at my vehicle? And what the hell was he doing walking with a suitcase in the middle of the street at 4 o'clock in the morning? Once I reached my work, I called the police and reported it. I told them that I was just a concerned citizen, and I have been living in this neighborhood for the past four years, and I had never seen this man before. The police told me that they would send a car out to patrol the area. Hours went by and I didn't hear anything from them. So I decided to call them back and inquire if they found anything. They told me that there was no trace of the man. So I just brushed it off and went about my day. 
I later mentioned it to my husband after my shift, and he told me that it was probably someone returning home from the airport or something, but the nearest airport is about an hour's drive away. My husband thought I was just overreacting about the whole thing. A few weeks later, I was talking to one of my customers and brought up this incident. It's a small town and everyone talks to everyone around here. As soon as I mentioned the man with the suitcase, my customer looked like he crapped his pants. He then started telling me that the police had recently discovered bodies and suitcases in our county. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up and my heart began to pound out of my chest. My customer asked me if I remembered what he looked like, but I didn't really get a good look at him. I'm not 100% sure if the man that I saw was the suitcase killer, but regardless, I'm glad I didn't stop to help that man. A couple of months later, I was again getting ready for work. I headed out of the back door of my apartment. My husband and I lived at the end of the hallway, so I figured I would just park my car close to the back door because I thought it would be easier than going all the way down the hallway. Plus, a lot of the front parking spots are always taken. When you go out of the back door, there are these huge pine trees lining a cement pathway that guides you to the back parking lot. It was still dark out, and the moment that I opened the back door, straight ahead was the dark figure of a large man running straight towards me. I didn't hesitate and I slammed the door shut and rushed back into my apartment. My heart was pounding violently inside my chest. I was in full-on flight mode. I had never run so fast in my life. The moment that I reached the bedroom, my husband literally sat straight up and asked me if I was alright. After I explained to him what was going on, he stood up from the bed and headed to our door to look through the peephole to see if there was anyone in the hallway. He saw nothing. So he opened the door a crack and started looking around. But there was no one there. I was still shaking, even when my husband walked me out to my car. I'm lucky to have such a great guy for a husband. Later that day, when my husband arrived at the gas station for a shift, he told me from now on to park in the front where the lights were. The same week, I ended up buying some pepper spray just in case I needed it in the future. It's been about seven years, and I still haven't used it, thank God. But I want to warn you all, even though you feel like you're safe in your own neighborhood, you still have to take precautions. Make sure that you park in well-lit areas if you're going to work very early like me. Always have a can of pepper spray or some sort of protection. You need to be aware of your surroundings, because you never know if there's someone hiding in the shadows, waiting for you to let your guard down. There are a lot of freaks roaming the streets, and you have to be careful out there. And if something doesn't feel right, follow your gut. One rainy night three years ago, I was driving on a quiet road with no other cars. Despite of the heavy rain, I managed to spot a soaked up man standing at the side of the road. His presence was strange. There was no place for pedestrians anywhere nearby. I thought that something may have happened to him, so I stopped the car. My headlights lit him up slightly. He seemed to be grinning widely. I was surprised as my initial assumption had been that something was wrong. But if that was the case, why would he be laughing like that? I lowered my window, only a little, feeling unsure. The man approached. When he got closer, and I got a better look at his face, my heart dropped. He wasn't smiling. He had no upper lip at all, as if it had been cut off. I could see his eyes were red. I wasn't sure if all the water running down his face was rain. There were tears mixed in. I spoke in a trembling voice. Sir, do you need any help? Then he suddenly screamed and rushed at me. You should be like me! He took out his knife and stuck it through the small opening in the window, madly trying to force it down further. I hurriedly closed the window and started the car, then hit the gas. I could see him chasing me like crazy from the rearview mirror. I floored it with all my might and got the heck out of there. 
I don't even remember exactly how I got home, and my trembling heart wouldn't calm down until morning. Even after all these years, I tremble whenever I think about that night. I don't have any idea what that man's story could have been, what kind of a person he was, or if he was even human. But one thing is for sure, I will never drive on that road again. In my senior year of college, me and my boyfriend at the time lived in an off-campus apartment on the third floor of this big old townhouse. In the mud room slash closet area right by the door was where we kept our cat's litter box. Now most people can tell you that unless it's right after your cat uses the box, it doesn't smell like poop. Usually just the cat litter smell. Clay, Febreze, whatever it is. So for about a week I noticed it smelled like death in that little corner and I tore the area apart and the rest of the apartment looking for rogue turds but found absolutely nothing. Then right in the middle of the mystery stink ordeal, I had to leave for a week to go on a work trip. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a welcome break from what was massively a disgusting little problem. And I quite openly hoped that my boyfriend might get the whole thing fixed before my return. But to my horror, it only got worse with my boyfriend texting me one night with the bad news that the smell seemed to have spread into the hallway outside. I felt bad for him, but there was nothing much I could do other than advise him to just call the landlord and see what she could make out of it. He says okay, and he'll call her in the morning and keeps me updated on everything that happens. The next morning I'm getting texts off of him like every 20 minutes, stuff like, just called landlady and she's on her way. Then I get stuff like, she thinks it's coming from another apartment. Then, okay, it's definitely coming from another apartment. Which I was kind of relieved about, but oh my god, was that jumping the gun because things were about to get way, way worse. The last text I get is, she just called the cops. I reply with, please don't tell me someone died next door to us. Then my boyfriend starts typing, but then stops. I go into full panic mode, trying to work out what it might be because I can't face the thought that our neighbor actually died, and we were living next to a corpse for like weeks, and partially because we were the jerks and didn't check on her. Then after about an hour, my worst fears are confirmed. The landlady gave some cop permission to bust the door down, and when he did, my boyfriend said he and the landlady literally ran from the site that greeted them. Our neighbor's dead body was lying there, face down in the hallway, with one arm out like they were reaching for the door when they fell. That piece of hallway ran perfectly adjacent to our mudroom, where we keep the cat's litter tray, which is why it smelled the worst there and out in the hallway. The whole time I've been thinking to myself, freaking cat, shaking my head and scrubbing the floor, and there had been a dead body just on the other side of the wall, not even two or three feet away. We always keep up with our neighbors now, even if they're more than capable of looking after themselves. Having that network, that kind of community, you don't realize how important it is until it's far too late. It all started when I was eight years old and we had just moved to Michigan. One night, my older brother and I were playing video games on our old PlayStation 1. In the middle of our session, I got a little bit thirsty and headed to the kitchen to get something to drink. When I was walking to the fridge, I noticed this odd, small shape in the woods outside, but I figured it was just a tree stump and thought nothing further of it. So I grabbed my drink and went back to play with my brother until bedtime. In the middle of the night though, I woke up to the sound of crunching leaves. The little eight-year-old me was immediately scared. I remember my heart was pounding so fast. I got out of bed, pulled aside the curtain and stared into the woods. But all I could see was the same shape that I'd seen earlier that night. Eventually I managed to calm myself down and went back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, I thought that I'd probably just had a bad dream. 
I'd soon learn just how wrong I was. I went downstairs for breakfast and poured myself a big bowl of cereal, but just when I was about to take the first bite, I suddenly felt sick. I could feel the hot puddle of drool in my mouth and my stomach twisted like it'd been tied into a knot. I rushed to the bathroom. When I threw up, all I could see were slimy and green things. I hadn't eaten anything bad. In fact, I had barely eaten the day before. There was nothing I could think of that could be causing me to retch like this. My mother walked in to help me clean up and then took me to see a doctor. The doctor ran a couple of tests on me, but the results showed nothing out of the ordinary. He told us to just wait a couple of more days and see if it would pass. Luckily, it did. The following few months were calm and free of any strange incidents. Then, my cousin came over. We were playing on the trampoline in the backyard when I felt sick again. This time, it was a bit different though. I didn't throw up. I just felt really sick and anxious. I went to my mother and told her that I wasn't feeling well, and she said that I probably just needed to eat something to feel better. Eventually my cousin went home, and the day was perfectly normal again, until I went to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of crunching leaves. I looked towards the window, and what I saw made my stomach drop. It was a woman's figure. I couldn't move at all, and my chest and right arm were hurting so badly, I somehow managed to finally find my voice and screamed as loud as I could. My parents burst into the room. My mother called 911 while my father stayed with me, trying to comfort me. At that point, I think I just fainted. When I opened my eyes again, I was lying in a hospital bed. I ended up staying for two more days, until I had properly recovered. Then years passed, and that strange woman didn't appear again. Around the time I turned 16, my family had to move to New York due to my father's job. On the day we were supposed to leave Michigan, I was finishing packing up my room. All of a sudden, I felt that strange wave of nervousness course through my body again. I immediately spun toward the window and froze. There she was, the same woman I had seen years ago. She was standing there in a long torn up dress in the very same spot and looking directly at me. Except, in the daylight, I could see her face better. She had no hair. I was missing both eyes. Just like when I was eight, I couldn't breathe or move at all. I heard my mom calling my name, but I couldn't answer. Shortly after, she knocked on my door. As soon as she entered and saw me having a seizure on the floor, she screamed. Then, something really strange happened. When my father ran in, having heard my mother scream, she was looking out the window and said to him, Don't call the cops. She just wants to play. Give her a chance. My mother stopped caring about me and kept repeating the same phrase over and over again. I thought she had gone crazy. But by the time the police arrived at the house, she had stopped repeating the words and was like my usual mom again. I was rushed to the emergency room and got an MRI to see if I had brain damage or something. But they told me that my brain looked perfectly healthy. We moved, and I thought that that would be the end of all that. A few years later in New York, I had found a job at a local store. I was just about finished with my night shift, and about to lock the front door, when I suddenly felt like someone was watching me. I turned around and... The woman with no eyes was standing right there. It had to be a nightmare. It just had to be. I passed out almost immediately. I didn't even have time to scream. When I woke up again, I could see flashing red and blue lights. The emergency technician said that my heart had stopped beating for about 60 seconds. The woman with no eyes hasn't appeared since then. Maybe she thinks that she finally managed to kill me. Yet, I'm still alive. This happened when I was only five years old. I remember that my family was coming back home from my grandparents' cottage that day. While on the way home, 
I started to have an extremely painful toothache. It was so strong that I was crying and screaming out in pain. So my mom searched the internet for the nearest hospital. Unfortunately, the only one around the area we were in was a mental hospital, which only had a dentist room for the patients of the hospital and for some emergency situations. As my mom was nervous about the patients, we immediately ran to the dentist's room. The dentist was in his early 40s, bald, and I remember that he had a really weird, kind of funny look about him. As we walked in, I guess he was annoyed about the fact that I was crying back then. Hey, kid, shut up. Real men don't cry, he said. I was just a five-year-old boy. My dad got pissed off, but he controlled himself because we weren't able to find another doctor. Suddenly, the dentist became super sweet and told me to sit on the chair. While he was checking my mouth, he seemed kind of nervous, but he was also saying some jokes to my seven-year-old brother. My brother started laughing, and then... What the dentist did almost made my heart drop. He screamed to my brother, Stop laughing or I'll take your brother's teeth out, one by one. It was enough. He was a weirdo, and at that point, my dad was furious. He was about to beat up this madman, but thankfully my mom calmed him down. Of course my brother got scared and started crying. He told him to get out because he was so annoying that he couldn't do his work. So dad got out with my brother and mom stayed with me. Being paranoid, my mom didn't feel comfortable about leaving five-year-old me behind with a weird stranger. I remember clearly that he looked at me in a very weird way that gave me the creeps. Just then, mom asked him if she could use the toilet that was in the room. Oh, sorry ma'am. This isn't a restroom. It's a room we keep old stuff, he said. But we could clearly see the restroom sign on the door, and even hear the noise of running water that the toilet made. From that moment until the end, the dentist seemed anxious. He was sweating and his hands were shaking. When he finished with my tooth, we immediately left and went home and my mom called her sister to tell her everything about the incident. A week after, my aunt called my mom. Did you see the news? She told us that she saw a dentist who had killed a woman in her late 20s, and he was keeping her in his clinic's bathroom for almost a week. And the place... The place was the same hospital where we had gone before. Shaking her hands, Mom turned on the TV, and there he was. It was the same man who had checked my tooth. That explained his weird behavior and why he didn't let my mom use the bathroom. A dead body was only a few meters away from me and my family. The dentist was diagnosed with schizophrenia and finally sentenced to death. I'm so glad that my mom didn't go to the bathroom anyway. And from my experience, I learned something that I want to share with you guys. If you ever notice that someone has a weird behavior that makes you feel uncomfortable, don't just stay there. Find an excuse and immediately leave. And this might save your life. The brown sedan stopped on the side of the road, yielding to the strobe of the squad car behind it. On a ghostly black road in the middle of nowhere, a veteran officer was walking a rookie through his first night of rounds and his first possible traffic citation. This car was going 20 under, making it an easy target. See, now that we've run the plate number, the driver should be Fred Halls, 
an adult male. White, brown hair, brown eyes. Okay, you're up, kid. Just take it slow. License and registration. That's all you need to get. I'll get those and come back. I'll walk you through the rest. Jane told the rookie, trying to be as encouraging as possible. He looked nervous, but determined. Okay, uh, I got this, he said, and with a deep breath, stepped out of the car. Jane watched from the passenger's side, grinning a little, and remembered her first night pulling over strangers in the dark. She watched him shining his flashlight in, chest puffed out. He spoke briefly, then shined his light to the back seat, then back at the driver. The driver turned his head slowly and spoke a little. Her grin started to fade, however. The rookie was walking back, empty-handed. He pulled open the door and said quickly. She could see his pale face. What are you doing, kid? Where are his papers? She barked at him, but he didn't even look at her. We should go. Now. That was all he said, his face frozen, a head in fear. What are you talking about? We can't just go. What's going on? What could you spooked? He said nothing. She looked at the car ahead, and the driver was just sitting there. Fine, I'll take this one. Just breathe, kid. She sighed and stepped out. Jane shined her own flashlight and walked to the driver's side where the window was still rolled down. Putting the beam on the driver, she said assertively, License and registration, please. The man who turned his head slowly appeared to match the description of Fred Hall's brown hair, brown eyes. But the rest of him was wrong. His eyes were bloodshot to the point of bursting. His skin looked like plastic. His mouth cut on each side to outline his jaw. His hands were stuck to the steering wheel. Bright reflective piano wire working severed digits that tapped at the wheel. What the... She said. What seems to be the problem, officer? Said Fred, clanking his jaw every syllable. She could see the piano wire coming from the back of his head jerked like a fish on a line. She followed the line to see hundreds in the back seat. It was all leading to the trunk. Panning light drew her attention, and she looked to see the squad car turning around, and in disbelief she had to watch it speeding off without her. She drew her gun. And behind her, the car door opened. What seems to be the problem, officer? I look at the children in front of me. Smiling boys and girls, dressed in pristine uniforms, hair neatly combed, assembled in neat lines. All hoping for a chance to get into my school. Yes my school. My school, with its Olympic-sized swimming pool and its sparkling blue water. My school, with its state-of-the-art classrooms and the best teachers and coaches money can buy. Everyone wants to attend my school, but I select only the best. I tell them to get changed, then lead them to the pool. They dive in like dolphins and begin to kick hard bubbles streaming to the surface. I watch them with a hawk's eye, noting how they kick with healthy legs and healthy arms. One boy, though, impressed me. He is faster than everyone else, stronger than everyone else, and he finishes first, then turns around and starts on the other side. Body glistening in the sun, water dripping off his skin like Neptune himself. He tells me proudly later his name is Peter. I tell him equally as proud that I'm thrilled to accept him into my school. He squeals like a little kid, and the excitement rises to his cheeks. His parents' eyes were misted with pride. The scribble on the contract seals the deal. Once all the paperwork is done, I lead him away to prepare. Lying him down, I sharpen my silver knife. I then bring it down, severing his arms in a swift chop. Blood gushes out of his wounds and pools on the metal table, dripping onto the floor. Peter moans, but I know he's a brave boy. 
Placing him carefully in a wheelchair, I wheel him to my car, which will take him to the best sporting school in the universe. I know he will do very well. After all, we always win gold at the Paralympic Games. Always. I live in Oregon in an area that has a lot of open areas like farms, lots, and just open fields. We also live about six miles from the nearest city. My parents own a lot of land, including our backyard, which is a well-kept area. And then it turns into a forest. Well, about 10 years ago, in 2011, for about a week or so, I remember hearing weird stuff out in that forest. And one day, my father said that he was grilling, and he went inside. He went inside for maybe three minutes. But when he came back outside, the grill was open, and all of the meat was gone. He thought maybe it were raccoons. So again, he grilled another day, and the same thing happens. After the second time, my father went to check the tapes, and what he saw was terrifying. It looked like something from a movie, like the movie Signs, the alien movie. It was very skinny, with no hair on his body, with eyes that would not be considered human eyes. My dad was a jokester, so I was convinced that he was playing a joke on me. He told my uncle what was going on, who's a police officer. He called him over to the house, showed him the video, and asked what he could do. My uncle didn't take my father serious, just like me, because my father was always playing jokes on people. To shut my father up, he told him that he would look into it. They decided not to tell my mom because she would freak out. I've never seen my father be this serious before. I thought it was just great acting until I woke up out of nowhere that same night. I heard the same sounds I had been hearing before. My room was in the back of the house on our second floor and I always kept my window open. So I looked outside in the darkness of the forest and just stared for about a minute. At that point, it was time for me to investigate. I had to see what it was or who that was messing with me. I watched a lot of military and spy movies, so I decided to sneak up on whatever this was with my camera. I went outside, silently walking into the forest with my night vision on. And this is what I caught on camera. I'm hearing the things in my woods again. I don't know if you can hear the noise. I'm recording with night vision right now. I've been hearing the uh, sound in the back of my woods quite a bit. I know that's what I've been hearing, but I'm not sure what it was or what it was doing, honestly. I just know that I surprised it. I'm not one to say that this was something weird, but maybe it was an animal. But it didn't look like any animal that I've ever seen in this area, or any human. What do you think it was? Jolene stood before a big oaken toy box. It had been over 15 years since she had last seen it. Now here it was, in her late mother's attic, gathering dust. She thought of long-forgotten memories of her and her brother Zack sitting in front of it, playing with their toys. Tears began to well in her eyes. She had not thought of Zack in a long time. In fact, she couldn't remember the last time she had remembered him at all. But looking at the toy box made the memories trickle back to her mind. It began to play inside her head like a movie. In their bedroom, Jolene and Zack were sitting on the floor in front of the toy box. Zack was bashing cars into each other, and Jolene was brushing her Barbie's hair. Their mother was out with her new boyfriend, and they were left to look after themselves. Why was it suddenly coming back? She blew dust off the top of the toy box and wiped the rest of it with her sleeve. She looked at hers and her brother's name scratched into the wood and drifted into another memory. The night she had scratched their names onto the lid of the toy box with a knife she had grabbed from the kitchen drawer. 
Her brother was cooking dinner, doing the best he could. Although their mother hadn't left them much, Zack had found half a bag of pasta in the back of the cupboard, just enough for him and Jolene. Once the dinner was served, they both sat down on the floor and ate plain undercooked pasta. Jolene wiped tears from her eyes. She couldn't believe it had been so long since she thought of him. But now it was all flooding back like an unstoppable wave inside her mind. Zack and her mom were shouting in the kitchen, and it woke her up. Jolene went over to the bedroom door and held her ear up to it. You're always out, it's not fair! It was Zack. He was crying. Why would I want to be here with annoying goblins like you two? I've got better things to do, their mother shouted. But, but we love you. Can love pay for the fucking rent? No, no it can't. Zack stormed to his room, weeping. And a moment later, Jolene heard the front door slam as their mother left too. That was all she remembered. All she needed to remember. It was clear to her now what had happened to Zack. He had been missing since that day for 15 years. Police never found him. Of course they never found him because nobody checked the toy box. Could it be? So my mother told me this story years after it happened. My dad was a truck driver at the time he left the military in the early 70s. By the time my siblings and I were born, he only drove in our home state of Texas, and summers were extremely busy for him. This incident happened during the mid-80s on one of his extended trips across Texas. I believe he was driving south on 281. He was getting tired when he pulled his rig into the parking lot of a truck stop. He was making his way to the on-site convenience store when he noticed a young woman pacing back and forth in front of the shop. She looked to be in her early 20s, slim, very pretty, blonde, and wearing a tank top with cut-off shorts, normal attire for Texas summers. She was carrying what looked like a plate covered in aluminum foil, as if she was making her way home from a family barbecue. He finished his business in the store and headed back to his truck. As he got in, he was stunned to see that the blonde woman was now sitting in his passenger seat. He was utterly shocked. He had no clue who this woman was or how she got past his locked door. My dad was always very vigilant on the road and never left his truck unlocked. He demanded that she get out of his truck. He wasn't afraid at this point, but something felt off about this mysterious woman. She sat there and looked at him with the covered plate on her lap not saying a word. For a moment he wondered if he should just get out, walk over to the passenger side door, and just yank her out of the cab. But he decided against it. I'm still not sure why. The whole thing was beyond strange, so my dad, against his better judgment, turned his rig on and drives off, with the blonde woman still in his passenger seat. A few miles up the road, he attempts to make conversation. I guess he was trying to quell the extreme discomfort he felt. He asked her name, but again, the woman remained silent. As they continued down the highway, lustful thoughts began to creep into my dad's mind. I'm sure it had been a while since he had last seen my mother. Out there in the rural Texas roads, who would find out? Just this one time, what could happen, right? My dad puts his hand on her thigh, right above her knee. As soon as he touched her, the blonde woman turned from a gorgeous young woman into some kind of hellish monster. Her face turned rugged, and her eyes were now black pits. Her teeth had turned into sharp fangs with a long, unnatural-looking tongue. The demonic figure let out a guttural hiss. From the plate she was still holding came the sounds of slimy movements, as if there was a pile of writhing worms beneath the foil. 
A putrid smell permeated the truck's cab, and my dad quickly turned his face from her and managed to bring his rig to a stop on the side of the road. As the truck came to a halt, my dad opened his door and jumped out of his truck. After taking a few moments to compose himself and allow his breathing to return to normal, he looked back at his truck. The demonic woman had vanished. He was now alone on the road. He started to pray, asking for God to rebuke the evil spirit. He eventually got back into his truck and drove off. The woman did not return. However, it was a while before the lingering stench dissipated. When my dad got home from that trip, he recounted everything to my mother. He had been so scared that my mother would not forgive him for his unfaithful indiscretion. He had seen a lot in his life, but nothing had ever frightened him like that before. He blamed himself for having impure thoughts, and perhaps that's why he attracted the evil spirit. I know many might say that people cheat on their partners all the time, and nothing like this happens to them. I can't explain why. I only know what happened to my father on the dark, lonely roads of Texas. When I was older, I brought up this experience to him and asked, Dad, did that really happen to you? He would never respond with words and just nodded. Back when I was 12, me and my buddies got to go trick-or-treating for the first time on our own. We had a curfew of 9pm sharp and by around 8.30, we suddenly decided that we didn't have nearly enough candy for our liking. So we started going really quick from house to house, trying to cover as much ground as possible. When our watches hit 8.45, most of us are suggesting just call it a night, but I had my heart set on one more house. No one wanted to get into trouble, but I'm insisting, like, just one more house. Think of the candy. That's what tips the balance, so we walk over to this one last house, up the driveway, and to the front door. I remember just instinctively pressing the doorbell, not even really looking at the door itself, so it took one of my friends to be like, Dude, look. I look, and I see the front door is actually open. It was only ever so slightly ajar, but it was open. I gave my buddy a look as to say, what? But we didn't push the door open or anything. I just carried on buzzing the doorbell, like maybe it had been left open on purpose. Another one of us called out, hello, but we didn't hear anything back and we were just about to walk away when we heard something from inside the house. It sounded like a thud, like someone, I don't know, kicked a couch or something. Not a super alarming sound, but... Enough to have us stop, turn back, and wonder if we shouldn't maybe check it out or something. Again, one of us calls out, Hello? Is anyone there? Only this time, I step forward to push open the front door. What we saw was a long, cream-colored carpet with what was obviously blood on it. There was blood on the carpet and blood on the door and its handle. We all see it, and for a second... We're all just totally dumbstruck. Then one of us just sprints off in the direction of a neighbor's house and bangs on the door. Within about 20 minutes, the street outside is just flooded with blue and red flashing lights and me and my buddies are sat on the curb outside answering some cop's questions. The worst part was when they wheeled someone out with a sheet over them, so we knew whoever's blood it was probably wasn't with us anymore. As you can imagine, our parents must have been pretty livid with us because we didn't get home until about 10.30. But since we were with cops, they knew something must have happened. I remember my dad kept checking the newspaper for any info, but all he could find was this tiny mention of a home invasion on Halloween. I guess the perps had knocked on the front door or maybe fooled the guy into thinking that they were trick-or-treaters. We didn't even get to save the guy. Like I was hoping that yeah, our whole year had been messed up with this thing, but at least we get to take credit for saving somebody whenever the EMT showed up, but we didn't get there in time, and he must have bled out pretty quick. All that after me insisting one more house. Just one more house.
I married my wife four years ago, and we finally moved into our dream house this year. It's a rustic home that's over 150 years old and on the very edge of town, but still within walking distance to everything we need. At some point, my wife had been convinced that our house was haunted. She kept telling me she heard voices when she was in the basement. I went down there with a baseball bat just in case someone was hiding down there. However, no one was there. Our friends started to worry about her mental health as she kept telling them about the voices she heard in every room in the house. I ended up bringing her to a doctor, but he couldn't find anything physically wrong with her. Then I asked a local priest to come over to our house and give it a blessing, and he agreed. My wife seemed much more relaxed after he left. She claimed the voices stopped, but she still didn't like to be left alone in the house. One day, I had a business trip to attend, and that would mean I was away for the week. I asked my wife to invite one of our friends to spend the week with her, but she refused, saying that she no longer heard the voices. After the trip, I came home, and to my horror, I found my wife's body hanging from the banister. She had written a note saying that the voices wouldn't stop. I immediately called an ambulance and they arrived within minutes. Of course, she didn't make it. All of my friends and family gave me sympathetic looks at the funeral, as they knew how crazy my wife was at that time. However, it was alright. After the funeral, my girlfriend helped me remove the hidden speakers as we prepared to start our new life together. Jeremy fumbled awkwardly in his pocket with his free hand, searching for the keys to the front door. He'd wished he'd have left the porch light on, but no, that was out of the question. He couldn't risk the chance of being seen with this parcel slung carelessly over his shoulder. After what seemed like an eternity, his fingers finally closed around his lucky pink rabbit's foot. It was a gift from his wife. Yeah, not so lucky tonight, he thought ruefully. He withdrew his keychain from his pocket and miraculously singled out the house key from the others. He inserted it into the knob and turned it. There was an audible click sound as the mechanism disengaged. He glanced over his shoulder looking at the neighborhood cautiously. It wasn't very late in the evening on this fall night, yet it had already grown dark. Most of his neighbors would be enjoying their dinner or catching up on the evening news, so he wasn't too concerned. Seeing no one, he turned the knob and began to open the door, then suddenly hesitated. Was that? No, no, couldn't be. He could swear he heard a muffled giggle from inside, but he must have been mistaken. He knew the house was empty. He took a deep breath, coaxing himself to relax as he stepped through the threshold. The increasingly heavy and frustratingly awkward parcel was nearly slipping from his grasp. He entered the doorway, closed the door behind him, and fumbled with the light switch. Suddenly, his living room was awash in bright overhead lights and... Surprise! Stunned. He gasped. Before him, leaping from corners and shadows, and from behind the couch in the bar, were dozens of people. Family, friends, co-workers, neighbors. Everyone was here. He was completely dumbfounded. Happy birthday! The parcel that was precariously balanced upon his left shoulder slipped and thudded to the floor. From within the loosely round roll of discarded carpet, his wife's hand flopped out, and her wedding ring sparkled beneath the fluorescent bulbs. On Monday, Eric was glaring into his mirror, noticing his hairline was pushing further back. He rubbed his hand over his balding head. This is just great. I'm only 25, too. What I wouldn't give to have a full head of hair again. Throughout the day, he was yanking on what hair he had left to relieve his stress, even pulling out some strands. When Eric woke up on Tuesday, 
Bits of hair had sprouted up again on his head. He couldn't explain it. It was like a miracle. On Wednesday, he woke up to his head fully covered, as if it had regressed back a decade and a day. He couldn't explain what happened on Thursday, though. Eric woke up to long, shoulder-length hair. He shrugged in the mirror and decided to keep it, not wanting to pass up the rare opportunity. Things were getting concerning when it was Friday. When Eric held his hair in his hands, it seemed to be growing at a visible rate. Eric was dumbfounded, unable to explain his ironic plight. He rushed over to a barber, begging him to buzz it all off before he was tripping over his own mane. It was a difficult process to fight back against the hair actively sprouting up, but the problem was subsided, for now. Eric woke up on Saturday surrounded by his own hair on his bed. The hair was really fighting back now, pushing out at an alarming rate. He leaped out of bed and haphazardly hacked his hair with scissors, but the hair still flowed out like a faucet. He dashed into his living room to give himself more space then soon realized he needed to run outside to give him more space. Ah! He screamed as he ran down the sidewalk, trying to hold up his hair behind him. The large mane was weighing him down, collecting twigs and stones while dragging on the floor. Eric eventually made it to an open field, hopefully giving him enough space. However, he had no idea how to combat it anymore. All he could do was stand in the field and wait for the hair to surround him. Ah! Eric held his head and shrieked like a maniac, unable to come to terms with his fate. One day, a gigantic bush was reported in the middle of a field. It had a disgusting smell, with clumps of dirt and small animals stuck inside. When police cut down to the center of the bush, they were shocked to find a human skeleton laying on the ground. I graduated from a Sam Houston State University in Texas back in the early 2000s. Like most college students, I definitely encountered a handful of weird and quirky individuals, but none I'd remember like Bart. Bart wasn't his real name. It was Thomas, but since he had the middle name of Bartlett, he went by Bart because it suited him better. And boy did it ever. He had a mischievous streak that was a mile wide and often verged on criminal. At best, he was the life and soul of the party. At worst, he seemed downright dangerous. Sometimes he got it into his head that certain people were just out to get him, and he always talked about his parents like they were the two evil tyrants in his life when it was common knowledge that they spoiled him rotten with cars, gifts, and a free ride through college. One time, when this one kid made him mad, Bart broke into the guy's dorm and tried to steal his computer. I think he only dodged getting kicked out of school after he convinced everyone, including the victim, that it was just kind of a prank gone wrong. But we all knew the truth. He really had wanted to hurt that kid. I just didn't think he had an actual violent bone in his body. But as it turned out, he actually kind of did. I remember he asked me out of the blue one time, How much money would it take for you to kill someone? We were always asking each other dumb questions like that. Like, who'd win between a bear and a lion? Weird, would you rather questions that were usually pretty not safe for work. So as much as I didn't take the question seriously, I still gave a moment's worth of thought. I remember telling him I wasn't sure. That'd have to be at least half a million. But then he looks all annoyed and asks, You wouldn't kill someone for ten grand? I responded, God no, dude. It'd have to be like retirement money. He comes back with, Twenty grand? I just laughed the question <laughs> off at that point. But then he just ups it by ten grand at a time until I gave him a definite no. A few moments of silence go by while he thinks, then he says, Fifty. I'd give you fifty. I'm literally about to ask him why he's obsessing when someone else appeared and called out to us and Bart dropped the issue. I remember thinking it was a weird question to begin with, but the way he asked it was even weirder. Almost like he was really thinking about trying to hire a hitman or something. But we always talked about dumb stuff like that, so 
I guess I just forgot about it after a while. Sometime later, Bart drops out of college for some reason, probably something to do with the fact that he barely did any of the work and that was pretty much the last we saw of him. I mean, we keep in touch every so often, planning to do stuff but never actually doing it. Then this one time, Bart is texting my roommate who in turn tells me that Bart was saying he was going to come visit, only he was serious this time. He said he was about to get his hands on some trust fund of his parents that he had kept safe for him and how he'd pay for us all to go down to Mexico for spring break the following year. I'm like, cool. I didn't believe he'd actually come visit, but I figured maybe a cash injection might help him get his butt into gear. Bart never did come to visit though, and we found out why when my roommate called me into his bedroom to show me something on his computer. Bart's entire family had been killed, and he'd been shot in the arm and would seemed like a home invasion gone wrong. We tried calling him a bunch, but he didn't answer his phone, so we figured he either wasn't out of the hospital yet, or he just wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone, which I found perfectly understandable at the time. I can't even imagine how devastated I'd be if something like that happened to my family. Then, over the course of a few months, the truth came out. It started when Bart was arrested, we were just confused at first, but the only thing we could think of was that the cops had somehow found drugs or something else illegal in Bart's possession while searching his home. I mean, we knew he'd been shot in the arm, we'd seen it on the news, and they had a suspect in custody who'd fired all ten shots or whatever, so why arrest Bart? Long story short, they arrested Bart because the cops found out he actually knew the home invader. Then once they checked his phone, they found text messages from the same guy where Bart was arranging for the guy to kill his own family. They even talked about how the guy would need to shoot Bart to make it look authentic and how the shooter had to make sure his entire family was dead, otherwise he wouldn't get paid out of the inheritance. I knew Bart was crazy and I knew he could be a little impulsive sometimes but dear God, to have your own parents murdered in such a horrifyingly elaborate way I had no idea he was evil too. And that's what freaks me out about it. You'd never have guessed that Bart was capable of something like that. At least I didn't want to believe he was. I heard one of his parents actually survived and begged the state not to put him on death row. They succeeded too. So I guess that's some small silver lining from a horrifying little episode in my life. One rainy day when I was driving home, I came across this man who was walking. As I'm approaching him, I debate with myself if I should give this man a ride or not. It can be dangerous because you never know what can happen, but in the end I decided to stop and ask him if he needed a ride. When I stopped, I looked at him and my first thought is poor man, soaking wet, dirty clothes and with a face of someone that just lost everything. So I asked him, can I give you a ride sir? Which he replies, a ride downtown will be appreciated. I told him of course and he got inside. When he entered the car, he didn't say a word. I tried making small talk but he wasn't answering. He just sat there looking into the void. After a few minutes I asked him if he wanted to eat something. It was late in the night but I could pass my house and make something for this man. I had established at this point that this man wasn't dangerous at all. He looked skinny and frail. The man answered, Yes, please. I haven't eaten in a few days. It didn't surprise me. I told him I would prepare something to eat, and I would arrange a place for him to sleep. When we arrived, I took the man to the kitchen. I told him to sit down, and I would prepare something for us to eat. He sat down, and I went into the fridge, and I saw what I could do for the both of us. I was actually hungry, too. But when I looked back to check the guy again, he was already gone. I couldn't find him anywhere. I had checked everywhere except in my basement. Usually my basement door is always locked, but for some reason this time it wasn't. So I made my way down the stairs and I see him standing in the middle of my floor, looking at me at the bottom of the stairs. I approached him slowly. Couldn't see his eyes, but he held an aggressive posture facing me. He then says, It was you. I don't understand, I said. 
At that moment, he shows me a necklace and says, This is my wife, and I found it here. It took me a long time, but I finally caught you. He draws out a knife from his pocket and he tries to slash my neck. He missed by inches but made me fall back. Once on the ground, I took my concealed handgun and I shot him twice in the chest. He fell to the ground. I got up and I shot him one more time just to make sure. And then I tell myself, I need to be more careful. You see, the thing is, I've done some messed up things in my past and this guy pretty much caught me. I guess I robbed his wife or something, but I couldn't let that situation unfold. I'm not going back to jail. So this happened last year when I was house sitting for my neighbor. He was in the hospital for a few days recovering from surgery, and I had been asked to stay in the house and keep an eye on his cats. The house was pretty small, but it was on a nice wide open property by the woods and there was a tiny swinging cat flap on the kitchen door where the cats could come and go as they pleased. The flap led into a screened in back porch and the house only had one bedroom. So I chose to sleep on the couch in the living room. After cleaning up, feeding the cats and watching some TV, I shut off all the lights and laid back on the couch. I had my phone out and was casually scrolling through Facebook when I heard the flap swinging back and forth. From where I was in the living room, I couldn't see the door because the counter was in the way, but I glanced over to see one of the cats scamper over and leap up on my legs. I gave it a welcoming pat on the head and continued scrolling. After another minute, I heard the cat door make a noise again, a soft squeak. This time, I didn't even glance over, figuring it was the second cat following the first into the house. Another few moments passed, then I heard the squeaking again and after another moment, it squeaked a third time. I looked up from my phone, wondering why the second cat was jumping in and out like that. I was wondering if I would have to scoop it up and put it in the bedroom. The door continued to squeak for another couple of minutes, as the second cat continued to jump in and out. I finally decided that I had enough. I put my phone down and sat up on the couch. I began to stretch. As I did, I happened to glance behind the couch and my blood froze. The second cat was curled up in its bed in the corner, and the first cat was still nestled between my legs. My confusion turned to fear instantly. Was there another animal on the back porch? Another cat maybe? I slowly stood up and carefully made my way over to the back door, tiptoeing across the carpet in my socks. The door made a squeaking noise again. I peered around the counter and felt the sensation of my heart leaping up into my throat. And at the same moment, my stomach dropped. By the faint rays of the nightlight in the hallway, I saw an arm reaching through the cat door, straining to get at the knob. The fingertips were brushing at the lock. For a few short seconds, all I could do was stare in terror, frozen by the surreal silent reality of what I was experiencing. It almost didn't feel real. The severity of the situation hit me, and I realized that if the intruder got in, I wasn't going to stand a chance. I grabbed a large two-pronged fork that was used for flipping steaks on a grill, and in one swift motion, I stabbed at the arm right below the wrist as hard as I could. There came a thunderous scream of pain from the other side of the door. and the arm was immediately retracted through the flap. But the fork had impaled the intruder, so it caught itself on the door. That produced a second loud scream, and the arm was wrenched violently outside. I heard the clatter of the fork on the ground, and then I heard footsteps sprint across the back porch and out the screen door. I immediately turned on the outside lights and caught the glimpse of a figure running towards the woods. Instead of calling the cops, I scooped up both cats stuffed them into the same carrier, grabbed my phone, my shoes, and sprinted out to my car, which was thankfully parked inside the garage. I drove up the road a couple of miles to my place, and once I was safely inside, I called the cops. It took them half an hour to get to my place, and then another half hour of questioning before they continued down the road to check out my neighbor's house. 
They told me that there was no sign that the screen door had been broken into, and aside from the bloodstains, there was no sign of the intruder. They put out an alert to local hospitals for a man with a stab wound on his right arm. The following morning, the police brought a dog out to follow the scent, but whoever the lucky bastard was, he was never caught. I kept the cats at my place until my neighbor was out of the hospital. It still shakes me to my soul. The idea that the stranger chose that house, in the middle of nowhere, trying to get inside. And if I hadn't got off the couch when I did, this may have ended very differently. As far as I can tell, the sleep talking started a couple months ago. I pray it hasn't been any longer than that. For all I know, it could have been going on for weeks to years without my knowledge. How could I not know? We've slept in the same bed for over a decade, but I never noticed my wife saying anything in her sleep, beyond an occasional moan or whimper. See, I'd been having issues with insomnia lately, probably due to drinking more coffee at work. It's a bad cycle. I'd go into work tired, so I'd drink more coffee. I wouldn't sleep well. You get the drift. Anyways, I was lying awake at 3am, staring into the blackness above me, when I heard her whisper something so low that it was almost inaudible. It was a name. Brad Johnston. Who in the world is Brad Johnston? I remember wondering. As I mulled it over, I fell asleep. The next day, I asked her about it. Who's Brad Johnston? She looked at me blankly. What? Genuinely flabbergasted. Brad Johnston, you said his name while you were sleeping. She just shrugged. I don't know. Never heard that name before. Sorry about that. Was it an ex-boyfriend? A character on a show she watches? I didn't know. I figured it could just be a coincidence. I shrugged it off. The next night... She didn't say anything. In fact, for a week there were no more whisperings that I was aware of. Seven days later, it was once again 3am. I was staring at the ceiling when I heard her whisper. Susan Decker. The next morning, I asked her about it. Just like the first time, she couldn't tell me where she was getting these names from. After that, the names started coming faster. Kyle Traeger, Kim Tran, Lakeisha Jeffers, and so on. At first, it was one name a night. Then it was two. Then three. Then four. After a couple of weeks, I got the idea to start googling some of the more unique names. I wish I hadn't. From what I could tell, they were all names of people who had committed suicide. Brad had hanged himself, Susanna had taken pills, and Kyle and Lakeisha were jumpers. Search after search confirmed it. They had died the night she'd uttered their names. I wrestled with whether or not I wanted to share this information with her. I didn't know what good it would do. It's not like she knew what was going on. In the end, though, that's exactly what I did. Of course, she was devastated to hear the news. She said she didn't ever want to sleep again, but she had to. And the names kept coming. And tonight, I heard my own name pass her lips. Christopher Amber. I've never made a noose before, but my hands sure seem to know what they're doing. The story's about my friend and her six-year-old son. One day, she brought a new phone. When she came home from work, she started cooking dinner and left her phone down on the kitchen table. Her son came into the kitchen and saw the phone. He asked his mother if he could play with it and uh, she actually told him yeah, as long as he did not call anyone or delete any text messages. So of course, the boy agreed and went off to his bedroom, well actually his mother's bedroom to play with the phone. Around 10 p.m. that night, 
She went upstairs to tuck him in, and she found him fast asleep on the bed. The new phone was lying on the ground beside the bed. She picked it up and began browsing through the settings to make sure he had not deleted anything. She noticed some minor changes. He had changed the theme, the background, and had given her a new ringtone. She noticed that he had taken some pictures with the phone. She opened the images folder and browsed through the phone. How cute, she thought. He had been taking selfies. Then she came across the last photo in the folder. When she first saw it, she couldn't quite believe it. Were her eyes playing tricks on her? It was a photograph of her son lying asleep on her bed. But the disturbing thing was that there was someone lurking in the far left corner of the picture. It seemed to show the left side of a creepy old woman's face. Until this day, her son could never answer the question about who that woman was and how she got in there. My husband won't look at me anymore. He used to tell me I was beautiful. He used to smile at me with adoration. But now, it's like he can't even stand to look at me. And I feel so unwanted. Whenever I call him out, he shrugs it off or just denies it. I've even tried sexy lingerie, buttering him up with compliments, cooking his favorite meals, but I get nothing from him. I'm convinced he's going to ask for a divorce. It's becoming unbearable. I've wondered if I should just speed up the process and leave him, but I really, really love him. So I asked him if he'd be open for marriage counseling, but he refused that too. He says that the only one with issues is me. That is just a plain lie. I don't have any issues aside from how he treats me. To be completely honest, he's had plenty of issues before. And I've always come up with solutions and stuck by him. When he lost his job a few years back, who took care of all the bills? Me. When he needed surgery, who cared for him? Me. When he was jealous of other men staring at me and calling me gorgeous, who took a knife and hacked up her face? Me. I just don't understand his problem. I always do everything for him. I love him so much. But I think maybe I need to make some huge gesture to show him how much he means to me. Any suggestions? A while back, my mom told me and my brother an unbelievable story of how she and her dad had a brush with the paranormal. It was an afternoon many years ago. Apparently, mom was just talking with the neighbors outside while dad was fast asleep on the couch and my then one-year-old brother was playing upstairs in his room. As for me, I hadn't been born yet, although mom was already pregnant with me at the time. Mom had just stepped back into the house when my dad woke up with a start, drenched in cold sweat and breathing heavily. Mom asked him if he'd had a bad dream or something. Dad nodded and started telling my mom about it. In the dream, my brother, uh, let's call him Louis for the sake of the story, was just sitting on the floor of his room playing with some blocks when a strange woman appeared. She had a long black dress and hair that hung over one of her eyes. Her skin was pale with black marks all over her body, but strangest of all, she had horns that looked like the branches of a tree. She was gazing at my brother. He didn't seem to notice her at first, but once he did, he started crying immediately. The lady raised her arms and reached out to my brother, as if she was about to pick him up. That's when my father snapped awake, and right when dad finished describing his dream to my mom, they heard my brother crying. My parents rushed up the stairs and straight into my brother's room. Dad was shocked when he saw the woman from his dream standing over my brother, reaching out exactly as she had in his dream. Dad screamed at her to not touch my brother, and in the blink of an eye, the lady disappeared. Over the next few months, my dad kept seeing the lady in black everywhere. In the house, at our neighbor's front door, at the yard. He once even saw her sitting in a tree by our house. But every time, the moment they made eye contact, she'd disappear. 
Then came the day when one of our neighbors, Diane, saw the woman too. So back then, my uncle used to live in a house near ours, but unfortunately, he died recently in a motorcycle accident. It was actually not too long before the incident started. Diane was taking care of his birds after his passing. She had just gotten to his house and started opening the windows to let some fresh air in when she saw her. The lady was hunched over the floor as if digging for something. Poor Diane got so scared, she jumped and knocked a knife set off the table. The loud noise alarmed the lady and she raised her head. She then slowly turned her face towards Diane. And they made eye contact. But the lady didn't disappear this time. She growled deeply like an animal and started to rush towards Diane. Diane screamed in panic and ran out of the house, slamming the door behind her. That was the last known incident with the lady in black. Even after all this time, there seems to be no explanation for who or what she was. And if I'm honest with you, I'm not sure I even want to know. I will never forget this horrible incident that I've been through. One sunny day, I was walking around the town just to do a little bit of exercise. Then I saw this man who wore a leather hat, a white shirt, and ripped jeans. I usually walk alone, so I was nervous at that time. The man tried to make simple talk with me, asking for my name and my number, but he seemed to be a little bit off somehow. Since I didn't have anything except my phone and my ring, which was a gift from my grandpa, and never suspected he would rob me. He then creepily smiled and asked, Can I escort you to your house? No, it's okay. I can walk by myself. Thank you, I replied. It's not that easy for me to trust a person, especially since I've gained weight these past few years. He then told me that he wanted to show me something in the back of his car. In the Philippines, I know some YouTubers make these kinds of hidden camera content. I knew this guy was acting a little bit suspicious, but then thought maybe he was one of the YouTubers or something. Once I followed him to the back of his trunk, he told me that he would just open it up. While I was waiting for it to be opened, I heard a few screams coming from the trunk of his car. I was confused. There was a button under the car, so I opened the trunk. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. There were two girls and one boy inside his car. I quickly ran up to the man, punched him so hard in the face and yelled at him, Why do you have all these people in your car? Why are they tied up? The man told me that he wanted to sell their organs because he wants to get some drugs. Just then I got so pissed and then punched him in his face five more times. When he finally collapsed, I hurried to get the two girls and the boy out of the trunk. They were excited to get out, and I asked what happened to them. There were three of us walking, and this man came up and told us that he has a lot of Xbox games in the back of his car. After we followed him, we realized that it was a trap. I ended up calling the cops. After dialing the number, I felt like it was an eternity waiting for them. They finally arrived after about 30 minutes. After I explained to them that he tried to kidnap us, he eventually got arrested. It turned out the guy was also high on drugs at the time. A few days have passed. I was awarded a medal from the police. And those two girls and the boy that I rescued became my friends. The man was sentenced to 37 years in prison for trying to commit murder and kidnapping. It's so lucky for us that we're still alive. What would have happened if I didn't fight back? What would have happened if I just followed the guy's words? I would have been a dead corpse. My name is Gianna. This incident occurred when I had just finished high school. I was looking for a small and cheap apartment to live in. One day, I was scrolling on this website which had a whole bunch of cheap apartments. Then, one apartment caught my eye, so I checked the description. It seemed pretty good except for the fact that it had a room for a roommate. Honestly, I didn't mind having a roommate as long as it was a girl. 
and there was a girl who was already living there, so I happily agreed to meet her. My mom came with me to look at the apartment. She said it was a nice place. She also helped me move all my stuff in. Then I met my roommate Connie, and I finally finished unpacking. She seemed like a nice person, but we didn't really say much to each other. One night, I was about to go to bed when I saw Connie walk out of her room, wearing black pants and a white cardigan. Where are you going? I asked her. I'm just going to the bar for a little bit with my friends, she answered blankly. This wasn't the first or second time I saw that kind of reaction from her, so I wasn't particularly surprised to see her like that. I went to bed again, but soon... <laughs> I woke up again from the sound of someone crying. It sounded over-exaggerated and dramatic. So I got out of bed and stood in the hallway to see where it was coming from. Connie's bedroom door was slightly open. And it seemed like the crying was coming from her room. Feeling uneasy, I decided to go and see what was happening there but immediately felt a sharp pain in my foot when I approached her room. I yelped quietly and flung my back onto the wall. When I looked under my foot, I could see the shards of glass scattered all over the floor. Oh crap. I decided to go wash my foot and came back out into the hallway in my slippers. When I came inside, there was no one in her room but her clothes were thrown all over the floor, which was kind of weird. That's when I realized the crying was coming from behind the door. I looked to see who was there, and to my surprise, a woman was standing behind the door crying, with no clothes on, and holding a knife. It happened in the blink of an eye. She jabbed the knife straight into my leg. Screaming at the top of my lungs in pain, I ran to my bedroom, locked the door, and grabbed a scarf. When I tried to wrap the scarf around my leg, I saw the knife was still stuck inside. I was terrified that the woman was still out there and ended up calling 911. The cop soon arrived at the apartment, and fortunately, she got arrested on the spot. After they investigated the apartment, they found three of Connie's fingers inside of a jewelry box. Since then, I have never lived in an apartment with a roommate again. My name is Mark. This story happened when I was in the seventh grade. One day in July, school had just ended so me and my friends grabbed our bikes to leave. I used to ride a bike to my house with a couple of my friends. We had a pretty nice neighborhood, so my parents and I thought that nothing bad would happen. But we were completely wrong. When we got on our bikes, all my friends decided to go to someone's house. Everyone except for me and the new kid that I didn't know very well. So... We just said goodbye to the others and continued riding our bikes on our way home. Since my house was a block away from his, we were heading the same way. And we came across a new office building across the street from my house back then. Then I came up with an idea. Hey, why don't we check out that office under construction? He agreed. And then we turned back around and started riding to the construction site which took about 30 minutes. Once we got there, we wanted to go inside so, quietly, we opened the door and went up to the 7th floor. Keep in mind, this office building was pretty much finished but, not exactly fully finished just yet. Just then, we heard something that sounded like someone's footsteps. At first, we brushed it off as, as if it was just a floor creaking, but then we heard a gun reloading. Looking at each other in panic, we immediately started running down the stairs. A loud gunshot went off, 
and someone pushed me down the stairs just at that moment. Thankfully, there was a carpet below, so I wasn't hurt bad, but still needed someone's help to pull me up. The other kid looked behind to see me on the ground and picked me up. We were both panicking back then. The adrenaline surged so hard and we both kept running down the stairs. We decided to look behind us when we arrived on the fifth floor. There was nobody, but we could hear someone running towards us. We didn't have a choice other than to keep running. It didn't take long to get to the first floor. When we managed to get out of the building, I looked behind the door again and couldn't believe what I was seeing. There were five men chasing us. Since we decided not to split up, we hopped on our bikes and rode all the way to my house. When we got to my house, we jumped inside and decided to look out of the peephole to make sure that nobody was waiting outside. To my horror, I could see some guy's glowing yellow eyes through my peephole. I screamed at the top of my lungs, picked up the phone and immediately dialed 911. Thankfully they arrived quickly. I'm sure that the police had noticed how frightened we were. The scariest thing was that the guy was still there, even when the cops had just arrived. However, he had soon disappeared when we walked outside to speak to the cops. And after their full investigation of the neighborhood, they found nobody. Now, it's been five years since this incident. However, it wasn't the end. Two days ago, I was walking across the street to go to my friend's house. The same kid that I was with on that fateful day. Just then, I saw someone. Across the street, there was the same man that chased me and my friend down that day. He was smiling so widely, as if it looked like someone stitched his mouth all the way to his ears. He looked straight at me, and then started rotating his head at a full 360 degrees. I screamed at the top of my lungs and started running down the street to my friend's house. Fortunately, I got to his house safely, but I still don't know how that could have even been possible. It wasn't my imagination, and my mind wasn't playing tricks on me, but it was so realistic. To this day, I'm still afraid of him and worried about that one day if I see him again. This time, he wouldn't just look at me, but he could do something much, much worse. When I was 13, my mom and dad let me go trick-or-treating for the first time without any supervision. All these years later, I can still remember how psyched I was that I was allowed out on my own for the first time. But little did I know, it would prove to be my first and last time trick-or-treating on my own. So at around 5.30, me and a few of my middle school buddies all got together and started walking from house to house. But we were faced with something of a problem. Some of the fancier houses, the ones with spookier decor, were so jammed up with kids that some had literal lines forming down the driveways. So, not wanting to line up for our candy, we figured we'd be smart and knock on the houses that no one else was knocking at. This was not a smart idea for obvious reasons, as the houses with no decorations sometimes just tell you to get lost or pretend not to be home at all. Anyway, we knock on this one house and instead of getting some grouchy grown-ups, some kid the same age as us answers the door. We didn't recognize him from school or from hanging around the neighborhood, so we're kind of confused like, trick or treat? All before the kid just slams the door in our face. Feeling suitably rejected, a few of us go to just walk back down the driveway, but 
One of my friends is like, nah, screw this kid, and knocks on the door again. The kid answers and my buddy sings, trick or treat, before striking this dumb pose as if to be like, screw you. The kid then absolutely explodes and screams like, you knock on the house again and I'll kill you, before slamming the door again. Again, most of us are like, dude, let's just go. But this one friend of mine is basically like, oh, it's on. Shoves his finger into the house's doorbell and keeps it there, resulting in this long, solid burr sound. Even over the buzzer, you could hear the kid running back towards the door from the other side. Only this time when he opens it up, he has this huge, gnarly looking blade in his hand, like a sacrificial dagger in design, but at least the length of his forearm. As soon as we see it, we just bolt up the driveway and out into the street, but I kid you not, this kid follows us. We managed to maintain a steady distance between us as we ran, and the kid wasn't all that fast of a runner. But in all of our dumb costumes, we couldn't run as fast as normal, so we're in serious danger of maybe tripping, falling, or just slowing down enough for this psycho knife kid to catch up to us. I think the worst part was when we saw some lady taking out some trash and we ran to her for help. She just looked at us like we were playing a prank. And then when she saw the knife, she just bolts back indoors too. I swear to God, that was the worst feeling thinking, my God, no one's going to help us. Then, I remember seeing the fastest of us like swerving over to some house on one side of the street where we were running down. Then, only when I got a little closer did I realize he was bolting into an open garage. We all follow and we manage to pull the manual door down just in time to shut out the knife kid, then starts kicking the garage door. This summons the homeowner into the garage who's obviously like, what are you doing here? But once we explain the situation, the guy runs off to call the cops. We're still in the garage, shaking and panting, still terrified the kid is going to break into the guy's home somehow. But the next time the homeowner reappeared in the garage, he has his cell phone in one hand and a gun in the other. Only then did I actually start to feel safe. Like I'm not even a gun guy or anything like that, but I saw that thing and just thought, okay, if the kid gets in, he's done. And in the moment, that actually calmed me down. Kind of scary that it did, but we move on. Anyways, the cops showed up pretty quick which meant we had the pleasure of watching that stupid psycho get slammed into the pavement. Kind of a sad story in a way because we heard the kid was super neglected by his parents and that he had a bunch of mental problems too. His parents used to leave him alone for weeks at a time because they traveled a bunch for work. Kind of like if Kevin from Home Alone had just suddenly lost his mind or something. I feel for the kid in a way, but honestly, he was lucky he didn't get shot either by the homeowner or by the cops. And we all hate that kid to this day because, after that, we weren't allowed to go trick-or-treating until we were way too old for it, anyway. I'm a DJ here in South Korea, and because English is not my first language, please excuse me if there are any mistakes here. Twenty years ago, I was driving home from a late-night wedding gig it was around 4.30 a.m. and I was driving south on our equivalent of an interstate highway, when at one point, the retaining walls on each side of the highway grew very narrow due to the road snaking through mountain passes and other tunnel-like places. It's not like a particularly dangerous place to drive, but the blind bends definitely made me a little nervous as I slowed down to traverse them. Good job I did too, because suddenly, out of nowhere, a young woman jumped out in front of my car, and I was forced to slam on the brakes hard. I swear I almost gave myself whiplash, but I managed to stop in time, and I was so angry that I got out of my car to shout at her. What was she even thinking that she was doing? She looked up at me, didn't say a word in reply, then actually ran to the passenger side door and climbed into my car. It was then that I realized that she was evidently running from someone or something, so I freaked out for a second and as many minutes, then jumped back into my car and drove off. I kept asking her, are you okay? Who's chasing you? But she only ever replied with, I'm sorry, I just need to call my mom. I just need to call my mom. 
She looked to be in her late teens, with dyed blonde hair and dirty clothes that made it look like she tripped a few times while escaping an attacker. I told her it was okay, that I'd drive her somewhere so she could call her parents, but I couldn't get a straight answer out of her because she was panicking and crying. We'd both seen the figure in my rearview mirror as we drove away. It caused her to scream out, which made me speed up. I thought she might calm down a little so she could tell me what was going on, but she was terrified and just kept saying I need to call mom whenever she calmed down enough to talk. I know what you're thinking. Why didn't she just use a cell phone? Well, this was a time when not everyone in South Korea could afford cell phones. They were in the market, sure, but to buy even a terrible one would require at least middle-class salaries, so I had to wait until I saw a 24-hour gas station to find anywhere the girl could use the phone. I asked her if she needed any change to use the pay phones, but she just looked up at me and said the same thing. I just need to call mom. I think that's when I realized that something wasn't right. It was literally the only thing she said to me for the entire ride and when we stopped, she just got out and ran into the grocery store. It was very evident that she was terrified of whoever had been following her and it was also evident that they were too scared to talk about it so trying to be a good citizen, I called the police and told them everything. I kept the car running and kept watching the girl as she used the payphone. The police dispatcher told me it would be around 10 minutes before the police arrived and I was worried she'd freak out if she found out I'd called them. So, that was what was occupying my mind as I watched the girl put the phone down before she appeared to start walking back towards my car. Suddenly, she stopped, and she turned back towards the gas station as if she'd heard something around the corner of it, which was completely dark and not covered by any lights. I watched as she walked closer and closer towards it, almost like someone was calling her name into the darkness, then... Out of nowhere, I saw a man leap out of the darkness, grab her, and drag her back into it. I immediately put my foot down, zooming around to where she'd been grabbed so I can illuminate the darkness with my headlights. It was a matter of seconds, and I thought I'd see some predator trying to drag her behind a dumpster or something, but there was no one there. No one there at all. It actually took my breath away for a moment. There didn't seem to be anywhere for two people to disappear, just a chain link fence and the rear of the gas station. So where had they gone? Before I got a chance to look any further, the police showed up, so I ran over to their car and frantically told them what I'd just seen. We searched the area completely. They even checked in the back room of the gas station, but there was no one fitting the description of the girl or the attacker. The police thanked me for filing the report, but told me that there was no longer any reason for me to be there. It was about 5.30 in the morning by that time, and adrenaline was starting to wear off, so I did as I was told and went home to sleep. Naturally, it wasn't the most peaceful sleep of my life, and my first thoughts when I awoke were that that poor girl had been dragged into the shadows. And I never learned of her fate. Nothing was in the news about it, and when I contacted the police about it, they just told me it was under investigation. But the thing that I find really scary about the whole thing is how there was a man chasing her when she got into my car on the highway, and we must have driven it at least five or six miles away from the scene. It couldn't have been the same guy who grabbed her, and there's no way of anyone knowing where we were headed. So how was someone able to find her at the gas station? Was it something to do with the phone call she made? I have so many unanswered questions about this event in my life, and sometimes I feel like it haunts me. I find myself scared of total strangers whose names I didn't even know, and as much as I hope she's okay, somewhere, and what happened was part of some horrible but brief chapter in her life, I have the worst feeling that she's not okay at all. On the last Friday in July, just before noon, Margaret Myers finished the report she'd been typing and shut down her laptop before emerging from her office. She made her way to the elevator, stopped by her assistant's office, and tapped on the door gently before slightly opening it. Cindy, I'm headed down to the cafe for lunch. You want anything? She asked. Cindy placed one hand over the office phone, looked up, 
and mouth the words, No thank you. This was the last time anyone saw Margaret alive. Surveillance cameras captured her leaving the office complex on the 16th floor and entering the elevator. She'd pressed the down button while chatting on her cell. Presumably, she was headed to the cafeteria on the second floor, but never emerged from the elevator there, nor any other floor in the building, including the roof and basement. It wasn't until 2 o'clock that Cindy noticed she hadn't returned to her office. This wasn't entirely unusual. However, her boss was notoriously punctual. If she were running late for anything, she could be relied upon to make it known to her assistant. Cindy sent a text, but hadn't become overly concerned. Margaret was a well-known and equally well-liked attorney in a prominent law firm, and thus her schedule could be erratic. Additionally, Cindy had a mountain of paperwork to attend to, so her absence was soon forgotten. Around 5, she packed up her briefcase and visited Margaret's office to have a word before leaving for the day. The office was empty. Again, she didn't consider this odd enough to be alarmed. Sometimes she held meetings that ran late, so Cindy might have simply missed her. With a busy weekend planned with her new boyfriend, she was eager to hurry home and prepare. The weekend passed with no sign of Margaret. Calls and texts went unanswered, and by Tuesday morning, law enforcement agencies Co-workers, volunteers, friends, and neighbors were frantically searching for her. Janitorial and maintenance staff scoured the building with no trace. Security staff worked overtime with detectives to review and scrutinize every second of known footage and were still left completely clueless. On Friday, a paralegal noticed a peculiar smell within an elevator and called maintenance. It was the same elevator that Margaret had been seen entering but not leaving. Her body was discovered on top of the elevator. The maintenance hatch of the elevator's cabin was intact, locked and securely tagged with no evidence of tampering. The autopsy revealed little, citing only faint traces of minor cuts and bruises, but nothing significant. The coroner's official cause of death was death by misadventure and or natural causes. To this day, it still remains unknown exactly how or why her body came to be on top of the elevator. A sizable reward offered by the law firm has never been claimed, and the mystery remains unsolved. If you have any information, please contact us immediately. My little boy is sick, and I am the one who has to take care of him. He has been isolated in his room for a few days now. He is not allowed to come out. I carry his favorite meal on a tray and knock on the door of his room. Honey, it's mommy. I've got your dinner here. Your favorite. I open the door gently as to not wake my little boy in case he's asleep. However, he sat up, wide awake, waiting eagerly for his food. I approached the corner where his mattress was placed on the floor and kneel in front of him. Thank you, mommy! My little boy suddenly lurches forward to hug me, but I step back out of his reach. The chains enclosed around his neck and ankles stopped him. I can see anger and frustration cross over his face. But it only lasts a moment. He sees what I have brought for him. He smiles when I set down the tray and digs in. I blankly watch my little boy chowing down on the meaty skin of the mailman who popped by this morning. His favorite part of the dinner are the eyes. He says they taste sweet and juicy. It makes me want to throw up. Everything about this makes me want to throw up. But like I said before, my little boy is sick. 
and I am the one who has to take care of him. He's finished. The tray is empty, and it is time for me to go. When I pick up the tray and turn my back to him, I hear his sweet, innocent voice sound out. I feel better, mommy. Can I come out now? Hearing those hopeful words is like a stab to my heart. I suck up my despair and say, Soon, my darling. Soon. Oh, okay, mommy. The disappointment in his voice will haunt me tonight. When I leave his room in the basement, I look and bolt the door. I then collapse to the floor and cry. When will this nightmare end? Will my little boy ever be better again? I'm a guy in my 20s working part-time at a convenience store. This unforgettable incident is the scariest thing I've ever experienced while working here. It was a few months ago. There was a boy who came to the convenience store every day. He looked like a middle school student and wore a baseball cap. However, he was always crying whenever I looked closely at his face. I thought he might have some backstory. Seeing him every day, I felt a sense of closeness toward him. So I asked him what was going on, but he always kept his mouth shut and never said anything. The strange thing was that there was always a very big guy following him. At first, I thought he would be one of his family members, but he had a suspicious look about him. One day, the child hesitated as if to tell me something. Then the big guy approached him and he glanced at the man and went outside with him. I knew something was going on. He seemed like he needed help. I made up my mind to talk to him and help this poor kid when he comes in next time. The next day, the boy came back to the convenience store. Still, he was wearing a baseball hat and the big guy was following from behind. Once again, I plucked up my courage and asked quietly what was going on. He glanced back and seemed to say something, but said nothing. I whispered to him, I'll help you. I'll call the police if you need me to. Then he opened his eyes wide and quietly said, No. He looked terrified. Poor thing. I wanted to help this kid. Then the man behind looked at us with a frown, approached us, and quickly took the child outside. I couldn't get the kid out of my head the entire time, but I didn't know what to do. The next day, he showed up again. I told him again that I would help any way I could. He still remained silent and gave me no response. This time, I eventually decided to follow the kid. After he left, I closed the convenience door and followed him in secret. I guessed that the child was living close to the convenience store, and I was right. I found out the location of his house. When this big guy who was always following the child went somewhere else, I grabbed the kid's shoulder. He looked at me with a shocked face, looked around, and soon began to talk to me. He said that he was kidnapped and was watched by the other men. I don't know when they would come. He told me he also told me to run as soon as possible. Hey, let me help you. However, he kept saying that if I called the police, we would all die. Then he hurriedly pushed me and went into the house. I was so confused. Then two larger men suddenly approached and asked me, What are you doing here? Do you know the kid? While I was in a panic, they suddenly grabbed me, tried to drag me into the house, and one rummaged in his pockets. I pushed them away with all my might and ran like crazy. I could hear the men shouting. 
Get back here or I'll kill this kid. I was worried about him, but I had no choice but to run in fear. Eventually, I got out of there and shivered for a long time. I tried to call the police, but suddenly remembered the child's face telling me not to call them. I couldn't do anything. Time just went by, but I didn't even have the courage to go there again. I haven't seen him since that day. After so many days, he no longer showed up at the convenience store. He was even no longer seen near his house. After that, I quit working at the convenience store and stayed in fear for a long time. But I still lived that day in my mind. It's just a constant loop. I wonder what happened to the kid. What kind of men were they? And is he still alive? I live in a duplex, and I think the girl on the other side of the house must be some sort of social media influencer. The walls are thin, and she talks all the time. And I'm always hearing snippets of her recording videos or doing live streams. Anything from makeup tips to her favorite recipes to DIY hacks. I tried to find her channel once to see her videos, but I'm not that active on social media, and I don't even know her name, just her face and voice. So I gave up. We don't cross paths often, and I've never been good with the friendly neighbor. We do kind of smile and nod things when we see each other, but that's it. But the last few times I've heard her, she sounded off, like she's forcing the happy voice for her videos. I've been working from home for over a year. The only other place I really spent time was my boyfriend's house. That's why I've gotten pretty familiar with her tones. Now I can even tell the difference between when she's recording for her channel or when she's on the phone with friends. A few months ago, she sounded extra perky, and I heard her mention something about a new boyfriend. I was happy for her, even if hearing it made me a little sad. I hadn't been seeing my own boyfriend as much lately, since he'd been busy with a new project at work. But lately, things don't seem as good for her. I noticed the subjects she talks about seem to have changed. Instead of the typical thing, how I prep a week of meals in an hour, or let's unbox this free set from so-and-so, I've heard her say something like this. Today, I want to teach you about how to notice red flags when you start seeing someone, or tips from moving on from a stalker. I was starting to get worried about her. I was considering going to knock on her door and introducing myself to see if she was okay, but I was swamped with work at that time. And I'd finally heard from my boyfriend after a few days of radio silence. I shrugged it off, thinking she had enough people supporting her. Maybe she was just getting into the true crime genre like every other girl. And I was being overdramatic. I ended up going to stay the night at my boyfriend's. I got home an hour or so ago and was settling in for dinner and a movie on my couch when I heard a different voice on her side of the house for the first time. And it was my boyfriend's voice. I just heard what he said. I think I need to call 911. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to teach you how to get revenge on the bitch who broke up with you. Four D is my passion. Four D is my life. Four D. This lottery is also how I got started in this business. My dad has been buying it since I was six. He must have had the luck of the devil because he always guessed the top number every time. In fact, he was so lucky that he didn't even need to find a job. The five hundred dollars that he got every time was enough. When I turned eighteen, he took me to the betting shop for the first time. 
I remember the excitement when I handed the piece of paper to the officials. After running back home, my heart pounded with anticipation. I remember reading the results in the newspaper the next day. I won second prize! My father was proud of me. He beamed as I showed him my winnings, and the money was fully displayed on the dinner table, like it was the most exquisite art piece. From then on, the betting shop would be like my second home. Running down there to buy it and checking the numbers in the newspaper became almost like a routine. Most of the time I won nothing. I was frustrated and despondent. Yet still, I was determined. I could still win this. Thus, I started researching how to improve my chances of winning. That was how I stumbled upon the advertisement one day. It was written in big, bold colors. Better chance to win big, triple the money. I just needed to give them a little something extra. It was exactly what I needed. <laughs> I woke my father up the next morning. I told him I would take him out to the betting shop, just the two of us, father and son. He agreed readily. He was getting old now. He was getting so old. His face was wrinkled and his hair was silvery gray. We took the taxi to the betting shop. After I bought 10 tickets, I marched up to the officials and handed them the money. Here you go. Take whatever you want from him. I said in Cantonese, shoving my father forward. He started to gasp and look back at me with his pleading face. But my face was like a stone. As the old man in charge opened the gates and dragged my father inside. I turned and walked away as my father's screams echoed out of the shop. They went all out taking their payment. Eyes, arms, legs, whatever they wanted. Blood pooled out of the entrance and ran down the drain. That night I checked the website. Despite buying 10 tickets, none of the numbers I bet on made it to the draw. I gnashed my teeth in frustration. I will win those million dollars one day. My brother looked over my shoulder. What's this? You know 4D? I asked. Hi. Do you want to come with me to the betting shop tomorrow? This happened to me when I was 10. I was sleeping in my room. Suddenly, the entire house started to shake with a huge crash, just like an earthquake. I was awakened with panic. I was trembling with fear, thinking that was an earthquake. At that moment, I heard my dad scream in his room. I ran to his room right away and saw a mysterious being standing in front of him. It was as enormous as it was about to break through the ceiling and my dad was absolutely overwhelmed with that horrible ambience. The horrifying creature talked. In five years, you will be dragged to hell. My dad cried and begged desperately on his knees. No, please I beg you, I have a little boy. The being blustered in a threatening voice. You committed the unforgivable sin. You will burn in hell. Then it disappeared. My dad collapsed to the floor, devastated. Next day he looked so grim and nervous. I was also frightened, but I didn't talk about what happened last night. After several days, we went back to our normal routines, as if we completely forgot about that day. Time passed away in an instant. And exactly five years later from that day, my dad vanished. The police handled it as a missing person case. They tried to track all his records and follow up on clues, but couldn't find anything. It has already been two years since his disappearance. His whereabouts is still unknown. In the CCTV records, 
The police saw my dad leaving work by driving away in his car from the parking lot of the company building. Then, his car was found in a distant alley. Only his clothes remained in the driver's seat. As if somebody took his body away. My dad disappeared. And nobody could find him. I had prayed to God every single day since then. To find my dad. I swore I would do anything if I could see him at least once. Even if he couldn't come back to me just once, I would be fine. I prayed over and over asking if he was still alive and where he was. Every night I prayed and cried myself to sleep. And last night I had a dream. That mysterious being showed up again, and this time in front of me. It was the exact same one I saw years ago. He said to me, Come with me, if you want to see where your father is. He took my hand and brought me outside. Immediately after stepping outside, the environment completely changed. It was hell. With boiling lava and sharp penetrating screams of millions of people. It was too hot, and I felt my body was burning in the fire. Because of ear-splitting cries and screams, I couldn't step forward anymore. And there, I saw my dad standing in the middle of hell. He stared at me with wide open eyes, not saying a word. Right in the middle of chaos full of endless pain, he gazed at me with eyes filled with pain and agony. I wailed, calling him, but no matter how loud I shouted, he didn't answer. He was just gazing at me, suffering in enormous pain. The mysterious being standing next to me said, Your father killed an innocent person two years before you were born. That is the reason why he is here with me, in hell. I couldn't believe that. I started to run to my dad, but at that moment I awoke from my sleep. I was awake, but I still felt the sizzling heat all over my body, and its pain. After that dream, I didn't look for him anymore, and I didn't pray anymore. I think it might just be a silly dream, but I can't forget that heat, those horrifying screams my dad's eyes because all of it seemed so real I don't know why but I feel like my dad is in hell I have hated my stepmother ever since my father married her it was obvious that the feeling was mutual as she hated children my father tried to pretend that we were one big happy family but it was clear that he knew the truth. She enforced these stupid rules on me that I hated. The dumbest one was no electronics at nighttime, as she thought I wouldn't get any sleep. Thankfully, my father listened to reason and made her drop this one. However, unfortunately, I had to obey her other pointless rules, like bedtime by nine, and I wasn't allowed to watch any shows she didn't agree with. I spent a lot of time at my friend's home over the next few months, just so I didn't have to deal with her. Dad's work is sending him away for a conference, so he will be gone for a week. I begged him to let me spend the week at one of my friends, but he refused. He kept saying that it would be the perfect chance for us to bond. After he left, she had a smirk on her face, as she knew that she was the one in charge of this house. I went to my room and decided to spend as much time here as possible over the next week. It was about 9 p.m. She walked into my room and told me to go to bed. Then I noticed her grab something from my bedside locker. When I confronted her, she reminded me of her rule about no electronics at nighttime. I begged her to return it, but she walked out of the room. I ran to the door and heard a key turn on the other side. There were footsteps walking away as I realized that she wasn't going to return it. 
Just then, I started to feel lightheaded, as I hadn't eaten in a couple of hours, and there was nothing to eat in my room. I ended up banging at the door, begging her to return my insulin pump, but she pretended like she couldn't hear me at all. My friend Max was one of the types who always did the best he could in school. He played basketball and everybody loved him. One day, he was on his way home from school and a girl by the name of Chloe followed him. While they were on their way, she asked Max if he could be her boyfriend completely out of nowhere. For your information, this girl had never spoke to him before. Um, no thanks. I'm not really looking for a girlfriend right now. He answered politely and left. And I guess this angered Chloe. A few days later, Max was walking home as usual. Just then, he saw three guys walking up to him. One of the guys said to Max, Where do you think you're going? Home, Max replied. He didn't know that he was in danger until one of the guys took out a knife. The tallest guy suddenly pushed Max to the floor and the rest started beating him up. Then the guy with the knife cut Max's back. Luckily, there was someone who had seen the altercation. He shouted at the three boys to stop when Max screamed in pain. As they ran away, the guy called the police and the ambulance arrived in a few minutes. Max woke up in the hospital in severe pain. Then he heard the police speaking to his mom saying, Ma'am, we've arrested the four suspects, three boys and one girl. To his surprise, the girl was Chloe. It turns out she had called three of her friends that just happened to be gang members and requested for them to stab Mike and beat him up. Chloe ended up being expelled from school and those three boys were sentenced to eight months in jail for helping Chloe in the assault and for stabbing my friend Max. My name is Donovan and this is a true scary story of mine that happened to me when I was four years old. It was a late Friday night. I remember it raining outside and my mom had put on a scary movie but about 30 minutes into the movie, she fell asleep. So I was watching the movie alone, and in the movie, a demon was going around killing these teenagers one by one after they summoned the demon in the woods. I stupidly decided to give it a try, to summon a demon. But I gave up after 10 minutes, as nothing seemed to happen. An hour later, I was going to use the bathroom, but I realized that the entire apartment was dark. At that time, I was deathly afraid of the dark, and I didn't want to go, but I couldn't just hold it anymore. So I finally gathered some courage and got up to use the bathroom. But before I made it to the bathroom at the end of the hallway, I... I saw a dark figure. It appeared out of nowhere, with red glowing eyes, just like the demon from the movie. It couldn't have been my mom, because she was still sleeping on the couch. And it couldn't have been my dad either, because he was still at work. I was scared to death and ran to tell my mom, but when I woke her up, she said that I must have had a bad dream. When I looked back again, it was gone, but I couldn't get it off my mind. I couldn't sleep that night, and things got much worse the next day. Around 8 or 9 p.m., my mom made me go to bed, but when she left the room and turned off the light, that same demon appeared again and jumped towards me. I just hid under my covers the entire night, but in the morning... 
I was surprised to see a big, long crack in the mirror near my bed. Now I'm 14 years old. But I still remember the incident like it was yesterday. This happened to me when I was going to school in Los Angeles during the spring of 2012. I grew up in Indiana in a very safe community, so it took a while for me to adjust to the craziness and crime in the city. I was living in an apartment with four other women at my college. Our place was above a house, so to access it you had to go down a long alleyway next to the house and up some stairs, so it was pretty out of the way. On this particular day, I stopped by the apartment to grab some music before choir practice, so I came inside and started gathering my materials on the kitchen table. I didn't bother locking the door since I would only be there for a few minutes. There was a knock on the screen door, and when I looked up, there was a man standing on the doorstep. He was a young Hispanic male, medium height, and wearing a t-shirt and jeans. Uh, hello? I called out to him thinking that he was delivering a package or something. The man doesn't say a word and reaches down and opens the screen door. He then begins to walk towards me. Still at this point I was not alarmed, starting to say something about him leaving the package on the table, when I noticed he didn't have one. The only thing in his hand was a box cutter. By the time I realized this, he was too close for me to escape, and he put the blade against my neck. He then told me to get up and walk into my roommate's bedroom next to the kitchen. He locks the door and pushes me onto the bed. My mind is racing the whole time, telling myself that he probably just wants to rob me and that I will let him take whatever he wants. As I'm sitting on the bed, he starts looking around the room. He then grabs some telephone cables next to the bed and begins trying to tie my wrists together. It wasn't working too well, but he kept trying. I eventually snapped out of my trance, realizing that this situation could become even more dangerous if he binds me. I screamed and started pushing him. I made a break for the door. He caught me and tried again to tie my hands together, but I was thrashing and screaming and kept hitting him in his head. After a few seconds of this, he decides to bail and runs out of the apartment. I followed him, screaming for help. One of my neighbors who lived in the house under our apartment came out within seconds and saw the guy running down the alley and chased him into the street. We called the cops and they came right away. I ended up going down to the station where I worked with a police sketch artist on a composite that ended up being posted on the television. They caught the guy within a week. The police officer who responded to the scene said that there was a local gang that required new members to cut off the nipples of women and bring them back as an offering. Ever since this experience, I always tell people to lock their doors, even if they're just stopping by to grab a few things. You're better off safe than sorry. This happened several months ago. We had a store beside our house in the Big Hut, and there was always a guy who would come in and purchase beer in the store. He would always get it for free, and said that he would pay for it all in the next month. However, he never kept his word. One month later, me, my mom, and my dad were staying at our hut. While they were eating dinner, I was in the back playing video games. After a few minutes had went by, the guy came in to get a beer for free, and this time, my mom and dad had got mad at him. Dad asked him to pay the bill right now and this made the man angry. They started yelling at each other and my dad told us to go back inside the house. When the guy just suddenly left, I could see him bringing his AK-47 and sitting on the chair. Pack up your things and spend the night at your grandma's house. Dad told us as my mom and I got in the car to get ready to head to my grandmother's house. One of my cousins was staying there, so I spent the night with her playing video games 
and my mom was watching TV with my grandma. The next morning, we woke up to my dad's phone call, and he had told my mom what happened last night. That guy tried to break into our house. Mom eventually called the police, but the man was never found. The next day when we returned home, Dad told us our dog had died. He said he was found with a big gash on his neck, which was most likely the cause of death. And one of our neighbors heard intense barking that night. She also saw a guy walking around our house. After the investigation, the police found out that he had an axe which was used to kill my dog. Since that horrific incident, my dad's friend and cousins went to our house to guard for the nights. And unfortunately, the guy was still never found. I hope that I don't encounter him in the future. When I was 21, I lived with my ex-boyfriend in Southern California. It was the first time in my life that I was on my own and had the freedom of being out from under the watchful eyes of my parents, which made me a bit reckless. We lived in what was considered to be a safe neighborhood. Nice houses lined the streets. Cal State University was nearby, and we rarely heard of violent crimes happening in the area. One late Friday night in July, at approximately 1 a.m., my boyfriend and I got bored and wanted to get out of our hot apartment. We decided to walk several blocks away to a lovely park that had an artificial lake where ducks and geese would gather. There were benches around the lake where you could sit and watch the water. The sky was clear, the moon was out, and it was a hot summer night in Orange County. The park was surrounded by an expanse of towering trees and thick bushes. My boyfriend was a naturally thin guy with long hair. I was 5'5 and weighed 100 pounds at the time. We sat on a bench to watch the rippling water as the moonlight reflected off its surface with the trees and bushes at our backs. Out of nowhere, the bright headlights of a police cruiser came speeding through the adjacent parking lot, the vehicle's frame bouncing off the concrete speed bumps as red and blue lights flashed. It then came to a screeching stop, and a spotlight was shined into the trees. We both thought, Shit, we aren't supposed to be here. The hell do we do? We may or may not have been under the influence. This was remarkably bad timing. We knew the police saw us, so we just stayed because if we started running, we would risk being chased down and arrested. However, the cop didn't approach us right away. We looked on for a while and wondered, what the hell's going on over there? We thought maybe the officer caught a drug deal going down. We couldn't make out a whole lot through the trees. Eventually, the cop approached us. We thought for sure that we would get arrested or fined for being in the park while it was closed. What the officer told us was truly terrifying. He was doing a routine patrol when he spotted a man in the trees watching us. He then told us that since my boyfriend had long hair and was thin, the man hiding in the trees most likely assumed that we were both females seeing us from behind. My boyfriend's ego was shattered. Once the cop saw that the stalker was slowly moving closer to us, that's when he decided to turn on his lights and rush in. What he found on the man was alarming. He found an arsenal of knives, handcuffs, zip ties, duct tape, and a gun. The kidnapper's field kit, basically. I was overwhelmed by fear. We were very lucky that the cop had seen him creeping around in the bushes, because it would not have ended well for us. We thanked the officer, and proceeded to walk the few blocks back to our apartment in silence. I feel very lucky to be alive today, and we never returned to that park again. It was just another winter day when I went to my friend's house for a party. We were playing video games and one of my friends suggested to go out for a walk. So we decided to go for a walk and started getting hungry along the way. 
We went to buy snacks from the local convenience store. After getting what we needed, we were heading back home when we heard someone yelling at us. Hey! We quickly stopped and turned around to see a group of teens hiding behind a car. They were just staring at us. We hadn't thought much of it until one of my friends pointed them out and said, Look guys, I, I think those guys are following us. We all turned around quickly again to see them trying to hide. We then started to walk faster and my friend wanted us to take a shorter way home through a small ditch. While walking through the ditch, we again heard someone shouting at us. When we turned around, we saw the same group running at us. Then my friend said, Run! And we all started to run back home as fast as we could. Suddenly, I got a call from my dad, asking when we were going to be back home. I asked him to wait outside the house for us, because some people were following us. When we got back home, I rushed to hug my dad and told him to call the police right away. When we were waiting outside for the police to arrive, I heard a stone hitting my window. When we looked out, we saw the same group of guys in our front yard. When the police arrived, we gave them our statements and the guys quickly headed off. Ever since then, my dad put up security cameras around the house. A few days later, while I was sleeping, I suddenly woke up to a loud noise. I quickly noticed a dark shadow in the corner, so I rushed to turn on my lamp. I was shocked to see a guy. A guy that I recognized his face. It was similar to the guy in that group that day. I screamed out loud and my dad came rushing to my room. He was as surprised to see that guy and tackled him to the ground. While he held the guy, he told me to call the police. After a while, the police arrived and they arrested him. I then remembered that we had security cameras, so I told them to check it out. While watching the cameras, we saw that he had entered through an open window. I was in total shock. I'm glad nothing has happened ever since. But I still wonder what could have happened if I would have never woken up. I hate watching TV with my family. Every night it's the same thing. At 6.30pm, mom and dad are on the main couch with both of my little brothers. My little sister sits over on the small couch with my older brother on the recliner. They don't have room for me. I don't care. Ever since my dad got the new top-of-the-line HD TV, something weird began to happen. They don't watch anything good. No movies, no streaming series, nothing. They just sit on their butts and silently stare at the blank 60-inch screen. I mean... From the way they act, it's clear they think they're watching something. But I just can never tell what it is. They'll be sitting there all dead silent, then burst out with the loudest, <laughs> most obnoxious laughter you've ever heard. And one other night, they just suddenly started screaming for no reason, with their eyes wide with terror. It's not like normal screaming either. High-pitched. Super disturbing. The other night, they did that for three straight hours. They were all hoarse the next morning, but none of them knew the reason. Sometimes I tried to ask what they're watching, but they just told me how stupid I am and told me to just see for myself. If I say it's because the TV is a non, my dad tells me I'm being a smartass and I can just leave if I don't want to join the family. But I don't want to leave either. Because the TV isn't always blank. I never know when it's going to happen, but every night it turns on for a little while. My family doesn't seem to notice, though. What actually displays is a grainy black and white image of a family watching TV, as if it's recording them. 
Sometimes it'll glitch out and one or two of my family members will flicker and disappear from the screen for a second. That'd be unnerving enough, but that's not the worst of it. The main reason why I even sit in the living room with them is that it allows me to know where they are. The ones I call the guests. The guests creep into our living room from the fireplace, the back door, the office, the hallway, everywhere. And I can only see them through the TV screen. There's the goat-legged thing who likes to chew on my mom's hair. There's a boy with a snake head who whispers evil things in their ears. The tall blinking thing that wants to kill me and the girl with three mouths. I don't want to see them anymore. And there are many more that I don't even want to begin to describe. So I just sit there and watch them. That's why I don't sleep alone anymore. I would describe myself as a loner during my high school years. I would often play video games, keep to myself, and not socialize with anyone outside of a few friends. One day, my friend who I'll call Charlie told me that he was having a sleepover at his house on Friday, and I agreed to join. When Friday came, my parents drove me to his house. Charlie and I headed straight to his basement and played some Call of Duty until around 11, when his mom told us it was time for bed. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to hear a thud above me, as if someone was stomping on the floor above us. I tried to wake up Charlie, but his subconscious told me to fuck off. I tried to go back to sleep, but I heard another loud thud above me about a half hour later followed by heavy footsteps. I heard the basement door slowly creak open. I decided to hide in the closet behind some coat hangers. After a while of waiting, I ended up dozing off. I would say I woke up around an hour later to the sound of heavy breathing. I looked up, and what I saw next sent chills rushing down my body. Through the slits in the closet door, a pair of eyes were peering in at me. My stomach felt as if it was about to explode. I covered my mouth with both hands to stop myself from screaming. I went further back into the closet and hid in the darkness, and stayed there until the morning. I didn't mention anything to Charlie or his mother about what I saw. To this day, I don't know who or what came down into the basement and just stared at me through the closet door. It gives me the creeps just thinking about it. After that night, I stopped going to Charlie's house. This happened to me when I was 15 years old. One day, me and my friend were planning to go camping in the woods. We packed everything we need, and my dad drove us to the camping site, which wasn't that far away from my home. After we arrived at the entrance, we started to go deep into the woods. When we found a good place to stay, we finished setting up our tent and eat our sandwiches. It was around 10pm, and we decided to go inside to get some sleep, as we were really tired at that time. Next day when I woke up, I looked around and realized that my friend was nowhere to be seen. I got out of the tent and started to look around, but he wasn't there either. I went deeper into the woods to see if he was playing with me, but no. There was not a soul in sight at all. That moment sent a shiver down my spine, so I eventually packed my things and started to run towards my home. When I got home, I didn't tell my parents that my friend disappeared at first. The next day in the morning, I took my bike and went to the same place where we camped to search for him again. As I went deeper into the woods, I saw an abandoned cottage. It looked quite old and dirty. I knocked on the door but nobody answered. Then I noticed the door was slightly open, so I pushed it to get in. It was dead silent. I started to walk around for a while and the first thing I saw was a door in the corner. I got to the door, grabbed the doorknob and opened it slowly. 
What I saw at that moment was something that I can never forget to this day. To my horror, it was a dead body. It was my friend. I couldn't even let out a scream. I ended up running out of the cottage and rushed home with all my might. But still, I couldn't tell anyone about what I saw. My friend's parents cried and struggled to find their son who never returned home. What's even weirder was... His body was never found in the cottage when the police had a search in the woods. We don't know what happened to my friend, and I guess we will never find out. My name is Ahmed. I am 23 years old and love to visit different places around my country. As I live in Saudi Arabia, I decided to go north, around 600 kilometers away from me. It was about 3 p.m. when I started my journey, and I was still on my way when it was 7. It was the winter season, so it usually got dark fast. I got hungry while I was driving, so I tried to find the nearest gas station. After about 20 minutes, I found one that had dim lights and seemed very old. It had a very creepy vibe to it, but still, I went into the store. While buying some snacks and drinks, I felt like I had to go to the bathroom. I asked the man at the counter if there was any bathrooms nearby, and he told me where to go. I was on my way to the bathroom when I heard... Screaming. What the... Confused, I stood there for a while and then saw a body thrown out of the bathroom, which looked like a bloody mess. That was all I could see from that distance. Then I saw someone walk out of the bathroom. When I hid behind the nearby wall, a man in his mid-thirties dragged the body and took it to a shit-like place. I could tell that he was in a very awful condition, as he had markings all over his face. He had a knife in his pocket, and his clothes were covered in mud and blood, and were all worn out like he never changed them. When he was done dragging the body to the shed, he started to walk towards my car, which was my only escape. I was terrified to approach my car, but luckily, he went away. After making sure that no one was around, I ran to my car. I started my car and stepped on the gas to escape from that place. When I drove far away from that gas station, I found a mosque. I stopped my car close to it, ran inside, and found the Imam who leads the prayers at the mosque. After telling him everything that happened, he gave me a bottle of water to calm myself down and call the police. The police arrived in a few minutes. They questioned me and eventually went to the gas station to investigate. I was still staying at the mosque waiting for them, and the police came back about an hour later. They said that the guy was arrested. It turned out he's been hiding in the place for about seven years and killed the people who entered the bathroom. What's even more horrific is that his parents and his wife were killed in the same bathroom. And after killing those people, he dragged their bodies to a remote place where no one could see. Eventually, he was sent to the prison and was sentenced to death. I could have been killed if I didn't see that body in the bathroom and just went inside. I'm glad that I am fine now, and I am thankful to God for saving my life. One last thing that I want to say is, please, follow your instincts, and always make sure you're safe in situations like this. My name is Caleb, and I live in Pennsylvania. Not near any big cities like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, so you can imagine it's a pretty woodsy area where I live. This happened some years ago when I was 11. It was my 11th birthday, and I had invited 8 of my friends, but for this story, there's only 2 of them who really matter. And their names are Landon and Mateo. To give you a basic layout of my yard, you have my house and driveway on the left, and if you move a little to the right, you'll get to the pig pen, and behind the pig pen is a big pine tree. And let's say you decide to go even further more to the right, you'll get to my neighbor's house. My dad knew that some of my friends hadn't been over to my house before, and didn't want them to end up into my neighbor's yard, so he built a little fence just to make sure that no one would go into the neighbor's yard. During my birthday party at one point, we all decided to play manhunt. I don't know if I played it right or wrong, but we made two teams. A seeking team and a hiding team. After an hour or so, 
Almost everyone said they wanted to go inside. I told them that they could go inside if they wanted, but I was going to go ahead and stay outside and search for Mateo, who was nowhere to be found. Everyone went inside except for me and my friend Landon. We both decided to search for Mateo. We split up at one point, and I was behind my house looking for him. When I saw a dark figure in my driveway, I guess the other person saw me too, because he rushed around to the front of my house. I chased after him since I thought it was Mateo. The figure then ran up to the pig pen and went around the pine tree. I swear at one point, I heard a strange laugh and it didn't sound at all like Mateo. It sounded like someone else, but there was something very off with that laugh. You kinda had to be there to really understand it. At that time, I didn't think much of it and continued to chase him. Once I went around the tree, he was gone. I searched everywhere, but I couldn't find him. While the fence was small, you couldn't jump over the fence that fast. That's what scared me. I heard something drop beneath the tree. I moved the branches out of the way and shined my flashlight towards the tree, but there was no one to be seen. Being absolutely scared to death, I began to run away when I saw Landon. I got him and told him the entire story. He didn't believe me. I told him that I wasn't splitting up again, and he said that that was okay with him, and we both started to search again behind the house. We were getting bored looking for Mateo. We were shouting for him and screaming, but after a while, we decided to give up. Then, in a sore and raspy kid-like voice, we heard from behind us, You can't give up. You still haven't found me. We both turned around and saw that same black figure running back up to the pig pen. I was terrified. Landon quickly convinced me that it must be Mateo, just changing his voice and trying to scare us. I nodded, and we both ran after him. When we were only a few yards behind him and about to get in the pig pen, I told Landon to run around to the other side. He did and I kept chasing after the figure. But just like last time, once it turned around the pine tree, it was gone. I saw Landon run around the other side. We were both terrified. We then heard in that same sore and raspy kid-like voice say, I'm right here. Come and catch me. Then came the sound of three to five heavy pair of boots stepping onto the ground from, from what sounded like almost every direction. We both screamed aloud and ran back towards the house. Mateo came out of the other side of the house where he was hiding the entire time. And we both told him to run inside the house with us. We got inside and everyone looked so confused seeing us all so scared. We told them what had just happened, and they didn't even believe us. I was just so shocked that not even my parents believed us. It wasn't like we were saying that there were zombies or something, but something so much more plausible. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. Now there's another part of this story, and I still believe to this day that this part of the story is connected to what happened that fateful night. Two years passed from that night. And one day, I decided to walk around my neighbor's house since she was on vacation. And I surprisingly hadn't been there before. I walked around her house wanting to see what it had looked like. When I turned around the other side of her house, my heart literally felt like it dropped. I saw a kid with long greasy hair and a dirty face that looked the same age as me. He was smiling and gesturing with his fingers for me to come with him. I was so scared I could barely move. Then he screamed. 
He's right there. He's right there. Get him. Get him. Then I heard three to five pairs of footsteps coming around from the other side. I was able to finally move and started to sprint towards my house. Luckily, my dad had taken down the fence after my 11th birthday, so I had a straight path right to my house. While I was running, the thought came to my mind that these were probably the same people from my birthday party incident that happened two years ago. Once I got back into the house, I looked through the window to see if they were still there. But they were all gone. I told my parents, and just like last time, they didn't believe me. I collected all of my savings I had from doing chores and I begged my parents to buy security cameras for the house. They finally agreed. Soon we got security cameras and connected it to the security app so that it would alert our phones just in case we weren't home and someone was going to break in. I'm older now, but I still suffer from PTSD from that incident. I have no idea what they would have done if they would have gotten a hold of me. Were they pedophiles or psychos or just looking to kill me? When I think of it, it still gives me goosebumps to this day. This is a true story told to me by my grandmother a few years ago. I had brought up Bigfoot as a topic and showed her the famous Ohio Howl. She snapped to attention in fierce recognition and said, I heard that one time when me and your grandpa were fishing on the river. It happened down in southeastern Oklahoma, west of Broken Bow Lake, when my grandparents decided to go catfishing in a spot we'll call the Big Hole. This was their favorite place to catch catfish, as the depth of the river allowed for bigger fish than what was normal. And so after a long drive into the woods, they picked their place along the bank and set up their gear. Sitting on the bank, they were enjoying the nice time period between sundown and nighttime, feeling the cool air from the water cooling them off from the fleeting sun's rays. That's when they heard what was described as a yell from upriver. Now it's at this point I have to say that my grandmother is a sweetheart, but in some situations, she lacks some common sense, as when she heard the yell, the first thing she did was to mimic it. They went back and forth between each other for about a minute, before it stopped, and she thought that was the end of it. Hours pass, and sometime around midnight, they hear the same yell again, only it's closer and louder than before. If you're wondering whether she tried to mimic the yell again, the answer is yes, and again it was a back and forth. However, this time when it stopped, there was silence for a while. Suddenly, an enormous splash came from just up the river. After the first splash, there was another, and another, until they realized it was rocks being thrown into the water steadily coming closer with every throw. My grandfather decided that he'd had enough and started to pack everything they brought, telling my grandma to go start the truck that was sitting at the top of the embankment. Once she got to the top, she froze at the trailhead because she could see a dark figure in the trees standing next to the truck, yards from where she was. This figure was taller than the truck by at least a foot or more, and easily towered over her. She could hear this thing breathing heavily, not in a tired way, but more aggressive, as if to say, I know you're here, but I own this land, and you aren't welcome. Right then and there, my grandma made the smartest decision of the night, and walked right back down the bank to my grandpa, so she wouldn't have to be alone with that thing. When she got back down there, he asked her why she hadn't started the truck, but all she said was, let me help you and I'll tell you later. They finished packing and now had to return to the truck, but once they got there, there was no sign of that thing she had seen. 
Relieved, they hopped in and sped out of there as quickly as possible. In the truck, she told him of the figure she saw by the truck, and the two of them swore they would never go back. To this day, they still haven't, and now that the roads going there are all blocked off by the forestry service, I doubt they ever will. I marveled at her story because not only was she someone who didn't make up tales, she was also a very experienced woodswoman and had accompanied my grandpa on many hunting and fishing ventures. So to say she knew about the animals that should and shouldn't be in the forest would be an understatement. <laughs>